Welcome back, my friends, to the Calling Phuket. It's time for day two. We got four more rounds of Classic Constructed. We got the top eight, and we got a champion. We got a crown. My name is Sam Burton, and I'm joined by Pongage Patwani. How are you feeling, brother? Feeling really good, Sam. I mean, being in Phuket in general is just so amazing. It's warm. It's sunny. We're at a resort. We're playing card games in a resort, people. This is just extremely fun and what an amazing vibe just to, to go into our day two of the Calling Phuket. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to, and the entire venue yesterday was in, was packed out. Mm -hmm. We were at capacity, yep. basically, for this calling, which really just goes to show how much the community out here, but also people from all over the world have enjoyed coming out and, and really taking part in this incredible experience. And just what, what a kind of like success story, right, for Flesh and Blood and for everybody uh, here involved in kind of putting on this whole show that we had a whole packed house yeah. yesterday. But now today, that packed house has come all the way down to the top 48 players. So let's go ahead and check out the standings. Let's see who's at the top, who's fighting their way to get to the top, and who is still undefeated. Pankaj, walk me through. What are we looking at here? Just one quarter of our players remaining going to day two of the calling. Now, what we're looking here is a lot of local talent. Now, of course, this has been pretty international. You know, we've had a few international names coming up. You know, the Peter Ward, the Brody Spurlock, the Michael Fung. But a lot of the names here are really just the local names. A lot of teams blue pitch and a lot of just the Singaporeans and Malaysians and uh, people from Thailand that a lot of people don't really hear about. So starting with our top two, Tian Wei and Vespa spearheading day two, the only two undefeateds left. Yeah, 100%. And a couple, you know, only seven prisms came to this tournament. You can see two of them in the current top eight right now. And if you want to see the one that's undefeated take on the other undefeated in Tian Wei on that Azalea deck, then you are going to love our feature match for round one because, dude, it's, it's the two undefeateds. What are we mm -hmm. going to do? Not check them out? Let's check them out. We have got Vespa from Thailand versus Tian Wei from Malaysia. These are your last two undefeateds of the calling Phuket. And, and listen, if there's one thing I know about the Flesh and Blood community, they're always going to have incredibly measured discourse. Mm -hmm. There's going to be respect on all sides. There's going to be understanding about the intricacies of the game. And I think that has been on display with this with this Prism and ALS Discord more, more than I've seen in recent times. It really seems like the community has, has you know, had a temperate response. They've measured their understandings and people are really talking about this with a lot of nuance and a lot of understanding. Would you agree? Yeah, very mature takes from yes. the Twitter community. Uh, about Prism and ALS coming out 100%. Yeah. Now, we did see this matchup yesterday. It was Channon versus uh, Justin Koo, uh, Prism versus Azalea, with um, Channon taking it down in the matchup. So Vespa is going to look to try and recreate that, and Tianwei is going to try and defy the odds and try and take Vespa down on that Prism. Yes, and we, we, we do make some jokes at you know we, uh, about the, the, the response from the community and seeing some of the things that this Prism deck can do, but I think that the response from the community is a lot of the same kind of internal response, not necessarily in the incendiary nature. <laughs> but a lot of players here, I think, this weekend are looking at these two prisms at the top of the table, and they're playing these prisms, and they're saying, what the heck is going on? And like we've talked about kind of leading into this broadcast, prism is a deck like others in the past, that you have to kind of bring some tech pieces around to have the greatest amount of success. And looking at it, this Azalea deck, you know, and, and these Azalea decks that we have here, there are some tech pieces that they could have brought. The question is, without those tech pieces, can they get through what this Prism deck is capable of? I think part of what we're seeing is a lot of people just not having access to really good Prism players to practice against. There may be just a handful of really experienced Prism players around the world, and if your testing group doesn't have one of those people, you might just underestimate Prism, not bringing those tech pieces, or not even remember things like giving them the priority windows for ALS or remembering that you can get blown out by something like an ALS. So yeah. I think that's a lot of what we're seeing this weekend, but I fully expect that to change after this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. This is going to be a big old Herald Herald of Judgment here, I believe. Uh, tenacity? Tena uh, judgment. Yeah, Herald Judgment, yes. Yeah, Herald of Judgment going to come down and say no cards from the Banished Zone if it hits, but that is not going to be uh, super relevant here for the Azalea player, but it is just a big old... Herald with Go Again, thanks to, of course, Luminaris Angel's Glow. Gives the first Angel Go Again and gives the first Herald Go Again, as long as he got that yellow in the pitch. Can see the Invoke Soraya, somewhat of a contentious card among the Prism playing community, if that is an auto-include or not. Can it buy a six block here with the two, three blocks from Azalea on the turn zero? But there is the Angelic Wrath. It is the plus two to target Herald. So this attack is going to come over the top, get the two damage across, and our first prism trigger of the game with the Empyrean Rapture on the field to back it up. What does this mean for turn zero, Pankaj? Very, very strong start for Vespaia. Not only leaking damage through, but very possibly establishing an angel as well. Not as strong of a start as we saw yesterday with a turn zero library, I have to say, but still, you can't ask for anything better when you are 
going uh, turn zero into an azalea. Now it does look like he's going to be arsenaling a blue herald, which is not exactly what you want to arsenal. But even those blue heralds are pretty overrate as long as they don't get popped. You know, without the phantasm thing, this it's basically a two for five with go again on hit, gain for life. You're seeing the figment of war going to come in and create a courage token upon entry. Looks as though because uh, Vespa might be keeping that card for the arsenal, not just snap grabbing the erudition. You see a lot of prison players grab that uh, initially to start the game to create the ponder. Um, we are going to go ahead and immediately activate, utilizing the Empyrean Rapture's discount ability. It is free to flip into Bologna, the Archangel of War. That did banish the card from the soul, so now, you know, Vespa can have to try to find another way to get a card into soul. But, as we saw, Angelic Wrath and these other kind of little buffer effects, plus potentially Dominate and just big old Herald attacks that Azalea might not have access to enough poppers, that's going to be a big part of the game plan. And the Empyrean, Empyrean Rapture's, you know, vestige of soul switching between these two game plans, a lot of why this deck kind of is finding success, almost dash-like, and you have these two different game plans based on the chest piece. So looking at the math of that turn zero, he leaked two damage in, effectively gained four life from the ward, and also established a courage token as well. So very, very strong seven power swing going turn zero, almost entirely making up for the life deficit that Prism starts with. Now on Sianwei's side, we do see one tech piece in his hand in that battering bolt, a popper both for Prism and for Dromai. However, battering bolt, given that it's a six power popper, sometimes not exactly a sort of yeah. power you need into Prism because of the Rainbow Herald of Triumphs that they usually pack, and also the fact that they have Halo to try and find Figment of Triumph at instant speed to make your 6 power actually a 5 power. Yeah, this is going to be a read the glide path after the Death Dealer activation. So we've already drawn a card, putting the Infecting Shide into the Arsenal, and now Tianwei deciding what is going to be the Opt effect. Just see a couple big red arrows in the hand there. So not much is going to do... You know, neither of those cards are going to really help the Infecting Shot that much, as well as we can see the Perch Grapplers down in the list. Because of these big Heralds and without a lot of poppers, sometimes you just need a little bit of extra block in that leg piece, rather than being able to do something like if this Infecting Shot go again. Still just two cards in the hand, so it looks like Tianwei might be left with a card in hand after the Arsenal here. So speaking of tech pieces that Azalea can bring into Prism, you know, a few of the common ones are something like Soul Shield, oh sorry, Soul Shield, Merc Maya Grapnel, uh, and also Tarpet Trap, actually, funnily enough, because mm. it denies the Herald on hit. But we do see another piece in Senwei's hand, which is that Sleep Dart. Now, Prism really relies on a hero ability to end up going, you know, massively overrated, you know, finding the figment and immediately flipping it into Ward. Um, so Sleep Dart will also probably come in very, very handy later on in this game, should Senwei be able to establish a big buff to one, preferably with Dominate as well. Look at this, the Ward 5 going to come through and take care of th 5 of that damage, of course, letting 3 leak over. Still having a couple tokens created, the Spectral Shield from the Wave of Reality and the Blood Rot Pox token from the Infecting Shot. But just like you mentioned, that turn 0, gaining that quote-unquote 4 life out of the Ward of the Archangel of War. And now Vespa's got a 5 card hand to work with and one of those cards is the light of soul let's see if it's pitched here to give this angel go again it is we're going to reveal the top card if it is yellow it goes into the soul let's see and it is going to be another herald of judgment which is a herald mm -hmm. that heads to the soul during an action phase you know what that means it's time to search mm -hmm. and very important to know, this Blood Rod Pox has a very interesting re uh, interaction with Ward. Should Vespa end his turn with an Angel oh, wow. and not pay for the Blood Rod Pox, it yeah, will yeah. actually destroy <laughs> the Angel because it has Ward is going to prevent the damage from the Blood Rod Pox. So Vespa does need to be mindful about that and make sure that he's able to pay for the Blood Rod Pox or not flip an Angel. Yeah, now, that's so, so, so nice of these Angels. Like, they see Prism feeling a little sick and they say, let, let me die. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'm, I got I'm, you. I'm going to die. I'm going to sacrifice myself. I'll I'm be the martyr. Die. I'm straight, just going to die. <laughs> I don't want want you to be sick that that's not how you know that's not how my girl rolls interesting you can see vespa brings the figment of triumph to the front maybe sniffing out like you know my opponent kept a card in hand after the arsenal wonder if that's a popper and the mm -hmm. figment of triumph let's see if that is going to be the selection here it is so now all attack action cards for Tian Wei are at minus one power this turn so those poppers not going to do anything and left their seven we know battering bolt comes in for six so now all of a sudden this herald uh from the Arsenal there, going to go ahead and be a little more challenging to deal with, and of course, more cards to work with for Vespa. A bit of a doubling down on the minus one effect is Vespa with the Herald of Triumph on the field and finding a Figment of Triumph. So, you know, Herald of Triumph already not poppable by a six power attack, and Vespa saying now even any seven power attacks that he might run, which I don't think Zenway is running any of them, but saying even those will not be popping anything. Or perhaps ensuring the second Herald that he sends this turn is getting a Figment of Triumph buff. Oh, uh, effect. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Um, any attack action card I block with is minus two? Yep, for now. For this turn? Not for this turn, just for this combat chain. 
for this. Uh, okay. Just that, for this. Should, should, should be for the attack, yeah. That yeah, chain so, link, I believe, is what Vespa meant. Yeah, so what they're saying here is, of course, the Herald of Triumph. If you block with an attack, it would be at minus two, but then any attacks following would just be at the minus one, thanks to the Figment of Triumph. It's cool, though. I mean, you can really see the flavor at work here, right? Here's the Herald of Triumph, right? That is the, the angel that heralds the coming of the Angel of Triumph. But before the Angel of Triumph can gain, first you just see the Figment of Triumph mm -hmm. shining through the sky before the Angel of Triumph will come and join. This Herald, of course, just going to go ahead and hit Tianwei here, which goes to Prism Soul, which means time for another Figment to join the party as Prism just pulls these astral images from the heavens down to aid in her fight against the Archer here. And there's a lot of implicit value in tutoring out these figments to put them on the field because it means you're not going to, you have less chance of drawing them in your hand. And it's so awkward to draw these no blocks. You never want to just pay for to establish a figment and you don't be holding them either because of the no block. So a lot of implicit value on these on hits, even if not all of them are flipped into angels. Yep. And the other thing is that, you know, if suppose your opponent has a cheeky rain raises to go over the top of one of their arrows, you get to instant speed flip a figment to mm. bring the ward for and then help prevent any damage. And against Azalea, you do want to make sure you are preventing those on hits. So while these figments come into play and they may not get uh, immediate value, there's a lot of implicit value to be gained from them. Good point. Now, I think we have to really keep in mind that there is this Blood Rock Pox sitting on the field. Like you talk about, if these angels go ahead and join the party thanks to the free flip based on the Empyrean Rapture, the Blood Rock Pox does have the potential to just eat through at least one of them, which is probably not how Vespa wants to see them used. We're going to go ahead and grab the Figment of Protection here. Look, that's going to go ahead and make a spe second Spectral Shield. So now the two Spectral Shields can eat up the two Blood Rock Pox damage instead of the ward. They're really heads up play from Vespa. Yeah, he's... You can tell the experience he's had yeah. with this deck and understanding the tools that Azalea has had to beat Prism. And this going this just goes back to the experience that these players have in these matchups. You can reasonably expect that the more dark horse deck like Prism has a lot more experience into a bit more of the popular deck like Azalea yeah. rather than the other way around. And here you see Vespa really showcasing that, saying, all right, I'm going to get the second Spectral Shield. Now I can just freely flip my, flip my Angels and I don't need to have any... Um, I don't need to be pay for the Blood Rod Pox to help save my angel. No, no, it's, it's the on-hit trigger, not huh? the ability that you activate. On-hit trigger? Yeah, it says that whenever a card with hero in its name is put into Prism Soul during an action phase, I yes. serve for the fragment, okay. and then her uh, hero ability, her ability is, is once a turn. Stand, you pay two Benita card for Prism Soul and awaken the fragment. So okay. I did not awaken anything yet, because it's still fragment, see? We were just speaking about how one of the players yeah, clearly going to be more experienced. experienced. Yeah. And when you see one of the players trying to read the opponent's cards, you know exactly who has you know the edge on that in in that aspect of uh, of the gameplay over here. That being said, Sanway is definitely you know not out of his game. We already spoke about a sleep dart. We've been speaking about these blood rod pox tokens. He has his outs, and you know especially Azalea with dominate into something a prism that has a lot of no blocks. Yeah, not yet. It's definitely, de definitely, definitely, very much a game for us. Still. Yeah, absolutely. Because once these, you know, we have seen a number of figments now join the party and go ahead. One's already, you know, died to a big arrow, and we do have a couple more figments on the table. There's a finite amount in the deck, so once those ward four pieces are taken away, the question is how much life will Tianwei be able to be left with after de facing down all the heralds, facing down all the angels? But then all of a sudden, you know, some of that ward effect will eventually get be worked through and then Prism's gonna have to play a bit more of an honest game. This is gonna be the swing of the Archangel of Protection after the free flip thanks to the Rapture. Banish a card from the soul, make two more Spectral Shields now. So talk about it, you know, eventually that ward's gonna be worked through, but for now, a lot of wards sitting on the combat chain. And here's where, you know, potential tech pieces like Moke by Grapnel yes, that Azilla yes. can bring in would become really, really handly, uh, handy into something like Prism. Not sure that Zenway is packing any of those in his list and we'll have to see about that, but Milk my grapnel against a board state like this will just chew through all the yes. ward and still deal damage to Vespa's face. Yes, and now look at this. We've got a War Tune Herald coming in to finish off this combat chain. Here's another seven damage, and if it hits, goes to Soul. Something Tianwei really has to think about. Already facing down an angel, a figment, and four spectral shields. Blood Red Pox is going to be able to chew through two of them, but here's seven more damage. So this is really showing that Prism can be nice and aggressive as well as set up big defensive pieces kind of at the same time. Look at how much offensive value has been presented on this turn. Five into seven into four. And look how much defensive value is also sitting on the field. The four, the eight ward total. That's an enormous amount of value that Prism has created. But again, a single Merkmeyer Grapnel dominated. Every mm -hmm. single piece of that ward, poof, gone.
And remember, the figment of triumph effect is still into, uh, in play in this turn, and that was the heads-up play from Vesper earlier yeah. on. He already had the Herald of Triumph, but when that hit, he still... Uh, no, when the, Ves when the Light of Soul put a Herald in his soul, he still searched for a figment of triumph to protect this Wartune Herald, which is almost like a pseudo... Herald of Triumph in this sense because of that figment's effect, and Sanway is just holding on to his battering bolts, just stressed out right now, saying, why is this not a pop? This is a block three. Well, and this is why, you know, Sanway honestly made a pretty... A, 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 pretty, a play that makes a lot of sense. You keep the popper to help with some of these turns, and it was very, very fortunate and very lucky for Vespa that the Light of Soul not only hit a yellow card, but hit a yellow, yellow herald that grabbed the figment of triumph that made this whole kind of crazy turn possible. It's very easy to look at this and be like, oh my god, this is insane. Prism is nuts. This shouldn't be possible. Ban it all. Let's just stop playing <laughs> flesh and blood. Like, you look at this, right? You, 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 you look at this, right? Like, this was incredibly lucky. For Vespa, right? You know, the Light of Soul had to hit the Herald. That got the Figment of Triumph. Otherwise, well, that first card's poppable. I mean, I guess the, the but, Herald of Triumph would have made it so the first card wasn't poppable, but at least the yeah. Herald of the Wartune Herald would have been poppable. Uh, un unless the Herald of Triumph went and found the Figment of yeah, Triumph. But, the, but yes, block, yeah, 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 yeah. That's why you have the Perch Grab. Exactly. Two, yes. two block plus a three block. Mm hmm. 100%. I, and I, also, I, and I, I do agree, yes. And I really think it can't be overstated. You know, Tianwei is at 7-0 in this tournament. Clearly yep. an absolutely badass flesh and blood player. Has been running through people on day one. And he's reading these cards. It looks like for, and maybe not the first time, but yeah. clearly doesn't have the same experience into this matchup that Vespa does, right? So there is just a difference in, you know, preparation into the matchup that is also leading into some of these, you know, p p situations that the players who are at this tournament are finding themselves in when they're playing into these prisms that are like, this is what I've been doing. I love this deck. I've been grinding this deck. So, I, you know, you have to imagine ProQuest season coming up. People are going to be a little aware of what's going to be happening in a different way. Yeah, it's really a story about both experience into the deck and even the deck building aspect of it, right? Like, you don't have the tech pieces into prism. You don't have the experience into prism. And these Prism players are just leveraging that. They're just eating that up. You know, a lot of Dromai players still think the Prism matchup is free, for example. But, you know, Vespa showed us yesterday that it really, really isn't. And it just goes to show how much more prepared he is uh, with his deck compared to his opponents. On top. Sure. I'm going to leave the card on top. I do want to also point out, I mean, this is a very... This was a very strong turn for Vespa, and he did, I think, plop a Soul Shield in that Arsenal as well. <laughs> so a lot of defense available. This is a fatigue shot now into the Arsenal. Going to have the Dominate. Here's a Seek and Destroy to pump it up. There's two, look at this, two pumps on top. Let's see if there's something like an Arc Light -like Sentinel to completely stuff. Fatigue shot here, no, it's going to resolve. You see a Figment of Hand. There's a No Block, a Three Block, a Three Block, and a Two Block. But this is going to go ahead and be a dominated fatigue shot coming in with an additional six power buff on top of it. Going to be coming in for should be 11. 11 with Dominate. There is a potential for six Ward on the battlefield and a Soul Shield in the arsenal here for Vespa. And then the last card in hand should just be that Battering Bolt now for Tianwei. I believe so. But remember, it's premeditated as the on-hit ponder. So if he mm. does get the ponder on hit, he could, you know, just uh, once again keep the Battering Bolt in his hand. And look a little less, and you know, uh, conspicuous. He, like, oh, I just I had this card. <laughs> and like, yeah. Can I see it? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, he is also threatening a potential Rain Raises, which is something Vespa does need to think about. Tianwei, 7-0 in this tournament. Vespa as well, sitting undefeated. Currently, Vespa has taken that life deficit and flipped the script up nine life to Tianwe after an incredibly powerful turn off the back of that Light of Soul activation. And yes, you build the deck to make sure Light of Soul as good as possible. But I played this deck yesterday. I hit a blue when I pitched the Light of Soul. So I didn't get to see some of this net madness take place. You can see a total... In the trade, I believe we call that skill issue, Sam. Yeah, no, I believe yeah. it is yeah. a skill issue, 100%. <laughs> So, very scary card in Vespa's hand right now, actually, in the form of that Pierce Reality. Now, Azalea, not very good at dealing with Spectra. Uh, and Pierce, so Pierce Reality basically just says every Herald, which is already kind of overrate, is going to get even more damage, just plus two on each of them. And um, all the Azalea will really, really struggle to clear. So, here's a Soul Shield coming out. That is going to block six. 11, right? Yep. Let's listen. 10, 11. Mm, okay. So we're going to go ahead and eat up the Archangel of Protection there, as well as one of the Spectral Shields. So a card pitch and a card played from Arsenal. One Spectral Shield remaining, but two Figments remain on the battlefield. And a couple pieces of soul that, you know, Prism is going to look to activate at some point and get those Figments to turn into angelic beings raining down fire and magical light from the heavens upon Azalea. And it looks like we're going to go ahead and... Mm. No, we didn't get we to did ponder. Not, yeah, 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 yeah. Didn't get to ponder, so... Once Did again, not Arsenal kept the card in hand. So at yep. this point, Vespa's looking at that. <laughs> One thing about the figment of triumph, 
it can flip into the Angel of Triumph. And then when it attacks, and then wh when the Figment attacks, of course, the attacks will have minus one for the turn as well. Yes, as long as you do banish a card from Soul. And now without any sort of Genesis, you know, the cards in Soul are a very, very important resource for Vespa. It's a big part why Soul Shields and the Light of Soul has made it, it has made its way into these Prism lists because the Soul is actually such a critical resource, very difficult to build up a lot of the times because... Uh, um, it costs a soul to flip a figment into an angel, and then it costs a soul to get the added effect when you attack with the angel as well. Look at this. That herald just was blocked out because once again, it was a herald of triumph. So, mm -hmm. so much. Vespa is just feeling incredibly triumphant on that side <laughs> of the field. Every attack so far seemingly having the potential to, you know, the, the, the powered up effect of all the attack action cards having minus one while defending. Let's see. Looks like Tianwei is just going to go ahead and arsenal that final card. I don't know if the battering bolt I believe was it's the still a battering card. bolt. Yeah, I'm not sure. There's two cards we can see that were blocked with on the last turn, but just Tianwei saying, listen, I've been holding this battering bolt. I've been trying to use it as a popper, and it seems like Vespa has the answer every single time. I can't keep IPing myself or I'm just going to fall too behind in this game. And Battering Bolt, you know, we talk about it being a popper into Illusionist, into Prism, and the text on it, the offensive text on it, is also pretty relevant. Remember, a lot of times Prism's holding on to his no-blocks. If this Battering Bolt hits them, they're going to reveal their hand and have to discard all these non-action cards and, like, take a bunch of damage for that as well. So the offensive power, power of Battering Bolt cannot be understated over here. Turn flip over to Vespa now. After an arsenal, four random cards off the top of the deck in first cycle. Let's see what Vespa's able to work with here. Still got a Pierce Reality, so of course the Angels will be swinging for six. Oh, no, no, the... Yeah, uh, plus yeah, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the attack action cards. Yes. Sorry, yes, Angels. A lot of people talk, refer to the Heralds as yeah, Angels yeah, yeah, as yeah. well. <laughs> so I, I, I <laughs> forgot if the Pierce yeah. affects the Angels, but no, they're not uh, attack action yes. cards. It will affect the Heralds. And Vespa taking a bit of time on this turn. You have to wonder whether he's drawn one of his Prism Brick Hands. Because, you know, for all the powerful things Prism does, you have to remember she also does need to fill her deck with, like, nine figments. No, they have has no Brick Hands. Have no, you have, <laughs> haven't you read what people are saying? <laughs> <laughs> There's no bricks at all. The deck is the most powerful thing in the world, but here is part of the optionality of the deck. Yes, Celestial Cla Cataclysm there. That's not going to do anything without three cards in soul, really. This Halo of Illumination, though, we're going to get to put a Herald into the soul for free, draw a card, and then now grab a Figment, powering up so much of the turn. It's a one-turn play. If you hear some P Prism Masters of the deck talk, they say it's just the best card in the deck. It's the only hat you run because, listen, just the powerful optionality of the effect goes so far, especially on a turn like this, where it looks like Vespa's hand wasn't cooperating as well. I have to take note, Vespa is sporting the Empyrean Rapture instead of the Vestige of Soul that you bring into the combo -y matchup. So while he has put a card in Soul, he's not going to get added resources every time he pitches. Uh, you have to wonder what sort of figment he's looking for here. Very possibly could be the figment of Erudition. Now, the Halo turn is pretty much the most powerful turn that Prism is going to have over the course of the game, and you have to make sure that it counts for you to be able to, make, uh, for you to, be able to take over the game. Because once a Halo is off the field, your opponent gets to play the post-Halo game plan, which is a lot more liberating. There's, there's a lot less tricksy things that can happen when the once a Halo is gone. You can f attack Angels without being worried that your turn is going to end. You can yeah, uh, put stuff in your Baron Zone if it's something like Katsu without being yeah, worried that it's going to be flipped face down and all sorts of things. So Vespa does need to make sure that his Halo turn counts. Look like he's looking for a Figment of Judgment instead of a Figment of Erudition. Very, very interesting choice by him. Yeah, I was I was wondering about the area edition as well, but I think be given that we are on the Rapture and not the Vestige of Soul, there are less cool instant speed auras to play when you draw the two cards off the figment of area edition. The judgment here is just gonna go ahead and be another figment. Yeah, the banish zone activation not gonna be relevant relevant, but it's another Ward 4 on demand, and it's another potential angel as well. And now it's time for Victoria. The triumphants of Vespa continues. The triumphants? Is that even a word? The, the tri triumph? The uh, triumph victory. Triumphantness. The, mm. the, the triumphs. The, the triumphs. Yeah, that would be it. The, the, the winning. The triumphs of Vespa continue. The winningness. The winning. The, the, <laughs> the, the very good. The, the very good. The, the keep, strong the very good power. Keep going. The very good keep going here for our player as he, <laughs> he creates the Angel of Triumph, the Archangel of Triumph, no less. So now, once again, the triumphant banner effect on the combat chain. So the attack action cards are going to block with one less power. But more importantly, there's just four more damage with go again. Very or Vespa coming across. Very interestingly, this angel also affects the attack action cards on your opponent's turn. It does say until the next turn, so oh all of Genway's attacks on his following turn are also going to be that much weaker. It's Crazy. going to be one weaker per attack action card. So the flipped Victoria 
effect is very, very strong compared to the figment. And going into Herald of Erudition, remember Ooh, the and there's the Pierce reality. And the Victoria Archangel of Triumph effect is active, so it's basically like he just resolved a figment already. This Herald of Erudition cannot be popped, and it's coming for seven with <laughs> Dominate, and all Tenway has his Purge Grapplers on the field to stop this. Oh my god. I mean, clearly, looking at this board state, and, 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 and how powerful this turn is from Prism, clearly, we should ban Scabskin Leathers. <laughs> I mean, clearly, right? There's, no, there's nothing else that can be done. <laughs> there's nothing else that can be done to stop this. Seven go in dominate from this Herald of Edition on hit going to Soul and drawing two cards. This one's being threatened by Vespa over here. Just absolutely very, very strong play for him. Really recognizing when he's supposed to be pushing for this power turns. The Halo pop. You, the difference between an amazing prison player and just an average prison player is really how they use the Halo of Illumination. Vespa just showing us why he is here undefeated at the Calling Pocket. It also shows a little bit why that figment of erudition wasn't as enticing for Vespa there with the Herald of Erudition ready to go, plus the Pierce Reality, plus the Archangel of Triumph effect. This is an incredibly threatening Herald from perhaps a tournament era gone past, but the card is no less threatening in this new Prism deck. Going to go ahead and threaten to draw two cards that dominate so relevant, and of course, heads to soul and can grab another figment. Stop this turn. <laughs> yeah. Tianwei is wondering whether uh, he wants to give up his tunic on the blocks. He would need to come up with four more blocks somehow if he still wants to cover up this Herald of Erudition. Somewhere in, in, t in space and time, Rhea, Rhea is smiling down upon this game. <laughs> You know, I've I, I I've I've been watching her videos. I've been dabbling in Prism myself recently, just because look at this. This deck does so, such cool things, mm -hmm. such powerful things. Does do some very scary things. So Tianwei also going to give up the Skullborn Cross Trap as well, respecting his Hell of Edition a lot. Really going to be hamstringing his own offensive value. You know, for the rest of this game, losing Tunic and Skullborn Cross Trap. Yeah, one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven put in front of the Harry Erudition here. So Tianwei really just saying, listen, I can't allow you to draw two more cards. The value has already gotten too strong. Tianwei going to go ahead and try to, you know, navigate a post Skullbone cross wrap mm -hmm. and Tunic game plan here. Still got three cards left to work with and a card in Arsenal. Remember, all his attack action cards are coming in for one last power. He does have a few things he needs to deal with, and this is what Prism does to you. She's going to put several threats on the board and tell you how you're going to deal with all of these, and even if you deal with all of these, that means you've sent nothing to my face, so here's a few more threats on the board, and just keep snowballing that way. It's anyway needs to deal with this Pierce Reality and this Victoria Archangel of Triumph. <coughs> See what air Tianwei wants to get here. Staring down the Ward 5 and the potential for 4 more on demand. Also important to note, Vespa has yet to resolve the dreaded Arclight Sentinel. I was going to say, dude, if, if, yep. <laughs> if an Arclight Sentinel is played on this turn, I think the Flesh of Blood community would just have a collective aneurysm, right? Like just across the world, we'd hear the sound of players just throwing their hands up, like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Except the prison players, except the players like Rhea. They're going to be like, yeah. yes, this yeah. is it. <laughs> Um, and yeah, Azalea, one of the weaknesses of Azalea into this matchup is that she gives the Prism a lot of priority windows for the ALS. She wants to play buff pump, after buff pump, after yeah. buff, or play the knock. Even activating Azalea, you can simply respond to the activation of Azalea. And actually, very, very critical. It's a very, very niche interaction. You can respond to the Crow's Nest trigger, too, Whoa. Um, uh, as, as an opposing Prism. Because when the Azalea... Main, it always goes on the stack? Yeah, so Whoa. what happens is when they activate Azalea, you don't know what the card is yet. Yep. If you want to respond to the Azalea, you don't know what the card is off the top yet. But once they flip it, and if it's an arrow, Crow's Nest goes on the stack. And gives the prisoner a priority window so they can, if it's an arrow, they always have the information after the arrow has been put in the arsenal to respond to that if they want to. That's fascinating. I also do just want to point out, imagine this was, say, like Azalea in Dukatsu, and we saw red in the ledger turn, red in the ledger turn, knock, or codex, red in the ledger, and the Katsu just wasn't able to play the game. Like... Would we be screaming for, for, for banning Red in the Ledger? I mean, Sunway is 7 0 in the tournament, right? Like, clearly, this dude has been crushing on Azalea. And if there's one thing Azalea can do, it's like kind of put some pretty oppressive on hits down and lock players out of the game, right? So, like, decks do powerful things, if I'm not mistaken. And, like, 
I'm just curious. Like, this is just kind of part of the game of Flesh and Blood, right? So here's what's going to happen if that happened. If there was a Katsu <laughs> yeah. getting Red Legend repeatedly, the Katsu's at some point going to play Warmonger's Diplomacy and come right back into the game. Oh, really? And then, yeah. and then oh, we're going to scramble for yeah, bans yeah, yeah. for Red Legend and Warmonger's <laughs> and Muscular Pouncing Links and Surging Strike. Letters, and Scapskin Leathers. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get Scapskin Leathers out of here. Empowerment and Wounding Blow. Yeah. Battering Bolt here is going to be, looks like, the pick for Tianwei. Just a nice, powerful arrow that can head to the top of the deck. And it looks like Tianwei is really just valuing getting as much damage as possible to try to chew through this ward. And a Rain Razor is now coming out of the arsenal to power up the Battering Bolt as well. A release the tension. And the Codex of Frailty now going to go ahead and power up another attack, which is just going to be a Bolt and Shot. We're putting a lot of damage through. So the Battering Bolt here going to go ahead and try to be the card drawn off the Ponder. Mm -hmm. Wonder if he's going to keep it in the hand or throw it into the arsenal. So just grabbing the popper from the deck. What an interesting use case for Knock the Death Whistle there. Grabbing the Ponder target, save for the card you want to, you know, Azalea in. Yeah, to, to, to make sure you have a pop on the following hand. Now, of course, with the Victoria Archangel of Triumph still on the field, uh, having a pop in a hand is going to be a little less uh, effective uh, as you'd like it to be. So maybe Tianwei just puts that into his arsenal and hopes for the offensive power of Battering Bolt on his following turn. Yeah, the Bolton shot here, only the yellow variety. You'd love it to yep. be red. Yeah, this was codexed in. Tenway did not, seems like he did not have a red zero cost arrow in his arsenal. So forced to get this yellow Bolton shot instead. But small victories here for Tianwei. That uh, Archangel of Triumph is just going to go ahead and head to the graveyard here. So no more potential, you know, minus one effects from the Angel. We'll have to see if there's a Herald of Triumph to continue the triumphant banner effects from Vespa. We do know that that Battering Bolt is going to be drawn. That's public information for both players here. And we're just going to keep it in the hand. Both players <laughs> share a bit of a smile because, again, it is public information. But at this point, Tianwei has to be able to do some you know, some <laughs> kind of effect to grab that phantasm. I have to, right? Laughing about the Herald of Triumph. What does that do, Ponkic? Uh, it makes your opponent's attack action cards of minus one attack when blocking this. So the six power battering bolt, not a popper right now, Sam. Yeah, not a popper. So even though Tianwei, I mean, you have to applaud him for, well, you know, honestly, a yeah. use case for Knock the Death Whistle that I haven't seen played out before. You grab your ponder target in a matchup like this, and sometimes when you've been facing down some really challenging turns from your opponent, okay, what, what, what do you do? You play to your outs, right? And you can't just assume they're going to always have, you know, the triumph, you know, the herald of triumph, and you've already worked through now the figment of triumph. You've worked through the archangel of triumph. You put yourself in the position, listen, if they don't have the herald of triumph, this popper can really help me get back into this game. Unfortunately for Tianwei Vespa, just having a really, really powerful first cycle of his deck and being able to shuffle, like you said, get rid of those figments, keep more gas in the deck, less potential to draw some bricks, and it's really working out nicely for the prison player here. And that's exactly why Tianwei is undefeated right now at the calling yes. Pocket. Now, this is a bit of a rough game for him. It is a rough matchup, and if you're not teched for the Prism, this is something that can definitely happen. But Tianwei is saying, look, I'm going to play to win and not play to not lose. I'm not going to try and dominate some random arrow that isn't really going to deal with the board. It's just going to, you know, put me... It's not going to really get me ahead. I'm just going to gamble in his battering bolt. Hope you don't have that Herald of Triumph. And that's my way back, to, back into the game. I'm envisioning how do I actually win, and I win by just stopping one of your turns after I've already dealt with that angel. Unfortunately, it did not happen for him, but that is exactly the sort of play that leads to someone like him being undefeated at this calling. Now, one ponder deserves another Soraya going to come in. When the figment hits the board, we're going to go ahead and make the ponder. And now, banish the final card from Soul. So now Vespa is going to have to work to get some cards in Soul, but it's going to attack for four, which is half of Tianwei's life. And go ahead and draw two cards after banishing the soul. So just just another really powerful effect here coming in for four. Does have the go again thanks to the new Luminaris. And now Vespa's got three more cards in hand and a card in Arsenal. Gotta well, hope you don't have it. <laughs> you can hear Tenway say, just hope you don't have another Herald of Triumph. He 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 recognizes this out is just popping a Herald and getting some tempo back that way. Remember, all these Heralds do have Phantasm. That is one of the downsides for the you know amazing <laughs> attack power they have on those cards. Now look at this, Vespa kind of putting the onus a bit into Tianwei's hand, saying, listen, if you're just going to use your popper, I'm going to make you use it on a way less powerful mm -hmm. Herald than one of these two big red ones in my hand. I hope you, you don't have uh, Celestial Reprimand. <laughs> 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 All right. 
I'm going to go ahead and now activate the Phantasmal Footsteps, pitching away oh. the Herald of Protection here. This is beautiful play by Vespa over here, recognizing that Tenway would use a popper on this, gaining an action point back. Remember, that Wartune Herald did not have go against Sam, but you he just got get an action, action point, point anyway? Yes, you got an action oh, point back really from Phantasmal, and then he follows up with a Herald of Triumph. Oh my gosh, insult to injury here for the Prism player, as that Phantasmal Footsteps activation is the only way we were able to continue the chain. And and Vespa, or, you know, Tianwei, here put so much work into grabbing to grabbing the battering bolt to go ahead and you know potentially utilize the phantasm you know downside but unfortunately yeah. the phantasmal footsteps had something to say about it he could have very easily just sent the herald of triumph knowing that tenway yeah. tenway's popper wouldn't work but he sent wartune herald first knowing that it would get popped and then using phantasmal footsteps to get the action point back just absolute master class by vespa that tenway was just relying on the popper to get some tempo back but vespa saying no i'm gonna take your whole hand through that that popper anyway because of this play. I believe this is another Herald of yes. Triumph. This is a red one. There's a reason these decks are running nine, like you said. Such a powerful effect. The Brute class does sometimes have ways to get around it, but but for the um, rest of us out here that aren't running these, you know, seven, eight, and nine power attacks, normally the six is enough. And Command and Conquer, like, we, oh, there's a Command yep. and Conquer in the hand. I was going to say, for mm -hmm. these Azalea decks, it's pretty much just Command and Conquer and Battery Bolt. And maybe, maybe some down and dirties. But this is just going to have to be nine put in front of this. Let's see if Vespa's able to just close the game out with his opponent already down to four. This is an attack. Four, seven coming in for four. That means it might only be a two block or three block in the hand, and that's going to do it. No ALS needed. No big auras on the field this turn. That are going to come down. Vespa's going to move on to 8 and 0 oh here at the Calling Phuket, and Prism is locked for your top 8. It's just our final undefeated player in Vespa. We're really showing us a masterclass in Prism, really preying on everyone at this event who's just unprepared into this deck, both deck building wise and experience wise. Yeah, I mean, it really goes to show when you bring decks that people aren't prepared for and are very powerful, can do very powerful things, but like we've talked about, a sing um, imagine, imagine what a Merkmeyer Grapnel would do in that game. I, my, my, my cousin Aiden was, was messing around with Prism when it first came out, and when I threw a Merkmeyer Grapnel down, I just remember him being like, oh, dude. <laughs> Like, dude, this sucks because, yep. like, you know, similar to a Vincent effect, unpreventable ward ward free damage, it just eats through everything. Literally, one Merc Meyer Grapnel changes the entire timbre of that game. And it deals the damage to the prism through. It's yeah. going to destroy all the angels and the spectral shields and deal the damage to the prism's face yeah. as well. So, and when you look to yeah. something like a Pro Quest season that's that's approaching, when you look at a deck, now this is often what happens. A deck does really well at a major tournament, has great games on coverage, people freak out and yell and call their mothers, and then they learn how to tech into the matchup and they bring different cards to prepare in case prism gets super popular or if another illusionist is on the precipice of leaving the format and there is, you know, a bunch of players who will soon be without a home and they look to another illusionist that might be doing some cool things in the meta, you have to imagine players are going to start getting ready. They're going to start bringing in tech pieces like the Grapnel, tech pieces like the Time Skipper, some lead the charges that can get through not only the Spectra, but add some unpreventable damage to work through those angels. Because let me tell you, in that matchup, the ward just went absolutely crazy. And to add on to the more generic sort of tech pieces you can bring to Prism is the seven power poppers, you know? Like, uh, we see all these Prism lists running nine Herald of Triumph for exactly that, because everyone right now is just running six power poppers, mm -hmm. thinking that's going to be enough. But you really need the seven or some even eight if you really want to play on Herald of Triumph plus a Figment of Triumph to deal with that. And if you put a bunch of seven power poppers in, you put in maybe even Tarpid Traps as well if you're an Azalea or an Assassin. You put in the Merc Meyer Grapnel yeah. these unpreventable effects, and suddenly Prism's life gets a lot harder. And until we see exactly what's 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 rocking with Enigma, right? You know, when when Dromai does eventually ascend the hollowed halls of Living Legend, that's going to be one of the major kind of phantasm parts of the game that relies on six power, right? So if it's really only Prism that you're kind of considering, all of a sudden you're not just thinking about your six power poppers. You're thinking about like, okay, I I don't have to just I can makes more sense to bring in the seven and the eight power maybe generic poppers if the illusionist you're having to worry about is Prism instead of Dromai. Speaking of illusionist, do want to remind everyone that at this event, we might entirely see Dromai LL. This is one of the few events before ProQuest season where we might see Dromai LL. Not only is it the calling, but there's also a CC battle mm -hmm. harden that started today. It's things started around the same time our round one of our round eight of the calling started. And, you know, two chances for Dromai to LL this weekend. 
before we head into ProQuest Season And Sam. this is one of the rare times that a player could join a very, very short list of some incredible players that were able to bring a beloved hero across the finish line to Living Legend at a major event where there is coverage. People can watch this uh, uh, this hero move on to Living Legend. I'm thinking about Joris Verhelst uh, bringing the original prism of Sculptor of Arclight uh, and the calling in Lille. And that game was streamed, that game was recorded, and the moment of exultation, you can see Joris just, yes, throw his fist. <laughs> down in excitement when that, that deck was brought across. You think about U.S. Nationals, Charles Dunn taking that incredibly innovative Briar deck, everybody with bated breath watching thing. Is this the moment that, you know, Madame 998 finally crosses the status? You think about Kevin Zonker with Icelander. That game wasn't streamed, but it was being live tweeted, right? And then the uh, coverage was eventually released on, on Rea's channel and on HitFX's channel. You can go and watch the moment that Icelander hit Living Legend. There is a, a chance that at this tournament we get to see another one of those, uh, uh Beautiful moments happen. The, mom the moment I saw the Living Legend, there was also the moment my heart broke. Every yeah, day. Me as well, brother. I, every me day as well. I wake up and miss her. Every, uh, I cry every time. But yeah, it is super <laughs> exciting to see one of these heroes LL at a big event like this, especially if it's on coverage. You know, when they LL over a ProQuest season or something, it's, you know, it just feels like a little yeah, less. Well, there's less excitement yeah, of getting to watch it just the moment. Happened. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And we can literally, if you'd like, go ahead and watch a Dromite right now on the backup match because this is the moment, folks, that we're wondering when will Dromite finally cross the finish line. You know Arthur Trahe did his job. Uh, 200 living did. 11 points closer in that incredible Pro Tour finish. We can see a popper be thrown down. This looks like a Dorinthia with, wow, one, two, is that, how many <laughs> counters? Sounds like Wait, nine counters. What? How many counters are on that Dawnblade? Uh, yes, just a casual Dawnblade for 12. Yeah, Sam. that makes sense. It's going to be a fatal engagement now here to block out the chrome so now we have action points so all these aether ash wings can come in do we have any kind of popper here for Peitung, who is on the droma are they on the dorinthia deck here this matchup is super interesting because in a pseudo sort of sense it is board state versus board state now Dromai obviously has board state very tangible board state in the form of allies but dorinthia with the dawnblade has some pseudo board state on her own side in the form of those dawnblade counters which are very easy to farm up against Romai because of all these allies that they keep putting on the field yeah no this is actually very interesting from what i have heard you know i've talked to a good amount of friends who are at the pro tour and they they said they brought Dawnblade in specifically for the Dromai match. I mean, you can see why. You just put so many counters on the Dawnblade, and then once finally all the dragons have been cleared, you just go ahead and throw that Dawnblade straight at <laughs> Dromai, and all of a sudden, like, yeah, okay, 12, go again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then 13, go again. So um, it looks like Dorinthia played a hit and run and destroyed the Chromai and destroyed an Ash Ring as well. Now, Ash Rings are probably the bane of this Dorinthia's existence. You can go ahead and farm all these counters, but you really don't want to send D uh, Dawnblade for 12 or 13 at an Ash Ring. You really want to kill a dragon and then send the big Dawnblade to the face. But when you're, when you're facing out six Ash Rings, you do need to just respect them a little. And I do want to point out the headpiece from the Dorinthia player over there. It was a Null Rune Hood. Oh, wow. Which, yeah, which means they're very, very prepared for this game to go long. You can almost expect if the game continues going this way, if they're able to prevent some damage, they might just send a Dawnblade for 20 <laughs> at the Dromai's face, and they aren't going to be dying to inevitable arcane damage because of the Null Rune Hood. Yeah, no, that is actually a, a pretty heads-up tech piece there. The question is, are those Aether Ashwings going to have enough juice to kind of finish the job? We saw the Chromai there because of the extra action point. There was a Popper, but then there was a second Chromai, and that allowed for all these Aether Ashwings to come in. It is a little more challenging to clear six Aether Ashwings when you're also facing down Yender Eyes, you're also facing down Kylorias, you're also facing down Chromai. So we're not sure because it's a backup game how many of those big dragons have been worked through. Even though that's a huge Dawnblade, uh, our our uh, Dorinthia player there was at 14 when that turn started. Let's go ahead and see if we can jump back in and see. Looks like down to 12, there is a sink below on an Enlightened Strike on the chain. We can see a number of cards left. Oh, and a couple of attack actions here that both cost two for Dirk on the Dromai deck here. So let's see what that arsenal is. Looks like Peitong is all the way down to seven, actually, after that turn. That's probably following that salvo of Aether Ashings that we just got to witness. Also, it looks like there's a Spectral Shield mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for the, for the Dromai player as well. It's time yep. for the first Aether, first Aether Ashwing, though. We've already gotten the go again. And this is what we're talking about, right? How many more poppers did you bring, Dorinthia? That's not what the deck's built around. Your deck's mostly attack reactions. So Looking at Peitung's hand here, it definitely looks like this is that hatchet Dorinthia that has a Dawnblade sideboard specifically for for Dromai because Dr Dorinthia is holding on to a Spillblood, which obviously does nothing with Dawnblade because Spillblood specifies your axes this turn. So you see a Spillblood in the hand, you know that this is a hatchet Dorinthia list with a Dawnblade sideboard. And I think your right Sam just doesn't have the popper right now, Peitung. And that's what these Ash Rings ask of you. They ask you, do you have the popper? Because if not, you're just going to be taking all these flying Kadachis that are just basically impossible to deal with.
And it looks as though that flying, the flying Gadachis are going to connect. So Dirk here really identifying the game plan. It's not the big dragons that are going to win a game mm. when you're facing down a Dawnblade for a million. It's the little <laughs> dragons in the sky that are going to threaten the Dorinthia player's life here. I just also want to shout out our production team. Look at this backup match. It's We're here beautiful. at a calling all the way in Phuket, and this backup match looks gorgeous. Shout out to Ethan and Esmond here going ahead and bringing you all this incredible coverage. Show them some love in the chat if you like what you're seeing. It is such a treat that we get to watch two games of two amazing games of flesh and blood per round. You're getting two for the price of one. It feels absolutely amazing. It's like they're just deciding exactly what the blocks are going to be. And now we do have two back to back matches of, uh, you know, an illusionist player in uh, what is considered to be a pretty favored a matchup. A dominant position, we might say, <laughs> yeah. yes. Uh, no, but pretty favored matchup as well. Looks like Nourishing Emptiness coming in for, you have to imagine, six dominate because the burn them all, you know, has four counters on it. You have to imagine he's banished all the attack action cards or he would have gone for this place. Six dominate, and I believe Peitang might be. Don't the life totals have been completely updated yet. That might just be the end of the game. This is six dominate. The fist bump is extended, and that is another Droma. This is Dirkwa moving on to seven and one. The illusionists are here to play <laughs> in the calling Phuket. The illusionists are doing quite well, and now that is another Droma on to seven and one. There's a prism locked for top eight, I think. I refuse to learn the breakers. I think at eight, no. Prism should be locked for top eight, though, after a, get a dominate run so far, Vespa has had. So looking forward at the calling Phuket, I think. The narrative is starting to take place. Who can take down the illusionists? Or which illusionist will take it down? And if it's Dromai, do we get to watch she her fly away on dragon's wings into the halls of living legend? Speaking of illusionist, Channon is also around X1. The last time we caught yep. up with him on that prism as well. Uh, we don't know how he did after round one, but you know, we could we could have a fairly um Strong representation of illusionists in these top eight just based on what we've been seeing so far. Yeah, I think we are most likely going to go ahead and take a quick breather before we move on to the next round. We're going to go ahead and listen and watch the beautiful part of the Mistvale trailer. Dude, I don't know if you're getting to see. Are you guys yeah. getting to see these spoilers? Are you seeing the way these cards look? They're they're absolutely gorgeous. The art, I literally, I was, I was like walking yeah. to do something. I was like, oh, new spoiler. And I stopped in like the middle of the street. And I was like, it was like Jaw dangerous. Drops. Yeah, it was like, it was literally <laughs> dangerous because I was like, mm. What? I'm oh, sorry. And I had to run out of the middle of the street. And we actually have a Majestic to show off for you all today. So don't go anywhere. More from the Calling Phuket plus a Majestic spoiler in just a sec. Welcome, traveler. You must be starving. Please, come inside. I think we can satisfy your appetite. Anything you like. Intimacy. Or perhaps ecstasy. <laughs> Come a little closer. I won't bite. Tell me, what do you desire? Beware the tongue of the snake. Her things shall soon follow. Pleasure is but the shallow illusion. Walk the true path, and you shall see clear. Who seek may discover formless, perfect, the serene, unchanging infinite, eternally present, eternally boring. Why don't we play rough? Embrace the solitude. Embrace the sensation. Look within. Look at me. Just a breath. Just a taste. Get 
tiger does not fall prey to the snake. The tiger walks its own path. So flow as life flows. No, they need no other force. The heavy is the root of the light. The unmoved, the source of all movement. The center is unbound and free. Walk the path. Seek the truth.
And we are back here at Calling Phuket. I'm Elliot Pankaj. So good to be in the chair with you again today. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a meta breakdown. Look a little bit at what happened today, uh, yesterday, and then a little snapshot of how day two is shaping up. Try and see how the meta has progressed going from day one into day two. Which of our heroes have survived the day one onslaught, to be honest? The competition has been really, really fierce, Elliot. Yes, absolutely. Were you expecting Prism to go undefeated in this series so I was, far? I was expecting... Prisms to show up at some point because I do think the deck has been sleeper good for quite a while. Um, and there's so few people that have access to a good Prism player in their team, in their testing team, that I was expecting a breakout performance to happen at some point. I thought it would have happened at PTLA, to be honest, yeah. but you know, there's also draft mixed in with that. And I do think the Prism players did well in the CC rounds, but not so much in their draft. But over here, CC only tournament. Yeah, it makes total sense that Prism is finally breaking out. But now we can expect to see some, some tech pieces and some experience in the Prism coming in, leading the ProQuest season as well. It's going to be extremely, extremely exciting. Yeah, get those copies of Lead the Charge. All right, so day one, we had KO as the most represented deck. Uh, the conversion has been pretty decent. I would say there's still Eng Chu Heng, who's at the top table, still X1 at the moment, uh, running that KO. But not trailing far behind is the Queen herself, Dromai. Uh, how do you think Dromai's performance has been so far? It's been really, really good. And, you know, the narrative of the weekend is definitely is Dromai going to ascend Ooh. to living legend at this tournament or even perhaps the battle harden that's happening at the same time today. Now, after Dromai, we have Victor. We know a whole bunch of the Blue Pitch members, Shing Sang, um, Alan Lau as well, oh, I believe, yep. really favoring that Victor deck. Putting Tom, though, also from Blue Pitch, on his, you know, very um, signature Katsu list. Yes. Did manage to make day two as well. But yeah, speaking of Victor, a whole bunch of Victors around as well. You have to wonder whether they're playing on the fourth most represented deck, the Dorinthias. Hatchet's Dorinthia had a Great performance at PTLA. It was a deck that a lot of people are talking about. Victor, pretty good into Dorinthia, I've heard. Yes, I think the Dory decks have really kind of like taken their spotlight after PTLA. I think the Hatchet build has come around and there's a lot of innovation that is floating around. We've seen some of the top tables. It's not just the spill blood combos, but they're finding little tech pieces like even cleave into Dromai, which is quite an insane thing. Now, the next deck I want to talk about really is Azalea, who's had quite a shining performance, so different from what we've seen in PTLA. Why do you think there's a resurgence of this deck performing so well at Calling Phuket? I think it's partly also because of the resurgence of Dorinthia, of the rising probably of yeah. Dorinthia. Now, people, not all people realize this, but Azalea actually preys on the Hatchet Dorinthia particularly. Don't play Dorinthia into Azalea as a bit more of a 50-50 matchup because Azalea doesn't really block very well and Dorinthia loves when your opponent can't block very well. Hatchet Dorinthia though is just trying to play numbers and Azalea can beat those numbers and has dominate as well. So Azalea, pretty, pretty strong pick as well. But with that, we've gone over the top five of our day one. Let's move on to see how many heroes survived into day two. Let's go over this. All right, so actually quite an even spread if we look at the top five decks here. KO at eight, Roma at 7, Dorinthia at 7, and I mean, the story kind of paints itself in this way, right? The conversion numbers for KO and Dromai are still there, but Dory and Victor are super hot in the heels at a higher conversion rate. Now, Dory obviously converted slightly better than Victor. Uh, do you think that it has a good matchup into this top 5? I think it has a good matchup into KO. It doesn't have a great matchup into Dromai or Victor, to be <laughs> honest. I mean, we saw the end of the backup match earlier today, the Dorinthia into Dromai. Dorinthia had you know, 10 counters on the Dawnblade, but it was just dying to Ash Rings. And, uh, you know, the Hatchet build into Victor. It's definitely winnable. Both It's it's not a slam dunk in either side, but Dorinthia is definitely the underdog in those matchups. Interestingly enough, we see that Bolton is still here, but the highlight of this is the two Azuris who fully converted into mm -hmm. day two. Now, do you think Uzuri stands a chance of breaking to this top eight? Definitely stands a chance. Uzuri, you know, pretty okay into KO. All that disruption, all that disruptive pieces can definitely mess up what KO wants to do. Just send, you know, be being kind of aggressive, trying to play good numbers. KO's numbers will beat you, but Uzuri's disruption can help, you know, counter some of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I also do want to point out, obviously, the two prisms have been a bit of a breakout this weekend. And the one of Kano. We have three Kanos in day one. One has made it through and is surviving, you know, into the second day of the Calling Phuket. No, very interesting. I think, like, this Kano could have a, a slight chance. It has generally a very good matchup into most things except Dromai, I think. So, you know, let's see how that day pays out. We still have, I think, three more rounds of the calling Swiss rounds before we move into our top eight for the day. Uh, I'm excited. It's still anyone's game. Like, 
I just love the fact that the spread feels so even on day two. And there are all these X1 and X2 players uh, who could still take it into like the seventh or eighth spot in our top eight today. Every single one of these heroes is extremely live and in contention for top eight. And you just have to love that. There's 11 heroes on the screen on the screen here. We could very easily see a top eight of eight different heroes. And that's going to be just such an absolute treat to watch. Yeah. So... Our next game we're going to watch, we're, not, uh, we're going to watch some of the X1s trying to get their win and ins for the rest of the day. Uh, the next one we're going to watch is Azalea versus Uzuri. Ooh, so we've, mm -hmm. we've haven't, we haven't seen an Uzuri uh, player on, on the live stream from the main game so far. So very excited to see this. Azalea into Uzuri as well. Uzuri, you know, her, she really started breaking out back in the Lexi meta. And I know I'm gonna, this is going to scare a lot of our viewers when I talk about <laughs> Lexi meta. Uh, but Uzuri, historically pretty good into the ranges. A lot of the CNC like effects. A lot of arsenal disruption, a lot of hand disruption as well in the form of that shakedown. And very, very difficult to block uh, when, you know, you're against a ranger that already doesn't really block very well. Uzuri, the few times you do want to block to stop, like, the leave the witnesses, Uzuri can punish that as well. So, And it's also a, a matchup where both sides have access to Codex of Frailty, mm -hmm. and that becomes a very powerful tool in disrupting arsenals. Both people, both of them really like the arsenal slots quite a fair bit. Uzuri wants to get D-Reacts inside to, you know, in order to go over the dominate attacks that Azalea has. And Azalea always wants an arsenal because, well, <laughs> that's how the cross reps are activated. So I, I'm, I'm super stoked. Actually, I think Uzuri is so sleeper. I just want to focus a little bit. I saw a game yesterday off camera where um, against Dorinthia, she blocks with the Dynamo and then they swap in the already, already dead. dead. Yep. <laughs> that is the most painful thing I've ever seen. And it's so hard because all her weapons... Like, um, like spiders might have piercing, so you can't just block in between on those uh, weapon attacks. It's so, so cool. Um, and Scale Peeler as well really just denies a dynamo value as well. And, you know, we spoke a lot about Prism mm. and how a lot of players lack the experience and, you know, the deck building tech pieces into Prism. I think a similar story can be said about Azuri as well. Not many people really respect this hero. Not many people yeah. have that experience, and that's what happens. That's how you get blown out by already dead because you just haven't played into it enough. You forget that that's a card that even exists, and bam, you lose your dynamos, and suddenly there's restraining nice numbers during there, but you don't have a dynamo anymore. Like, what are you going to do? You don't have disruption. Your numbers are now a lot worse with the dynamo gone. So, yeah, Azuri definitely a bit of a sleeper pick as well. I think I agree with that. It's very interesting. I, if we had to isolate out an Uzuri versus Prism matchup, I actually, I've actually seen this play out several times. The fact that stealth cards come in for such a low number, you can actually kind of play or play around it and just be like, hey. Uh, here's a one one cost uh, a one attack stealth attack. What are you gonna do about it if you're angel on board? And he has to sit there and think for a very long time whether they want to commit more cards to protect things or just let it sneak through. Mm. Um, so I don't know. I I we're gonna jump straight into our next game. I'm so excited. Uzuri is one of my favorite decks in the format. I know Sam plays a lot of it actually. Um, so let's jump to the table, catch up with the players and get this game started. Uh, so, Josiah Chia from Malaysia versus Tianwei from Malaysia as well. This is a homegrown rivalry. You've seen Tianwei a couple of times on stream yesterday and today. Running it back, is he playing on stream? Shout out to our players on, our, on the stream as well. It's no easy feat to play under camera at a high stakes tournament like this, especially in you know, some of your unfavored matchups as well. So big shout out to our players for agreeing to come on stream to give us, to let us view these amazing games of Flesh and Blood so far. Yeah, when the lights are on you, you can feel that little bit of extra heat. I know you and I, we've been sitting in front of lights for like, <laughs> for like the two days now. Uh, and that's that's always uh, adds a little bit of pressure, a little tension on the table. Uh, but yeah, Josiah and Tianwei, they've been playing in their locals for quite a while now. I'm very sure they know each other's like deck compositions because the Malaysian team, they're pretty tight in terms of the testing groups together. Um, so we should be in for a nice day of like fun little games, as well as the fact that I think the players are very expressive. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things I've enjoyed so much about this weekend is how expressive the Southeast Asian players have been when playing their games. They're laughing, they're rolling scabs, they're rolling threes and like, ah, oh, all these, all these nice little nuances that you love to see when you're going out there to play the game and see the world. The player banter is definitely such an absolute treat to watch. I'd love to see that on camera. And now I do want to go over this Azuri deck uh, particularly because there have been quite a few builds of Azuri. Yesterday we saw Justin on a bit more of a hybrid contract and stealth Azuri list. And we have to wonder if Josiah is running more of a list similar in that vein that has a bunch of contract cards, which means Tianwei would have to be worried about potentially getting fatigued out as well. Or whether Josiah is on just the 
more standard aggressive uh, red line is realist that has hurls and looking for scraps uh, and ravenous rabbles, middle of these golden cards on top of the stealth cards. Which uh, which version of the Uzuri deck do you think has an edge into this Azalea matchup? I think into this matchup in particular, the contracts can put a real pressure on the deck size of Tianwei because remember, rangers don't have a weapon. So if you're going to banish extra cards from the top of the deck or force them to come in more cards to block to not let you get the contract effects. Also, you know, you get silver back to buy back your armor to block oh, even yeah. better. Uh, I think that has a slight edge into Azalea, but even without those pieces, this is already, you know, a slight favored matchup for Zuri already. So we could definitely see Josiah get there even if he doesn't have the contract pieces. And what is Tianwei's strategy going in? If you're sitting in the Azalea seat, what are you hoping to achieve and what's your game plan going to the match? I think you need to look for really effective dominates because Azuris historically do run a fair amount of defense reactions uh, and they block very well. All these assassin cards block three and the determined direction block four. They also can run some of the traps. If you don't dominate them enough, they could just default to the sort of fatigue game plan where they just kind of block you out and they say, I have a weapon, you don't. Can you get over my defenses? Uh, and so because of that, uh, I expect Tianwei to need to try and uh, get some strong dominates off with some really, really good on hits. Well, we just watched Tianwei on the previous match against Vespa. Let's hope for his comeback here and let's see how these two players really battle it out. Trying to fight for that top eight spot. We only have three rounds left in the classic constructed Swiss rounds and all these players cannot afford to drop more than two games. So, very exciting. The players are shuffling up. Uh, they've got their headsets on. Hopefully, we can tune in some of the of the things that they're running through. I know uh, when I've played in the Pro Quests and RTNC since in Malaysia, uh, they're very expressive. They're very they like talking about what they're trying to achieve on the table. I don't think it you know very little much of the psyops level going. Mm -hmm. Like we're not playing poker here. A lot of the times, these guys are thinking a lot about like, hey, if I do this, they're vocalizing the thoughts of if I do this. What's the outcome? And because of that, I think the thought process and the and the and the outward thinking of it uh, allows us to just get a little bit of insight when they're sitting at the tables. And looking at the deck sizes here as the players are shuffling up, it does look like Tianwei is sporting more than 60 cards, going to be needing to use both hands. Phil, both of his hands are completely full uh, with his deck. Um, <laughs> definitely potentially worried about the potential of fatigue and you have to wonder whether he knows just as you were saying these players have played against each other before mm -hmm. they're in the same region you have to wonder whether he knows that Josiah is sporting some of those contract cards that will really just affect his deck count yeah from my time catching up with a lot of the Southeast Asian regions um, here at Calling Phuket it's so lovely to see that they're also tightly knit communities right so everyone kind of knows someone else um, the number of shops that they attend especially in places like Singapore and Malaysia where Land space is much smaller, so <laughs> they attend all the armories, right? Mm -hmm. if, if they're in the competitive mindset, they're hitting up every single armory they can play, every single pro quest, every single RTN, because, I mean, uh, things are like a stone's throw most of the time. One hour drive, yeah, that feels pretty good. Uh, so I think they're super familiar with the decks. What I'm interested to see um, today is really who here understands a little bit more about the deck efficiency and like executing a game plan. These two decks, I would say, like, Azuri is a little bit more low variance, right? Uh, it has a very standard package of what it's trying to achieve, whereas Azalea, there are at times you have to press that button blind just to get those dominates in. Especially in a matchup like this where you're potentially uh, afraid about fatigue. I was watching one of Brody Spurlock's matches in the Swiss mm. yesterday. He was against, uh, it was against a Decimator Axe Bolt and definitely a very fatiguey matchup. And the number of times he just went for a blind Azalea because he's saying, if I don't dominate an arrow, there's almost no point me wasting all my buffs uh, because uh, you're just going to block them out. So I'm going to blind Azalea a bunch of times. Sometimes I'm going to hit an arrow and then that's when I actually push for damage. I think we might see Tianwei do that as well. However, unlike Decimator Axe Bolt, Uzuri is packing a whole bunch of Disruption. She's not just going to give you the time to set up. She's going to say, oh, you didn't do something very threatening that like you missed on your blind Azalea. You're not dominating anything uh, too bad. Well, here you go. Here's a stealth card into potentially a CNC or a shakedown or leave no witnesses. Or here's a codex of frailty. Now all your... Uh, your uh, you know, the frailty token is going to make your R attacks from Arsenal come in for minus one. So it's just going to disrupt you back when you give it the space. So the pressure is really going to be on Tian Wei to navigate. Very interesting. Uh, he's not, I, I think we're looking at Josiah's equipment loadout. He's not running the Mask of Edition and choosing instead for that two block from the Crown of Providence to fix certain hands. Now, what does this suggest to us, Pankaj? Maybe that he's not running too many of his contract cards, or maybe the fatigue contract game plan isn't 
part of what he's trying to execute. Maybe he's trying to go for a bit more of the tempo-y, disruptive pieces. And his hand has quite a few <laughs> defense reactions. I mean, it is a sink of fate and an inertia trap. Well, that is a, that's an interesting one to start the game. I wonder who's going first. Oh, it looks like yes. uh, Josiah is going first with that two-unit counter. So 3D reacts and start the hand. <laughs> we'll have your pick of a little of what you want to Arsenal. Inertia trap, very, very effective into Azalea. Pretty much every time she sends an arrow at you, it is buffed by a whole bunch of extra power because it is not really going to send just a vanilla arrow at you. <laughs> and Inertia Trap is going to take them off in Arsenal for the Falling Tone, which can really, really cripple their offensive power because they don't get to opt. And that yeah. they'll, without an Arsenal also means they might not be able to Azalea into something as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. Looks like he's pitching away... Um the inertia, he's pitching yeah. away the inertia trap, the and just scene. sending that nerve scalpel, coming in for one, asking, hey, is it time for, for your first block card? So there is a bit of a gamble going on here from Josiah. He is allowing his opponent to filter, but is getting a card out of Tianwei's deck. We spoke about how deck size is going to be a very important concept in this matchup, your deck count and deck equity. Uh, so he's doing this. He does let Tianwei filter and potentially have a stronger offensive turn on uh, on the following turn. Uh, but he is getting cards out of Tianwei's deck for basically free. Yeah, this is, this is really, really interesting. So just kind of signaling, if I see my opponent pitch away both the Inertia Trap and the Fate Foreseen, I'm almost certain that yeah. he's holding on to a defense reaction <laughs> yeah. in his hand. Mm -hmm. So Tianwei probably thinking about, you know, how many cards... Like he, he, he has a choice. He could just put his whole hand down pre pretty much in front of the spider's bite and just say, I want to mulligan this entire hand. Or, you know, take his pick. I want to mulligan like one to, one to two of these cards instead. Wow, but choosing to take that first blood, that mm -hmm. first leak of damage, he probably likes the three cards in his hand, mm -hmm. hoping to draw into something that maybe enables it even further. Uh, interesting enough, blocking of that first um, lace with Blood Rod as well. So mm -hmm. that's a very powerful piece uh, into Azuri because it tells them, hey, you're not going to use that blue to be uh, sending that dagger at me for one. You're going to be using it to prevent two health. Also, typically a lot of Azuri lists don't even pack that many blues as well. So Oh yeah, I, that's true. That's true. So, you know, Blood Rod Pox, if it hits, basically just says it's an extra two damage. Very, very strong card there. Tianwei probably also just recognizing that um, he doesn't want to just give up too many cards for free on turn zero uh, from his deck. So he's saying, I'll pay one life to just keep an extra card too. That's that's also really good. Loading up this infecting shot. Um, and just nice, pitching a, a solid blue here. That's going to allow him to maybe play around with um, a, a couple of buffs and then still keep an Arsenal card for later. I believe he is holding on to a Deadeye as well, a one-cost buff. So it'll work very well with the infecting shot because of that blue that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So let's see how this goes out. The, my favorite thing about Azalea is how many buffs that they can, like debuffs they can stack onto a single card. Um, if Azalea gets a rise in popularity, I, I'm assuming cards like Ripple Away will be very important in the future. Looks wow. like <laughs> Knock the Death was coming out from Sanway, and this is exactly what he needs to do. We spoke about this going into this game. He does need to set up Dominates. He needs to try and dominate as much as he can to get over Josiah's defenses. Now, however, he probably does have the read that Josiah does have some defense reaction in his arsenal, so the question is going to be whether he'll be able to pump this arrow up enough uh, to get over that defense reaction in Josiah's arsenal. Yeah, and with Deadeye in hand, you can actually dominate and still get that aim counter in order to activate the secondary effect. Hey, if Uzuri is a good disruptor, there's a chance that uh, yeah. this Azalea could do it the same as well. It, critically, he would need to find a zero-cost arrow for that to pay one for the aim counter and pay one for the dead eye. So him finding a sleep dart probably tells us he wants to not quite go for that for that effect, opting instead for the sleep dart, which is all in its own right very, very disruptive into his You just turn all of the assassin cards face up, and that is not how they want to play the game. They want to play very face down and sneaky. Yes, it's all about that attack reaction uh, of swapping cards, being the actual switchblade that she is. So sleep dart, the card of choice, going to be placing that on top of the deck. Still two cards in hand with two resources floating. I can't wait to see what the buffs are that we're going to be placing on the Sleep Dart. Once again, Tianwei just shuffling the massive behemoth of a deck over there. Double sleeved <laughs> as well and definitely sporting uh, an extra uh, above 60 cards. I love the fact that a lot of the uh, Southeast Asian players, they love sleeving the decks based off like the not heroes that they're playing. <laughs> it's always like about the psyops of this. So misleading. <laughs> so misleading. <laughs> so this leave that will be dominated, as you said, uh, choosing not to activate the crow's nest, I believe, and instead just dropping these buffs like the dead eye, purely for the for the plus attack. Mm. 
8 damage, a little bit awkward for Josiah. We saw him pitch, you know, one of the 0 for 4 defense reactions on a previous turn. He has one in his arsenal, but unless he has another one in his hand, if he wants to stop this on hit, he would need to give up a piece of armor as well. Yeah, I mean, the good thing about Uzuri is that those Black Tech Whispers, they're going to be there for a long time. But in this case, choosing to just say, hey, this isn't, there's no uh, inertia tokens on it, just turning off my hero power. I can do other things. Sometimes Azuri has a hand where they're not going to be activating the hero power anyway. So Josiah is saying, all right, you know what? This on hit, I actually do not care about it. Mm -hmm. There's no blood rod on this. There's no frailty. There's literally nothing. And if I'm just not activating Azuri on my turn anyway, I have like an enlightened strike or something in my hand. Well, then sure, I'll just preserve my defense reaction for when you do something actually, um, actually disruptive. Yeah, and you were not wrong. There is an enlightened strike in Josiah's hand ready to do some oh here we go it's a very aggressive list and showing that fateful scene actually huge it so, kind of signals to Zianwei next turn I can block 8 off both my hand and arsenal and any sort of armor pieces and yet Ooh, Josiah yeah. exactly having one of those hands that just doesn't care about Azuri's ability it looks like it's going to be <laughs> ravenous ravel into enlightened strike also shout out Zianwei's amazing full art tokens for his arrows I, I was watching him in his Swiss rounds the, uh, yesterday he has one for fatigue shot as well he has one for rental ledger it is just absolutely beautiful and I just love the sort of flavor these players are putting into the deck it just shows how attached they are to these heroes that they go to the extra mile to get these full art tokens for the debuff effects it, it is very sweet. It is very sweet. Love. I love the way people bling their stuff out in Flesh and Blood. So this is a 4, probably coming in for a 7 as well. I mean, yeah, 11 damage off a 3-card hand. Uh, I'll take those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think players just having the players are just having a quick chat about how both of them pretty much known as a defense reaction <laughs> uh, in Josiah's arsenal. Uh, and Tianwei just. Probably a little sad that he did a sleep dart on a turn that it really just absolutely didn't matter. Remember, that was Knock the Death Whistled in. He did choose that card uh, from his deck when he had the pick of pretty much any card, probably having a bit of regret on the choice of arrow there. Blocking with two arrows from hand. So maybe we're looking at Dianwei getting one of those uh, in a slightly ineffective hands. You technically want to see like three buffs most of the time. Something to pitch and then throwing an arrow or dominating it uh, since you have an Arsenal card. But flipping up that rain raises that could be huge. How's it looking? So thinking about that op from the skullbone cross wraps, so whether he puts it up or down. Uh, but with a two card hand, this rain razor might not be the biggest pump that he has. Looks like he has another rain raises in hand wow. as well. Skullbone cross trap, of course, has a lot of synergy with Azalea. You have so many options once you know the top of a deck. You know you can draw into it with Death Dealer as what Zenway is doing now, or you could Azalea in as well. It's almost like an like a sixth card in many ways. You know, a lot of uh, high level players consider Azalea to be a pseudo intellect five hero mm -hmm. uh, because of this, because of the Death Dealer draw card effect, and that top card could be in your arsenal, could be in your hand. It's it's very very flexible and very difficult hero to play because of that. Absolutely, absolutely. So this is going to be a ravenous rebel coming for four go again, uh, and on the following, it's probably going to be this sleep dart for seven. A nice pesky brick point. Uh, will will Josiah commit the D react and a card for this? So, but still tons to think of. Tons to think of. Four vanilla damage doesn't seem like a lot, but in a 40 card, a 40 health game, that's 10% of your health. Zenway representing that he will be getting off an arsenal on this turn because the rain raises is already played. So if he just keeps a sleep dart there, it's going to be pretty inefficient. He's not getting the rain raises effect. So we're going to send it and get off an arsenal, which means Josiah's command and conquer in his arsenal looking a little. Um, you know, not very effective, a little suspect. However, it does mean the Codex of Frailty gets better because Tianwei is off an arsenal, so he'll be forced to discard. Yes, this is... I love watching, like, high-level play of Flesh and Blood just because there's so many interactive interaction points and there's so many things you need to play around. In this case, the Sleep Dart isn't effective once again. I mean, let's looking at Josiah's hand. Yeah, we don't need to activate the Zuri for this one. Okay. But still, committing the Sink Below and just the Sink Below to negate four damage and taking three. Yep. And no sync. Yeah, this went back. So use two d defense reactions here that are, are not for actually big dominated arrows. That could bite him back in the future if he's trying to... And remember, he sank a fate foreseen uh, at the start of turn zero as well as an inertia trap. Finding the next defense reaction might not be so soon. 
And that's one of the awkward things about Codex of Frailty, right? If you want to play it on your turn, you do need to empty your own arsenal. And that could be why he used a defense reaction on an arrow that wasn't dominated. Not, even the on hit wasn't threatening. He's not Uzuri flipping on this turn, didn't have a stealth card in his hand as a blue backstab, but, you know, opponent doesn't have an arsenal. Mm -hmm. So oh, well. if you want to Codex this turn, you need to empty your own arsenal and you're forced to use a D-react in such a way. And as you pointed out, he already pitched to defense reaction, uh, to defense reaction, already used one right now as well. So, yeah, it could be, you know, it... Could be a while before he sees another one. Yeah, but interesting enough, setting that CNC just for the vanilla and using that tunic counter as response. So, keeping that Codex of Frailty for another turn. So Tianwei probably very happy to have gotten off an arsenal over here, and that is one of the things you sometimes need to do into Zuri. Oftentimes, no matter what hero you're playing, a lot of times playing off an arsenal is just the way to go into Zuri, so you don't get blown out by the CNCs, don't get blown out by Leave the Witnesses. Of course, as a ranger, it's a little bit more difficult and also opens you up to Codex of Frailty Lions. Uh, but Tianwei getting rewarded for his play of getting off an arsenal on the previous turn. Well, health-wise, both players are neck and neck playing 32 to 33. And it looks like Tianwei is happy to commit maybe two or more cards here. Might have gotten the dreaded all non-attack hand. Oh, oh and no. the E-strikes So no arrow and all these buffs only buff. Arrows, so Tianwei is stuck on a bit of an unfortunate hand over here, not able to utilize these buffs, not able to capitalize on the tempo that he's gained by Josiah basically just sending vanilla damage at him. Yep, yeah, but thankfully there is one Enlightened Strike in his hand, so he will be able to keep a buff for the next turn and just send, hey, here's a vanilla 7. Both players not really showcasing the hero abilities <laughs> as much as possible this match so far. It's been value gaming for the longest time. So, 7. Nice value here. Uh, the question is, wow, uh, Josiah showing the Black Tech Whispers at this point in time with no silver on the board. So this is not going to cover any breakpoints uh, for the remainder. So alarm bells should be going off in Tianwei's head over there seeing the Black Tech come out. You have to imagine T uh, Josiah is planning to use those on his turn to you know, maximize the value out of it, block with it, and then use it, maybe buy it back later with silver mm -hmm. as well. Yep, yep, yep. Awesome. So just taking six over there, blocking only one. Oh, and now uh, looking at Tianwei's hand, now he's coming to the unfortunate bit of drawing the all, like all arrows and attacks once again. This game has been really rocky in terms of the draws from both players. Bit of an unfortunate flip for Josiah over here, revealing one of the few blues in his deck, you have to imagine, off the Raven Travel, just coming in for two. Tianwei just says, all right, I'll, I'll take you two, two damage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's an easy no block right there for him. Uh, the question, what is the follow-up uh, from Josiah's side? We do know he still has a Codex of Frailty in his arsenal. No information for Tenway that ooh, another Codex drawn from Josiah. You hate to see that. Drawing two Codexes at the same time can be extremely, extremely awkward. Yeah, it also means um, later on... I mean, you will have a Codex for the later part of the game, and I imagine this game can be drawn out quite a fair bit. Uh, but yeah, if he's going to activate the Codex of Frailty from the Arsenal right now, well, he has to get rid of the cards somehow. So, thankfully, each of these daggers are going to cost two resources each. Mm. And so here we go. Oh my goodness, the cheeky Isolate with the already dead in hand. And a potential activation of Black Tech Whispers as well to Codex in another card in his graveyard. That is so sick. So far, Josiah has been taking a bit more of an aggressive stance in this game. We spoke about how, you know, Azuri has the default game plan of just backing into a fatigue style. But with the way he's been using his life total as a resource, just taking the vanilla E-Strike damage and, you know, going all the way down to 26, the same life as Tianwei, we can totally expect that Josiah is actually going for a bit more of a tempo-y game plan with his Azuri. That's really, really interesting. So, looks like, yep, activating Azuri, putting it to the bottom, the Banish card comes in, oh, and it's dead. just vanilla 6 at this point in time. Mm -hmm. That and banishing the top card uh, of uh, Dianwei's deck. So, let's see whether he's also activating Black Tank. Looks like he isn't just moving on, just dealing the 6 damage, banishing the top card of the deck, and saying, Dianwei, you can just have um, your entire, your, all your cards. Dianwei kind of got away with murder over there. When you see the Zuri activation happen, after they took your Enlightened Strike damage, you just had to be sitting there, well, okay, what's getting disrupted? Am I getting Shakedown? Am I getting CNC? Leave no witnesses? Dianwei just, oh, that was just vanilla 6. Oh yeah, I'll take that any day of the week. And not getting any silver out of it because the Command and Conquer was banished. It needs to see a non-attack a, a non action. A, a non-action. A, a non-action card, yes. So, Rain Razor is probably one of the few hits uh, in uh, Tenway's deck. Or, oh, you know, Valen Dynamos <laughs> if you're against a warrior. <laughs> That's really interesting. So, flipping up the release attention, 
trying to opt from these uh, these cross traps at the moment. He's signed to himself. He's got a full grip. It means it might be time to press that button and go ham on that face. World is his oyster over here for Tianwei. The pseudo six card hand from Azalea that she's so very, very well known for. Let's see if he's able to dominate something big over here while we know that Tianwei doesn't have a defense reaction in his arsenal. Yeah, and it's also a tunic turn. So honestly, there's a lot of options <laughs> here for him. Whether he wants to draw a card, whether he wants to blind flip. If he has something like a knock on this turn, that would be insane, honestly. Looks like he left a card on top, and that's, you know, typically a little scary, because then that's Azalea saying, all right, I can Azalea that, you know, I can draw into it. That dealer just they, has the whole turn planned out by this point. There we go. So we're going to draw this next card, probably a buff. It looks like it's a dead, a dead eye as well. So this sleep, into dart, dead eye. Mm -hmm. this sleep dart is, uh, is just loaded in, so there's no dominate on it just yet. It is a one-cost arrow with a four-card grip. You gotta wonder how many buffs can he play this turn and still send this arrow to the face. Release the tension has already been placed so far. Sleep Dart, at least what's face up, is that it will come for a minimum of eight on this turn. This is also the last Sleep Dart that uh, Jen Wei has. He's already shot two um, across the board. This premeditate, though, pretty good. Well, last Sleep Dart in his deck, but Codex of Frailty is a card and will be uh, <laughs> will be able to recur the Sleep Dart should he choose to do so. And remember, just Iron's Codex of Frailty is two, so potentially this is not the last Sleep Dart we've seen in this game because three Codex of Frailties from each side could definitely make this Sleep Dart come in again and again. Fun times, fun times in playing <laughs> these Codex Mirrors. So just sending out over here an 11 cost? Yeah. The 11 damage um, across the board with just Sleep Dart. Uh, no, we noticed that there is also an enlightened strike in uh, Tianwei's hand. So, wondering what he's gonna do, um, whether it's gonna IP himself this turn. So you have to, yeah, because remember, there's also a ponder on hit on this premeditate as well. So should this hit, he's also gonna get a ponder while he's already holding two cards. You have to wonder whether Snapdragon Scaler is going to be his choice over here as a reaction. Yeah, looks like just blocking nine. Not too concerned about taking that two damage and giving that ponder token away. Yeah, when your opponent's holding a bunch of cards, you can be like, oh, okay, so the opponent doesn't really matter. And Snapdragon is coming up from Tianwei over here. He's saying, okay, you've committed three cards to the block already. Here's, I'm going to present more damage uh, to you. No, take two. Take two. Yeah. Very, very interesting. I mean, the Death Dealer has already been used. So are we going to see a Bullseye Bracer or are we just going to see a Lighter Strike for seven? Probably just the E Strike for seven and set up with a Ponda as well. So he's not even giving up an Arsenal to do that play. Yeah. Very, very strong turn from Tenway coming out here, but you have to remember it was at the cost of the Snapdragon Scalers. Normally in Azalea with the Snapdragon Scalers into a potential slower matchup, you like to set up something like a multiple arrows with Rain Razor sort of yep. turn with Bolt and Shots and, the, and the, uh, Bullseye Bracers as well. So won't have the option later on choosing to use it aggressively over here at Tenway. 18 damage turn off this tunic and a five card hand. Yeah, I think that's pretty fun. So, yep, setting straight to the face, placing as much pressure as he can possibly do in order to slow Josiah's fatigue slash deck damage game plan. <laughs> They're going very tempo based at the moment. Josiah choosing to just take the full seven over there. Yeah, and all the way down to 17. You love to see these kind of games of flesh and blood where both players are using their life as a resource. Mm -hmm. He's probably pretty happy with that exchange, knowing the Snapdragon Scalers are down and he's not that much far beyond on life. It looks like he's planning to perhaps use the Codex of Frailty that's been sitting very patiently in his arsenal. Yep, I think you have to try to catch off um, the Azalea on a weird turn without that arsenal and also get maximum value. The Frailty token as well, very, very powerful. Uh, I took seven, right? Oh, sorry. I, I didn't update this. Oh, okay. <laughs> Seven. Two, Thank you, players, for updating the live totals for all the viewers at home and for us as well. <laughs> it does help a lot. All right, so we might see the Black Tech Whispers uh, being committed here. Uh, it's just a one card. So, uh, so it's just a one card. So if the Leave No Witnesses hits, then yeah, we can use the Codex. But if not, I mean, we've just threatened Arsenal. That's pretty good too. Very, very, this is such a strong play from Oziri because Azalea, a deck that doesn't really have armor, blocking four is actually pretty difficult. Sometimes they do run sync pillows, but without those few sync pillows, Leave No Witnesses demands two cards, all the loss of your arsenal. And very, very critically, this is the first Leave No Witnesses we have seen from Josiah, which means now that it'll go to the graveyard, it is a potential target for Codex of Frailty in the future. And it's probably one of the strongest targets for Codex of Frailty because you can.
can just do it off of a one card hand. Yeah, you like uh, zero cost CNC? Yeah, we got yeah. one for you. Yeah, against a deck that doesn't have any armor? Yeah, yeah I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I think Tianwei's considering how valuable is this uh, Arsenal slot at the moment, or are we committing two cards from hand? So with this going to the graveyard, Josiah has a CNC and Leave No Witnesses in his arsenal, uh, in his graveyard. So the Codex of Frailty will have, you know, his pick of the litter yeah. uh, for which arsenal disruptive effect he wants to get. And very instinctive, Tianwei picks up Josiah's discard. Mm -hmm. He kind of senses that Codex of Frailty is coming. So whether or not we need to commit two cards here, he makes the he makes a he makes a good play. Just Ooh. soul reading that out. Two buffs coming out from Tianwei yeah. over there. You cannot be happy to, you know, to be doing that. But just valuing his life total and uh, Arsenal probably has a strong card in Arsenal that he wants to resolve at some point. So mm -hmm. it's a lace with blood rot, opting it out. And if it's more, I think there's a battering bolt in his hand at the moment. That's a bit of one of the clunkier arrows, I would say, um, for for Genway. Yeah. But I'll leave it on top. If, and it's a blue infecting shot as well. So uh, mm -hmm. let's see what he wants to do with this. So it does have the resources to play the battering bolt. Now, while the effect isn't too relevant in, into Azuri, you know, it is a chunk, chunkier arrow. It's a two for six arrow alongside the three from the run. Nine damage, just more damage coming in. Yeah. Um, and it does hit yeah. the reactions that yep. Uzuri sometimes runs, like shred and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So this could be an interesting one. Definitely not happy that to, that he had to give up those buffs. There's a potential extra six damage that he could have put onto this battering bolt on a previous turn if it if he didn't need to block that leave no witnesses. Oh yeah, and um, we're looking at another Codex of Frailty in Josiah's hand. So a bit of a tough one without any stealth cards as well. Well, his hand doesn't block very well, Elliot. He's got two yeah. two blocks, and then the Death Touch and the Codex of Frailty, and then he has an Inertia Trap and another three blocks. The, Potentially why we're seeing this Crown of Providence come out. It's, yeah, that's that's actually a really, really rough one to deal with at the moment. Currently blocking for nine. Uh, for, seven. for seven. For seven, yes. Inertia Trap is live, though, so to, uh, is going to give Tianwei that Inertia token and deny him that arsenal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's okay. Oh, inertia. I'll, I'll put it on, I'll put it on him. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you Just know, short they, yep. they, know, they, know, they know the drill. <laughs> this yep. card's not going anywhere. So we have to point out that is, you know, uh, Uzuri doesn't have that much armor. The current Providence is probably the strongest piece of armor they had. They didn't want to block the... They don't, you don't want to block with flick knives when you're Uzuri because that represents unpreventable damage uh, in the end state. So Uzuri, Josiah now, with not a lot of armor left, Elliot, and he didn't even use a Crown of Providence effect. He just didn't filter at all. He just used it as a two-block, not what you want to do. But this is an interesting play. He's going to send that Spider's Bite, and now he has that opportunity with Tianwei not having an arsenal to finally play that codex that's been patiently sitting there, it's time to read some books. <laughs> and with the zero cost leave no witnesses in his own graveyard as well, this codex can give him a lot and a lot of value. Here we go. And I, I think you're right on this one. The codex of frailty coming in. Tianwei's going not too happy to see this. He has to dig through his, his discard, find an arrow and then play with potentially just a three-card hand. And you have to remember, the Spider's Bite also hit this turn, and Azalea's best blocking cards are her attacks. Those are pretty much the only block threes in her deck, so this Leave No Witness is going to be even more difficult to block because of the Spider's Bite. We might see Tianwei need to give up two cards to block again, and giving one card to discard to the Codex already, so that's, you know, his offensive power is just going to be pretty crippled on the following turn. Yep. I love the tempo swings that come from this. Josiah's going to have an arsenal. Mm -hmm. and it's very unlikely that Tianwei's going to have any much of a retaliation in the next turn. Oh, all the attack actions are red. <laughs> <laughs> so there is the possibility of even just taking that enlightened strike as well. I mean, one of the key cards here when you're playing on a small card hand uh, for Azalea is, you know, just play that E-Strike from Arsenal. Sometimes you get draw a card. Sometimes you just get a buff and to a six that's okay yeah the e-strike draw card definitely going to be helpful to you know refill the arsenal because remember he is probably going to give up three cards from his hand mm -hmm. uh one to discard to the codex and then two to block to leave no witnesses just leaving one card remaining in his hand and whatever he chooses to get back from an arsenal so e-strike draw card could be very very viable to you know refresh the arsenal and still send some damage although do remember the frailty token means that it will come in for one less damage from so the be arsenal four if yeah. you just do that one card for you know it, it, it's a wounding blow sometimes you know something you just gotta do it 
Not too bad. Considering the ravenous rabble here, very interesting in this case. Or maybe just, you know, throwing in any attack inside and, and maybe not taking... Um, maybe not blocking in that case. Yeah, yeah, yeah you almost have to wonder whether he's just going to say, all right, you know what, I'm just going to take this trash attack that I don't really care about and just let this leave no witnesses hit and say, all right, cool, come back at you with a four-card hand. <laughs> Good. Oh, well, three-card hand after you discard the codex. So, very well, could be the line over here. Ah, codex of Frailty just puts you in such a bind. Every time you need to try and decide what to discard, you're like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm getting PTSD from Lexi, my friend. <laughs> Throwing back to the good old days. So his hand looks like there's a bunch of buffs and arrows as well. Is he considering the Seek and Destroy being thrown away? That's actually a very powerful card because it acts as a more powerful inertia token in these matchups. So... This leave no witnesses coming in for four, threatening the arsenal. There's a red card inside, and there's the other <laughs> just chock full of reds. Yep. He's gonna make some silver. Very, very likely, unless this is blocked out. Four damage on the field here is yeah, four looks like it's there. gonna be a no block. Yep. Take four, yep. destroy the arsenal, and uh let's see if he makes one or two silver. Yep, yep that's oh and a remorseless, not the piece that matters the most in this matchup, but it is still a block three. You don't have that many in Azalea. Two silver being generated for Josiah here. This represents another one block in the Black Tech Whispers after he buys it back. And a potential another go again from his Black Tech Whispers as well. Very, very strong. Like, you know, it's a small piece of value, but it's the sort of thing that does add up and helps him cover up those critical breakpoints that you need into Azalea. Absolutely. Going to activate the Death Dealer here. Um, trying to see if you can find more cards. Thankfully, a bolt and shot yellow. So give that a little bit of resource. If you draw into those one-cost arrows, you can still uh, very much play them. And uh, speaking of one-cost arrows, one of the best ones we know. Red in the ledger uh, potentially just shuts off the Black Tech Whispers, right, from playing a second attack. Yeah, but critically does not shut off Uzuri herself. Uzuri, of course, activation is a reaction, which Red, Red in the ledger does not stop. So... Yeah, Josiah could just you know put a bunch of cards to block this, but still have a pretty threatening turn on in, in his own right. Unlike you know a lot of other decks, a lot of the more aggressive decks, Rendel Ledger, not really an on hit Uzuri typically cares about very much. Coming in for seven, and with those black tech whispers actually having blocked before, seven's pretty threatening still. Hmm. Yep. So on hit ponder here for Tianwei as well. You have to wonder how much Josiah is going to respect that given that Tianwei already has one card in hand. Of course, if that's a rain raises, the ponder is going to matter quite a bit. But if not, ponder is just going to be just a little bit of arsenal selection for Tianwei. So looks like that is a full block for seven. Awesome. Yeah. Yep, and looking at the cards that Josiah <laughs> blocked with, you know, we just spoke about how Azuri doesn't usually care about Rendell Ledger, but with the hand of looking for a scrap, Ravenous Rabble, yes, actually that hand does care about getting <laughs> Rendell Ledger. So Josiah, you know, sh we, we had the question of what sort of Azuri list he was running coming into the match, whether it was a more contracty version or the more aggressive version. Looks like he's definitely on the more aggressive version with the Ravenous Rabbles and looking for scraps. Yeah, so this vanilla, vanilla shakedown isn't going to do much. Uh, at the moment. So. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Assassin's play sneaky. Remember, he has Black Tech Whispers and Flick Knives on the field right now to, um, to make the Shakedown's effect happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but throwing away uh, both Knock the Death Whistle and yeah. Judge Jury Executioner. Yeah, you, you have to respect that. You, you have to respect the Shakedown because of the Flick Knives and the Black Tech Whispers. Yep. Assassins have those attack reactions on the board. It wasn't Azuri flipped in, but he still could have I've done an activated attack reaction on that chain link to disrupt Tianwei's turn. Amazing, amazing. Mm. Now Josiah off an arsenal in his own right. V vulnerable to Codex at this point. Yeah, uh, flipping up that Command and Conquer uh, from the cross reps to see and choosing to opt down. So we don't know what the top card is at this point in time. Uh, and sending in a vanilla CNC just won't do it. But hey, Ravenous Rebel fixes those problems for us. Yep, opting to the bottom and then revealing it again with this Ravenous Rebel. It's anyway, and that is you know the dual purpose thing the Ravenous Rebel does in these Azalea decks. Not only is it a bit of an extender in those hands where you draw a few too many attacks and not enough buffs, Ravenous Rebel acts as a you know pseudo buff. You send a zero for four with go again. Also gives you the critical information about the top card of your deck, uh, which allows you to leverage Azalea's hero ability as well as Death Dealer. Yeah, not necessarily the card you wanted to see on top. 
Bolton shot is one of those that you don't mind just trying to extend the chain with like a rain razor turn. But in this case, uh, we're playing three card ten. Speaking of vulnerable to Codex, Senway did have the Codex in his hand while Josiah was off in Arsenal. However, just with the CNC and Arsenal Bolton shot on top, not didn't have a way to play that efficiently. You do need to empty your own Arsenal if you really want to leverage the Codex. Yeah, without a buff, that yeah. Bolton shot isn't going to have to go again. So, uh, tough spot. We do see that uh, Tianwei does have those uh, sink pillows in his deck. So, could be pretty pivotal in some of the um, isolate turns. Unfortunately, it's in his hand. Mm -hmm. This blue isolate's coming right now. So, when you are off an Arsenal, the only thing you have to be scared of when the Zuri plays isolate is really Shakedown. And we just saw one played on a previous turn as well. None of the Arsenal disruptive pieces um, are going to, you know, obviously affect you. Yeah. Yep. Oh, uh, thinking that was a backstab. So, in the process... Oh, yeah. Just getting the already dead to come down. Yep. And now. Uh, J Josiah pointing out that Isolate had dominated, so you couldn't sink below that. You had to wait for Zuri to resolve uh, before you could play that yeah. sink below. Wow. And choosing to use the Bullseye Bracer here just to send Bolton Shaw for five, go again. Very interesting. Did have the tuning to Death Dealer in this as well. Yeah, probably thinking of doing like. A codex. I a believe code he has a codex. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think yep. so. Of course, this time Josiah has an Arsenal, so the Codex not going to force him to discard. Very tight game so far. Uh, this Fate Force scene is going to leak one damage. Uh, but looking at Josiah's hand, we know that he has a red stealth card, a red isolate in his Arsenal, uh, and that Command and Conquer looking really spicy right about now. The Death Touch as well, to be honest. The both very, very strong effects uh, into an Azalea. You can, get free, you can give him a frailty of the Death Touch, which can really cripple some of the turns. Um, the Bolton Shot Reload, obviously not threatening it at all. You know, a lot of times people hear the Bolton Shot Reload and they're like, oh no, I need to respect this. But if your opponent, Azalea, hasn't activated Death Dealer, you don't really need to care about it. And Josiah is showing that he's very familiar with that fact and saying, all right, I'm going to let this Reload hit. Because if you have an arrow, you're going to want to activate Death Dealer anyway. So uh, I do not care about this Reload. Floating that one resource at the moment. Um, probably going to find a good one-cost arrow. This Sleep Dart, like you were mentioning earlier on, is going to recur a couple of times. If you're thinking of using Azuri, well, this Sleep mm -hmm. Dart's going to change your mind. Yep. So Tianwei favoring the Sleep Dart over the Rendel Ledger, recognizing Rendel Ledger, we spoke about this earlier, not going to stop the stuff that Azuri can do that Tianwei actually cares about. He doesn't care if Azuri goes wide with vanilla damage like Ravenous Rabbles or looking for scraps. He cares if Azuri activates a hero ability and destroys his arsenal. So he's saying, I'm going to get a Sleep Dart inside the Rendel Ledger. Wonderful stuff. And because he didn't activate Skullbone Cross Traps this turn, Mm -hmm. uh, he, gets, he gets to see the top card of his deck. Yep. Either to dominate it or to fuel for a later turn. But this yep. 5 is coming in and it's asking for cards. Basically, Tianwei knows exactly what he's going to ponder into off of that Codex of Frailty. Just a little minor optimization. A lot of, you know, if you're inexperienced on Azilla, you might forget that you had the opportunity to Skullbone and Cross right there. But Tianwei really showing why he's 7-1 at this day 2 of the Calling Phuket. With these little minor optimizations, really playing Azilla to the best of her ability. Well, but here we go. The Red Isolate kept the Command and Conquer in hand. Uh, this is going to be threatening the Arsenal, even though it says Frailty for two. Yep, and Josiah did block out that Sleep Dart, so Zuri is going to be uh, is activatable on this turn. So Tianwei, you know, recognizing the Sleep Dart was blocked out, probably sniffs that something is up this turn. <laughs> it's You always can sniff when something's up. You just don't know what that smell is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, passing priority. Cracking? The Black Tech Whispers in this case. Interesting. Oh, he just wants to buy it back for the block. For the block yeah, because extent. CNC is not going to get go again. I mean, he doesn't have any cards anyway to make use of the action point. But he does have the two silver. Josiah, in his own right, really showing. Once again, there's a little minor optimization. The reason why these players are the top tables at this calling. He's recognizing, look, I don't really need the go again from the Black Tech Whispers, but I need that one extra block. We are approaching those life totals where I just need that extra life to get over the edge. Yeah, game is now at 10 and 9 health mm. each. I love watching these close games both players playing very precariously of their life blocking when it matters and taking damage when it matters uh, a four card grip i think the is holding at the moment i think we do see another red in the ledger uh being held up so even if he were to buy that black tech whispers back it could buy him a turn 
So CNC on her did come through. And this is what Uzuri does to try and make up for her lack of amazing damage numbers. You know, when you think about it, that was just a two card six, but it was a sneaky two card six yeah, that, you know, forces the CNC on it, which made it, you know, more than a two card six because of the on hit. And it's really why he's able to contest Azalea's amazing damage numbers with all the buffs and the death the drawing card every time. This is 10 to 9. Very, very tight game going on here between these two players. All right, pitching away that bolt and shot just to show uh, that red in the ledger. Now, question is, is, are there enough buffs to get over the line? Pitching a red into Death Deal and loading a one-cost arrow, not where you want to be when you're Azela. That's two cards in the pitch zone, which is just it's so incredibly inefficient, especially when, when you're pitching reds. Yeah, so it means at best he can play two different buffs. But I think there's a, if I'm not mistaken, there's a read the glide path somewhere there. But, well, here's Lace with frailty at the moment. Got to give a plus three. Got to give an opportunity to weaken the daggers, stem some of the bleeding, and also prevent, like, oh, slightly go white. Uh, we haven't seen any of the looking for scraps being played out yet. So, Red the Ledger, still a very relevant card. With the guy that possibly fishing for zero cost arrow here to just Azalea it in and not need to pitch another whole card. Leaving it on top. That's a pretty good sign. But looks like just mm. pitching away the boulder trap. Sending us in for a nice clean 11. Cleveland and getting off an arsenal again. So, you know, just denying Josiah any value from any of those arsenal disruptive effects. We've already seen CNCs and Leave No Witnesses. He's saying, all right, I'm just going to get off an arsenal and just send raw numbers at you, which yeah. you can't really beat unless you get your disruptive effects off. And Zenway has already seen two of the codexes go down in the deck and we're not approaching second cycle anytime <laughs> soon. So, blocking for three here, not... Probably willing to take 8 damage? Oh, the Inertia Trap comes in, but not effective on this turn. Hmm. Tianwei has been very, very good at just dodging these Arsenal Disruptive Effects, for forcing Josiah to like block with a CNC or send CNC for vanilla. This is the third CNC we've seen come out from Josiah. Only one of them hit. The first one played when Tianwei didn't have an Arsenal. The second <laughs> one hit, and this one is just being forced to block with because Tianwei just said, I'm getting off an Arsenal. Even dodging the negative effect of the Inertia token as well. That's actually wonderful. So, uh, Josiah only left with a two-cut hand. Can still make one of those sneaky Uzuri plays as you talked about. But this Infect Red, yeah. sometimes it's three, Would sometimes it's five. <laughs> Wouldn't need to be a shakedown here if he really wants to disrupt what Tianwei wants to do because if not, it's just going to be vanilla 5 damage, as you said, Elliot. Now, however, with the Flick Knives still on the field, you know, Tianwei is getting to a life total. Like once you hit 2 against an Assassin, you're actually very... You're, you're pretty much dead because Flick Knives, you know, once they flick 2 daggers at you, you just, you just lose the game. game yeah. So it's almost like a Brute-esque sort of game plan where your life total isn't actually 40, it's actually 38 because once you go to 2, you are almost deterministically dead. Yep. You're always in reckless swing rage. Yep. And in this case, you're in flick knives. Uh, line of sight. Ooh, thinking long and hard about this one. If he does block it and it is a shakedown, that's going to be a two-card hand for Tianwei, and that's not where Azalea yeah. wants to be. Yeah, that's really, really scary. If you, you, when you come in cards to block and more cards get stripped out from your hand. But he has to be very careful. Only seen one shakedown so far in this matchup. The full art red in the ledger there, point, uh, reminding everyone that Uzuri did get hit by that card, but, you know, not really going to matter. I guess he can't activate Black Tech Whisperers. Or he can, but there's nothing to do with the action point with it, but still can very, very easily activate Uzuri's ability and potentially disrupt what Sanyo wants to do. It's always about those fake-outs, man. This mm -hmm. could be just five damage and then keeping an arsenal and asking to get one card commitment in the process. Can you do to me? <laughs> 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 Round nine of the calling Phuket over here. This is day two. Both our players stri striving to make that coveted top eight over here. And these these last few rounds of Swiss is really what's going to determine our top eight players. Yes, it is such a tight game. You love to see it. And it looks like a dead eye will be committed in the process. It's even potentially... Was even potentially trying, maybe thinking of putting the tunic there as well, just to save a bit of life. Wow. He's probably afraid of the surgical extraction, if that's the case. Mm -hmm. So committing four here is just to play around that one particular card. And that's a, it's a sneaky thing about Azuri. <laughs> Josiah could have just been holding a defense reaction for all we know. Exactly. And, but just got Senwi's tunic for free off of the just the infect on the field and just went ahead and arsenal anyway. Yeah, I think Tianwei has kind of like uh, thought to himself, you know what? We're approaching the end game. 
Yep. This shooting's not going to hit three by the time the game's over. But once again, Tianwei having to pitch two reds. It's, it's, it's so... Normally, you know, Azalea, we praise her for being so incredibly inefficient, having amazing damage numbers, but this was three card eight. So, so just, you know, not exactly where you want to be. Of course, threatening the ponder, though, uh, is Tianwei over here. So maybe we'll be able to refresh the arsenal unless Josiah blocks this out. Looks like he is. That's a nice, clean block. Eight over there. And Josiah... Not coming in that many cards. Still has that one arsenal, so it's three cards. And the red, isolate. So this must be a card from hand. You can't use re-switch blade from the arsenal itself. Uh, but you have to wonder, blocking the black tech whispers, maybe there's a chance you try to let that through and then crack the black tech. And going back to the block, I, that was a clean eight block on the Renault Ledger because he bought back the Black Tech Whispers. Once again, I want to commend that play that he did a few turns ago where he just activated the Black Tech Whispers for no effect, but just so he could buy it back and get the one block on it. And he, you know, really made use of that on that previous turn to block out the Renault Ledger. Really goes to show his experience on this deck and why he is 7-1 in the Calling Phuket. Oh. oh, what a beautiful sound effect over there from our production crew for the swap into Surgical Extraction. But the sink below coming out from Tianwei to deny that on hit. Excellent soul read here. <laughs> just making sure there was just enough. But then again, we're back to Azalea having only a two-card hand. Yes, that Josiah's at five health, but is it enough? Putting a blue spice, I mean, really hoping to fish for something of him. Now remember, he hasn't drawn a card yet from the death. He might have missed the card draw from the dead. I guess it wouldn't have mattered because he's playing a codex so he would have had to discard it unless it was a buff anyway but that was a bit of a you know miss over there. Players playing a little quickly as the time counter also you know takes down. Just six minutes left in this round Elliot. Oh that's true. These players I don't think they will expend the full six minutes but what a nail biting game this is. Finding this sleep dart man has seen so much action in this game. Yeah, we spoke about it earlier when he played the third sleep dart from his list. We're like, oh, this is done. Now, it's six codexes between these two decks. This sleep dart's going to recur again and again. Coming in for five right now. It's a five, yes. It should be, wait, should it not be five dominate? Uh, no, it was oh, codex. It's, five, it's codex. It, it was codex. codex right? That's right. Yeah, the Zayla flip put in the codex. Yes, that's right. That's right. So coming in for that E strike, uh, it's it looks like it's E strike. Probably just seven? seven. Yeah. But E Strike 7 literally puts him in Flick Knives range. Yep. So Josiah Tianwei does need to block this. Yep. Yeah. T Tianwei could potentially, um, could potentially just block with the cross reps right now and play with a full grip going down to three, essentially. Mm -hmm. But he's playing it very safe. Blocking with a, probably an Axis Blue in this case. Or oh, Axis uh, Arrows. Or an Axis Arrow yeah. for Bolt and Shot Blue. But going down to five. Live totals have evened up. This is still anyone's game at this point in time. But the first bit of breathing room I think that Tianwei has had, being able to hold three cards in hand and have that arsenal and activate that cross wrap. This is one of the few turns in the past few turn cycles that he's actually been able to start his turn with an arsenal. So let's see if he's <laughs> able to start up, uh, do something pretty offensive on this turn. But yeah. remember... That Arsenal from uh, the Zuri player's side just hasn't moved for a while. You have to wonder whether that's a defense reaction. You have, and you know that Tianwei oh. is wondering the same thing as well. If that's a defense reaction, the patience that this man has held to mm -hmm. keep it inside the Arsenal the entire way. But double, double nimbleism plus E-Strike in hand? Yep, not that's that. crazy. Oh, so activating the Azalea just to come in um, with the E-Strike? I wonder if this is a go again or uh, a seven. Almost certainly a go again. The double nimbleism and leave no witnesses in Josiah's hand. Pretty, you know, that could be pretty, pretty offensive. When you go nimbleism, nimbleism, leave no witnesses for ten. That's kind of, kind of scary. Uh, but it looks like he did commit one nimbleism to the block. Ah, uh, so he did draw the card. He just placed it straight into the pitch zone this time. Yeah. <laughs> so coming in for five and five. Back to back turns of just not. I was just pitching so inefficiently for Tianwei. He just cannot be feeling good about that. And especially when Josiah put his whole hand down on defense, Tianwei not having an arsenal going to his next turn has to be feeling pretty bad. Yeah, and this looks like a, one of those big arrow hands once again. Not what you want to see. We're reaching that deck stack where it's yeah. going to be mostly arrows. 
a lot of the non-attack actions have already been played. So, uh, running out of options here to buff these arrows. Not only are they mostly arrows at this point, they're also a lot of blue arrows. A lot of these, like weak arrows and blue bolt and trying to pitch someone. Oh, this drill shot. Oh my god. This, this is where the tables have kind of turned, Elliot. We saw two turns back to back with Tenway. Had the full five card grip to go for something. But all he's able to do now is just a zero for four drill shot. Oh my goodness. With a full grip, you can't feel good about that if you're Azalea. And just drawing up. This is the rain raises that he pitched earlier on. So we know we're running out of options at this point in time. And also approaching these live totals where you kind of have to block these little pesky little daggers. Looks like Flick Knives activated, sending a Nerve Scalpel uh, at Tenway's face. Down to three, including a Spider's Bite. The Surgical Extraction is going to ask for... Th two cards minimally at this point in time? Yeah, because remember, both effects are active. Spider's Bite and the Nerve Scalpel effects are active because they both have hits. So every attack and every reaction going to block for one less from Tianwei's side. Yeah, this is not a happy spot for Tianwei. Yep, one card still remaining in Josiah's hand. Me could be one of the shreds as well to really punish this block. Wow, if that is the case, I am going to stand up on this chair and shout. <laughs> So currently, two block being presented from that bolt and shot, reduced by one from the spider's bite. So four block being presented, just exact. Does Josiah have the punish? He does that have the punish. shred! Oh my god. Okay, I need to stand the chair now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. And Elliot, more than just the on hit of a surgical extraction, this puts Tianwei down to one. And you know what that means? That is flick knives range. Yeah, that last spider's bite. I think it's going to come in for some sick lethal damage. It looks like it might be almost time for that blind Azalea movement. But not a blue, so not going to get a silver out of this. That rain raises in hand going to be the yeah. only thing that keeps him alive. Uh, oh shit. <laughs> going down to one life is Tianwei. It's been an unfortunate day too for him so far. He started the day undefeated. Unfortunately lost his first round today against... Uh, Vespa on Prism and looking to have his back against the wall in this round nine against Josiah on Uzuri as well. <laughs> so, uh, not choosing to blind Azalea, just sending out this bolt and shot. For With the rain raises in hand, so this is lethal. This and, is but lethal. Josiah knows about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yep, Josiah knew about the rain raises, so of course that no, blocks, uh, that no block meant that he had the defense reaction to counter it. Just going to go oh, down. Yep. Not even going to take any damage. Just <laughs> insult or injury a little bit. And with the flick knives over here, I think we are seeing the final parts of our game, Elliot. Yes. I think there's nothing much left that Tianwei can do here. The clock is inevitable. Flick knives still readily available, but... <sighs> no way out of this, right? <laughs> Duh. No way yeah, out of this. Recognizing that. <laughs> so some Azalea list back in the day did used to run Sigil of Solace. Now Levi Raj did, you know, run those in his list. But it looks like not going to be the case here. Flick Knife's coming in. And that is the oh. game. Round 9 of the Calling Pocket. Zuri takes it down. Wow. Tianwei from being undefeated on day one. Taking two losses uh, at the start of the day. But he's not out of the running. Not out at all. He's not out of the running. If anything, Josiah is one step closer to locking himself into that top eight. Two more rounds of Swiss still to be played before we determine our top eight winners. Josiah, a bit of a rough start for him going to day two, but still very much live for the top eight. Seven two record, still very very strong as he as he goes into his final two rounds of CC to claim that coveted top eight. But aside from that, Josiah's play on Uzuri, absolutely amazing. We have we have to command that eight one Uzuri in this field of several illusionists. That's not an easy matchup for Josiah, but he's been able to navigate it, and he's currently eight one. Well, all. 1,500 of you watching from home. 1,400 of you guys watching from home. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching these incredible games. We've got so many rounds of Classic Constructed. Still two more rounds of Swiss. You're going to be joining Sam Pankaj and myself to watch these wonderful games all the way at Calling Phuket. It's a sunny day outside. I'm glad we're indoors. <laughs> and yes, uh, after that, I think we're going to see uh, two more games. Uh, we have a lot of X1 and X2 players who are still trying to inch their way into that top eight. I wonder how Vespa's doing. The undefeated Prism story is still alive. The past two games have been absolute nail biters, and you just know that the next two games are also going to be that way oh. as these players just fight for the chance to make top 8 at the Calling Phuket over here and I believe we just got confirmation that Vespa beat a Dromai so 
still undefeated so far and this time didn't manage to pull off the actual full ALS loop which he wasn't able to do yesterday because he was missing the Genesis but this wow. time didn't manage to do it undefeated 10-0 Prism over here but we will be following some of our other players the more you know the X1s and X2 bracket to you know see who's going to try and make their way into top because Vespa at this point is locked so you know we will yeah. catch up with him in top eight yeah the winning ins are so important at this point in time the stakes are really really high I think the first couple of days that we're in Phuket it's like, you know, fun and games. It's a holiday calling. Everyone's having a great time. The Playing card games in a resort. It's so fun. <laughs> yeah. What else more can you ask for? But now, when we're inching to that top eight, it's going to be so, so high in tension. So, we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we've got more games of Flesh and Blood just for you all. So, stay tuned.
Welcome back, everyone, to The Calling Phuket. My name is Sam Byrne. I am joined by one, two, juice his own, Elliot Tan. And, and talk to me a little bit about how the day is feeling for you. How you doing, bro? I am in my holiday shirt. I bought this <laughs> locally. I just mm. think it's so pretty. Yeah, lovely I'm shirt. Having a great time. Sun is wonderful out there. Mm -hmm. The beach, beautiful. The people, just so, so hospitable. And uh, I have to say, you're looking mighty fine. Oh, 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 stop it. Stop it, stop <laughs> it. I, 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 I insist. <laughs> I'm just uh. having such a great time. Like, the casting for these games have been like, so phenomenal. Oh, my gosh, yeah. And so many tight games, honestly. How have you been feeling, actually? I've been feeling great just going out and watching so many of those games during the last round of Switch. I, Swiss, I saw uh, Josh Lau take down a nail-biter against Ooh. basically a hybrid, you know, not, not quite slab dash, but just in the more of the hybrid game plan. I saw uh, Pei Tung Liao uh, I, I, uh, facing off against Takano. I saw a triple R. Art of War against a Victor, which was, I was like, I don't know Beautiful if Art of War? I don't even think it got there. Victor's looking pretty scary. But uh, yeah, it's been, it's been just an unbelievable day of games. We were talking right before we went on air. Just I feel so, so grateful to be here and be a part of this. And I know all the players out there are also feeling so grateful to be gaming. And so many of them are still in contention for top eight. Let's go ahead and take a look at the standings. And let's see exactly who is still live and in the running to make the top eight of this calling. So when you look at the field, my friend, what are you seeing? Okay, so the one thing I was not expecting, obviously, was Vespa is still undefeated. Yeah, man. Right? Just a clean nine points. Um, what I am very excited about, honestly, is the fact that the Azaleas are still alive within this tournament. Oh, yeah. That's the one deck was not represented very heavily at Pro Tour Los Angeles, but people are figuring out that meta really, really fast. They know that Dory's strong. They know that, um, that KO is in the meta. So, you know, if we want people to not go wide on us, why don't we just bring in uh, Azalea? Yeah, three Azaleas sitting there looking with seven points. So if I'm not mistaken, right, everybody basically from one to 17 has a shot, right? It's going to be X and twos, X and ones. I mean, maybe crap, crap, an X and zero if Vespa still continues to go on the absolute tear that they're on. But, you know, you have to imagine that one of those slots in the second, third, or fourth slot might be if an X and three makes it in. It might be one of them if they drop these last two rounds. But you're looking pretty much all the way from one to 17 to find our top eight. So when you look at that, you know, spread, what heroes jump out? What names jump out? I know you know some of these players somewhat well. Like, what, what are you seeing, you know, when you really look 1 to, one to 17? Yeah, right now, I'm actually looking, I'm actually quite concerned about the middle column, right? Mm -hmm. People like Lionel, Pei Tong Liao, very big names here in Southeast Asia. Some of the greatest players coming out of Taiwan, Hong Kong. Uh, si Fen Fei, one of, or Fi Sensei, as he puts his name here. Uh, so he's, he's a Singaporean player, probably one of the most biggest aces on Azalea and he's showing up hard he's he's he thinks he's figured out the Victor game plan Whoa. and uh which honestly pretty good because if you look at this um first two columns no victors yeah, that's very true. Only, wow, only one victor between numbers 1 and 17. And he's number 17 down there. Exactly. So um, other big names like Josh Lau, who's all the way from the U.S., still very much alive. Uh, but special shout out, really, to Pudding Tom. Mm. All the way from Team Blue Pitch. Running that Katsu with seven points still. Yeah. Right. And he's playing against a Prism right now. The, the victor is, I think. I think the oh, victor the is playing, playing against a prism. Yeah, yeah. But putting putting Tam, I think, wow. was maybe X and three to start yesterday. So it was really, or to end yesterday. If I'm, if I, so I think I might have seen it on like Twitter. But that looks, that means Pudding has really, you know, put up two great results, three great results so far today. Or maybe if he was five and two coming out of tomorrow or coming out of yesterday, but just been absolutely crushing today. See if he can really pull a kind of little Pablo out of this out of this tournament. Honestly, this field is so representative of the Southeast Asian meta, mm, right? Let's go. A lot of people on their pet decks, uh, like I was mentioning. A fee sensei, for example, his pet deck is Zelia, and he told me he said, you know, I think the top three meta decks are gonna be like Ko, uh, Dromai, oh and uh, maybe like Hatchet Dory, but I think I feel most comfortable playing Azalea. So yeah. we're gonna see these players like duke it out. Let's jump straight into our featured match right now. It's Ang Chu Heng from Singapore, the GOAT himself, versus the Malaysian national champion, Dirk Kuali. What a battle of the titans, as you just set out. I mean, we've seen Ang Chu Hang, you know, on, I've, I've seen him on YouTube videos. I know he's at the top of the ELO ratings, right, in, in, in he's Singapore. He's one of the best, one yeah. of the best. Uh, we always propped him to be one of the best players, and I've extensively played with both these players. Really? These guys <laughs> are some of the best Southeast Asian flesh and blood players I've ever come across. They've got the mind for the game. Now, the question is how they've not played this matchup together before 
So I'm very excited. I'm very sure both these players have tested extensively into both um, their this this particular matchup itself. But will they do anything sneaky? That is the biggest question. Yeah, I just when I was out there watching the the last round of Swiss on the tables that weren't the feature mats, I saw Ang Chu Hang take down Mr. Brody Spurlock in a nail biter, about two to one when that game ended, and Chu Hang was able to take it. But it's time to get right into our feature max, folks. Dirk Wally, we saw yesterday in uh, in a match on stream. Now going to go ahead and crack that gold token. We can see I think a ravenous rebel and a sand cover heading to the bottom, and a couple of ashes created, which is the critical part of that gold token. Right into a billowing mirage. Looks like we're going to pitch uh, a sink below quite a valuable card in today's meta. Going to go ahead and not only create the Aether Ash Ring, but come in with three damage go again. Pretty, you know, less than relevant on turn zero, but a bunch of Ash created, an Aether Ash Ring left over, and it looks like Dirk Willi is going to be able to establish an arsenal as well. Yeah, interestingly enough, keeping another card in arsenal that and not playing that Sigil of Solace. Gaining yeah. that three life actually can be pretty important this matchup because KO's explosive turns are explosive. Yeah. Um, Chu Heng here has to be very careful. He used a CNC already uh, in order to block that Billowing Mirage. Interesting enough, KO doesn't have that many sixes, actual sixes in the mm -hmm. deck. Yeah. So, no, yeah, that's 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 a good point. Yeah, poppers are going to be pretty premium, even if they're running like 20 out of them. Um, but the strategy for Dirk Quad Elite to, to win this match is once again, like I said, Ashwing Gaming. <laughs> he needs to make as many babies as possible to strip these powerful sixes out of the hand. Absolutely, yeah. And um, no, the send packing over here, sending the mirror guy away, premium piece of the puzzle, needs to block it. 100%. I mean, and interestingly, Ang Chu Hang right now, you know, these KO decks, when they don't have the agility token created, sometimes their turns are a little less than stellar. Here we go. Right as I go to say, turns a little less than stellar, is able to use the second card in the hand, going to make uh, the agility and the might thanks to the agile wind-up discard. And it looks as though we flashed a little cast bones headed to the arsenal there. You know, cast bones, such a huge card in the matchup. Yeah, and oh, keeping that cast bones for a sneaky turn later, amazing. But Dirk Hua's response here, with a rake the embers is exactly what he needs to stem that bleeding. You want to be able to strip one card from KO's hand every single time. That's the only way you win out of this. Yeah, and we did we did see in the Pro Tour Arthur Trehe face down not one but two turn zero cast bones on his way through to the finals, which of course he did eventually take down Dirk Willi. You know, fortunate to not have to face down the cast bones on turn zero. We know there is one in the arsenal for Chu Hang, and we'll see how and when he's able to deploy it. But it's time for an agility and a might token powering up this pulping. We're gonna draw a card. We're gonna discard a random card, of course, if it's a six or more power attack. Go ahead and just a great card in this matchup, just because if you were to hit an Ovia with that, it gets the Gogan. You don't have to worry whether you it's dominated or not. Savage Beat down here going to come in Ooh. and create a Might Token. Pulping now going to have Dominate, and unless that's a D-React in the arsenal for Dirk Wally, it is going to also have Go again. Yeah, very much uh, not a gamble anyway because of the Agility Token. That's perfectly fine. Now, the question is, if there's another blue in his hand, he can Claw. And then afterwards, there's a little cast bone sitting there waiting for the next turn. Already making a might token. So essentially, he's protecting him from the whiff of hitting like a blood rush bellow or another cast bones within the next six cards of the deck. Very, very astute player here from Ink Hang. Wave of reality, of course, with that ward one going to soak up some of that damage. Yep, six, taking six straight across. to the face. <laughs> Oof. Players here. In the penultimate round of Swiss, can see the Mage Master's boots so powerful in a way to get out those passing mirages on critical turns in this matchup. Like you mentioned, Ashwin Gaming, the key for the matchup here for Dirk Wally, but the key to a KO victory often rides on the back of a Cast Bones. Let's see, there is another Cast Bones in the top, so that is just going to be five, but because we have the Might Token from the draw and the Discord of the Pulping, still going to get that agility. That's, Thank you, KO. That's so big, Brain. Being able to use the Pulping first in order to guarantee one Might Token is a surefire way for that Cast Bones to be more effective. Of course, he would have loved to have seven Might Tokens, <laughs> but, you know, can't be too greedy in these games. Seven is, in fact, Bigger than six, but I think the the agility token is really what the doctor ordered there. And now for for Chu Hang, even though there is of course a cast bones in the top six cards, and that you know it doesn't get you the full value off the first cast bones you played, 
That means there's a second one that's going to be coming up in the next hand or two. And unless you have to worry about some draw and discard effects and that cast bone either in the hand or on the top of the deck, that's another six might tokens for a future turn. Let's see what Dirk Willy is able to do to kind of clap back against this board state he faces down. Board states for both players here. We see dragons on one side, but we see agility and might on the side of KO. Yeah, interestingly enough, in the stack of cast bones that he showed just now, there were a lot of reds. So hope that's going to either signal he's going to have a very red hand later on in the next in the next draw cycle. Um, and that could be, spell really bad. You need resources if you want to play KO. Uh, this mirror guy, pretty good though. And if I'm not mistaken, I saw a passing mirage in Dirk Ma's hand. That's, uh, that's the kind of tempo turns you want. Chaining mirror guys alongside passing mirages and chromies, if possible. So uh, playing that burn them all as well and uh, just chipping away. The good thing about this matchup is that KO will never be able to prevent arcane damage. So you want to milk the burn them alls as much as possible. You want to milk the Asvalize as much as possible. Um, and even the late game, just being able to send those Ash Wings alongside BTA is just... Mwah. And this is, I think, you know... You don't do a lot of pressuring, right, of, of Chu Hang's hand here per se, but you put some pretty must-kill threats on the board if you're the Dromai player here. You have a Mirage guy and you have a Passing Mirage. Those are two cards that make your Dragon Attacks so much more threatening in the, fa threatening in the face of these Phantasm Poppers. But with, with for Chu Hang, you know, you have to imagine they want to utilize the Might and the Agility as well as possible. So now having to make some different decisions rather than just, you know, Unga Bunga throw everything at the face of the Dromai opponent. The Passing Mirage and the Mirage guy here complicating the equation. And like we see, the cast bones into the blood rush bellow from Arsenal. So yeah, don't want to worry about drawing and discarding the cast bones. Let's go ahead and throw into the pitch. Let's make this turn as powerful as possible for Chu Hang here. Let's see how he wants to navigate the board state, the passing mirage. Oh my goodness. Discarding the popping is pretty big here though, because it means that there isn't like a middle attack that will just clear out um, the mirror guy. KO's disadvantage is that he only has one mandible claw. And if he has to commit to the mirror guy here, well, I mean, that's just part and parcel of the package. So, Bear Fang starting off the chain. This is going to be a oh huge God. one. This is going to be a, like, <laughs> disgustingly huge Bear Fangs. <laughs> Zerk was saying, uh, coming for 10,000 over there. <laughs> <laughs> and the discard is going to be the second Command and Conquer of the game, headed to the Graveyard for Chu Hanks. Let's see. So, that is going to be 8 from the Bear Fangs, plus 6. So, 14 plus 2 from the Blood Rush Bella. So, uh, I guess 16 go again for the KO player here, showing exactly why, even though this deck, you know, it's not the most represented here in the top 48. It was, it, it, it's, it's a lot of players are bringing it because it's got some pretty powerful turns like the one we're seeing before us. Yeah, Chu Hing showing the explosiveness that uh, KO has to offer, especially when you're patient about using things like cast bones and then arsling the Blood Rush Bellow. It's very much a series of fortunate events, but when they happen together, they come in hard. So 16 damage and only blocking four in the process. That's blocking four plus the Spectral Shield, so going to block for a total of five, so 11 damage taken from the Bear Fangs and a Might Token for later after the Blood Rush Bellow. Uh, easy leak, oh, I feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's still a very commanding board that Dirk Hwa is presenting, so uh, you have to really really ask yourself, um, how am I going to deal with both a Mirror Guy and a Passing Mirage? Mirror Guy dealt with, now are you going to commit an attack just to hit that Passing Mirage? Wow, and then the Beast Within thanks to the Tunic there, able to come in for an additional eight damage that Dirk Willie has to deal with. Only so far is blocked with one card from hand. Do see, let's see, you can see a Fate for Scene in the hand, another Sigil of Solace, looks like an Enlightened Strike, and then I think an Invoke Kyloria as well. So plenty of offensive and or utilitarian cards to work with. And he is gonna be left over with a Passing Mirage at the end of this uh, whole turn cycle here. And that is the type of permanent that can, if, it, if left untouched, can really snowball the game into Dromai's favor. But the question is, is Dirk Willie gonna be able to live long enough to really see the value out of that card yeah at 23 health that's not the place you want to be in uh with those three ash wings on board and not swinging them the previous turn um what what he gave up really is taking a card away off the powerfulness of the cast bones hand but still this you know blocking three and gonna keep that fate for scene kind of signals to me he's gonna have a slightly weaker turn and then arsling that fate for scene going down to 18 Literally Ooh. half the health of Ang Chu Heng at the moment. 
This is often how we've seen this matchup start to play out, though, right? This is a, a pretty... Look, another Sigil of Solace headed to the bottom of the deck there. So that's six life that you could have gained, but instead got to power up some of these other one-cost cards. But it seems like Dromai just is kind of priced into taking a buttload of damage to start the game. Try to establish a couple of permanents that are annoying for KO to deal with, and then, like, kind of a classic Illusionist game plan, snowball the ball, and snowball the game through the value of those permanent cards. Look like we're going to be putting a Scab Skin uh, yeah. Leather in front of the Kylo plus another card it's going to be riled up so technically a six in chaos deck but not on the combat chain yeah and also the passing rush is still there so yeah, yeah. it doesn't really matter we have to block five and oh this savage feast just going straight at an Ashwing? Yeah, got to pop it. Like you said, they, the Ashwing Gaming. Yeah. But now there is the second counter on the Burn Them All. There is, of course, a Kyloria plus two Aether Ashwings and a Passing Mirage. So something that Chu Hang has to deal with. Just got two cards in hand. You have to wonder if that Mandible Claw has a date with the Passing Mirage and another card has a date with for the Arsenal. We're going to have to see here. Yeah, I'll, I'll see you in the next one, Passing Mirage. Yeah. <laughs> Passing Mirage, too threatening, too powerful. Has to head to the graveyard. So full five-card hand here for Dirk Willey. As Chu Hang is going to go ahead and arsenal himself and see exactly what is the return fire, the return salvo. Do you have the Kyloria? I have to imagine there is a natural popper in Eng Chu Hang's hand as well. Can see a Chromai, though, in the hand for Dirk Wally. That could change the math quite a bit. Yeah, it's very important. The number of times that Dirk has Ash for, it's going to be quite low in this matchup. You're using a lot of cuts to block. That means you're not feeding them to the Furnace. So Ash negativity is quite a common thing that you'll see in this matchup. Uh, but sending in a 5 go again, just to ship some vanilla damage. Ain't Chu Hang looking at 36 health going, mm, yeah, that's, that's actually pretty cool. Looks like, oh, the oh. Scowling Fleshback. Going to go ahead and take the last card away, though. You have to imagine you can just respond to the trigger with the Flame Scale Furnace, if so desired. So have to wonder exactly what Chu Hang is super worried about here. Yeah, it really forces the hand because if that's a Passing Mirage, yeah. you don't want to Furnace it. Yeah. You don't want to, like, throw it away. Instead, um... He'll have, to, he'll have to just get it intimidated. But if not, it's also forcing him to furnace it away if it's like a, thing, like a dust up. This Chromai, essentially, if unblocked, yeah. Ooh, but look at that. And you said, I believe you said it was a D React in the arsenal as well for Dirk Willey. I think so. It should be a Fate Force yeah, so that's that means sitting there. This card was always destined to head to the pitch zone in response to the Flame Scale Furnace. So the Scowling Flashback definitely not getting all of the value that I think Chu Hang would have wanted in this game. A nice little, you know, bluff and or uh, kind of bait there from our Dromai player. Mm -hmm. uh, popping that Ash Wing, really, really good. I love Dirk's discipline here. Just swing the Ash Wings rather than trying to send something like a Caloria or the Chromai to get like a double popper turn. Because he's waiting and he's telling Chu Heng, hey, respect this Chromai, spend your turn killing it. And that's exactly what he has to do. And discarding a card to give the Mandible Claw go again here uh, and also to make that Might token. Yeah, that feels pretty good. At the same time, oh, oh, there is the third cast bones. One's been yes. played, one's been pitched. Another one out of the hand, rocketing forth. Let's see. We've seen a couple misses already. You have to imagine with two might tokens, we're definitely getting the agility. It's going to be eight might tokens oh. and an agility for Chu Hang's next turn. And this is an amazing spread. If you're looking at the six yeah, cards wow. on the table, two wild rides, one pulping, and a bear fangs with two blues. Dude can't miss. Dude can't miss. Now the question is, is there any kind of pressure, any kind of disruption that Dirk Willey is able to throw? Because the other thing about Wild Rides and Bear Fangs, those cards don't block whatsoever. Chu Hang draws the wrong combination of them. His hand is going to block for um, for negative value. It's going to it's going to give power to Dirk Willey's hand instead. But let's see if, if there's any kind of disruptive pieces, a Command and Conquer, or some kind of effect, nourishing emptiness that perhaps Dirk Willey would be able to do. It's going to be another Mirror Guy here. So this is uh, another kind of must respect piece. For Chu Hang. Yeah, this, this mirror guy actually coming really clutch, especially with the Kyloria in the process. So if if Chu Hang has drawn the no block hand, this Kyloria is gonna draw him a free card. And it looks like it's a no block coming in from Chu Hang saying, Yep, oh, I'm gonna screw another passing mirage. Yes. Off the top of the deck. That That's is massive here. That is actually <laughs> massive. The only unfortunate bit for Dirk is that his second cycle is going to have three sink below, sink below, sink below, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's going to have three sink belows, and that can feel pretty bad sometimes. But uh, you're never upset about two Kaloria and Mirror Guy on the table. And I believe Dirk Willey is going to be able to just throw down another Passing Mirage here at the end of the turn. And draw another card off of this. 
Look, suddenly the life gap has closed all the way to 23-18. Wow. Not exactly the spot that you want to be. And the command and conquer. Oh my god! The command and conquer being drawn. So we've all. Oh wow! This is fascinating. So we've already utilized the flame scale furnace. So we can't just do that to grab another resource here. But Dirk really has a, a huge decision to make because all of a sudden Chu Hang has just taken two Kylorias to the dome, allowed two cards drawn. We talked about this at the start of the turn. A disruptive piece here could really change the equation here for both players. And you know Dirk Willie is thinking, did he draw all the no blocks? Well, in, I think that's enough information being sent that right now oh. another Aether Ashen. what a powerful kind of aggressive read from Dirk Willie here he has a huge decision to make for this game round 10 of the calling here I think he's oh he's gonna play the passing mirage instead of the disruption and hoping to use maybe the CNC as a good three block in this case because this is a commanding board but I think the disruption could have stopped a lot more or at least brought the health down quite a fair bit. Yeah, we'd have to see. I mean, you do. he, he does have three block available to him in the Scabskin Leather and the Apex Bone Breaker here. But the question is, would that, if you utilize that, that might have been the only resource card. We're going to see, you know, a card was just drawn a discard, so that does change the equation. But if, if a Chu Hang had to put the pack call in front of that to stop the Command and Conquer effect, I wonder if there would have been any resources for him to utilize all these cards in the hand. Yeah, discarding the Wild Ride's pretty good in this case as well because it stops an extender from happening uh, in the middle of the chain. But 16 from Bear Fangs. Another yeah. 16 go again out of the Bear Fangs. That, mm. is, that would put Dirk Willie all the way to 2 if he just wanted to take it all. To be very, very fair. Dirk's hand is awesome right now. Uh, there is a sigil of solace inside, and everything else, I mean, they're just block threes. So you could stem in essentially a nine from hand, four from arsenal, and on the next turn, hey, I got a starter. One that gives mm. me health. Yeah, absolutely. A starter, and then a couple Kylorias and the mirror guy on the field look like we're just going to go ahead and block six to start, and then there's the fate foreseen finally from the arsenal for blocking for a total oh, of 10. No. Oh no, this could be disastrous. Dirk actually saw a pulping in the hand in, in the cast bone stack just now. That's not of that's not of the question of the two unit counter on. If this pulping comes through, it's in the hand. Yeah, if this pulping comes through, Dirk's gonna really feel super bad for using that fate foreseen at this juncture. Yeah, absolutely, because it wouldn't have had the go again if the fate foreseen would have come out there. A huge read there, Elliot, because if that fate foreseen had been thrown down, yes, you would have kind of overblocked by one, but you would have saved yourself at least the damage from the Mandible Claw or whatever is in the arsenal because it could be another two-cost. It's a swing big! This is the worst possible scenario here for Dirk Wally. Everything getting completely punished for not only, you know, potentially not throwing out the Command and Conquer, but utilizing the fate for scene on the first attack. Now that Pulping is able to come in, two resources utilized on the swing big here. What a move from Chu Hang. Yeah, that fate for scene is really going to haunt him for a bit because there, it was telegraphed. He should have known that there were no blocks left in the hand. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to know exactly given, oh, you know. Now he has to use the Sigil of Solace, like, Oh, it's a, and it's a tome left in hand, so he only had that much to block in the first place. A very forward play here by Dirk, but um, oh, I think if he just held that one fate for scene for a little bit more... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard, right? Because you don't know exactly what yeah. you know, it could be. You know, the Pulping, yes, it could be the next card, but it's not guaranteed or anything like that. You'd like to get the value while you can, but now this is a Tome of Imperial Flame. Yeah, you're just going to have to pitch those two cards away, but it is a starter. You do have two Kylorias and a Miragai plus the Passing Mirage. Those two cards, of course, have to head to the pitch zone, make a couple of Ash, but all the way down to three is Dirk Wally going to see if he's able to push damage through with these Kylorias. The question yep. is, does Chu Hang have the popper on this hand? The good part is that the two Kylorias are still very much alive. Uh, this could give him a chance to, you know, draw a card. Uh, if And Chu Hang doesn't have that much of a powerful turn, I think Dirk could still claw it back. There is an actual good popper in the hand in Runner Runner um, at the moment. Looks like Chu Hang is going to take the one, attempting to try to pop the Kyloria when it's come down, that Runner Runner. Is going to go ahead and get in front of the Kyloria, send it to the graveyard. But like you said, not a very exciting turn for Chu Hang. It'll set him up quite nicely. He's going to be able to, looks like, maybe discard that Agile wind up, make the Might and the Agility come in for four. That will have to be represented and respected with the Mandible Claw. But then the Moragai and the Passing Mirage most likely going to be sticking around unless Chu Hang wants to send the Mandible Claw in one of their direction. 
Four cars off the top of the deck, still in first cycle. What was Dirk Wally able to draw here to try to stabilize in this game in which he is now currently just fighting for his life? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Playing with just this four-card hand, Chu Hing has an arsenal and he's going to draw up all the way. I think he has, a, he has a lot of decision points. There's no armor left as well for Dirk. Just that one block on that flame scale furnace. Anything, any piece of might that is generated from a mighty wind-up and the KO ability, that's a break point that he can't deal with just with armor alone. And look at that, the Mandible Claw not going to take any cards out of the hand of Dirk Wally here. He's taking care of the Kyloria, not one of the Phantasm removers because there's two of them left over, basically saying, I don't want you to worry, I don't want to worry, worry about you drawing any cards on this next turn cycle. Chu Hang is basically putting the onus on Dirk Wally to have a good, powerful hand here that can utilize the prevent the Phantasm prevention effects quite nicely because otherwise Chu Hang is set up with that agility and with that, and with that might, but how about a Tome of Imperial Flame? That is about a good card as you could want in this scenario. Get to pitch two cards away, make a couple of ash, and power up the other three cards in your hand. Yeah, that that was a real lifesaver. He hadn't seen any of his tomes beforehand, so um, uh, except for the previous one, he just used as a starter. But once you play your first tome, the likelihood of you seeing your second and third one gets exponentially higher. So thinking of throwing away... We should be ban tome. It's too oh. strong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, pitching away a Ravenous Rabble here. I can't really tell what the other card is. Um, but yeah, pitching away. Still thinking about it, but uh, considering the Ravenous Rabble. Okay, a th Invoke Thermine that's gone, uh, as well as, as a Ravenous Rabble. Uh, making that two Ash, getting a bit positive, but Ash doesn't really matter when you're at three health sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's see what the other cards are. We do see Rake the Embers, looks like a Dust Up, and maybe an Invoke Yender Eye. So all of these cards will be able to be played here. Will they pressure Chu Hing enough for him to want to respect this with any kind of defense given? Dirk Wally is sitting all the way down to three. This is going to be Yender Eye coming in for three. No blocks, no phantasm on this one, thanks to both the passing mirage and the mirage guy. Yep. Um, got to think whether or not Dirk wants to play this other rig, the embers, in order to start end the turn. Um, interestingly, I think there's a play here where he just keeps the dust up in Arsenal mm -hmm. as a bit of a bait. Although Chewing has seen that three stack sink below. Yeah, absolutely, and a couple fate. I think maybe all three fate first scenes have been played. I think I think so. Actually, yeah. I think all three fate first scenes have been have been either played three already. or one left. But you're right; those three sink below's right at the bottom of the deck in a row. And there's just a big swing, big. This is nine with go against. You can't just give two cards in front of this. You'd have to also place the flame scale furnace just to stay alive at one. One of the huge powers of. Uh, this swing big card with the might oh, token is no. yeah. This is nine in hand and a tome of imperial flame in the in the hand. I think that's probably gonna be it. There is a no block in Dirk's hand. And oh. that is gonna do it. Oh, yes. Xu Hang moves on to nine and one. You can see a little bit of the exultation on his face, leaning back as that's most likely gonna put him locked into our top eight. So Ang Xu Hang moves on not only to nine and one, but into the top eight of the Calling Phuket. Let's go, Xu Hang. I'm so <laughs> happy. Uh, we have such cool, cool swag we're gonna show on stream after this. Uh, but. Yeah, Chu Heng, one of the best places in Singapore. I'm so glad he's finally made his second calling top eight. Uh, Dirk Kwa Lee, we still have one, uh, two more rounds. One more round. Oh, one more round. We still have one more round. In uh, Very much Swiss. alive for your top so eight as well. At 8-2, he's still one of the better performing 8-2. So in standings-wise, yes. uh, he could be the best uh, X3 even. Yes. So right now... Uh, the dream is not dead for either of these players. And, and, and very critically for Dirk Willey, not only is the dream not dead for Dirk, the dream not dead for Dromai, my friends. If Dirk Willey does manage to sneak his way into that top eight, then there is a chance that we all get to watch Dromai ascend into the hallowed halls of Living Legend. But we will have to wait and see exactly what happens there because unfortunately for uh, Dirk Willey in that game, he, he was next on the barbecue menu. I don't know. Yeah, you can see... This was a card I was given in the Calling Taipei, and I was sitting next to Chu Hang uh, in the what, CC event on Friday, and I didn't even realize, and one of the players near us went, hey, hey, that's, that's him. <laughs> that's and the so guy. He, he, he signed it for me, which was very kind, but that is, you can see exactly, this is, this is what we all just got to witness, folks. Next yes. on the barbecue menu, indeed.
we're going to go ahead and watch our live backup match. This is going to be a, you know, looks like another Prism matchup facing down Azuri. This is going to be, I believe, our 9-0 and player, Vespa, taking on our X-1 Azuri. A tough matchup for Azuri, but let's look here. Looks like there's a Genesis on board, a Leave No Witness on the combat chain as well. Things not going nearly as poorly for Azuri as maybe I would have expected at this point in the game. This is a live feed of the backup match here, so exactly what you're seeing is exactly what's going on at the table before you. So you are my illusionist friend. You will, you, you are one of the many, you know, illusionist uh, uh, senseis I will be turning to in days to come. But talk to me about what you're seeing here and this matchup in general. Okay, so this matchup is very dependent on what kind of heralds that Vespa can draw as well. Remember, Uzuri doesn't have seven power poppers. She's also in the six power popper plan. Um, so most of the time, Uzuri also blocks pretty darn well in this case. So um, when it comes to using armor pieces like the Black Tech Whispers, which she can buy back most of the time, you don't too worried about a Herald of Triumph for 7. In this case as well, opting to use the Balance of Justice because those Tome turns um, that Vest wants to go off from, hey, he's going to have to deal with a lot more cards in the hand or at least be able to block a lot more out. Secondly, uh, because Vespa has two daggers, actually dealing, uh, sending one dagger as, as an attack um, just to poke for damage and one to clear an aura is actually very, very possible. Um, but things not going so well. We don't see any figments on the table. Um, cool, cool fun fact. You can use flick knives oh, yeah. to also pop those angels. 100%. It's an amazing feeling in the world. Um, but this uh, frailty token, also making Wartoon Herald come in purely for four, <laughs> looking like he's going to crack it uh, with a shakedown and then use the phantasmal footsteps to send another Wartoon Herald. Oh, but another popper in the hand here for Josiah if we, if wanting to use so in that big command and conquer. You can see an enlightened strike and another leave no witnesses as well. Yeah. Um, the good thing about... about Azuri is really there's there's a a truck ton of six powered attacks in your in your uh in your deck, and you get to get them back with the uh with the Codex of Frailty most of the times. So let's go ahead and see how Josiah wants to handle this War Tune Herald. No figments yet on the battlefield, but also no Halo activation. Halo's such a powerful card in this Prism deck. You know, a soul on demand and a figment on demand as well. War Tune Herald here coming in for six. Looks as though Josiah's just going to go ahead and take this here. We might be seeing Prism go ahead and activate as the Herald heads to soul in the middle of an action phase. Actually, there's so many, there's so much soul that Vespa has at the moment, and I'm wondering... Where are all these figments? Yeah, have we seen them already come out? Have they already been dealt with? Looks like he is going in and resolving the trigger, so he's going to go ahead and grab at least the one. With the Halo not being activated as well, you have to imagine, this. Well, maybe this is one of the first ones. The thing, there's a lot of soul, but there's also a Genesis, right? And so when the Genesis, tr Genesis triggers, it doesn't allow for Prism to go ahead and grab a figment, so maybe that soul coming out of the Genesis and not coming out of the on-hit triggers, but the figment of erudition here going to go ahead, create that Ponder token, create that Arsenal, and maybe give Josiah a nice Arsenal target for the Leave No Witnesses that we can see in the hand. Ooh, that would be very, very spicy. But there is also no, um, what's that called? Uh, there isn't any go again from that second Herald that came, that came in because that was the second mm -hmm. one played that turn and it was used off the action point gain uh, from the Phantasmal Footsteps. So we're going to start this turn with a uh, E-Strike. Enlightened Strike going to come down with the go again. Maybe putting away the uh, Command and Conquer that was in the hand that... Uh, Josiah did have. We know he had that and the Leave No Witnesses, so not sure what the final card is. Does have a card in Arsenal as well. That's going to go ahead and eat the Spectral Shield here, so four more damage coming across. Yeah, that's going to feel so rough once he, does, once he sees that Leave No Witness, um, because in this matchup, if Order's protected, he has to use both the Footsteps and a card from hand, so it's kind of like two cards, honestly. Missouri activation here after the Isolate. See, no response from Vespa yet. Now time to flip in. Oh, it is the Command and Conquer, so the Leave No Witness is headed to the, headed to the bottom of the deck thanks to the Enlightened Strike. Defense reactions cannot be played to the chain link, so no Soul Shields can come in. We're going to have to see only Ward 4 on the board currently represented thanks to the Figment of Erudition, so some major decision points, and it's just going to be a taking of 6 going down to 10. A huge move here from Josiah in this game. Yeah, and most importantly, he got rid of a Herald of Triumph that was in Arsenal. Wow. So with that Herald Triumph gone, a lot of these 
poppers are alive and running. So here is the other the other uh, uh, kind of element here. From what I understand from 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 doing a bit of learning, watching a bit of, of Rhea, Rhea's uh, videos on on Hit Effect, you can see you know this is the Genesis on board. There's the Figment of Air Edition on board, right? So now all of a sudden we can start to draw a bunch of cards. We already have the Genesis out. Something can start to be you know working together here. We haven't used our Halo yet, but first we're gonna go ahead and create our. Uh, Soraya, Archangel of Erudition. This is now where this is where it begins, folks. We're gonna go ahead, we're gonna attack, we're gonna banish a card from Soul, pitch another card into the pitch zone here to do so. But now this is not only four damage with go again, thanks to Luminaris, two cards off the top of the deck. Yeah, back to a four card grip in this case. Um I'm not sure if the ALS loop is the thing that you want to do. It'd be very fun if you could do it, um, but you have to stem a lot of the damage in the early game. Uh, the way Uzuri does it is that she's going to consistently disrupt you and she's going to take away key pieces at times. Imagine if a surgical extraction hits, hits the table or a shakedown hits the table. You're going to be taking... You see a figment inside. Hey, that's gone, buddy. That's ALS. Hey, that's gone, buddy. And there is an ALS just off the hand here. Just need to pitch uh, another blue into it because... Oh. We have the Passing Mirage headed on the field as well. So the Vestige of Soul allowing for that blue to pitch for four instead of three and a Passing Mirage as well. So like we said, there's a Genesis and a Soraya. When you have those two combinations together, your cards are all pitching for an additional resource thanks to the Vestige of Soul. This is where things start to get a little nutty. Yeah, the Hail of Illumination as well. And we do, have, of course, have an interview with our 9 and O Prism player here, Vespa. You can check out the live blog if you want to hear thoughts from this incredible player himself. The link is going to be in the chat, so make sure you head over to fabstcg.com. Check out the live blog for all uh, the incredible resources there, as well as an interview with Vespa right before this round. 9 and O on Prism, and has now established a pretty dominant board state here in this game, potentially looking to move on to undefeated, moving into the last round of Swiss. This is a very, very bad spot for Josiah at the moment. Not only has the ALS uh, kind of like hit the table on a really awkward turn, the Passing Mirage is going to make sure that these six power poppers are just never going to be effective. It's going to take so much time of him to get rid of this Passing Mirage. I think at 10 health, Josiah is probably thinking to himself, I think I need to go face. The face might be the place. <laughs> Face might be the place now that that uh, ALS has been dealt with. Do see a Genesis, a Passing Mirage, and a Soraya on board. There we go. A light card has hit the soul this turn. So the Vestige is now turned on. No Halo activation yet for Vespa. So let's see exactly how he wants to go about continuing this part of the game. Soraya now going to be activated. Going to go ahead and draw two cards. Figment of Ravages headed to the bottom of the deck here. Yeah, this is actually really, really rough. You might think that Vespa's at 10 health, but effectively, yeah. it's so much closer than that, right? Every turn that Genesis is alive, he's gain effectively gaining one health um, each single time by making that Spectral Shield. And unfortunately, Josiah doesn't have any, like, Van Brace of Determination in order to pop all the wards at the same time. This erudition coming off of Soraya as a go-again herald we might just see that ALS loop happening right now. The erudition, the uh, Vespa looking, Vespa was super triumphant in the last game we watched, and now as erudite as any scholar we've ever seen in the flesh and blood annals of history, as the, the Archangel of Erudition has connected, now the Herald of Erudition comes across. No Phantasm thanks to the Passing Mirage, does have go again thanks to the Luminaris here. Such a powerful play, not only gonna get to draw two more cards and have the go again, but it's time to trigger Prism once again. This this is a pretty exciting part of the Calling Phuket. I think we're getting to watch the battle hard in that, that Rob Catton did win was so exciting because it was kind of the first time Prism really hit the quote-unquote flesh and blood, you know, worldwide consciousness. But this is the first time we're getting to see Prism really have a coming out party on stream, right? Really getting to see Prism do the thing that the deck was designed to do into a field that like we kind of we watched Kano over RTN season, this field wasn't prepared to deal with Prism necessarily. I mean, Vampires of Determination, that's a card I haven't even thought about. That's a great call, you know? That's a, that's a complete anti-Prism tech right and no player here bringing that card because prism hasn't been super represented if all of a sudden prism becomes a little bit more of a metagame menace we might be seeing that outsider's legendary brought into the equipment slots yeah and getting the herald uh, the figment of protection here instead and maybe flipping to an aegis later on um 
This suggests to me that he's he doesn't really need that ALS. No, right? you're just gonna kill your opponent. Yeah, <laughs> and look at this point in time, uh, at ten to eleven life that they're playing at. Oh my! Oh goodness. my gosh! Atoma Divinity here. Remember, all of the cards are pitching for one more thanks to the Vestige of Soul, and we've already had a Herald or a Light card hit the Soul as well. So this is gonna go ahead. It was just a, it's just a card. It doesn't have to be Light or a Herald. It's just a card has been put into the Soul. Three more cards on the turn. How many cards have been drawn on this turn? Seven. Wow, that was three seven cards additionally have been drawn this turn. And there is another ALS out of the hand. Don't need to worry about looping it with the Re Angel of Rebirth because they're just coming off the top of the deck. It's pretty hard, easy to find it when you're drawing close to 10 cards a turn. Yeah, and he he had the uh, the Figment of Rebirth in the hand. So next turn could be a really, really scary one. Uh, the board state, he's, let's look at this, right? Vespa has 10 health. Count how much ward is on this table at the moment. Oh my gosh, and another Genesis as well. Thanks for being able to pitch a blue. What do you have for me? You have a Pierce Reality oh as well. My. This is why this matchup feels like it was going to be a little bit challenging. But as we look, the Balance of Justice is going to go ahead and be popped at the end of turn here for Josiah. Facing down an Arc Light Sentinel that wants to find another card as well. Maybe he does have some secret prison tech that we're not aware of. Maybe he has some, you know, lead the charges and or style effects that, you know, he's trying to find with the Balance of Justice here. Yeah, Vespa is in such a commanding lead. Uh, the the Arclight -like Sentinel itself is the least of his problems. Double Genesis means you're gaining two life every single turn. You're filtering through your deck and finding the best heralds you could possibly send to your opponent. And that Pierce Reality slash Passing and Passing Mirage combo. Yeah, I love my heralds coming in. Wartune 1 for 9, no Phantasm. Sounds pretty fair. Gonna be going in. Let's see. Looks like the player's just discussing how do I even get around this Arc Light Sentinel here. So he's talking about like the flick knives in terms of the ward, but the flick knives wouldn't do anything about the Arc Light Sentinel. It itself doesn't have ward. It just must be declared as the subject of an attack when it's hanging out. It is the Sentinel at the gates of any hero that wants to try to take down Prism. It's Prism specialization that is there, prepared to defend its master at all costs. It's one of my favorite pieces of art. You can see like Prism just like hanging out in the center. It's like, hey, oh, I'm, what? I'm chill, dude. Oh my god, you can. Yeah, he can. Oh my, wait, it's huge. <laughs> and she's just in the middle. She's just I'm in the middle. I'm literally like forehead to the monitor right now. I had never <laughs> noticed that. Yeah. that. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, one of, my one of my favorite pieces of art in the game. That's why I started playing Flesh and Blood. Arclight Sentinel, one of the peskiest cards <laughs> to have ever uh, entered this realm of light illusionist gaming. But yeah, I think Josiah is caught between a rock and a hard place. You can deal with the Arc Light Sentinel this turn. You might be able to deal with maybe Suraya. But can you deal with Passing Mirage and Pierce Reality at the same time? I don't think so. Oh, and it's just going to be a dagger into the Arc Light Sentinel here. It's time for the first Genesis trigger of the turn here for Prism. This is where it all starts to get going, folks. Let's see exactly how Vesp wants to continue the turn. They're just going to go ahead and resolve. Uh, looks like Josiah just at the end of the turn just drawn up his final couple of cards here. Did have five cards in the hand, so maybe maybe grabbed uh, an extra card just right, thinking. An extra card. Just thinking like, oh, I always draw two after I pitch two, but did have that extra card thanks to the balance of justice, so they're just gonna resolve it. Yep. I'm sure with the judge on site as it looks like. Yeah, just just one a very common or like simple mistake here. But I'm I'm looking at this board state right now, and there's two figments already. It's very likely that he can find the rebirth now, now that it's pitched it back into the deck. And from here on out, this game is going to be so much in lock for Vespa. He's in too much of a commanding lead at the moment. But double Genesis, man. Those yep. are, this brings me back to the old days of Prism Stopped of Outlight, <laughs> where it's like, uh, let's have this board, and they all come for one. I'm excited to see the Flesh and Blood community respond to this performance. Perhaps there'll be a, a deluge of new Prism players that, you know, try to play the complicated deck and realize it ain't as easy as perhaps it has looked a couple of these times on stream, especially when the other Flesh and Blood players are preparing to learn how to tech into it. I mean, we talked about Merkmeyer Grapnel and Azalea. We've talked about Vamburst and Determination as this generic arm piece that can you can use. Maybe all of a sudden Vincent becomes a terror as that unpreventable damage stapled onto the hero ability there makes any piece of ward seem significantly 
significantly less exciting for Prism to work with. So this is exactly the type of field that is so exciting to get to watch at one of these kind of, you know, tier three tournaments, right? You get to watch a deck that people bring that is very strong, but does have some, you know, tougher matchups and some easily targetable elements. But when the field isn't ready, it's the perfect time for a deck like Prism to come in and shine here at the calling. We have a couple Prisms live, definitely for top eight, and Vespa here super locked and looking poised to be 10 and 0 moving into the final round of Swiss. Yep, so they're just um, just fixing the board state at the moment and determining where the Death Touch should be placed above or below. And it looks like Vespa has decided to place um, the Death Touch on the top of the deck. So uh, first Genesis Trigger has been done, placing an Angelic Wrath Blue into the soul. And then, hey, I don't need this angel. Uh, figment nah, of, I don't uh, need this Figment. Yeah, that's Figment of Triumph. That's yeah, Figment of Triumph, it's fine. Uh, so we put in the soul, we'll make that into another card and to a shield. So... Just fueling up this to the right and um, light of light soul. soul being pitched. Let's go ahead and trigger. Let's see. Of course, it's a yellow. It's heading right. Yep. Is it a blue? No, it's a yellow. But I think he wants to keep the celestial cataclysm. Look at that soul stack right uh, now. Oh wow! And tell me, do I want to send seven to face? Oh right, because he's drawing two cards here from the, yep. the Archangel of Air Edition. Yeah, that's probably going to be pretty good. It's just seven with go again. Thank you to the couple of Genesises helping out the soul there for Prism. So here's first four damage that Josiah has to deal with. Then there's going to be attack that's going to have go again. Potentially some more heralds as well. With the amount of cards that Vespa has been able to draw, and another herald of Air Edition again. The Air Edition that Vespa. Vespa is showing is just unmatched. Freud is jealous of the intelligence that Vespa is showing. The, the most erudite figure, the scholar of flesh and blood here. This is the most big brain plays I've seen. <laughs> like this, this five dominate. It's just five. Oh, it's seven dominate, by the way, because oh, yeah, this is the pure reality. Is the pure reality on it, and it can't be popped. So it's definitely going through. Now the question is. How much more damage can Josiah take at this point in time? Yeah, it looks like he's going to have to go ahead and take four here, head down. Oh, two. Yeah, should be to three, right? Yeah, down to yep, three. All the way to three. There is a Celestial Cataclysm in hand that is going to be asking for things. <sighs> arcane damage from the Archangel of Ravages. Wait, that's just that the game, game, right? That that's game. one Arcane damage from the Herald of Ravages. Then you can attack with the Herald of Ravage, banish a card from the soul, and deal two damage to any target when you banish with the effect of the Herald, not the Figment. Let's see how we're just going to go ahead and flip into the Archangel. This, this is... Salar, what's a, a second? Sakem, Sakem, the Archangel of Ravages. But beforehand, why not? Here's a Celestial Cataclysm. Here's seven with go again before the Archangel of Ravages comes down. Have to put seven in front of it. And then let's see. That just has the go again thanks to banishing the three cards from Soul. Let's see if Vespa's going to go ahead and let the Archangel of Ravages come through. Two points of Arcane damage and four physical here. Looks like we might be going ahead and put it on the combat chain. Two points of Arcane damage coming across when we banish a card from the Soul. What does Josiah here have? He has the fist, fist bump, bump and the Archangels coming in. Oh, and just oh my we got the Archangel. We've got a Vespa stop. Vespa, leave him alone. Vespa, it's too late. He's already dead. Oh, oh that that was uh, that was uh, accelerating. I know that Josiah's deck has the card already dead, but that's not how it's supposed to go down. That's not, that's not, to be that's like not how it's supposed that's to go supposed down. To like Come this. on, man. Oh. Mercy. Well, Vespa really representing Thailand in a big way here at Calling Phuket. Oh, wow, man. yeah, what an amazing hometown hero here as the Calling Phuket is rocketing towards the top eight and Vespa has just been putting on an absolute clinic on an underrepresented deck and showing just how powerful it is when the field isn't ready for something like Prism. Yeah, decks like Prism, Kano, time after time again. Even the first time Michael Hampton brought an Icelander, Bulllander into the field. It's so, so intense. Just the way deck innovation, when in the right meta, can really shake the entire thing Absolutely. Up. All of a sudden, Prism starts to get really good, and then the decks that are good in the Prism also start to get really good. Bolton, Spirit of Arena, but laughs in the face of Arclight Sentinel, right? Dash and Dash IO, High Octane, laughs in the face of Arclight Sentinel. So everybody out there freaking out and doomsaying, there's, there's, there's recourse, my friends. It just might not be present so far in the Swiss rounds here at the Calling Phuket, but that does not mean it's a foregone conclusion. Anything can happen as we move towards our last round. Yeah, it's just a slice of the pie. You know, when Heavy Hitters came out, you remember everyone was saying like Illusionist is dead because it's such a power six heavy sort of like format. Yep. But you know, we're looking at Prism in a heavy meta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's still doing pretty darn good. Well, we're gonna jump over real quick to see the battle hardened meta, since you guys are interested in this classic constructed battle hardened Phuket breakdown as well. So 
a little bit of a change compared to what we saw on day one of the calling. Yeah, the, the top heroes are definitely still the same top heroes. Their order has kind of shifted around, and then you get to kind of similar representation in the bottom. Any any standouts that you're seeing? We do see there are a fair amount of prisms out there as well. And one Vincent getting ready to tear through the Light Illusionist. The interesting one for me is actually Leviah. A lot of Southeast Asian players have been very high on mm. Leviah uh, for good reason. They've been watching Mansant play a bunch of it um, on stream. Who's and that? <laughs> Yeah, just some, just some just some Levia player. Okay. Yeah, just some dude. Uh, but the one that I actually want to uh, point out here is that the Bravo representation is is hey, still hey, here. Hey 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 Who is that? <laughs> <I'll>... <laughs> Who, got, who is that guy? All right, sorry. I, I've, I've seen him uh, do some cosplay once in a while. Yeah, yeah he's yeah, cosplayer. Yeah. That's what it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the one Viserai, mm -hmm. you know, I've actually been missing Viserai in my daily diet of flesh and blood mm. for the longest time. I still think he's a pretty decent hero, just missing a good weapon at the moment. Well, listen, if there's one thing we know about LSS is that they love Viserai, right? We saw their Ark Knight Shard was printed. It's literally a Viserai fable. You have to imagine that Viserai is going to be back on the menu at some point. Looking at these heroes here, do you have three OG Bravos out there? Yeah, so the, the common... What's the common wisdom here is that Bravo has a good Victor matchup, and a lot of these players, they're looking at the standings, they're looking at who's dropped from calling, and they're saying, well, I think a lot of Bravo, uh, a lot of the Victors uh, from calling day one are not going to play in the Battle Harden. Mm. I think we should bring in the Bravo just to be a, mm. a very good Guardian matchup for themselves. Yeah, right. Well, because the on you know the, the dominate on demand into a deck that doesn't want to run too many D reacts because it's trying to clash and win as much as possible. Perhaps Bravo it would be what the doctor ordered to wipe that smug grin off of Victor's face. Look at that dude. I think I'm here and it's time in the round for the calling player, so we should probably go ahead and take a quick break so that we can get ready to set up the final feature match of our Swiss rounds before we move into top eight. Most likely going to be watching a win and in to see who's going to try to make it in to the top eight here at the Calling Phuket. So don't go anywhere. There's an undefeated prism, folks. What are you doing? You can't go anywhere. It's too exciting. We'll see you in just a moment.
Hello, and we're back here at Calling Phuket. I'm Elliot, and joining me is none other than the Kid Wonder himself, Brody Spurlock. Hey, Brody, how are you doing? I'm good. What's up, everybody? Uh, so we have a ton of players watching from all the way back in home, I guess, for you. This is halfway across the world. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm good. I'm playing Azalea in this calling. I'm X2 right now, so still live for top eight. Yes. Pretty sure my next round is a win and in, and I have to win, so just feeling excited and a little nervous. <laughs> well, you've been doing great so far. We've watched some of your games. I heard they've been real nail biters at times, so uh, just wishing you all the best. What have you enjoyed about Phuket so far? So I've had a very short trip because I had some like last minute schedule changes, so I didn't get into town until 10 p.m. Friday. Wow, okay, just one day before the calling itself. Yeah, like, like 12 hours before the calling. But despite that, I did manage to uh, walk around a little bit Friday night, went to the local 7-Eleven, just kind of like uh, went up and down a few streets. So just kind of got to like see just the, the area I'm in, just the culture and stuff. Um, and then today I made time before, uh, before round eight of the calling to run over to the beach because I hadn't been yet. Just because like I, like my flight is later today. So it's possible that I'm going to end up in a time crunch. So I was like, it would be the biggest crime in the world if I were to end up leaving this place without going to the beach. Yeah. So I made sure to go this morning. It was beautiful. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, is there anything that, about this venue? Like, how do you find this calling so far? Oh, it's been great. I uh, I love that they have free water available. I normally bring a bunch of water to stay hydrated. They just have, like, these, like, cases of water and little cups for us. So yeah. I Downstairs, uh, there's a little, like, tea time snack thing if, you are, if you're interested later. I think they do have some sandwiches. So they, you know, it might not be the kind of sandwich that you like, but uh, tons of food down there. A lot of player welfare, I feel, in this in this calling itself. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, we, we don't have a lot of time. We're going to go to the next round really, really soon. So, wishing you all the best. I hope well for your winning in. Go get them, bud. Thanks, Elliot. Bye, guys. Welcome, traveler. You must be starving. Please, come inside. I think we can satisfy your appetite. Anything you like. Intimacy. Or perhaps, ecstasy. <laughs> come a little closer. I won't bite. What do you desire? the tongue of the snake. Her thanks shall soon follow. Pleasure is but the shallow illusion. Walk the true path, and you shall see clear. Who seek may discover formless, perfect, the serene, unchanging infinite, eternally present, eternally boring. Why don't we play rough? Embrace the solitude. Embrace the sensation. Look within. Look at me. Just a breath. Just a taste. Enough! A tiger does not fall prey to the snake. The tiger walks its own path. Those who flow as life flows know they need no other force. The heavy is the root of the light. The unmoved, the source of all movement. The center is unbound and free. Walk the path, seek the truth.
Welcome back, everybody, to the Calling Phuket. It's time. We've made it. The Swiss rounds rocket towards a conclusion, and we are getting ready to look at what is bound to be. It is fated to be an incredibly interesting, incredibly excited pop, top eight. I was, I was about to say <laughs> pop eight because I was about to say punkage. A I'm punk a eight. <laughs> a top punkage eight. So punkage, Mr. Top Eight himself, talk to me about what is on the line for these players as we look to try to figure out our top eight. Right before the top eight, yeah, it is the final round of Swiss here at the Colling Phuket. This is where the tension is at its absolute highest. We're gonna, we've already had so many nail-biting games, and we're going to have one, possibly two more for you right here because of the backup match as well. Our first match is going to be Pudding Tam, fan-favorite Pudding Tam, on his Katsu against Channon on Prism. Very, very exciting matchup there. A lot of people think Ninja is automatically favorite into Illusionist, but Prism has a lot of tricks up her sleeve for this matchup. This yep. And we will go into that as we get into it. I'm really excited, Sam. Let's go. <laughs> so talk to me. So so pudding, right? He was five yes. and two coming out of yesterday's match. Yeah, he was. Um, so has really just gone on a tear today, right? Three and zero to start today to put him in contention for top eight. Now ninja into illusion, as people say, it's uh, you know favored because of the Kadachis, because of the consistent pressure. Do you think the ward is going to really come into play here, or will the heralds be more impactful in the potential game? Both of them really ward to really prevent the you Katsus cheater. on hit. I asked that was a bit for of a witch. Oh, that's fine. It's fine. All right, well, so <laughs> Ward to prevent the on-hits, because Katsu really needs those on-hits, yeah. right, for his own hero ability, and that's kind of how the hero works. Uh, but also, some particular heralds, particularly Herald of Judgment, because it's going to prevent oh, Katsu yeah, being yeah, yeah. from a banish. Yeah, and then that's where Figment of Judgment comes in as well, and that's where we talk about Prism having all these tricks up her sleeve. Halo, instant speed, getting the Figment to turn a banish yeah, card face was... down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bonds of Ancestry, Katsu's hero ability can really get blown out by these things, but putting time... Probably no stranger to these little tricks that Prism has up his sleeve, so he, you know, he's going to need to navigate his way out of those. You'll be helping me out, and you'll be helping everyone at home with the exact priority windows in which something... I think we're going to be having to watch the Halo of Illumination quite closely, because if there is a priority window for the Halo to strike, grab the Figment of Judgment and turn a card face down in the Banish Zone before it can be played. That can just be absolutely back-breaking for Katsu. So I'm, we'll, we'll be watching that to see when the card hits the Banish Zone, when mm -hmm. can Prism respond. So I think let's go ahead and just dive down into the final round of the Swiss here at the Calling Phuket. It's Channon versus Pudding. This is Hong Kong versus another hometown hero in Thailand. A beautiful, oh look at these incredibly thematic mats for these players. I can see the Library of Solana. I can see the Lord of Wind. These are two players who are at the absolute top of their game with some off-meta picks kind of in both of these heroes looking to punch their ticket into the top eight. The meta is so wide that it's the fine line between what is off-meta and what is actually meta. I don't know, that line is so incredibly yeah, blurred yeah, at this point. Fair. We saw the spread of heroes, uh, but this is a win and in for both of our players here. Not necessarily a losing out. Now you know we've talked, we've joked a lot about how none of us understand the tiebreakers <laughs> in this game. Uh, but whoever loses the matchup is still potentially in contention. They'll need tiebreakers to go their way. But whoever wins this matchup is guaranteed locked for top eight. That means there'll be no holds barred for this matchup. Yeah, there's a lot of players jockeying for position right at the top of the standings, right? So a lot of these players are still going to be in contention even with a loss. But you'd way rather be guaranteed your spot in a calling top eight. Not only a calling top eight, but a calling top eight on the beach. I feel like the <laughs> fact that the calling is on the beach should make the top eight just like a little more valuable, right? Like they should get they should get the money, they should get the gold foil, and they should get like a another night at this resort or something. It does mean that you have less time to spend on the beach because you're playing the top eight, but you continue playing card games at a resort. So yeah, it does it does mean it's more valuable overall. Yeah, I, I think so too. So looking at these players here, I'm so, super excited to see just kind of what the game plan is for both players. Just putting just go all gas no breaks, you know, just vomit as much damage as possible, make Prism have to really consider how to, to navigate the two blocks, the no blocks, you know, uh, or, I mean, more, more no blocks than two blocks in the deck, but, or just pitting, really try to, you know, craft the perfect combo line, set up the arsenal, really create the bonds, the descended, the bonds, you know, the, the dishonor, I mean, dishonor in this match would go crazy. The question is, how much ward will those angels provide? And for Channon, what chest piece is flipped, right? What is, is it, is it heralds? Is it auras? Is it tomes? It's all going to come down to these first turns of the game as the players are shuffling their opponent's decks here, getting a good little final moment of anticipation. Looks like the fist bump is being extended. It's 
time for the final round of Swiss here at the Calling Phuket. We have, it means got to be the deck of the tournament, Prism Sculptor of, or not Prism Sculptor of Arclight, <laughs> the Awakener of Soul coming in with that new Luminaris. Angel's Glow have powered up this hero so drastically and now getting to see if Katsu is going to be the ninja that stands in her way of the top eight. Let's get into it. You just invoked a whole bunch of PTSD when you said Prism Sculptor of Arclight. <laughs> so oh my God. <laughs> Dear God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let's begin the game. It's going to go ahead and be the Herald of Triumph. This is the one that is going to make it tough Ooh. to go ahead and block with Phantasm. But the first pitch of the game is the Light of Soul. And that means not only is the card hitting the soul, a Herald on turn zero. This is how the Prism deck can begin to spiral out of nowhere. You saw Pudding just kind of take a moment and breathe deep because this is about as good a start as possible for the Prism here. The incredible start for Channon over here. Remember also, Empyrean Rapture is the chess piece of choice for Channon, which means he will be able to flip this figment for free. He will need to get rid of that soul that he just put in there, but you know he's going to get an extra ward for effect effectively going up for life on turn zero. Also, there's Herald of Triumph in the combat chain. Pudding is holding on to a popper. It's a six power popper, Sam. It's not really a popper into a figment of triumph. We're going to have to see what are the final cards for Shannon, right? So goes ahead and found a figment of war. Now remember, he does not have any spectral shields, which means keeping the angel safe from Kodachis is actually going to be potentially a little tough. It is why sometimes it is why the angel, the figment of protection, and the angel of protection is going to matter a lot in this matchup because then you can generate a bunch of spectral shields and, and keep your angel safe. And the courage token here, I think we're going to have to see exactly how. Uh, Shannon is able to utilize it. If it's another Herald in the hand, if it's something like a Herald of Triumph, right, that w would be normally coming in for six, but comes in for seven, right, or or because if there's a two block in Pudding's hand, might make it harder to block. But first, we're going to go ahead and have a free flip. Thanks to the Empyrean Rapture, pitch a blue. So potentially attack with the Archangel Solana. of War. Yes. No cards in soul for Prism over here, so cannot activate Belana's ability, the additional ability of when she attacks. So just coming in for four, no plus one counters. Now, while this start has been amazing for Chan, and we do want to point out that this is not all doom and gloom for Pudding. He is able to fill up the graveyard with the Bonds of Ancestry and the Whelming Gustway. Very, very important, because as we speak about, Katsus these days need to fill up the graveyard so that they can have targets for the Bonds of Ancestry. So the fact he's able to fill a few combo cards in his graveyard, still, you know, he's getting something out of his turn zero. What does Chan and half here is it something like one of those one cost heralds like a war tune herald this is a huge moment as the popper has already been committed to the combat chain in front of the angel not a potential herald here shannon thinking about this turn could also just be one of the zero cost blue auras it is a war tune herald war tune herald coming down it's a blue but a popper has already been committed the courage token is going to go ahead and pump it up to six as well so Shannon is getting off an arsenal over here, but very likely his Herald is going to hit, and he's going to get yet another Figment to be able to put into play well, from unless, this Herald hitting. he grabs the Figment of Erudition, then he's not going to be mm -hmm. off an arsenal. Then yep. he's going to grab a Ponder token and power up this turn as well. So putting here has to be looking down at the block on the Angel and just wondering if perhaps it would have been better served as a potential insurance piece against the Phantasm Popper. Yes, I think the card in his hand is a card he wanted to keep and or it's a two block. I think it might be a surging strike, a really powerful card in these matchups, but this War Tune Herald presenting all kinds of problems, and now the surging strike still has to go in front. Four damage coming across, and a second prism activation when the Herald goes to Soul here. What a huge beginning of this game for our prism player. Pudding Tom took a bit of a risk there, putting the uh, the popper in front of the angel there, saying that the only thing that punishes me here is a War Tune Herald, but Shannon had that exact card to come in and punish Pudding Tom. Now Pudding starting at five life down in this turn zero. Yeah, but this is the moment, right? Pudding started out at five and two to start the day and has won three games in a row, right? You know the mentals are tough. You know this is a, a battle-tested competitor out there. Yes, you might be down to start this game. It is going to go ahead and be the figment of erudition. You're going to get that ponder set up a five-card hand. Just such a powerful start from the prison player here, but Mask of the Pouncing Links, Breeze Rider Brutes, Breaking Scales. So these are incredibly powerful pieces of equipment that can e equalize any game board as well as an, you know, an extended art tunic, which actually <laughs> gives you two 
two resources when you pop it instead of the one. Definitely. Now, for a moment there, Chanon was considering getting the figment of protection to get that crucial spectral shield, because now this Balana right here, Sam, kind of vulnerable to these Kadachis. No spectral shields to protect her. No um, wave of reality either on Chanon's side. Opted mm -hmm. for the Goliath Gauntlet instead. So he did get he did get to refresh his arsenal after that amazing turn zero. But let's see if he's able to protect this angel or whether it's just going to be given up as a ward for to also stop a critical Katsu on hit. So important to know, this angel is on the field and is an available target for Katsu to attack. But here's where the tricksiness of Prism comes in. The halo is still on the field. If you send an attack at an angel, yep. Channel is able to, at instant speed, find Figment of Ravages, deal yep. damage to himself to destroy the angel, closing the combat chain and ending ending putting Tom's turn. So he does need to be mindful of that line. Yeah, so you attack into an angel, right? It's declared as the target of an attack. And then you can kind of spectra the attack while in the layer step still before the attack has resolved and the go again has a chance to resolve. That's when you go ahead and activate the Halo, grab the Figment of Ravages, target yourself with the Arcane Damage, which blows up the ward. Then all of a sudden, your attack is still on the combat chain. Once the layer step resolves, there is no legal attack uh, for that attack to resolve towards because it's been blown up from the Arcane Damage. Then there is no go again, and that is a way to stop the turn. Looks like we might be going ahead and throwing the Phantasmal Footsteps in front of this to start. So that's one of the more efficient lines that Prism has access to once she has a figment on the field. You can pitch a blue to Phantasma footsteps, have two floating to flip one uh, one of your figments on the field. In this case, it would be the Erudition. Turn it into the Angel so you did still get full value from your one card that you have pitched. I'm going to think here we can see there is the Figment of Ravages in the hand, actually. So not available Ooh. on this turn because you can't grab it out of the Halo, but you can just play it at instant <laughs> speed from the hand. <laughs> can just play as enchanted. And that is one of the downsides of this Prism list, right? You are running, you know, eight to nine Figments. I and mean, every time you draw one of these, that feels not good at all. Yeah. I mean, whatever the, it's not Angelic Wrath, but it's the one that, I think it isn't. Maybe it is Angelic Wrath, the plus two. Yeah. Yeah. Blue Angelic Wrath is often in the yes, list. Yellow Angelic Wrath sneaking its way into this list as well. A bunch of no blocks in the Prism deck. So definitely has potential to draw up a hand that has no defensive value whatsoever, but that's where the ward comes in. Looks like it's going to be a no block here, and there goes the angel. Yeah, and we spoke about this. Shannon's choice on a previous turn to find Figment of Erudition instead of Figment of Protection. That uh, kind of punishing him over here, losing his ward for angel to just a one damage Kadachi does not feel good. Oh my god. I Look at putting sleeves, dude. Team Blue pitch absolutely stunting on the competition with like a kind of a custom, custom almost like it resembles Katsu, but it's not Katsu. It's pudding. You can see the name mm -hmm. down there. That I, I, I love that. That's, that's class that's right there. Super that's, cool. Yeah. The surging strike also a nice continuation of the combat chain here. He had to block with it on the last turn. You know he was trying to keep that card, but luckily found another one. Now it's time to activate the Katsu ability because we have hit with the surging strike. It's at least going to be on the stack. Let's see if pudding wants to go ahead and grab. Something like a Whelming or another kind of follow-up to the Surging Strike. Be like water, headed to the graveyard. So we just have to remind everyone that now Pudding is open to the line that we were talking about earlier with the Figment of Judgment. After the resolution, the, in the resolution step, after the Katsu ability has resolved, Channon does have a priority window right here to pop the Halo and turn that Bonds of Ancestry in Pudding's Banner Zone face down. It will cost him his halo, but it will effectively stop putting from getting off that critical bonds piece. So technically in between when this Whelming Gust Wave just hit the combat chain and like before the Whelming Gust Wave hits the combat chain, there is a window where the Bonds of Ancestry is in the Banish Zone. There was even a window after the Katsu trigger resolved, before the Whelming was even put on the, yeah, on yeah, the that's chain. Yeah, that's yes. what I'm asking. Yeah, 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 yeah right yeah. before this Whelming. And now, was, honestly, yes. even though the Whelming is on the chain, the Bonds of Ancestry is still sitting there nice yep. and vulnerable in the Banished Zone, right? Yeah, but uh, an early pop of a Halo would be incredibly aggressive for Chan. Yeah. And let's see if it actually opts for it. Uh, you know, uh, there is no Dishonor being threatened here, so really it'll just be a bit more uh, vanilla damage. Yeah. And, and critically, in case those at home aren't familiar with this interaction, the Figment of Judgment, right, is going to turn a card in the Banished Zone face down. Yes. And if Face down card can't be targeted, can't be played. It basically doesn't exist in there anymore, and it remains face down for the rest of the game. So that is the way you can shut down that Bonds of Ancestry. Even though Katsu says you may play it from the ba the banish zone, as if it's face down, it's it's almost like it's not even there. But now, though, Channon does need to deal with this whelming gust wave with a pretty 
threatening on hit of draw a card. This is Snatch with Go again. It's very, very strong, followed up by the Surging Strike. Now, these figments, when you draw them, very, very unfortunate. They block for nothing, but you are able wow, look at this. to play them into footsteps. And here is the Halo of Illumination activation. We're going to go ahead and put a Herald into the soul. We're going to go ahead and grab a card from the top of the deck. Let's see. It is just another big Herald, so a figment can be grabbed here. Let's see if he's going to go ahead and turn that Bonds of Ancestry face down. So not running Vestige of Soul is Shannon over here. So not going to get the extra resources for the rest of the turn. But yeah, is finding the Figment of Judgment. That Bonds of Ancestry turned down. They just bought himself A's life with that play, Sam. Unbelievable here because now that's a Bonds that doesn't go to the graveyard. You can't use another Bonds to banish the Bonds, right? Like that Bonds does not exist. That changes the math for putting here of the ceilings of these turns. But this is a one-time effect for Prism. Like we've talked about throughout this tournament as Prism has just had this breakout run here throughout the Calling Phuket. This is often in other games can be Prism's most powerful turn. Having it deployed on defense also kind of limits the ceiling of what Shannon is able to do further on in this game. This is turn one. This is Pudding's first real turn of the game. Yeah. He's actually got to be pretty happy that the Halo was already used 100%. so early in the game. And now the Phantasmal Footstep is going to be put in front with that final floating and let's see. The answer is no further block. So just going to go ahead and take three allowing Pudding to go ahead and draw a card off of the Whelming Gust Wave Trigger. Let's see what it is here. Enlightened Strike with no cards in hand. That most likely is just going to have to hit the Arsenal here. Good, powerful card. Yeah, Does a lot of work in the Arsenal. matchup. Yep. But at the end of the day, which, and you know, the Whelming Gust Wave, even though sometimes you're like, oh, man, you can, you can hit something to follow the Whelming Gust Wave. An Arsenal, almost yep. like a Ponder, still does quite a, quite a good uh, bit of work in the matchup as well. On the Channon side here, just two figments to speak of. That Halo of Illumination gone. Now, I did manage to catch one of Channon's games at the top tables yesterday into another Katsu, and he did end up losing that matchup. Uh, unfortunately, drew a hand in the middle of the game with three figments in it or something like that. It was, it was right. a terrible, yeah, yeah, yeah. no blocks in there, and against a Katsu, that's just a death sentence. Yeah. Um, so, looking to not repeat that is Channon in this game. We're going to go ahead and activate the Goliath Gauntlet. Let's see if it's a Herald of Erudition. No, it's just going to be a Herald of Triumph. So, cannot be... Um, or, or, sorry, excuse me, has to be blocked with something with seven or more power because of the Herald of Triumph's effect, and is going to get plus two thanks to the Goliath Gauntlet, so making putting put some significantly, you know, more powerful blocking cards in front of this and maybe committing something like the Breeze Rider Boots or the Breaking Scales. This is a scary point in the prison. When you can't pop something oh. and you're just blocking with seven power, they might have one of those pumps, like the Angelic Wrath. Yeah. And, and, and then there's one in the pitch already. Yeah. There's one in the pitch already, making you have to imagine if you're in putting seat here. There's one in the pitch. Does that mean he's got another one in the hand? The Herald as soon as they hit the soul do so much work let's see if there is a reaction from shannon here the blocks have been committed it looks like no just a couple more heralds from this point forward so did have to go again thanks to the luminaris effect not sure if we're still in the chain link resolution see how chen wants to continue this turn down 10 life but the potential for eight ward on the turn and blocked that bonds of ancestry by committing the halo early in this game as we speak about threatening Heralds, aside from Herald of Triumph, Herald of Judgment, also a very, very strong card that Janon has access to against Katsu, saying that when this hits, you are not allowed to play banish, uh, cards from your banner zone on your following turn, something that Katsu definitely, definitely wants to do. Interestingly to see, interesting to see the Goliath Gauntlet, you know, pitched, sorry, excuse me, activated on just a blue Herald of Triumph. But you have to imagine Shannon wanting to keep the pressure on, making those blocking uh, equipment be used early, and making sure we grab the three blocks, because sometimes the three blocks here can be some of the more powerful cards in the matchup that you want to use for offense. But now it's time. Look at that beautiful Soraya Archangel of Erudition is going to come. We're going to pitch away the big Wartoon Herald here. We don't want to put it into soul. We just want to draw a couple more cards, does Shannon here. So this is going to come in 4-4 four, four with the go again. He's looking for a strong tempo swing here with the flip of the angel. Again, remember, he has no way to protect oh, that angel right now. He also doesn't have a halo anymore, so Pudding Time is actually free to go ahead and attack the angel this time and not get blown out by any sort of halo shenanigans because the halo is gone. Four damage going to be taken by Pudding down to 31. See a Merciful Retribution. And there it is. That is going to be a Herald tenacity. of Tenacity coming down on the combat chain. Six with Dominate and Phantasm. This one does not have the minus one text of Hell of Triumph, so it is poppable, but I believe Pudding is holding on to an Art of War yep. and another attack. Yeah, I think it's it's a blue that costs zero, and you see a big sigh here from Pudding as he faces down this Dominate attack. See if he wants to put, I think it might be a blue. I 
can't quite tell. I think it's a blue that would be powering up Kadachi's most likely a zero cost. So he needs to deal with his Archangel of Erudition. You cannot pass a turn over to Prism with that Angel still alive. We know he has an E-Strike in his arsenal, so mm, he has a bit true. of a decision to make here. He can, you know, you send the E-Strike at the Angel, Arsenal at Art of War, or block here and still send E-Strike at the Angel and pick draw a card. So it means you're switching. Instead of having Art of War Arsenal, you're going to have a random draw Arsenal. It's going to be a little more, um, uh, a little more efficient because you do get to con uh, block with a card and you get to choose the mode of E-Strike draw a card. But you're... Instead of having Arsenal guaranteed, uh, an Hour of War Arsenal in guaranteed, you're going to have a random draw off the top. Yeah, some major calculations you can see putting. We need to be very careful on this turn. One kind of misstep against Prism, and we've just seen how much power is able to be put onto the battlefield here. Looks as though Pudding's going to go ahead, commit. Looks like I think it's Blue Bonds of Ancestry. Only on hit here for this Herald of Tenacity is just the Prism on hit. Looks like he's giving up the Tunic, Sam, to cover wow. this up. Wow, oh my gosh. The, the keeping Channon off of Soul is what P Ch uh, Pudding is really considering, right? Because now that he's off of Soul, unless there's something like a Genesis, there's no on-demand anymore. Yes, there are more dominate effects like the Herald of Tenacity, but Pudding did have a popper earlier in the game. He might have one later. Even, oh my god. Wow, he's considering putting the links in front of this. Really respecting the on-hit go to soul and on-hit choice of figment for Chen. He does put the links in front of us. Block five. The mask of the pouncing links being put for its defensive value early, folks. You talk about you know implicit value in flesh and blood. It's not just a numbers game. Sometimes the idea for putting of that herald going to soul, grabbing a figment, but also just powering up the Soraya for a further turn is not something he could stomach. You could think about the potential offensive value lost for something like that pouncing links activation, but just the value gained from the defense there. It's not always just black and white in this game. And putting you know sometimes you have to put a little bit of gray into the palette to find the win. And now this Enlightened Strike is going to go ahead and take care of the Soraya. Looks like it was a red 100 wins drawn from Pudding Time. Going to go to her Arsenal. Very, very fortunate he got to draw, you know, a pretty good offensive piece to put in his Arsenal. Yet another zero cost that he is able to just play, even if he needs to block out again into Channon. All right, let's see here. Oh, looks like Pudding drew, drew another Art of War. And on Channon's side, holding Soul Shield. Looks like a Herald of Tenacity. And a Figment of Rebirth and an Arclight Sentinel. Not, not an amazingly threatening hand, but Pudding doesn't know this. You see a Herald of, going again, uh, Herald of Triumph with Go again, and you're just wondering, is there going to be another Herald after this? Is there going to be an Angel? Is there going to be an Aura setup? And that's the sort of uh, questions that Prism asks of you. Like you. It's very hard to guess what they're going to do later, down, later on down the combat chain. Now, because this is just an attack 4-6, no dominant, you can put a couple three blocks in front of this, but then you know, you'd really like to power up your, your hand with something like that Art of War. But now the three blocks do just have to go in front of the Herald. He has to try to see and respect something like an Angelic Wrath here, trying to keep Channon off a of soul. And that is, you know, the quote-unquote IP penalty, a card left in the hand and a card headed to the Arsenal there. So nothing that threatening from Channon. But again, the on-hits are just so powerful and so devastating when these figments start to chain together. Let's see how Pudding wants to continue the turn now that Channon was only able to attack with that Herald for six. 100 wins coming in. This is going to be three with go again. We know there's an Art of War in the hand. It's most likely headed to Arsenal here. You have to imagine, like we've talked about, are we just going to go and throw everything we can, putting here kind of priced into trying to craft something pretty massive. Janet's only at 25 and one figment on the board, so the right kind of combination of Katsu math and Katsu combo could just blow Prism out of the water. As long as the following turn from Channon isn't too aggressive, Pudding is actually sitting in a very comfortable spot, mm -hmm. especially with the Tunic on three as well, if yes. he's able to set up this Art of War in Arsenal. And remember, there's no more Halo on Channon's side, no yeah. more tricksy stuff of that coming in, banishing, putting your cards and banners on phase down, giving your attacks minus one, nothing like that. However, Arclight Sentinel is still a card, mm -hmm. and we know Channon has that in his hand right now, so that'll be the only thing Pudding will need to um, be worried about, but that's a lot easier to play around. You're able to put threats on the board first um, instead of, you know, setting up something uh, and setting up like a bunch of buffs like Azalea and then getting blown on by ALS. Absolutely. Here is the 100 wins 4-3. Katsu desperately trying to cut down these angels and these heralds that bring forth the news of their coming, but still whirling through the battlefield. The winds have joined him as he brings their 100 forms towards Prism. And Prism here, respecting this attack so much, putting a whole soul shield, probably just to get the card in the soul. 
And then Arclight Sentinel pitch, putting Tom looking at that. Some alarm bells must be ringing. Is he wondering, is there going to be another Arclight Sentinel being set up in the arsenal? Or oh, what's that about? But Channon opting to send the Arclight Sentinel away and just taking these Kadachis, it looks like. Two Kadachis down, it looks like to 24, I suppose. That all you got here for wow. Channon. What a tech piece. Going to go ahead and not only block the Kadachi, but draw another card at the combat chain close. And the Soul Shield, you have to imagine being deployed there. Channon kind of sniffing out. I don't think you're doing anything bigger than an attack for three on the turn. And I just need a card in my soul. I want to flip this judgment. I want to, you know, just have another big threat potentially, or at least just have a soul for a future turn. I wonder what the random draw was off the top for the that all you got. I can see a Herald of Erudition, though, in the hand. That's a massive card, Celestial Cataclysm. Not going to do much, but maybe pitch in and make this Herald of Erudition significantly threatening. I was just going to point out that it was a little inefficient for Chen and needing to pitch a yellow for Soul Shield, not having one f left over to pay into Phantasmal Footsteps, but in here, that all you got into this Herald of Erudition on his own turn. Herald of Erudition, this is five. Dominate, go again, thanks to Luminaris. Is there a popper here for Pudding? We saw one committed early. The answer is no. It's a bunch of three blocks, but there is Dominate. We're going to go ahead and float and play out potentially an Art of War here. Ooh. We're going to go ahead and do a defensive Art of War, getting two more cards into the hand. And critically, if he chose a plus one more, the Surging Strike is a popper now because Art of War on defense still increases the attack of your, of your attack action cards. Putting here, utilizing, like you said, the Tunic Resource, so important to make that play. Now four cards in the hand, the Art of War, turning the Surging Strike into a popper on demand. Incredible play from Pudding, really showing not only a mastery of his deck, but an understanding of the matchup. That was sick. Every time you see Art of War being used for uh, uh, anything other than its classic modes, you know, uh, back in the day we see some Rangers, some Lexis using Art of War defensively to block with arrows from Arsenal. They load it at instant speed and block with it. It is just incredibly, inc incredibly skillful play and really goes to show why Putting Time is sending 8-2 at the Calling Phuket. Art of War, such a modal card. So versatile, showing you when... when when dealing with the Art of War, sometimes you have to navigate many different possibilities. But now, all the onus is on Pudding. Make your opponent respect you. You have your Kadachis, your Tunic back to one, but the Breaking Scales, you haven't blocked with it. But such a powerful effect. A lot of bonds in the graveyard there for Pudding. So not having many more, you know, not too many more available to him. Let's see how the turn is going to begin. It's just going to be a Descendant Gust Wave to start. It never feels as good to pitch into a Descendant Gust Wave. Oh, and pitching another red into the Descendant as well. So maybe this turn not as impactful for putting to start at least. Bit of an unfortunate draw for him. He drew four reds uh, from his previous turn, and then out of what drew a further two cards, and those two were also red. So bit of an unfortunate sequence of draws for putting time over here. Shannon no. here, gonna go ahead, take the damage from the descendant. It's time for the Katsu ability to hit the stack, and we do know there was another Arclight Sentinel in Shannon's hand here. He sits down at 21, 10 life down, one figment on the board. Let's see if this Arclight Sentinel wants to come out and put some major problems in front of wow. Pudding's potential attack. You see the standing order? I just saw yeah. standing order yeah. in Pudding Tom's yeah, deck. Yeah, That's yeah. an interesting, cute little tech piece as well. Those, you know, acts as pseudo poppers. Because you can choose to give it plus two attack even on defense? Yes. Wow, that's cool. Well, wow. it's, it's, yeah, when you block, when you defend or attack with it, you can sink your arsenal, yeah. and it gives a plus two attack on defense. Oh, it just gives it to both? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought it was you choose. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. That is cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's another Bonds. It looks as though he's just going to go ahead and play it immediately. Channon, you know, didn't make any motion of like, you know, I would like to hold priority. Just said, okay. So the Bonds is going to go ahead and just grab the Fluster Fist here. Here's three more damage. That Channon's going to have to be thinking about. And a Fluster Fist on the back end. Channon's just going to go ahead and take three. No mask of anything to speak of because it was committed to defense. Now four more from the Fluster Fist. Let's see if Channon's just going to take this damage. And if so, Pudding has to be wondering what Prism is cooking. I just want to shout out again Pudding Tom's amazing use of the Art of War defensively. Not only did it just pop that erudition, it also leaves him with two armor blocks still on the final spring tunic and the breaking scale to deal with the future erudition if need be. Pudding Tom is really just showing mastery of his hero and understanding of his matchup. While, you know, for a lot of this weekend, we've been seeing a lot of people struggling to prism, not really not having the reps needed to beat this deck. But Pudding saying, I actually have those reps. 
Arclight Sentinel, it's a scary card, but sometimes these her heralds are even scarier. This is coming in 4-7. You can see Pudding here just has to take another deep breath because the Herald of Triumph gives attack action cards. Minus one while defending. So even a popper isn't the recourse here for Pudding. He has been putting every inch of his power into blocking these heralds and figuring out exactly what needs to be done to stay alive in this game. But... This Herald of Tenacity spells some major problems at this point. And we were just speaking about a standing auto attack. It does look like he has drawn into it and has an arsenal to fuel it as well. Oh, but, but as you pointed out, Herald of Triumph, just time and time again, just just gutting these poppers that people are putting in for the Illusionist matchup. Herald of Triumph does so much work here. The other implication of the Herald, like we talked about, when it's not the Brutes in the game, you know, when it's not the Brute as your opponent, it's mostly six power poppers that these decks are bringing in. But the Herald of Triumph, not only is it going to connect, but we're heading to grab another figment from the deck here. That's another four life potential from Ward. What a huge swing in this game. Critically, Empyrean Rapture now turned on as well. The next time Shannon chooses to use, his pribs, uh, to use Prism's ability, it will be free just costing the card from soul which he just got from the herald of triumph going in there figment of protection gonna be the pick you called it out earlier sometimes really impactful to get those spectral shields to deal with the harmonized kadachis it's it's how you protect the angels we saw channel already lose one of his angels he lost the balona archangel of war to just a kadachi swing this figment of protection with the spectral shields if he flips it uh, if he flips it to aegis archangel of protection and also makes more spectral shields from it that will be a way to protect his angel news from swiss the angels have finally fallen in swiss vespa has taken his first loss to eng shu hang on ko Whew. So not yeah. impervious yet, folks, for all the potential worries of the hero. K.O. still has something to say about the potential power of Prism. Blood has been spilled across the angel's feathers here. But we're going to see if Pudding can do the same, taking the game off a of Chan. And now not only does this Aegis come in for four damage, but that final card is going to go ahead and be banished. That means two Spectral Shields created and a second Herald of Triumph red hitting the combat chain. So this time the angel being on the field is actually very different from the first time because there is no halo. Now that there's angels on the field, that is actually a body for putting time to guarantee that he gets a Katsu trigger off, potentially even a draw off of like a Whelming Gust Wave or something like this. Let's see if he's able to capitalize on that. And that is the downside of when you have allies in your deck. You know, we see that's part of Katsu's game plan into Dromai as well. Into Prism though, while they still have the halo, you can't go for the risky line because it can just end your turn. But now that the halo is gone, let's see whether Pudding's going to try and leverage that fact. Once again, Prism sitting out of soul. So this Herald of Triumph really trying to go ahead and give Shannon another fuel for the angelic fire here. You can see the Herald of Triumph. Look at the banner that she holds. The light streaming from the chalice as pulling, Pudding can do simply not but face down the Herald. Let's see if any blocks want to be committed. Does have the breaking scales as well. Oh, the standing order. We saw it in the deck. It would have been amazing yeah. to see it utilized for its potential popability, but instead, just going to be some potential extra block on the turn. It just feels so bad when you put poppers into your deck. And, you know, sending order can sometimes be a bit of a clunky card. So it does cost two cards to turn it into a popper, but then to just have that completely nullified yeah. by these Heralds of Triumph. And it's a zero cost for your Katsu uh, activation as well. So a really nice little include here from putting respecting the Dromai's, but the Herald of Triumph, such a powerful effect that the Draconic Illusionist does not have. The Light Illusionist has the ability blinding these attack action cards, giving them minus one to their power. And as we look at the life totals here, Channon looking like he's six life behind. However, does have seven extra life in the form of those ward pieces on the field. It looks like another seven damage. Pudding just has to take it. Forced, priced into putting all of his offensive power together and trying to string together the greatest turn that he can. We'll be having another figment on the field here. Let's see what the pick is here for Channon. Much of your power cards have been used, but it's time for the figment of rebirth to hit the battlefield, which means maybe something like an area edition. Mm -hmm, very like, like another just edition. yellow herald of triumph. Yep. Something a big, powerful yellow action card now can hit the top of the deck. Critically cannot flip another one of his figments this turn, even though two heralds have hit, because Prism is a once per turn ability. But we spoke about this earlier. Just having the figments on the field gives you the very efficient line of paying a blue into footsteps and then paying the remaining two to flip one of these figments to just gain effectively another four life from the ward effect. 
So Channon currently one life ahead on the board and also seven life ahead in the form of those ward pieces on the board as well. Thirteen life for Pudding Tam. Fourteen for Chen and Puttery here. Is the calling Phuket. Thailand versus Hong Kong. Hometown hero versus one of the greatest regions in flesh and blood in the Hong Kong area. <coughs> targeting, targeting, looks like Prism here with the harmonized Kadashi. Three spectral shields on the field. Chanon might just say, you know, just gonna let these shields cover up those Kadashis. Also has the blue in hand to paint the footsteps and convert to figment. This is going to be eating up one Spectral Shield and now maybe a second. Harmonized Kadachi coming in. So much work that this Archangel of Protection is doing. Now it's time for 100 rings. Once again, targeting Prism. Three damage. And this is painful. Channon, if Channon doesn't block this, he will lose his Angel just for uh, to three damage from the 100 wins. So, you know, it's not the worst, not like when he lost the Angel to a simple Kadachi early on uh, in the game. Looks though, yeah, we're going to lose the entire Angel, but keep the Spectral Shield around because the wards can be, you know, chosen. What is putting Tam able to put together here? It's now a second 100 wins. This one comes in for four, but the Spectral Shield can do a lot if there is a three block in the hand. And we know there is one because the, you know, Figment of Rebirth put one on the top no matter what. Putting Tom took a lot of damage to do this line. I have to remember, he took two heralds to the face uh, to be able to accomplish this line. Maybe the Angel too, right? Yeah, I think so as well. So, you know, he better hope that he can do something a little more threatening just two Kadachis and 200 wins. Might be something in hand that can help out. Is he still holding to a standing order? I think he might just be still be holding. He might just be standing order. I'm not sure what the Arsenal card is. Maybe that is part of the piece of the puzzle here for yeah. Pudding. Because that standing order can still go ahead and discard to Katsu Trigger and, you know, get a piece that he wants. I think Arsenal might still be the ancestral empowerment at, uh, from the previous random draw, I believe, of the E-Strike. This is white knuckle flesh and blood. I mean, just watching these two players navigate such challenging board states, such interesting decisions. Something like the Mask of the Pouncing Lens from earlier in the game. It looks like, are we going to throw down? It is the Ancestral Empowerment. So putting another damage on the stack and drawing a card. But now, of course, there is another window for Channon to respond because either of those angels now all of a sudden block five damage, which is perfectly covering up the hundred wins. You get the Spectral Shield and the Ward four. So now all of a sudden, it's maybe a little more enticing for Channon to go ahead and get rid of what would be the last card in the soul here. Just absolutely stone-cold analytics here from Shannon, piloting this prism list to 8-2 and two in the Calling Phuket and putting here 5-2 and two to start the day, trying to push his way into the top 8 by going undefeated so far in the second day of Classic Constructed of a Calling. Such an incredible feat both of these players have already put on in this tournament, putting on such an incredible show for us all here in the booth and at home. What a joy it is to watch high-level flesh and blood played here the calling putting Tom just giving himself a bit of uh, op a bit of optionality over here with the ancestral empowerment drawing a card having more information about what he wants to potentially discard to the Katsu trigger should he get it Chen is still deciding whether he wants to flip one of these figments into a ward for to prevent the Katsu trigger remember it has not been triggered this turn yet because all the damage so far has just been absorbed by ward more news from Swiss Dorinthia lies with an arrow sprouting from the breastplate oh. as it looks as though Brody Spurlock has taken down Pei Tung Yao in the win and in. So Brody will definitely be here in the top eight after just getting into Phuket literally at 10 p.m. the night before the calling started. We'll see if he's going to make his flight now that he's in the top eight. If there's one thing that Brody is known for, it's playing with speed and alacrity, so I'm sure he'll be fine. But this is going to be five damage that Shannon has to think about. So, so far, one Azalea and one Prism locked in our top eight, as well as one KO, Eng Chu Heng, as well, locked for top eight. Three different heroes already and three different nationalities as well. Just goes to show how exciting this meta game is. And it looks like Ward is being activated. Shannon is activating Prism, banishing his last card from Soul, just wow. turning a figment into Ward for denying pudding that also covered a Katsu trigger. I wonder if the breaking scales is going to be the play here to push it up to an attack for six. 
without having blocked or breaking skills that will represent a loss in value. It looks like putting saying, all right, it's fine. You deny my card to trigger, but use the last card in soul and use the card from hand as well. Now, the one floating that Shannon has can go into the Phantasmal Footsteps block as well. So, you know, still going to be a pretty efficient line from him. And now here's just standing order coming in 4-4. Four, four. four damage. We're going to put one block on the Phantasmal Footsteps and maybe just take three more damage. So after all that ward, look at all those cards on the combat chain. Prism, only a little bit of a tickle. The Kadachi is eaten up by the Spectral Shield and the Standing Order, the only thing managing to connect. As Pudding's going to go ahead and Arsenal here, but things are still somewhat precarious for Prism, right? No cards in soul. What are the Herald that Chan the Heralds that Shannon has access to? We can see there's the Herald of Triumph grabbed from the, the Rebirth Figment, and there's an Angelic Wrath in the hand. So if two cards are committed to block this, Three damage will be placed over the top. It looks like another out of war for putting on his side. Carter doesn't block, but very strong offensively. Question here for putting does he want to put any block in front of this at all if he's potentially going to try to use the Art of War to finish out the game? There is going to be a card left over for Shannon here. So if important to Angelic Wrath isn't committed. Important to know that Pudding Tom does not have a starter in this hand. We don't know what his random draw was from the Ancestral Empowerment. We know he had a standing order left over, and that's what he sent as a last card. But this Arsenal card, just a random draw off the top. If that is not a starter as well, this is one of those cursed Katsu hands that simply does not have uh, a way to begin the onslaught of ninja attacks. Of course, Art of War could potentially dig him into that starter. He is coming up on a Tunic turn as well, which is exactly when you want to use the Art of War. But let's see whether he goes for that gamble can hear some cries of exultation from the, the, the rounds out there as the players are ooing and aahing over something <laughs> that I'm sure is incredibly exciting. And I do just want to take this moment to shout out the greater APAC community, uh, both here and I was fortunate enough to be uh, present at the Calling Taipei last year. And the players in both of these events and in the greater region, just such absolute beams of joy and light. And watching uh, everybody here get to enjoy Flesh and Blood has been such a treat. So we have to point out here that put, that Shannon is not able to present lethal on this turn. It's just one card in hand. There's no way he can send another Herald after this Herald. So Pudding does have the option to just take an aggressive line and just take just take a bunch of damage. Of course, that will leave him open to an ALS, and that's potentially why he's potentially lining up a block. But it's important to know that all Shannon can do after this Herald is potentially send an Angel, an Angel attack, but nothing much more than that. And now, fascinatingly, Pudding here by only putting one card in front of it. If you place the Angelic Wrath on front, oh, there is the Flick Flack from the Arsenal, but there's the Angelic Wrath in the hand. It is gonna come over and all Pudding can do is take a moment and look to the skies as the Flick Flack was the random draw. That would have been enough, but the Angelic Wrath, the Illusionist Instant, not quite an attack reaction, but what a powerful response from Shannon. It seemed as though Pudding might have had the pieces to the puzzle, but Prism, the ultimate puzzle master in this case. Important to note though that Shannon can go ahead and find a figment and flip it into an angel, but critically will not be able to attack with yes, it. Using the angel one card wrath offensively. No, just no cards to pitch to attack oh, with the angel. Of course, yes, of course, yeah. of course, of course, of course. Yeah. So it does not have a card to pitch, but it does represent a gain of four life. And now putting time on his turn with just three cards. Tunic up as well, still holding the Art of War. Let's see what he can do. Remember, this angel not going to have any spectral seals, spectral shields to protect it. So if Pudding goes ahead and starts an onslaught of Kodachis, we could see that angel just die to one damage rather than getting the full ward fall value. Let's see, even if an angel is going to be flipped here, it would be free thanks to the Empyrean Rapture. What a huge angelic wrath from Shannon there. Just backbreaking for Katsu fans heard around the world. Let's see exactly how Pudding wants to put this hand together, but without the starter, like you mentioned, this Art of War looking a little less than threatening. This Figment of Ravages also representing a potential endgame state for Prism over here. There is no AB to speak of on Pudding Tom's side, so if Shannon, you know, flips his Angel and gets to attack with it a few times, we could be seeing an inevitable endgame state, and we see that exactly. He flips the Angel of Rebirth instead of the, of the Angel of Ravages, just saying, hey, look, if you get too low, I'm just going to flip this Angel and send two Arcane at your face, and if you're too low, you have no AB, you will just die to that. Kadachi, threatening Prism here. The ward can, of course, absorb it, but that is significantly less value. Go ahead and take a look at the hand. We can see a Soul Shield, a Celestial Reprimand. That's going to not block at all. An Arc and an Light ALS. Sentinel and a Herald of Triumph. So you'd have to pitch all three into it. And that's two no blocks in his hand, Sam. That's This is exactly what lost him a Swiss game into Akatsu as well. Just drawing a hand of two to three no blocks against a deck like Katsu. That, that could just be... That's what spells you do. 
So we might be saying no blocks here, which would mean a couple different things. It would mean that this Arclight Sentinel is going to come down, but it would also mean with the one, so before blocking, yes, we can, of course, absorb with just the extra one resource there going into the Phantasmal Footsteps. So that means that the award will stick around. Now the Arclight Sentinel here is going to get destroyed thanks to this next attack, and that means Pudding is going to be left with a four-card hand and an Artivore in the arsenal. With Tunic up. With Tunic up. That also means there will be Ward 4 for Channon. There will be no cards in Soul to speak of, so the Ward can only be activated on the Empyrean Rapture by pitching into giving it Ward 1. So perhaps this is the opening for putting four card hands and an arsenal plus your Tunic. What kind of defense is Channon able to mount? He has no cards in Soul. He has no cards in the arsenal. Pudding has just seemed to have been facing down back-breaking decision after back-breaking decision. There's another ALS in the hand, though. Let's see if it's deployed, if the Art of War comes out, or if Pudding is going to try to play around it by doing something else. Less in hand and another soul shield, and I think another no block as well. But Channon almost a deja vu of a hand over here, it's almost the same thing. And you know, his previous turn cycle, he was sort of just priced into playing the ALS because when you draw another no block and a soul shield as well, that's a terrible blocking hand, which is w w what will kill you. And that's why he was priced into the ALS, and he actually lost a lot of tempo from that. That was a very tempo negative play. He played four cards just to deny uh, putting Tom's turn. So it looks as though we're going to be going ahead and maybe putting the Phantasmal Footsteps in front of this. This is a, this is a massive turn in the game. Like this, this might be the turn of the game, right? See if the ALS comes out. See if the Art of War comes out. Talk to me about this, Ponkage. This Phantasmal Footsteps blocks could be incredibly, incredibly risky because Pudding Tom has that Art of War in his arsenal, making the Surging Strike go up to six, which will break the Phantasmal Footsteps because that is the text on the card. When it's defending an attack with six or more power, it will break. Surging Strike here for five, so even if Shannon wanted to deploy the ALS, it would then go ahead and eat up the Archangel of Rebirth there. This is, th I mean, this is, this is the turn of the game, right? This is, this is where everything can potentially switch on its head. How does Shannon want to go ahead and handle this attack? And it looks like yeah, Pudding natural. has the natural, natural combo the, line. Natural Whelming. Uh -huh. Not only that, there's an Angel on the field for the Whelming Gust Wave to go into to just get the on hit. If you send it to the phase, Angel absorbs it, it doesn't hit. But if you just send it at the Angel, there's no Halo around. Shannon can't deny you the attack. You're going to get the draw of the Whelming Gust Wave. Looks like Pudding Tom has found the opening that he needs. So this is the Soul Shield. This is going to go ahead and cover up the Surging Trick, but that means ALS is now no longer an option whatsoever. And it's a no block in the hand. I think it might be another three block blue in yeah. the hand for Shannon. So there is a potential for four four blocking value, and then the four ward, and then you can't flip the figment because there's no card in soul. Yep, you can't flip the figment. You can pitch the ALS into Empyrean Rapture for just one extra damage, if you re if for one extra ward block. If you really, really want to, that would be an incredibly desperate uh, play from Channon, though. Interestingly, going to go ahead and just bump it this this attack up to six to draw a random He's card. He's out of war. He's out of war in Arsenal. He could make this go to seven and get the on hit and get the Katsu trigger. No, 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 no. It will blow up the ward. He's going to blow up the ward. He's going to blow up the ward here. He's yeah. going to go ahead and pump this up to seven, draw two extra cards, put a card in to the Banish Zone here. So, so Channon does have Ward on the Imperial Rapture. He can just go ahead and activate that to deny the Katsu on it and save his Angel. So let's see. Let's uh, see you, yeah. can't, you can't breaking scales on a card with, without combo. So this is going to come across for seven, currently threatening to go ahead and blow up the Angel here. The Art of War off the Tunic, and now three cards left in hand, and one of them is that Whelming Gust Wave. Let's see exactly how Channon wants to do this. That Empyrean Rapture does have that oft-overlooked Ward 1 as well. But there is a no block in the hand here for Channon, and he is at 11. Pudding has been facing down Herald after Herald, Angel after Angel, a swarm of feathers and doom, but perhaps the Wanderer can wander through the chaos and take the game on this pivot turn. Shannon perhaps regretting not deploying the ALS, not realizing that, you know, this could be a potential out of water from Pudding Tom, and we have to give so much props to Pudding for that as well. Expertly hiding that he had the out of war in hand. It, 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 had Shannon known this, probably would have deployed the ALS a bit more offensively. It looks like he is going to pop the ward from the Imperial Rapture to deny the Katsu trigger, and also save his angel. Very critically. So the Katsu trigger would happen if the angel dies because it, like, hits the angel, or...? So if the attack goes into the angel, it is considered to have hit. If, if, if the ward pops? No, no, no. No, no, no. If, if he attacks face and the ward, is and the ward prevents all the damage, yeah. then it wouldn't have hit. But if you just send the attack at the angel because it's an ally... Oh, you're saying... Sorry. Okay. I, I thought you were talking about for the preventing the, de the Katsu trigger on the surging strike. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because it, it, it's not hitting. Oh, I see. I see. I yes. see. Yeah. Uh, Empyrean Rapture and the Soul Shield blocking a total of seven just means the attack just doesn't hit. But wouldn't the, the ward of the angel wouldn't just stop the Katsu trigger? Oh, yeah, it, it would have as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh sorry, yes, 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 yes,
Alrighty, so now, now that the Imperian Rapture has been committed on blocks, we do have the Natural Whelming. It can go right into the Angel Draw card and give a Katsu ability to trigger here. And putting Tom, it's got a bit of breathing room here. Knows Absolutely. for a fact that Cannon cannot deploy an ALS on this turn. Absolutely. But he doesn't know it's in the hand. He does know it's no longer a threat. Warmonger's Diplomacy and Winds of Eternity are two zero-cost cards. They're not the most threatening, but this Whelming Gust Wave, if he just throws it into the Angel here, can go ahead. But is this not a guaranteed hit? Oh no, I guess the Phantasmal Footsteps plus the three block could, could take care of the... But then the breaking scales could come in. If, is this not a guaranteed hit of the Whelming no matter what? Well, if he puts the three block uh, in front... If the Whelming goes face and he puts the three block in front of it, well then... 3 block plus the ward on the angel will just absorb it. Oh, even right, if the, break the angel ward, the angel yeah, ward. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes, yes. So let's see if he just chooses to send it at the angel to get the draw. And anyway, he does not know that Channon's holding on ALS, but I bet at this point he'd be pretty happy to know that Channon's holding on to a no block. At this point, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it reminds me a little bit of like Heavy Hitters Limited, right? Like you <laughs> sometimes have to just, you know, assume or just based on the texture of these decks, you know, in Limited, there's a lot of two blocks. In Prism, there's a lot of no blocks. Like that just is how the deck is constructed. And the way that this turn has been constructed so far for Channon and for Pudding, you have to imagine that perhaps he can go ahead and get aggressive. Let's see where the, let's see where the call is. Whelming Gust Wave currently coming in for five, buffed up by the Art of War. Let's Targeting the Angel. It is going to hit, he is going to draw, and he's going to go ahead and get the Katsu trigger. Random draw has the Zero Cross Blue in his hand as well. Drew another Zero Cross Blue, another Winds of Eternity, not happy about that, but does have the Katsu trigger, is able to send quite a bit more damage at Channon's face. Remember, he is holding on to a no block. Warmonger's Diplomacy going to go ahead and hit the graveyard, which means we can go ahead and grab a card with combo. Remember, he still has a Breeze Rider Boots as well. Could activate that and still send those Winds of Eternities mm -hmm. on offense. They both will have go again because they both have combo if the Breeze Rider, bites, uh, Breeze Rider Boots are popped. And remember, with an Art of War as well, that would be uh, two, three damage swings. So Genshi release here going to be the call. Talk to me about this. Your eyes are as big as dinner plates, Bonkage. <laughs> Tell me about what's going on. This is incredibly bold. He's really banking on his Mugenshi hitting because then he'll be able to find uh, a bunch of Lord of Winds and probably just cinch out the game over here. Mugenshi currently coming in for six because of the Art of War, and he has a breaking scales as well. Scales. Could make it come out for seven. Channel will need to block seven somehow to stop the on, and if he does, it's going to be a massive Lord of Wind to end this game. We are seeing surging, interwhelming, into Mugenshi, the combo is assembling. Katsu is standing there, hand on the hilt of the katana. The Lord of Wind himself has the wind surrounding the blade. Can he call them to his side to finish this game? Breeze Rider Boots also popped by putting time. He's just covering all his bases here. He's saying, if you somehow block this Mugenshi, I can still send this Winds of Eternity at you. He'll come in for three and send two more Kadachi as well. But if you can't block that Ms. Mugenshi, and we know he can't, Sam, he's got an ALS in his hand. We're going to see a massive Lord of Wind coming out from putting time. Mugenshi release here, coming in for six. No block in the hand for Channon. That's just going to block for three. No reactions. Three damage coming across. <laughs> Mugenshi trigger. If this hits, search your deck for any number of cards named Lord of Wind. Reveal them, put them into your hand, and then shuffle your deck. I'm seeing one, I'm seeing two, I'm seeing three, Bonkage. It's going to be an absolutely massive Lord of Wind, and we know Channon has a no block in hand. He can and most block one more of the Phantasma footsteps. This could just be lethal right here to finish off our last CC round of the Calling Pocket. The Lord of Wind is here, and he is furious. He has been facing down these her heralds and facing down these angels and feathery doom, but now you can see in the art, the winds have answered Katsu's call, and he stands dominant and potentially victorious at the end of a such like a, a maddeningly t t tough game here for Pudding and perhaps going to be the finishing touch. Finding all the surgings and whelmings, I believe there is six surgings and whelmings in the graveyard. This Lord of Wind will be coming in for nine plus six from its own effect, plus one from Art of War. Breaking skills still on the field, potentially coming in for ten is this Lord of War. And, and it has go again. He is just salt in the wound here, still has Kodachi's to swing after this if Channon somehow survives. Nine points of damage, and the arc-like sentinel is flipped. 
What an absolutely explosive finish from Pudding Time over here, coming in with a classic combo line. We've been seeing so many bonds of ancestry, so many dishonor lines, but Pudding Time with the Lord of Win for the finish, cinching his place in the top eight of the Calling Pocket. What an absolutely incredible game really from is. Pudding. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> punching his ticket into the top eight through such a challenging game, such a tough position. He was put in time and time again. The block with the mask of the pouncing links, understanding that he had to keep Prism off of the soul, and, and could it get more perfect and exciting than the natural, beautiful Welcome to Wraith combo line to finish it off. Mugenshi release indeed. The Lord of Wind is here, and he is moving on into the top eight. When you see a Katsu player block with a mask of pouncing links, that just tells you how well they understand their own deck, understanding the amount of offense they need to close out the game against a deck like Prism. The fact that he did that and still, still came out on top just shows us how experienced he is and now for Channon, it is not the end of the road for him. We don't know how the tiebreakers are going to work. He might still be in our top eight, folks, making it two prisms in the top eight. But for now, the story of that last round of the CC of the Swiss games in this calling pocket was putting time taking it down with a lot of win finish. Let's go ahead and take a breather. <sighs> I'm gonna need one. Take a breath. <laughs> We're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna come back to our majestic spoiler reveal from Part the Mist Veil, vale, a set that might have something to do with some ninjas and some illusionists as well. And then we're gonna go ahead and reveal our top eight here of the Calling Phuket. So don't go anywhere. It all goes up from here, and we'll see you in a moment.
right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back with your top eight calling Phuket finalists. So the top eight, let's start from the bottom. All right, gentlemen. All right. Mm. So we saw yesterday our first featured match of the day. Well, guess who made it? It's top eight. It's Lionel CYK all the way from Malaysia playing those hatchet Dorinthia. Were you guys expecting this? I was expecting a Dorinthia, uh, whether it was Lionel, well, I don't know, Josh Law was also in the field, but Lionel's showing us, you know, in this region, he is the warrior to be feared. I'm really also happy for Lionel, just, just yeah. he's, he, he's so nice and he's such a killer, so I'm ha happy to see him in this top eight. No, excellent. We have such a diverse top eight for you guys. In number seven, we have Chanan Putari. Woo! That's how... Yeah. Mm -hmm. So great player, also running Prism, uh, all the way representing his home country of Thailand. In number six, we just saw him on the stream. You guys cast an incredible game, by the way. <laughs> uh, the Katsu player, Mr. Pudding Tom, all the way from Hong Kong, representing Katsu. What a team blue pitch, like exclusive hero to bring to this tournament. So sick. X2 into 4 0 on day two to make it into the top eight. What an incredible run from him and, and a game that just had a storybook written all over it. Incredible story and just ex incredible explosive finish in that final round of this uh, CC Swiss rounds on day two. Speaking of uh, wonder people, uh, number five, Mr. Brody Spurlock with ham sandwiches in hand. Uh, he made it all the way to top, uh, top five and uh, yeah. Cannot be stopped. Azalea, yeah. Cannot be stopped. He's the young man. So fun fact about his ham sandwiches, he has actually upgraded them. I saw him eating a ham sandwich with cheese on it yesterday. Ooh. I was asking about it. I was like, wait, what happened? He was like, yeah, I've grown up a little. He's got <laughs> cheese in his ham sandwiches now. Damn. I'm 18 now. I eat cheese. Yep. Nice to know he's not lactose intolerant. And number four, from Malaysia, we saw him on stream as well, Josiah Chia. Oh, Oh, wait, Azuri? This is like the what fifth hero we're talking about? Azuri? Fifth hero out of the five, uh, we the five about? we're talking about so far. Wow. Yeah. Uh, wait, it doesn't stop there. Another Malaysian, Derkwali Andromai, <laughs> coming in at number three. Okay. So we're still six for six. The story of Dromai potentially LLing is not done yet. We could see Derkwali take it and just ascend this hero to the living legend. Absolutely. Did I say six for six? You did. I meant seven for seven. Ain't you hang on KO coming in number two? <laughs> How can we forget the KO's the most represented hero in the room showing up, putting one copy in the top eight with Chu Hang representing Singapore? Okay, and that's where the seven for seven ends. Because uh, we all saw the story play out <laughs> yeah. today. We all knew this was coming. Yeah. Everybody this was on everybody's expectations, everybody's tier list, right? This was what yeah. was this is what was bound to happen. Uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, the only <laughs> undefeated player in this tournament at eleven wins. It's none other than Vespa. I mean, tell me a better Cinderella story of having a Thai player number one seed right here in Phuket. Yeah, and I do just want to make a small correction. In the last game, I had heard news from Swiss that Vespa had taken the first loss to Ang Chu Hang, but the standings were just misreported at that time on our end, so do want to correct that Vespa undefeated. Peru yeah. <laughs> Swiss, y'all. Prism is moving into the top eight, not only as the one seed, but without dropping a single game. Yep. Two Prisms in the top eight. There were only two going into day two of the Calling Phuket, and they both made it in top eight, both Shannon and Vespa, just showing them mastery of this Dark Horse hero that a lot of people just weren't prepared for. 100% conversion into top eight. Uh, speaking of that, do you want to transcend a little bit? Because I think we've got something for the viewers back home. It's time for our majestic spoiler for this weekend. Let us take a dive, my friends, into, once again, the world of Mysteria. We want the countdown. Can you give me the countdown? Go. Okay. Drum roll. Five, four, three, two, one. The Orion of Mystic Tenants. This is a mystic instant. It is a legendary that costs four resources and pitches for three. You may only have one Orehon of Mystic Tenants in a constructed deck. It allows you to draw two cards. If a chi was pitched to play this, instead, draw three cards. Wait, three cards? Three cards. Where have we seen that text before? T a Tomb of uh, Divinity uh, is... I believe you're, ta I believe you're talking about from that. Four? I believe you're talking about three of a kind. <laughs> Are you not? Cost four, draws three. Yeah, mm. that's Tomb of three Divinity. Three of a kind. Yep, yes, yep. three of a kind. We're all, on this, we're all saying the same thing. We're all, we're all, saying, the same. We're all saying three <laughs> of a kind. We're all saying, in whispered tones, legend speaks of the mystical bond between the fading parchment of the Orahon and the memory of Mysteria. It is said that as the ink fades and the pages weather with age, the essence of her story wanes until finally, in the shroud of obscurity, her legacy is consigned to the forgotten depths of time. This was Koki 
to new. Oh, I just got chills, Sam. New is hitting of the Orihon of Mystic Penance. What does our mystic assassin want with these sacred texts? Only time will tell. I think they drew Mike Wazowski inside uh, this book. Here. Yeah, that is that is Mike. We're all yeah, yeah. that's Mike Wazowski. Canon. canon, like yep. canon. We can all we can report that, right? They, they've given us pre. We're getting word from the, yes. We can and we can report it is Mike Wazowski. Yes, Mike Wazowski is in the world of Wraith, ladies and gentlemen. That is so cool. Well, another tome. Another no block card within this set. Mm. It looks like it's going to be a very spicy little list across all three mystic heroes. Tons of no block cards. We know that inner tree also is kind of like a bobble, a, a blue yeah. bobble in that sense. Mm. Very excited to see. I hope you guys are like brewing these crazy ideas back home. How many cards of no block can one deck have? I guess <laughs> Vesper has shown us. Yeah, you can, oh, have, yeah. You can have a bunch <laughs> and of them. And Tannen too. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Interesting to point out, this is also the other chi payoff that we've seen. So far, the only chi payoffs we have seen are on the hero cards themselves. Yeah, this yeah. is the first main deck card we have seen that cares about chi being pitched to play it. Yeah, that's well, true. My friends, we must give the people some time to prepare. For the top eight, we must go ahead and put some food in our stomach so that we are ready to bring you the top eight. And the players must prepare for the top eight here at the Calling Phuket. What an incredibly diverse range of heroes, players, and the metagame could not be more delectable. So please take a breath, enjoy some of our pre recorded content. We will see you at around 2 30 hour time for the top eight. What do you say? 40 minutes. About 40 minutes until the top eight. So don't go anywhere. We'll see you in just a moment. Oh, hi. Didn't see you there. We're just uh, enjoying the beginnings of the sunset and the beautiful deck here at the Calling Phuket. Let's go ahead and talk Izuri Switchblade because when I'm relaxing on the beach or at the pool, the only thing I can think about is slicing through my opponent's defenses and leaving them bleeding on the ground while I collect my pay. Normal beach things. Let's talk Izuri. Azuri is uh, an incredible hero that I think is very well positioned in the meta. You know, Dromai is definitely beginning to sunset, but yeah, while the Dromai matchup, I won't call it awesome all the time for Azuri. As we look ahead, as Dromai beautifully ascends to living legend, Azuri can do some really nasty things with her ability to give all of the disruptive pieces, as well as inertia tokens and frailty tokens when you're looking at a world of hatchets, Dorinthia, and a lot of uh, victors that aren't running as many defense reactions. All of a sudden, you're feeling good if you're in an Azuri point of view. So let's talk a little bit about what the deck is trying to do. This version of the deck, there's two main ways to do it. You can either go a little more red line focused, or you can go a little more contract focused, like Caleb, the winner of the Battle Hardened, uh, I believe, in Philadelphia. And that is the deck we're going to be looking at here today. So Azuri, of course, the once per turn attack reaction allows you to banish a card from your hand face down and then flip that card in to the chain link, getting the switch blade switching that, uh, you know, disruptive card onto the chain. And that's really what the deck is built to do, is to disrupt the opponent. And this version of the, de uh, the deck is really ut utilizing those contract cards to, you know, kind of fatigue your opponents out while also preventing some really nasty on hits. And so let's talk about the equipment suite as always. This is your trio of crowns. Balance of Justice does so much work in a brute heavy world. The Crown of Providence, because there's still a lot of Command and Conquers and Pummels flying around. Even Sen Packings, I mean, I guess Sen Packings is, is, you're not gonna be able to do anything with your Crown of Providence there. But uh, d does so much work. And then the Mask of Perdition goes in often because this deck, you find yourself, you know, your opponent's just got a couple cards left in deck, you're up some cards in deck, you're up some life, and the Mask of Perdition just getting you repeated banish effects, getting a bunch of silver, puts in a lot of work with this deck. Now let's go ahead and talk about the chest piece. It's Tunic. It's always Tunic. Tunic is so good. It, it remains so good. Looking at the arm slot, we've just got the Flick Knives here. Flick Knives, such a versatile weapon. It can block one in a pinch, but then also when you use your daggers to flick a dagger, especially the Nerve Scalpel turning a sink below from a four to a three, getting the on-hit effect you need to get through, so powerful. Even has some random, uh, really powerful effects into ward. If the player uh, you know that you're playing against presents a ward mechanic, you can Flick Knife. Uh, in response to the ward being activated and then blow up the ward before your attack even really resolves. So a nice uh, thing we saw Ben Dodd do quite well in the calling Melbourne against his Dromai opponent. And then of course, let's look 
at the leg slot. We got a couple main choices here, the Black Tech Whispers and the Snapdragon Scalers. Snapdragons, you know, this deck still can be relatively aggressive and you, you, you can be coming in East Strike draw card, but also all of these crazy contract cards we're gonna be looking at. A lot of them do cost one or less, so the Snapdragon Scalers can do a lot of work. And then the one block of the Black Tech Whispers, that's something I do wanna highlight as well with the Mask of Perdition. This is what the Assassins do. They collect their coin, they finish the contract, and then the silver that they're paid allows them to buy new equipment, buy new uh, tar you know, arsenals and, and, and uh, equipment for the job, and then the repeated block value you get from your silvers, bringing those cards from your graveyard back into your equipment zones, you get to use their effects again, and you get to block with them again. And there's a lot of nasty breakpoints in our game. The repeated block value of these two pieces of equipment goes so far. And the Black Tech Whispers, like the Snapdragon Scalers, can also extend your chains, uh, as well as sometimes turn on some attacks that we will get into in just a moment. And of course, the two daggers here, your Spider's Bite, uh, gives your, when it hits, the attack action cards block for one less, and the Nerve Scalpel reaction cards block for one left after this sit. There's also Scale Peeler. I just, I don't have it. I'm sorry. I had to borrow it, and I gave it back, because I didn't want to steal this, this nice person's card. But Scale Peeler also, you know, Kasai, Valiant Dynamo, all these, you know, it, it makes your equipment block for one less when you do the Scale Pillar. can do a lot of work as well. Now, let's go ahead and talk about some of the main, the main pieces of what this deck is trying to do. And this is a much more contract-focused build. So let's look at the contract cards. Starting off with a card that no one knows why it's so expensive. This is already dead. You are contracted to banish opponent's non-action cards, so reactions, instants, or, uh, and cards of that nature, and then whenever you do, of course, you always get to create the silver token that all these contract cards want to create. Um, this is gonna go ahead and banish the top card of the deck and a defending card. Most of these contract cards are gonna banish a card from the top of the deck, as well as sometimes uh, another secondary effect as well. This card's really good, just a two for six. Uh, honestly, it's a good Azuri switch. It can do random damage. A lot of people don't really care about the effect of the already dead, so they're more willing to let the damage through. And when you're playing a disruptive deck, often the vanilla damage is how you get your chip through so that eventually later in the game, they're like, dude, how am I at 15? It's because they've been taking your E-Strikes, they've been taking your already dead, because these are sometimes the less disruptive cards and, but that's often how you can kind of sneakily get damage through that your opponent is not even thinking about because they're thinking about your Command and Conquers and your Shakedowns and your Eradicates. So Already Dead puts in a lot of work there. It's also a popper. We love poppers. We've got some incredibly good cards here in Leave No Witnesses. This is bread and butter of every single Azuri build, every single Assassin build. It's a zero for four that blocks three. It's going to threaten not only the top card of their deck, but up to one card in the arsenal and with Codex of Frailty. I mean... That's, that's, what, that's part of why that card's so dang good, is because Codex, leave no witnesses. It's about as classic a play in flesh and blood at this point in our game's life cycle. And uh, leave no witnesses does everything you want to do in a card. Uh, also, red cards, so many decks run the red cards, and getting silvers from your leave no witnesses is often exactly what you're gonna do. Let's look at another zero for four here. This is Plunder the Poor. A really great card to Arsenal. You can always throw it out. You can always pressure your opponent with it as it costs zero and comes in for four, which is a great rate, exactly what you want to be doing. Blocks three. And again, a lot of these cards, a lot of these decks are running pretty aggressive packages. A lot of decks run cards with cost one or less. And Plunder the Poor is, is a really good one sometimes to target if you're not able to do so uh, with your other cards. Often, I'm finding myself activating Mask on this card often because people, again, they're less scared of your Plunder the Poor's than they are of your leave no witnesses. So if they're letting the plunder the poor through your mask of perdition in certain matchups, you're often getting two silver out of it, which lets you buy back your mask of perdition, get another block value. So plunder the poor does a lot of work in the deck as well. Another great tunic play here in Annihilate the Armed, just really solid card, a one for five. It's gonna try to banish attack action cards and you can banish the top card of the deck. Blocks for three, comes in for five, another kind of uh, a card that some people are a little less afraid of, and it's how you can get some good damage through. And again, nice off the tunic as well. Let's go ahead and look at some of the ways to buff up some of these contract cards. We just have a one of Nyx the Nimble in the list. I think that's because there are a lot of uh, reactions kind of in the format with, with Kasai, even with the Guardians and Victory. You have a lot of people playing these attack, uh, sorry, attack reactions or um, defense reaction heavy builds, and that one of Nyx the Nimble. Another thing I do want to actually highlight about these one costs um, which we'll talk about a little later. A blue into your spider's bite into a one cost. 
so powerful, so so effective. The the spider's bite or the nerve scalpel is gonna make the opponent's cards block a lot worse. And then you finish your cost curve perfectly with one of these one costs. Now all of a sudden, even though these attacks are only coming in for five, when your opponent's cards block one less, that five can be a lot more obnoxious. Uh, and the Nyx, the Nimble, just a one of in the list, I believe, for that region. Got a couple cut to the chases here. This is an attack reaction, which is, you know, as I found in my games earlier today, sometimes nice into Bolton. You don't want to be pumping up their attacks. Cut to the chase is a good way to block and not pump up a Bolton's attack, but that's not why it's in the deck. It's in the deck because it uh, pumps up these contract cards plus three. Also lets you do a little Arachne impersonation and put a card from the top of the deck onto the bottom if you so desire. It's also just a nice combat trick that is not shred. So you can actually play it even if they don't block with a card. Sometimes shred, your opponent can play around it by just saying like, listen, I'm, I'm just not gonna give you a card here so I don't let you shred me. But cut to the chase says, great. Now all of a sudden this attack for four is an attack for seven. Ah! All right. Let's go ahead and look at some non-contract cards here that just also put in so much work. Command and Conquer. You guys heard of this one? It's pretty good. No D reacts on the chain link. It uh, destroys cards in the, let me read it, it's been a while. Destroys cards in the arsenal, that's crazy, yeah. Command Conquer's pretty good. Um, another card that works really well off of your Codex of Frailties, when you have your tunic up, you're able to go attack with the spiders by play your Codex and then use your tunic resource to come in with the CNC. Often, you make them put a card into their arsenal, you immediately threaten their arsenal, yeah, uh, leave no witnesses is a great way to do so, but Command and Conquer, no D reacts, comes in for more damage, and if your Spider's Bite has already hit, so powerful. And of course, Azuri, a really great card to uh, Azuri activation in, especially off of something like your blue backstabs, because no D reacts can be played to this, no D reacts can be played to this. You basically make your opponent play face up. You know, they don't get to try to react around your Azuri on this turn. Normally, if you're putting in Command and Conquer with Azuri, they have a reaction before the Azuri resolves. You banish with Azuri, and then you can let your opponent react kind of in the middle of the Azuri activation, and that's when they can try to play around the Command and Conquer by playing the D-React out of their arsenal that you are threatening, but the backstab says, no thank you, I'm getting that, I'm getting that no matter what. Uh, also, a, you know, a really good Azuri flip with the three blue isolates that are in the list. Only three isolates in this list. The red line decks run, you know, often the reds and the yellows because isolate such a powerful target for the Azuri flip. Uh, and this is, it's, it's good in those decks. It's still good in this one. CNC just always puts in work. Where the rest of my reds go? Here they are. Shakedown. Now listen, you might be asking yourself, why are we not playing Arachne? We're playing all these contract cards, and this is why. Shakedown, just such a powerful specialization. If you've played an attack reaction on the chain link, Shakedown gets, when it hits a hero, choose red, yellow, or blue. The opponent reveals their hand, and then you get to banish a card of the chosen color. I mean, anytime you get to do a nice uh, look at your hand and discard a little dead eye impression, so strong. Yes, you have to kind of make the soul read and, and think about what card your opponent might have that you want to target, but you know, with certain decks, Against Guardians, most of the time they have blues. And if you, do, if you do call red, and they don't have any reds in their hand, then you might be happy anyway, because you're not getting pressured by a big red card. But if they do have a red card, all of a sudden, it gets banished, and you don't have to think about that CNC, or the Choke Slam, or, or any of cards like that. Um, Shakedown is the main reason why you're gonna be playing Azuri over Arachne uh, in this build, because of that specialization. Even though Course of Tendency quite good, Shakedown, such a nice Azuri flip target, can also be utilized even if you don't, uh, Azuri, you can flick knives on the chain link, you can black tech whisperers on the chain link, you can shred on the chain link, but even if this is just your two card play, these cards are always threatening this ability. So it's, it's just so, it's, it's very versatile. You can, you can have the shred, you can have uh, uh, some of these other cards that allow you to attack react on the chain, but the two equipment pieces here just constantly give you that threat. It's why Shakedown is so dang good. Moving right along. Death Touch, just an incredibly powerful card for its rate, a one for six that gives one of the three diseases on hit. Yeah, you can't play it from your hand, but in a deck like this, you're, you're, you're playing slower, you're playing a little grindier, and often Codex of Frailty is a great way to just smack that down. Or the Azuri flip in on, on the blue stealth cards that you do play, Death Touch, it just does so many great things for you. Only blocks two, so you have to be cautious about, you know, in one game earlier today, I had three in my hand in, the, in one turn, and that wasn't awesome, but we did have a way around that, which we'll get to later. Let's go ahead and talk about some other red cards in the deck. Oh, I do have three Enlightened Strikes here. <laughs> Enlightened Strike, a very good card. 
Uh, just take my word for it that those are enlightened strikes. One of my friends is borrowing the enlightened strikes. I don't have them. I'm so sorry. But this is, uh, they're just so good in so many decks. Does all, it does all the things. You guys know enlightened strike. If you don't, I'm sorry. Look it up. Okay. <laughs> Let's go ahead and look at some other red cards in the list. Let you kind of slant both aggressively and defensively. But before we get into that, we got to talk about another one of these just incredible cards in so many decks, Sigil of Solace. This card's actually worth about, give or take, like 20,000 these days after the Pro Tour. But Sigil of Solace, it's so good because not only does it threaten like attack reactions, you have it in the hand, you can like threaten that it's a cut to the chase, threaten that it's a shred, and really it's just a Sigil of Solace. But also, uh, with so much arsenal disruption just in the game right now, especially cards like the Send Packings, like the Command and Conquers, anytime you can arsenal a Sigil of Solace and make your arsenal look like enticing to target, then you can respond to that arsenal disruption with the Sigil of Solace. It's just a great card. In Fab, you're moving through your cards so frequently. The fact that this card gives you ways to hold more information more often can also can, can give you, you know, some percentage points in various matchups. Plus, I mean, they're very pretty. Now let's talk about a, a way if you want to go ahead and slide or slant a little more aggressively. We do have three looking for a scraps in here as well. All of the blue stealth cards do have one power, so if you block with a couple of them early, this is a way to just get a nice one for five go again in a deck that doesn't have a lot of the go again naturally. Looking for the scrap is a great way to do so. It does only block two, so when you're playing your kind of more consistent game plan of utilizing your contract cards, not it's, it's mostly like fatigued by damage because you're threatening damage, but you're also banishing cards off the top of the deck. Looking for the scrap can sometimes run a little counterintuitively counter to that based on the fact that it does block two. But sometimes if you try to go too slowly, decks will just be able to grind you out with some greater defensive pieces or some greater end game pieces. And that's where looking for a scrap can do a lot of work. But this deck is definitely slanted a little more defensively. So let's go ahead and look at some of those main defensive pieces. Firstly, get out of here, Command and Conquer. Firstly, three sink belows. Some of the best cards in the game. Some of the best cards in the game. Blocks four, reaction speed, so good. Sink a card away, especially coupled up with cards like Fate Foreseen. Three Fate Foreseens, if you fate on a turn, you can look at the top card of your deck and then decide if you want to sink into it or not, so good. Also some of the best cards in the game, zero for four, defense reaction. Much has been said about these cards. In a world of Kano, Sometimes Oasis Respite is just what the doctor ordered. Kano got getting so much better throughout the Road to National season, getting so many uh, Road to Nationals wins, and all of a sudden people are talking about Kano again. Oasis Respite, such a great way to stay alive when you're facing down Kano, but also in the certain matchups, so good in the arsenal, off your tunic, get you a life, uh, you know, ostensibly get you five points of blocking life value, especially off a tunic, so good. And then some cards that really do a lot of work in the meta right now. You're talking about Hatchet Dory. Frailty Trap goes a long way into turning those three swing turns into not just the apex of value that everybody's like, oh, I just there's too much, there's too much value. I cannot believe all of this value. I am a Dorinthia player, I buy him French. I don't know, I don't know why I, the Dorinthia player was French in that scenario. But Frailty Trap goes a long way, not only into those decks, but into so many decks. Go again, a huge part of Flesh and Blood, and Frailty can go ahead and, and turn the math in your favor in a lot of instances, as well as Inertia Trap. These couple traps here, a lot of things are coming in for power greater than their base. A lot of decks are trying to set up big five card hands. There's other ways to get Inertia in this list, but Inertia Trap can really do work, honestly, when you, even on something like an Anathos and they're trying to set up their pummel and they don't expect an Anathos for six to get got by Inertia Trap, it does. Uh, as well as so many things that the Brutes are doing, honestly, even the Dorinthias and the Kasais, the Warriors, they're all, everybody's pumping right now, and Inertia Trap goes a long way to help shore up those matchups. A lot of reds. Let's talk about some yellows. I love yellows. Do you, do you guys at home love yellows? If you love, if you love yellows, type yellow in the chat. Okay, let's go ahead and look at some yellows. Uh, I don't know if you guys can hear the music, but it is bumping up here. I'm not sure, and if, if they, you can't hear the music and I'm just dancing to nothing, I'm so sorry. All right, another contract card, so good. Eradicate, especially with some of these uh, warrior decks out there. Kasai, you think Kasai runs a lot of yellows? Of course, the hero ability. 
Uh, Dorinthia, a lot of her attack, attack reaction specializations are yellow, so a good way to grab your silver and a good way, especially with something like a cut to the chase. You cut to the chase on an eradicate, all of a sudden you're coming in for seven damage, you're banishing seven, you're most likely getting some silver, and seven cards off the top of the deck puts you often so far ahead in the fatigue race. So good. I mean, what, what, what has and hasn't been said about Codex of Frailty? I think we, we talked about one earlier, so it's in, it's in my other piles of cards. Of course, there's three in the list. It's so good. It has six million points of value stapled onto it. You get your recursive pieces back, you threaten the arsenal by immediately putting something into their arsenal. It's so good. Frailty Ponder, you don't need to hear me say anything else about that. Three yellow shreds. Not running the reds in this list. Looks like just running the yellow ones. Give me minus three on the combat chain. So strong, something you are able to do on something like, you know, a backstab into a C and C, right? You have to make sure you shred on the backstab first, and then when you finish your Azuri activation, even though you shredded the backstab, it's still getting minus three on the combat chain. So your CNC will connect if they try to just block two cards and you know hope you don't have a, uh, a reaction. Shred is the way you really you really make them quite sad. And then a couple spicy little one ofs here. Have a remembrance, of course. Really good in the matchups that you're trying to hard, hard fatigue to put some good three more. Honestly, if it's just block threes in the list, but also some really powerful uh, action cards, quite good. Also, as I, earlier today, when I had three death touches in the same hand, I had to pitch two into a dagger. I had to put one on the bottom to an enlightened strike and remembrance. Did a great job at shuffling my deck so that those three backs, those three death touches weren't in my hand for the second cycle. And then a one of spreading plate. I love this card. This card is sick. It's so good when your opponent, especially late game, is trying to just throw three cards down on your attack that they're scared of, you give them three blood rot poxes. Two, two, two to three blood rot poxes can often just swing the game because all of a sudden they block with three cards, they're staring down six points of damage. If they kept a red in hand or a D-react, you're golden. I love that card. Uh, it's sometimes tricky to get all the value out of it. And often it's just a good block three. Does great, you know, it gives you percentage points into Bolton. Quite good. Now let's just talk about the blues. We're almost done, folks. This is the bread and butter of the stealth. Let's talk about the stealth cards. We're gonna be looking at the backstabs first. The backstabs, a nice little way to, again, you can pair that with the Command and Conquers. No defense reactions to this link, no defense reactions to the Command and Conquer link. Super strong. Uh, we also have the three blue sedates. Inertia, really powerful, and sometimes just even an attack for one, you can threaten something, again, like, ooh, am I gonna Azuri flip? Am I gonna Azuri flip? They say no blocks, because they're trying to, you know, see what you got. You just let the one hit, give them an inertia. Everybody's happy, except for them. Of course, the three blue isolates. The only isolates in the deck, and even though it's the blue, the, the effect is still the same. Dominate, so strong. You dominate into your Azuri flip, unless they have a defense reaction, they're bummed. Um, yeah, Isolate, super good in the deck as well. And then three Surgical Extractions. Again, if you're running all the contract cards, even if you're not running the contract cards, you're playing more of a red line list. Surgical Extraction, just super strong. Comes in for four, if it hits, you get to look at the, you banish the top card of their deck, and a card in their hand. You just, whatever card you want. You don't have to worry about the shakedown clause. You just banish a card. Looking for blues, um, but just something that your opponents really have to respect. They're either gonna give you a card to block with, or they're gonna go ahead and give you a card for its effect, really good. And then there should be two blue shreds here. So pretend there's two blue shreds, I just can't find it. But a just good blue block three, that's really good um, for so many reasons. Gives minus two, it's a, it's a way to get damaging on hits through. It's a way to just end the game and kill them by just making sure you get the damage through if the opponent's at one or two. That's often a way to finish the game. And shred is super good. I mean, red shred is really good when you're facing down a lot of big like zero for fours, but you have to really line it up nicely. And sometimes shreds can get really stuck in your arsenal and red shred especially, it's sometimes hard to get like all the value out of it. Um, so blue and yellow do make a lot of sense. Good resource cards, pitch into your daggers, pitch into with the blue kind, you can go dagger into the one cost, your tunic into your CNCs, things like that. And that, my friends, that's, that's Contract Azuri. She's trying to get paid up, she's trying to go ahead and slash through her opponent's defenses and in a meta like this, can put in a lot of work. Um, I love the deck, I love playing Azuri. Of course, I'm so excited for new, but uh, until our mystic illusionist joins us, the the OG, not the o technical OG assassin, but the OG assassin that's seen a lot of tournament play here in Azuri, I think can do a lot of work in today's metagame and tomorrow's metagame. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing exactly who here in Phuket has brought Azuri to the tournament and looking ahead to see just how well the Switchblade 
takes down more tournaments. So thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you for more coverage in just a sec. Okay, hello, I'm Chu Hing. Uh, I'm here in Phuket. So uh, the deck that I will be playing for this event is KO. So uh, I'm going to do a short deck deck. Yeah. All right, so this is my deck. Yeah, well, this is my KO deck. So uh, we'll start with the blues. So uh, starting with the wind-ups, I think the wind-ups uh, are quite natural in KO because uh, it triggers off your discard effect and there are 5 powers so because of KO's ability it becomes 6 power so it fulfills all your cards that needs you to discard a random card that is 6 power and in addition the wind-ups are very good at uh, for the agile wind up, it gives you the go again, and for the mighty wind up, it lets you get more damage the following turn, as well as enable your mandible claws. Okay, and also fulfill any cards that need you to discard the six power card beforehand, now, other than mandible claw. Uh, we'll go into that later. So then we'll go into the rest of the blues. Uh, there are mostly three bulk blues and a reckless swing. So reckless swing is to close out games where your opponent decides to go to two or less life and uh, most of your deck is six power anyway so you don't have to like block with specific like non-attacks other than cast bones and blood rush bellows to enable it uh, okay moving into the rest of the blues uh, pet call blue here is a uh, not just a three block blue it lets you filter your deck such that you, when you have to draw and discard a card, you won't draw a non-attack action off the top. So you get to control like what kind of cards you are discarding from the random draw and discard effect. Because sometimes you do draw non-attacks like cast bones or flourish battle. Okay, then the rest of the blues, uh, are six power blues, uh, Rekorom, the only six power blue for Ko and Rhyna. Uh, it's so that you can pop dragons against Romai. Uh, three cost blues. Uh, so and battery can be played on the first turn for the GT. Uh, Smash instinct can be played even though you know sometimes your draw discards are bad and you end up with blues in hand. At least you can intimidate. So specifically, sometimes on your blood rush battle turns, it still goes in for seven and it in and it intimidates one. So it's like it's like a back hunt but it's blue okay then uh, round up uh, so when you discard your wind ups round up gets one extra power so it still attacks for at least six yeah so that's why it's included okay but uh, generally you will play all your blues in every matchup so that's the blues okay moving on uh, we'll go into the yellows so the most important card I would say in a lot of matchups is blood rush bellow because not only does it start the turn with a discard so that your mandible claws can go again it also pushes your damage over the threshold of normally you get about 12 damage a hand so blood bellow sometimes pushes the damage past 12 uh, to you know upwards of it can even be over 20 damage if you have like multiple go again effects okay then we move on to beast within very good synergy with all your discard effects uh, from Poppings, Wild Rise, Bear Fangs, Savage Feast, and so and so forth. Okay, so it's also very good with Blarash Bellow. So when you Blarash on three cards, you get three cards back. So you can play out a very big turn. Okay, uh, next is Sand Packing. So the latest edition, one of the newer cards for Brute. Uh, Sand Packing is like a Command and Conquer, but in a sense, your opponents cannot really use defense reactions either way because when they arsenal a defense reaction, Sam Packing will banish it first. So it's a good way to get rid of defense reactions for Arsenal because it forces your opponent to block the Sam Packing and then now you know that they have an uh, they have a defense reaction in their arsenal. So you can play around it. Okay, then moving on, Agile wind up pretty much the same uh, use case as the blue ones except it's 6 power so sometimes like because chaos ability only affects uh, only affects cards when they are not in the on the combat chain 
so you can use this as a popper against Jomai as well. But uh, otherwise, pretty much does the same thing as the blue edge of wind up. Well, sometimes you get to attack with it for like six, but I'll try not to, I guess. <laughs> okay, so Clash of Agility um, in yellow is mainly a blocking card against decks that you want to block. So against like warriors and uh, warriors, I would say ninjas, because they are matchups that you kind of want to block uh, to you know soften the damage that you take. But uh, the additional effect is that when you win a clash, you get agility. So sometimes, if you have an arsenal and you have, you know, when you block with one card, you have four cards. The agility will come into hand, come in handy, so that uh, you get to play out big turns while preserving life. Yeah. So that's what the clash of agility is for. Okay. So moving on to the main part of the deck, which is all the reds. So all the reds are cards that you want to attack with. You generally don't want to block with reds if you can. But uh, a lot of them don't block anyway. Like okay, so we'll start off with Wall Right, the Wall Right, Popping, and Bear Fangs. These three cards do not block, <laughs> but they are very good offensively. So starting with the Wall Right, they are very good. Uh, so sometimes you don't have a GD tokens, you don't have other sources of this card. Uh, so Mandible Claws has no go again. So Wall Right is one of the few ways you can extend your turn. So Wall right draw this card will enable Mandible Claws for Golgin most of the time unless you discard Garage Bello or Cast Bones, which is unlucky. Uh, but other than that, when you get a go again from Wall right because you discard a 6 power, you get a Might token. You get your Mandible Claws get go again because you fulfill the discard and now you have a you have an attack going at your opponent and then you can extend it with Mandible Claws into your next attack. So your turns go from maybe just 6 damage to upwards of like 15 and, and above. Okay, then uh, next, Popping. Popping is very important in the mirror because it has Dominate. So as you can see, most of the Brute cards have no like real way of evasion other than just being very big. So Popping is a way to go through your opponent's blocks and it's also because you, when he has dominated, your opponent can only block with one card. So unless he has a defense reaction, uh, the popping will generally have go again. Uh, on the off chance that you know sometimes your opponent has the defense reaction, if you have a couple of might tokens, at least you still have the dominate effect. And if you have a GT, you can work around the lack of go again. Yeah, so that's for popping. And bear fangs is like swing big, but. Instead of just having three copies of Swing Big, you have six copies of Swing Big. The only downside for Bear Fangs is you cannot block with it. So unfortunately, and the draw discard sometimes doesn't work out. But for KO specifically, when you play Bear Fangs, you are actually getting about nine points of value in terms of damage because you get a might token for the following turn and from the discard and it's still a power. So unless you again draw a non-attack which is quite rare in the deck uh, Bear Fangs comes in for about 8 yeah so you can play like a 1 card Bear Fangs 8 it's something like a Swing Big right? so moving on Swing Big uh, I've already covered it it's like your Swing Big is your main 2 for 8 uh, compared to Bear Fangs but Bear Fangs covers the other half so you have more copies of Swing Big Okay, so uh, moving down, we have Savage Feast. So for Savage Feast, uh, if you have a GD token, it enables your claw. So the discard is not so detrimental because you draw the card back. So you get to play out your like, you still get to attack for six with go again, and then you claw, and then after you claw, you still can play another attack. So that's where Savage Feast is good. Uh, sometimes you draw like a cast bones of the savage piece which is like perfect so you have go again on your savage piece you threaten the claw and then your opponent is there trying to block you and then or maybe he'll take the damage and then you can follow up with a cast bone so you get more damage next turn so the draw the draw also helps sometimes when you like have two cards you have a blue and a savage piece and your tunic so you want to you don't want to arsenal the blue so you can always play the savage piece to discard a blue because they are all six power 
uh, you can draw a card and hopefully draw a red to Arsenal. So that's where Savage Feast can come in as well. Okay, so uh, moving down, we have Runner Runner. Runner Runner synergizes very well with all your Agile windups. So because you have six Agile windups and also cast bones. So Runner Runner lets you chain a GED tokens. So you get back to back big turns and you can put a lot of pressure on your opponent that way. Because other than Scapskin Ladders, it's very hard for Brute to have multiple action points as well. So getting a GT is very important for the deck because you get to attack twice with your very big attacks. Okay, uh, so Runner Runner helps to chain the GT tokens. Okay, moving on to Command and Conquer, everyone's favorite generic red 6 power attack. Destroys the arsenal, cannot play defense reactions, it's very annoying. In KO, it attacks most of the time, it attacks for 7 because of your might token. So yeah, it's, it's generally just a great card. Uh, then moving on, Enlightened Strike. So, it's a little bit of a like weird inclusion, like for brutes, because it doesn't synergize at all with Blurish Battle, and you have to put a card below, and then you know, there's no discard, you don't get a might. But for Enlightened Strike, because uh, in KO specifically, outside of the combat chain, it's six power. So even if you draw and discard it, it's fine, and also. It has very good synergy with cast bones because you don't have to discard it. You don't have to rely on random discards for the go again. So you can put some pressure on your opponent, and then after that, uh, you can play the cast bone. So that's why the lighter shot is a great addition to KO. All right. So moving on to more like okay, we'll cover the cast bones first. So cast bones, the best, one of the best cards from heavy hitters, especially for brute. But specifically KO because almost your whole deck is six power. So when you reveal six power, six six power attacks, you get six might tokens for the following turn and the GT. So not only are you threatening at least six damage already because your mites are already generated on the table, you have the GT token. So your opponent will have to play around like your first big attack. It could be anything from a command and conquer, sand packing to like dominated palpings and stuff. So it's very hard to block. So uh, yeah, the only downside is your opponent will know what cards you're drawing the next turn. So possibly if he sees a lot of no blocks, he he could take a more aggressive approach. But that's where like a GT tokens and enlightened strike comes in because you can put pressure beforehand. So your opponent has to decide whether he wants to block your attack and then you can follow it up with a cast bones so he cannot attack you back even though you reveal a lot of no blocks okay so moving on to more side border cards savage beat down uh, seems like a very hard card to play but it synergizes extremely well with your nine agile your nine windups it can be might it can be agile it doesn't matter which windup you can discard it for the effect and then attack for 12 so that's that makes a per, like kind of a perfect four card hand uh even better if you discard a beast within because you can control discard uh and it attacks for 12. so effectively you you know when you discard a card you are like your three cards need to deal about four damage each now your three cards deal four damage each and you get an effect from a wind up uh also synergies with pauping and wall ride Sometimes with Savage Feast if you have a GD tokens and Bear Fangs because you have to fulfill the discard effect but otherwise it's a very good way to push over 12 damage a turn so your opponent cannot really block so, Yeah Okay, so moving on to No Fear So No Fear is an inclusion for against uh, Wizards but also quite a good inclusion against decks that you need to block because your deck has so many cards that don't block very well or don't block at all so when you draw your no blocks you can use the no fear as blocking to make those cards block for at least one so like against katsu for example ninjas against uh, generally against kano sometimes you have a lot of red cards you can use it to block your the aether wildfires or aether spindles uh, any big red, red arcane damage you can use your no fears to block it. 
Okay, then uh, Clash of the GT red fulfills the same, more or less the same effect as the yellows. You are just blocking with it, but with the added upside of it being six power, you can actually consider it against Romai because you can block their attacks, and when you get a GE token, you can chain into big turns or even clear dragons. And then now the last card in the deck is down by now. So specifically. It's a very good card against uh, other chaos because when they generate they because of chaos ability you generate tokens quite a lot and if you aggressively block with your armor you have less armor than them and sometimes when you have less life you can benefit of the overpower because KO doesn't have uh, doesn't have reactions they don't they only have attacks right and well they only have actions actually. So overpower is basically dominate against other chaos, and with the added upside of when you, you know, when you need the tokens, like vigor, might, and agility all work very well in KO. So it's a good way to gain an advantage and even claw your way back in the game. Yep. So that's the deck. That's the yeah. That's the deck. So move on to equipment. Uh. Oh, equipment yeah. Yes. Okay, so moving on to equipments, uh, KO can only play one. Uh, what was it? Yeah, you only have one weapon zone. So, uh, mandible claws is kind of the no-brainer because it can gain go again. So it's something like an ember blade in KO, except you know, yeah, one hand. So moving on, uh, scowling flashback, uh, one of the best brute equipments. Uh, you can block, you can actually prevent a lot of damage because it's something like a frostbite. You can always prevent damage that might come, so your opponent's turn gets like less threatening. And sometimes it also does screw up their turn because if they need a card to pitch, they can no longer attack with the other card. So it doesn't matter which card you intimidate, it's great. Okay, then uh, Tunic, very good equipment in general. Brutes don't have a lot of chest piece to work off and uh, Bugbone is too random so Tunic generates a lot of value in Brute Okay, moving on, newest edition in Heavy Eater's Apex Bonebreaker card is too good you block and you get damage off it uh, you get to... yeah, it's just, it's just good it's not only life, it's damage so Apex Bonebreaker and the Brute mainstay Skepsin Ladders so when you're in a pinch, you don't have go again, you don't have your GT tokens, you can always resort to the good old rolling of dice in Brute. So this is where your turns can get really big, you can push 3 attacks with 3 action points, 2 attacks with 2 action points, or if you just get 1, you just hit him with your usual 6, at six power attack. But, you know, sometimes it's just 0, you roll the 1, that's too bad, that's power Brute. Okay, moving on to Arcane Barrier Equipments. So, Skullhorn and Now Rune Gloves are the mainstay. You get Arcane Barrier 3, and because KO has quite a lot of blues, you tend to be able to block 3 damage. Uh, the spell Frey Leggings is mainly against Kano, because uh, for, for Kano, you need to block up to about 4 damage on Wildfire so that you don't die. But sometimes you draw a bunch of red cards, you can at least use this as a buffer for your third like Arcane Barrier in case you cannot pay for your Arcane Barrier cards. Okay, then the last one is Heart and Cross Trap. So Heart and Cross Trap is also mainly against Kano because it's a good way to cheat on more resource and tuning sometimes takes too long to to ramp up. So that's why I'm playing Heart and Cross Trap. So 
against most matchups, you will never play any of these like Hutton Cross Traps and your Arcane Barrier. So they are more or less Kano specific, but in certain matchups, maybe against Rune Blades, you want the Arcane Barrier. You can always play the non Rune Gloves. Uh, and yeah, every other matchup in this like current meta, you need to block. So all your blocking cards are very good. So yeah. Uh, a card that I'm not playing is Gambler's Gloves. I think some play into Dromai, uh, but I'm a bit short on space and I rather improve my matchup against like decks like Kano, which I don't think KO should lose to. Uh, so that's why I'm not playing Gambler's Gloves, but uh, against Dromai, you just need to threaten them and Cast Wounds is a pretty good card. Yeah. Okay. I am joined here by Jasmine from Malaysia. Esteemed PQ winner, one of the few PQ winners on Leviya. Now Jasmine, how are you feeling and how have you liked your stay in Phuket so far? I'm so happy that calling this year is going to be ha uh, is happening in Phuket because it's really fun and it's like, you know, all these beachy vibes. Less stressful for me and uh, the other players, of course. So yeah. So I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, are you on Leviya again for this event? And what do you think of Leviya's position in the meta? I'm definitely going to be on Levaya and I think I'm, we're all expecting a lot of KO and Dromai. So hopefully uh, we'll get a lot more Brutes win, winning this calling. So you've played quite a bit in this region and what do you expect to see in the room? Do you expect to see a lot of ninjas, a lot of illusionists, a lot more Brutes? What do you expect to see? So uh, in this region, people typically play ninjas like Katsu and Fai, but with the current meta, we might be seeing a lot of dromais trying, trying to get that, you know, that last two points. Mm -hmm. I am joined by one of Flesh and Blood's most prominent players, world's finalist Shing Sang, fresh off of his top 32 at Puerto Los Angeles earlier this year. How are you doing, my man? Yeah, um, I'm not doing good in draft in PTLA, but yeah, my CC part is quite good, so I'm. I'm feeling quite good about the CC that I'm going to play, so yeah. So, you're one of the few people that brought Victor to Proto LA. A lot of people were, you know, feeling a bit iffy about that list, but you managed to get top 32 uh, at the PT off of Victor. Are you playing Victor again at the calling today? Yeah, I'm going to play Victor in this calling also, yeah. What do you think about Victor's position in the meta? Um, I think he definitely got some hard matchup, neither like KO and Kano, but I think it's still fine against any other deck, so I think it's still pretty good. So you've played in this region many, many times, so you're probably pretty familiar with the meta. What do you expect to see in the room? I heard that there will also be many other Victor players here, and yeah, but I also expect to see more Acelia and less Dromai when compared to the Western meta, yeah. I am joined by world's top eight competitor Pudding Tom, esteemed player of the team Blue Pitch, famed for his katsu play. How are you doing Pudding Tom and how are you enjoying Phuket? You know, we have been just eating some food around here and yeah, we are planning to eat more. <laughs> As you know, we are Blue Pitch and we just eat everywhere. <laughs> Food in Phuket has definitely been very, very good. When did you get in? Uh, we came here like two days ago and we just walked around, uh, around the bridge. And yeah, we had some nice food here. Now let's bring it back to Flesh and Blood. Everyone knows you as the Katsu player, of course, making top eight at World's Barcelona on that hero. Are you on Katsu again for this event? And what do you think of Katsu's place in this matter? Uh, actually, I'm struggling a lot should I play Katsu because uh, my teammate play Factor, and there's a very hard, harsh matchup for Katsu, and I almost gave up. Uh, but eventually, yeah, I do play Katsu today. Yeah. So this region, you are no stranger to this region. You've played in so many events around here. What do you expect to see in the room? Well, I didn't expect a lot of drama, to be honest. Uh, I think there will be like uh, Acelia or uh, some Guardians player, because. Um, many Hong Kong players are playing Guardians, so yeah, and another point is my teammate Wen, he, who is uh, a Dromai player, and I want him to can play Dromai at the Pro Quest Season 2, 
That's why I'm playing Katsuri. Hello everyone, my name is Pankaj and today I will be going over a Kasai deck tech uh, that I took to some RTNs over the past RTN season. Managed to take one RTN down with her and also uh, get second place at a different RTN as well. So yeah, with that, let's get right into it. Uh, we're going to start off by going over the equipment, starting with the weapons. So I tend to prefer Kasai with just two Centauri Sabers. Uh, I don't run the hot streak because I find that Typically my game plan involves uh, generating some form of currency, either a bunch of copper or a bunch of gold. And with that game plan, I want to make sure I can push those on hits. And two sabers is just much better with doing that than one hot streak and one saber. Because typically on the turns where I'm threatening currency, I have go again already. And what I want is the extra damage boost uh, that the sabers can give me. So my Kasai list only runs two Centauri sabers. And moving on to the equipment, uh, the three pieces which come in basically. Hello everyone back home, we're here back at the Calling Phuket. We're almost ready for our top 8, Pankaj. Oh, our top 8, about time we've been waiting all weekend for this. I am so incredibly excited and I believe we are going to be starting by taking a look at our bracket. So let's get that on the screen right here. Amazing representation across the board. I love the fact there's so many different flags. Uh, yeah. yeah. When was the last time you saw this many flags at a calling? Aside from like worlds most right. of the time, right? PTLA, so, actually. We saw eight different flags oh, in the top true. eight of PTLA. That's true. And we that's see true. Five, six different flags here. This is absolutely this amazing. Is the, the most international year we've had so far, <laughs> yeah. I would say. So, our first place seed, you guys have seen him play out of his mind the only undefeated player in the entire of Colin Paquette Vespa uh, rocking up that Prism Awakener of Soul uh, playing up against Lionel CYK from Malaysia on Dorinthia but that's not the game that we'll be watching uh, right now in fact um, you know the next match uh, Josiah and Brody They'll be playing it out. They'll be our backup game. Yeah, backup stream. Yep. Yep. But the match that we'll be focusing on is actually Dirk Wally piloting at Dromai. I would say very, very well. But we also saw how Pudding just absolutely navigated perfectly uh, in his f last match of Swiss Cut. It's going to be an incredibly spicy matchup. We know, we know that Pudding is equipped to beat the Illusionist both in his deck building and in his playstyle. We saw him with the Mugenshi release and I managed to speak to him yesterday about why he still includes that card and he said it is for Dromai because Dromai can potentially fatigue Katsus. Katsus do a lot of discarding and Pudding was like, I'm going to have this Mugenshi Lord of Wind line in here for Dromai so I can avoid getting fatigued. We saw that come into play in his game against Shannon um, in the last round of Swiss. We're probably going to see that come into play against Dirk as well. Also remember, this is, for this event, Dromai's last chance to potentially ascend to living, le le living legend status. So will Pudding be the one to end that dream and give us all the chance to play her in the Pro Quest season? Now, uh, last but not least, our second seed, Eng Chu Heng, the only KO. I think KO was like public enemy number one prior to this, right? And yet only one KO represented going into Shannon. Uh, I can't believe we have two prisms in this top eight format. In a whole diverse field of things, the most converted hero from day two into our top eight. 100% yeah, of prisms who made day two also made top eight. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible conversion rate. And But yeah, Ang Chu Heng, you know, I spoke to him earlier. He seems pretty confident in the matchup. He does, of course, have the, you know, the scab skin leathers to help deal with some of those very pesky spectra cards that Channon has access to. But of course, Channon, you know, you talk about a KO number one enemy. If there's any deck Channon's practice against a whole bunch, it is KO. Oh, 100%. So these players will be playing uh, the quarterfinals, semifinals, and finals. And someone's going to walk home today with that gold foil extended art balance of justice. Oh. So let's, let's look at predictions for each of the brackets, mm -hmm. okay? So uh, let's start all the way um, at, the, at, the, at the bottom right here. The bottom? All right. Let's uh, on KO versus Chan and Putari on Prism. What do you think this is going to play out? Let's, uh, let's do some Fantasy League. So Chu Heng it feels pretty confident about his matchup, but I asked him about his list, and he does not have Gambler's Gloves, mm. whereas Channon does. So this is really going to be whether Channon can establish an early lead and force Chu Heng to roll those Capskin Leathers, because if he does that with him having the Gambler's Gloves, but Chu Heng not having it, the advantage definitely goes to Channon. But 
can he actually get ahead? Now that is the question against a brute, against someone like Chu Heng as well, a very experienced player. We've seen him put on a tear across this whole event, ending up second seed in the top eight. Will he give Shannon the space? Like, will Shannon be able to get ahead? I don't know, but I think if I had to guess, just based on equipment loadout, I'm going to give a slight advantage to Shannon. Okay, I'm very biased here. Eng Chu Heng is my boy all the way from Singapore. He's my fellow Singaporean. What are you talking about? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pankaj, for reminding me about these things. But uh, yeah, I I've wanted to see him succeed for the longest time. So I'm going to say Chu Heng takes this quarterfinal match. Thanks, uh, and thanks so much, Ethan, uh, for yeah, throwing Chu Heng. He just dismissed my prediction, I guess. He's like, yeah, this, this, what well, this guy said just doesn't matter. Was... Okay, let's. Let's look at the next one. Uh, Dromai, pilots up by Doug Hua Lee, going into putting time on Katsu. Now, this one, I think we might be able to arrive at a consensus. Yeah, I think so too. I'm, 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 I'm gonna give this one to Pudding. Uh, then Mugenshi, Lord of Wind line, very, very good piece of tech into Dromai. Doug's gonna have his work cut out for him. He's gonna need to make something happen to beat Pudding's Katsu. Yeah, I think so too. Pudding showing just a masterclass on punishing Katsu in this meta. I mean, we saw that Victor was one of the top represented decks in the format, and yet he clawed out of that victorious six seed is nothing to scoff at, and the only blue pitch player to make it to the top eight. Speaking of Victor, conspicuously missing from our top eight completely. It was He was in our top four. It might have been the third most represented deck or the fourth most represented yes. deck at this event. No copies in the top eight. Just showing you how this region has favored Victor a lot, but currently not really the space for Guardian, it seems like. There are lots of Dorinthias, lots of Chaos able to feast on those Guardians. You want to hear my hot take on this? I think Guardian's a great deck to play. Not very top eight worthy most of the time. Yeah, not this meta particularly, yeah. right? All the Dorinthias and the Chaos that are running around being very popular right now. Kind of... Well, actually, no, no. Dorinthias is a good matchup for Victor. What, what, what am I saying? But uh, the Chaos mostly being num uh, enemy number one for Victor probably could explain why not a lot of them made the top eight. Absolutely. All right, let's move over to the Josiah Chia on Uzuri's Switchblade going up against Brody. Now, this one's very interesting. Traditionally, we know Uzuri is pretty good into the Rangers. So, what's your take on this? Oh, this is a tough one. Just because the the matchup wise, Josiah is favored, but Brody's just experienced. You know, he's mm -hmm. been in several top eights, and there is a level of pressure yes. in these top eight events, especially when you're playing on Shame Down. There will be a backer match, so not quite the main feature table, but still, there's a lot of pressure there. And I'm gonna give that experience, um, that experience to Brody for that. And I think for that reason, I would put. I'll pick Brody as the winner for this match. Yeah, I will say, once you take that time limiter off of Brody, oh, yeah, that too. <laughs> things, yeah. take a, things take a very different sort of turn. And uh, I'm going to say Brody's experience, he is Pitbull to me, Mr. Worldwide, flying everywhere, just playing these tournaments. So uh, let's say Brody goes into the semifinals and finally, our top seed. This is, uh, I think we'll arrive at somewhere similar <laughs> yeah. as well. Vespa, the only person with 11 points in this tournament against Lionel, uh, who stuck his way into top 8. This is a very difficult matchup for Dorinthia, especially when you're not prepared for it in terms of deck building. I spoke to Lionel, he has no time skippers, no time snap portion, no mm -hmm. lead the charges. Very, very difficult to get over Prism's, uh, all of Prism Spectra, and we know that his game plan Vest was going to do. Into a warrior, they don't race you incredibly well. We know he is uh, Hatchet Dory. He has a non-blade sideboard for Dromai, but he is Mostly uh, on the Hatcher's game plan is not quite fast enough to put Prism on the clock that you need to put on, especially with all the Spectra running around as well. I'm going to give Vespa that win. Yeah, and Lionel did say, we talked a little bit to him earlier, and he said, you know, he thinks he's good into this matchup, but uh, Vespa's on a roll, man. Mm -hmm. We've seen turn zero libraries from this man. He's drawing hot. I've got to get it to the Thai hometown hero, first seed Vespa. All right, so with that in mind, <laughs> let's look right below again. If it's Pudding versus Chu Heng, now, KO into, into Katsu, I think it's quite the toss-up, honestly. What do you think is going to happen in this semi-finals? I think it's fairly Katsu favored. KO doesn't block very well, doesn't really want to block. They have the one flesh bag. Like, they have a flesh bag to stop one of Pudding's strong turns. Mm. Uh, but they're going to need a little more blocking power to really get over the consistent damage and the consistent disruptive on hits that Katsu is able to provide. Getting a Dishonor off into a KO is just so... In, it, you basically win the game on the spot. I mean, KO grows his arm back, to be fair, <laughs> but cannot <laughs> equip a second claw. And then now the deck is just full of blue six, uh, blue fives uh, that aren't going to uh, turn on all your brute effects on Mimonta 
the world where you make the might tokens. Katsu, a deck that you need to be able to block properly. And Kale, unfortunately, just not one of those decks that's able to do that very well. Agreed, agreed. If there's, I think Pudding will take this one as well. But I will say, in the Singapore meta in particular, Katsu is one of those decks that never really dies. It doesn't matter if there's Iceland in the field. Old him, who cares? Eng Chu Heng is a player who has seen Katsu go really, really long and he's always managed to come out on top. But in this case, Pudding is a force to be reckoned with. We'll see him in the finals. Of course. I mean, KO does have answers to Katsu, and that's yeah. disruption, right? There are mm -hmm. six CNC-like effects in KO, and they that's usually right. come in for seven as well. We speak about how you need to be able to block properly if you're against a Katsu, but Katsu himself doesn't actually block very well, has no, almost no armor to speak of. Those CNCs and send packings coming in for seven could really just be a disruption that Chu Heng needs to get on top in that matchup. It's Absolutely. And finally, Vespa and Brody. Now, now who are we going to in our finals because uh, it's been looking very dominant in Prism's favor against these Azalea decks. The story of the tournament has really been that a lot of people don't have the deck building pieces they need to get over the Prism and the same is true for Brody. His yep. list does not have those Merkmire Grapnels, does not have those Tarpid Traps and so because of that uh, I think this, I, I'm going to give Vespa the edge in this matchup over here uh, but you know I think things are going to change moving forward into the CC meta as we move into ProQuest season as people start actually respecting the Prism in the deck building and testing it against it a little more, I think we could see the matchup change. But for today, based on the list that we have seen so far, uh, I think Vespa is going to take that one. So we're looking at a Prism and Katsu final. Now this one, I think is very interesting. Pudding showed a masterclass going to Prism, but Vespa, you know, also showing just absolute mastery of that deck. This to me is a big of a toss up. Yep. Pankaj. What is your final prediction? Oh, this, <laughs> <laughs> this is a tough one. It's really going to come down to the Halo activation. I think if uh, this is by the entirely set in stone, we have seen the future. This is exactly what's going to happen, by the way, to all the, to all the viewers at home. Uh, I think it's going to come down to the Halo activation and how much value Vespa can get out of that. Um, it's definitely a toss up. I think I'm going to give the edge just to Pudding uh, simply because he's that amazing explosive Mugenshi, a lot of win finish. He is a bit of a favorite on cards, so I'm just going to give the win to him. All right, then you and I will have to take that bet with each other. I'm going to say I want Vespa to take this entire thing down. What do you all think back home? Tell us all in the live chat. We'd love to hear your predictions as well. But I think we're going to jump over into our featured match. Let's see some draw my into Katsu action. We're going to jump straight into this game. So these, these two have been on stream uh, previously. You've seen some of the ways they've played out. It is open deck list, if I'm not mistaken. So they know all the tools in their opponent's uh, arsenal, basically. And uh, look at putting the mm -hmm. standard art uh, tunic. Oh, also, wow. seeding here does matter. Dirkwa is the highest seed and has elected to go first, looking to just generate a bunch of ash on a, a bunch of <laughs> ash on his turn zero, popping the gold, having two ash on the field. Oh yeah, he does. So uh, pitching that Kyloria away, not gonna try to make an easy mask of momentum, but like, hey, going to forty three on turn one, wow. yeah, that that sounds really really good. Very very strong shot for Dirkwa here, especially playing the sigil too means he has played a red card this turn, is able to activate the flames. Furnace going up to that third piece of ash. Now, in this matchup, when you're under uh, when you're under a lot of pressure, which is what Katsu puts on you, it can be sometimes difficult to generate the ash that you need. But Dirk going into his following turn with three ash already set up, still having the wave of reality, looking like a very, very strong start for him. But this is a great opener coming from Pudding as well. This spinning lick kick does threaten the wave of reality. You want to get rid of those. Um, and not just waste them on like these non-hits from the Kodachis, especially because you're running Mask of Momentum in this matchup. A very good choice. Some people have been talking about uh, Pouncing Lynx versus Momentum, but if you're going to farm dragons, hey man, let's get some value over time. Putting Tom saying that every time he kills a dragon, he wants value out of it. He sinks a card into a dragon, he wants a card back from the Mask of Momentum. And we know that he is teched out. He will not really get fatigued because he has access to that Mugenshi release line into the Lord of Wind as well. Yeah. Excited to see who's going to go into the semifinals and who's going to hang out at Patong Beach after this. <laughs> it's going to be a fun one. Uh, hard one to, to start with. This one for four, spinning leg kick. Uh, mm -hmm. Always asking for, you know, what is the follow-up card? Mm -hmm. 
Also, so. important to note, Pudding Tom has not pitched a card with cost zero. That means he won't be able to swing a Kodachi with go again. And yeah, so it's looking like it's just going to end off with a fluster fist, meaning that one floating a bit you know, left there, not really going to get any value from it because that is a two cost in that Bonds of Ancestry. Yep. So getting rid of that wave earlier on, now it's going to be so much easier for those Kodachis to get through and then get the activation of the Master of Momentum on the next turn. Uh, looking at his hand, Dirk's hand is, well, an early Chromai into two attacks. I think that sounds pretty good to me. It'll be very interesting to see if he chooses to drop that Burn Them All. It is very, very early in the matchup as well. Burn Them All, typically a card you want to play once you have some reds established in the yeah. graveyard already. However, when your deck is full of reds and you put some of them to block, it's very easy to refill those reds too. So let's see if he opts for that a bit more aggressive posture. Looks like he's attacking with the Dragon before playing the Burn Them All. So it looks like he might have other plans for the Burn Them All. Yep, and uh, looks like in Pudding's hand as well, there is a popper just ready to go. Also, Sometimes you might not you might not necessarily want to use a popper in this case. You can get a lot of value just using the Kodachis to poke down the Chromai and then, you know, send an attack straight to face, threatening the muscle momentum, forcing Dirk to maybe block it out. Excellent point there. Looks like Pudding is going to use the popper and he does not know this, but Dirk actually has a snatch in his hand. So very heads up play by Pudding there, mm -hmm. actually choosing to pop this because had he not popped it, Dirk would have had two action points and playing a snatch with effective go again is incredibly strong. Looks like he won't be able to do that. Yeah, just forcing that out. I think very prudent at this point in time. Taking that four, Oops. yeah, just straight to the <laughs> face. No questions asked. Uh, I, I think I might have misseen something or misspoke. I thought this was a snatch and I thought the, uh, the play is headlong instead. Right, right, right. <laughs> so taking four, um, the reason Doug's health. No, oh, no. that, that was a snatch. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was snatch and head blaze yeah. long in the, in the hand early on. Yep. yep. So now using the breaking skills for that one block, very effective. Love the fact that Katsu um, nowadays, you know, they're running the breeze rider boots and the breaking skills in order to get just two temporary like breakpoint blocks most of the time. Uh, critically, that's a dishonor in Pudding Tom's graveyard as well. Remember, oh, the yes. graveyard is a resource that Katsu cares about these days because of the bonds of ancestry. Mm -hmm. And having a dishonor in graveyard means you're able, you're going to be able to target it for future bonds of ancestry. And dishonor into Dromai, we just spoke about how dishonor is incredible into KO. It is also incredible into Dromai, just not <laughs> being able to attack with the dragons effectively. Yeah, yeah excellent point. Um, also, I think signaling the breaking skills as a first as a first block. Now it's always valuable to crack it, especially if the Zona is on the table. So this is just coming for a straight seven, I believe. <laughs> Dirk has to really think about, does he want to develop a board? Every time he develops some dragons, it's opening opportunities for putting to fish out the combo pieces and then finally go for that big explosive turn. And we saw putting in his game against Prism really leverage the extra bodies that these illusionist players put onto the field, really capitalizing on that. And uh, on his game against Prism, he sent a whelming gust wave into the Angel of Rebirth draw a card. You know he understands how to leverage that and punish these illusionist players for putting extra bodies in the field. Yeah, and every turn that goes by, Pudding is finding those combo pieces, assembling the entire combo line. Dirk, very liberal of his health, just eating that seven straight up on the previous turn and now setting that Rebel in for four. Pudding says, I'll take it on the chin. Revealing an Uvia of the top is Dirk Hua as well. Would be very, that'd be a critical dragon if he wants to establish as, uh, Ash Wings. Uh, now Ash Wings, you know, there's just more Kodachi fodder and more mass momentum triggers for Pudding Town, but a six held dragon in that Uvia would be a bit difficult for him to deal with. That will, of course, be on the following turn. For now, Dirk Hua um, establishing a Yenderai. Yenderai is a pretty good dragon in this matchup simply because you can negate the first Kodachi as a hit because of the Endurance counter. So, um, one of my favorite dragons to play against um, the Katsu matchup. Yes, unlike Fai, Katsu is not running um, Shuko to be able to get through that Endurance counter and still get the hit. Oh, yeah. uh, Katsu will have to do it the old-fashioned way by swinging a Kodachi into Yenderai, and that will not count as it for Mask Momentum. That's right. Uh, but the Asvolai is there as well, so at least there's another dragon here uh, for him to farm some Mask Momentum stacks. A bit of a red heavy hand for putting over here, but he will be coming on onto a tuning counter, so maybe he'll be using that to fuel his turn. That's true, and also an ancestral empowerment in his hand. So sometimes that allows you to draw into the cards that you need, or even discard it off the Katsu trigger. There's tons of things that um, I think the Katsu list have been so flexible recently, right? They do have a combo line in the bonds of ancestry and stuff, but still, there are some four card red hands that just pop off like 100 wins. 
So in this case, I think Pudding being very liberal with his health, uh, just eating all these dragons to that face, that's a total of, what, 10 damage swing that turn? Huge. I'm so excited to see how Pudding navigates this matchup. Now, Fi oh. usually has an easier time to clear dragons because all his damage is vanilla. It doesn't, the sequencing doesn't quite matter. But it, the sequencing matters a lot for Katsu. And we're going to see Pudding do some incredible things. He's starting with a Be Like Water into the Asphalite, getting both the Katsu trigger and paying for the Be Like Water off of the tunic. This is going to be the first of our surging strike oh. all the way to the bonds of his history line. You know what this means? Dishonor is live at the moment. Dirk doesn't know this, but there's an ancestral empowerment in his hand. Ancestral empowerment in hand and the breaking scales and the wave of reality was already popped. Dirk, if he does not overblock the potential dishonor. This game could be over on the spot. Could be. Now, Pudding still has that Yenderai on the board to, uh, to potentially deal with. Let's see if he chooses to go for that or for the you know, potentially greedier dishonor to the face while holding on to the combat trick. Yeah, I think. What Pudding needs to do here is really pressure the cards out of Dirk Kwa's hand as much as possible. So much so that he's going to have to trade his hand for that Dishonor turn and just eat a bunch of force to the face. Looks like he has gone for the Dishonor Banish. He will have a Dishonor to follow his Wands of Ancestry. But critically, his Wands of Ancestry is threatening a Mask Momentum draw as well. So Dirk Kwa has two on his to have to deal with already. The Mask Momentum draw from this and the potential Dishonor is coming down the, the line. Can he stop both of them or will he have to let one of them through? Amazing start here uh, for Pudding. I think you couldn't ask for a better line. A three cost, right? The three health dragon as Volai was exactly what Be Like Water needed on the tunic turn. Mm -hmm. That feels so good. Uh, you thought two cost surging strike was good? How about one, <laughs> like a one cost surging strike? And one All right. So, um, yeah, managed to get that dishonor out. And also, I think now he, Dirk has to think. Am I just eating four and giving one more extra mm. card? If he draws another Dishonor, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that could spell disaster. Yep. Mask momentum being threatened here. Dirkwa looking to oh. go and put some armor in front of it, blocking five, respecting the breaking seals and a potential ancestral empowerment as well. And here we go. The Dishonor, if he blocks for six here, that might be enough. This is a game losing on hit. Dirk Hwa does, if, if he gets hit by this, he will almost certainly just lose the game right on the spot. Has to respect this. How much will he respect this though? Yep, so blocking six here. And let's see if uh, Pudding has anything he wants to do. Pumping it to five, still not enough. Dirk Hwa is seeing his life flash before his eyes over here. Is there another combat trick? It's an art of war! It's an art of war! No way, no way! Going to seven! Does he have the defense reaction in his arsenal? Is he going to get dishonored in our first? Dishonored on turn oh three? No way! No way! That no is way. so my hero ability turned off for the rest of the game. No more Ash no for this more Ash artist. No more dragons with go again. This might have just been the game right here, Elliot. Oh no, Dirk has had such an incredible run, but he's been hit by so many of these illusionist tricks. ALS loop on stream, and now Dishonored in the calling top eight. My god. And the crowd has that just erupted in response to that Art of War. Not No other mode was used on that Art of War, Elliot. Yet. It was just no. pitching a red just to get plus one. It was choose two modes. He didn't even care about the other one. Just wanted a plus one. Getting the dishonor of Dirk Hwa even overblocked the dishonor by two and got punished out of it. That has to be one of the craziest top eight moments I've ever seen, Pankaj. We always talk about the dishonor on the drone eyes. It usually <laughs> never happens. This time, as the doctor ordered, turn three. <laughs> exactly as it needs to be. Turn three without a mask of the pouncing links as well. We told we spoke about it when he used the dishonor as a block. It went straight to a graveyard. Was a potential tutor target for bonds of ancestry. Getting rewarded for that here. I am sweating in my seat right now. I cannot believe what we just <laughs> saw. And pudding has to feel really good right now. The dragons will never get go again. What an amazing story for Pudding so far. We saw him pull off the Mugenshi Lord of Wind line to close off the game in the final round of the Swiss rounds. And here we see him on turn three dishonoring a drama. He's just putting these illusionists in their place. Yeah, if there was ever a time the illusionist killed himself putting Tom. I'm just showing he knows this deck and the deck is in unison with him right now. They are one. So now the, now the, the Kodachi is really going to show a lot of work here because... Dirk's not going to have any incentive to play a lot of these dragons most of the time. 
Every time he plays it, he's only swinging with one a turn, and the Illusionist game really is about making a board. If he can't do that, and he can't swing with it... And he, he's also going to be stuck on Ash. He has no way to generate any more Ash except, like, rake the embers of sweeping blows if he has them. Because yeah. the hero ability is turned off. It's only that and the Furnace. And the furnace oh, no, the no, Furnace, the furnace doesn't make Ash. <laughs> the Furnace doesn't make Ash. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yep. And so, with that... Tough. Putting Tom sends a spinning wheel kick into the end right, clearing it off the board. Dirkwa, oh. just one Ash remaining and a hero with no hero text. I am so dizzy right now, Pancatch. <laughs> I would have not expected this how we start our calling top eight. Yeah. Uh, but there we go. Just being chained up. The queen has been chained and locked down here. Just thinking, thankfully... Um, for, for Dirk Kwa, he is playing a bit of a hybrid list, so attacks are still alive. Things like Dust Up can still create Ash. E Strike still comes for 7. You still have Ravenous Rabbles and Snatches. Blaze Headlongs are also just 0 for force with Go again. Looks like Dirk Kwa will need to default to a bit more of a racing sort of game plan, almost playing like a like a pseudo fi to try and out ninja this ninja. That That is the game plan he has to try and enact, and let's see whether he's going to be able to do that. The Snapdragon Scalers are still alive as well, but this is just a vanilla 6 going for an empty arsenal. That Art of War might have just changed the entire game. Putting Tom, the world is his oyster here for now as he faces down this vanilla 6, as you rightly pointed out. There's no on hit to care about on the CNC. Yeah, but... You can see that Pudding is really taking his time to think about this. Every piece of life matters. Pudding knows he has breathing room in the next couple of turns. So if you can block and not just take incidental damage, I mean, this is the only loose condition right now. Discipline is the name of the game here for Pudding over here. And he has shown time and time again throughout this tournament that he is a disciplined player. He's incredibly far ahead in his first round of the top eight in this calling Phuket, but he's not going to take his win for granted. He's going to play slowly, he's going to play disciplined and show us why he's one of the best players in the world. Yeah, just taking that, that six right to the face. Once again, playing a yellow bond, uh, pitching a yellow bonds to play this surging strike, Zerkwa has to respect it. The Katsu trigger is still very much online. And now, he doesn't find this on anymore. He can find another uh, Fluster Fist. He can just keep doing damage straight to Dirk's face. Um, very rightly so, since you can't make Ash. Yeah. Well, I mean, this furnace is now just a one-block piece of equipment that says you can pitch cards. Yeah, pretty much. Um, furnace could be, you know, could have some use on those Tome of Imperial Flame turns. Still, will give you more resources, mm -hmm. uh, but no more Ash to speak of from the furnace. Dirkwa potentially using that as a block piece. Look like a bit of an awkward hand from Pudding potentially just doing surging to Kadachi Kadachi. All was really relying on the Katsu trigger to potentially come through. Yeah, this very much feels like a setup turn as well. Seeing how the cards played out, uh, placing the bonds into the pitch uh, into the pitch zone. That kind of means that there might be another combo piece right in his arsenal at the moment, and he's fishing for outs. Also important to note, he is going to be coming up onto a tunic turn with a full five-card hand. And I believe he has drawn into an Art of War, so potentially might see that being played over here. Yeah, this seven um, that Ooh. Dirk is representing is the second Enlightened Strike we've seen. So uh, I think putting a 19, still thinking very prudently, do I need to save some health in this scenario? Yeah, hand not looking the best for to go along with the Art of War. It's a CNC and a standing order. Two pieces, two tech pieces you bring in as poppers, but not very good when you want to go off in the Art of War. No starter in the hand that we can see. You don't know what his arsenal is. So putting, taking the discipline line, as we were speaking about earlier, just going to give the block six, potentially just set up that Art of War in his arsenal, go into a following turn with the tunic up. Absolutely, absolutely here. You know, the thing about this matchup now is that Pudding actually has a weapon Mm -hmm. and Dirk doesn't, we could see Pudding even just think about, hey, there is a possible chance I can just fatigue you out. You only have so much attack value in your deck. I can eventually win with these Kodachis. Pitching an Art of War while Tunic is up must be setting off some alarm bells in Dirkwa's head. He, he didn't notice that as well. It's like, oh, pitching an Art of War, you have to wonder whether Pudding Tom has yet another Art of War in his arsenal, hence why that second one was going to the pitch zone. All right, I'm going to filter and look for some cards here. That's a Chromite Caloria. And I think one That's more. Three dragons. Oh, no, and a sink below. Okay. And a sink below. So just <sighs> pitching those dragons away, filtering. We have to find attacks. If you're in Dirkwa's position, your win condition is getting attacks and using that Snapdragon Scalers. But here we go. 
The oh, start yeah. begins, surging strike for five. That was what was placed inside this arsenal. A key starter piece in this line. You have to really feel for Dirk Hua. Oh having goodness. a Tover Imperial Flame and just yeah. having a bunch of dragons, but doesn't want to resolve any of them because he would go down to zero ash. And here we go. That's the first red whelming gust wave we have. Uh, coming in for four, no Katsu trigger was necessary. So, you know, I love the Katsu game most of the time when you have to kind of respect the surging because you could do that at any time, but very good use of the sink below in the, this position. Elliot, if we also see a Mugenshi combo line in this game, I am going to flip out. We already saw yeah. the full Dishonor line, that one connecting. If we all see a Mugenshi, that would just be an incredible, incredible showing for this Katsu. Hey, we'll we already got a warning from the judge. Please don't flip out, Pankaj, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will go parasailing after this if that happens. Oh, so much adrenaline just running in our veins just off the first quarter final match. Dirkwa blocking with burn them all and a bunch of dragons burn them all. You know, sometimes in these matchups you can go for an arcane damage endgame, but without Ash's speak of to continuously make dragons, it's gonna be not really the game plan Dirkwa can go off for. It seems like he's just trying to preserve his life total, find those attack action cards like those blaze headlong, so snatches, dust up, CNC, so maybe that we know his list has, trying to go for that to try and finish off putting time. Yeah, this is really, really in Pudding's court at the moment. At any time that he chooses to pop off and he can align the perfect combo hand, Dirk has no choice but to just keep blocking these cards. These dragons have rendered themselves to block three non-attack actions. So something has to be noted is that because they're just being put on the combat chain as block cards, they are not fodders for putting time to get the on-hit triggers that he need. Uh, two, twice in our two turns or the previous turn cycle as well, the, after Whelming was blocked, all Pudding could do was just send a couple of Kadachis afterwards and he ended up IPing himself as well. Goes to show how awkward it can be sometimes if you just block out the Katsu's um, attack action cards and don't give him the Katsu trigger, which is kind of what Dirk has been forced to do, but we see that in some ways paying off. He's still maintaining the same life toll as putting time. Yeah, and that's coming off like a really, really difficult turn. So sending in, <laughs> <laughs> sending in that first Kodachi, it looks like Dirkwa has opted not to block for this, just taking the first one, Masco Momentum ticking up. Ooh, and then just the pump fake sending in that surging strike uh, to begin the combat chain. We know that Pudding has another whelming gust wave red uh, somewhere in his hand or arsenal. Surging Strike coming in for five. Tunic still up, though. Re definitely representing Art of War, potentially even Ancestral Empowerment. So coming in, <laughs> just sending in that second Red Whelming Gust Wave. Will De Qua commit the Flame Scale Furnace? And there is a blue, there is a blue Bonds, right? That's a blue Bonds. Mm -hmm. okay. Back to back natural combo lines for putting time here, but that's what happens when you just give Katsu the space. You know, Dirkwa hasn't been able to put on the pressure because of the Dishonor. So putting time is just being able to craft these hands where he naturally draws his combo lines and not, you know, need to rely on the Katsu trigger. Follows up this Whelming Gust Wave with the blue Bonds of Ancestry. Yeah, I mean, there's so many cards you can pick from. There's still Fluster Fist. You can even take a spinning wheel kick if you want to be efficient with the tunic counter or save it for a previous turn, or for another turn. But there's so many things that Pudding can use to his advantage in this scenario. And I believe he's holding on to a Fluster Fist in hand as well, so could just potentially go even wider if he gets a go again card off his bonds of ancestry you go bonds oh. into a go again card into fluster fest if he really wants to you can see putting space he does not know what he's going to search for at the moment <laughs> there are no great targets for him to yep. kind of go into and that uh whelming gust wave being blocked by a sink below in the scenario also kind of denies the mask trigger in this case so even though it's a blue bonds typically if, uh, if the whelming had gone through well uh blue bonds actually kind of extends the chain a little bit more so like Pudding is going for a Gorgon card in that spinning wheel kick, so we'll be able to threaten Mask again. You know, Bonds of Ancestry into spinning wheel kick into a Fluster Fist, yeah. should he cho choose to do so, which would threaten the Mask. Hey man, that's still 10 damage that Dirk needs to deal with. This Bonds of Ancestry coming for two, yeah, that doesn't mean a lot right now. Mm -hmm. Two, four, four, awkward numbers for Dirk to deal with to really stop the Mask Momentum trigger. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If he lets the four and four go through, well, and this too as well. That means putting as an arsenal for next turn. Ah, rake the Embers, just <laughs> when you're unable to make any more Ash. I mean, Rake the Embers does make one Ash because that is text on the card itself, but you don't be pitching one card and playing a Rake just to make one Ash. So Dirk just blocking with two Rake the Embers on the combat chain here. Absolutely, absolutely. 
And uh, finally, just any of the Flusterfist. I mean, here's four damage. What are you going to do about it? Pudding Time finally able to get some damage on the board. The past few turn cycles since the Dishonor has really been struggling to get some damage into Dirkwa, finally managing to do so. And, you know, this is Dirkwa getting close to what we call the Kadachi lock. Mm -hmm. Where at, once you're at two health, you're always committing two cards to this Kadachi lock. Now, of course, Dirkwa does have some Sigils of Solace in his list as well, so that can help mitigate some of the Kadachi lock pressure because, you know, you don't need to commit cards to Kadachis anymore. You just get to heal back up. Uh, but still, Dirkwa needs to mount some sort of pressure if he wants to try and make his way into the top four of the Calling Poket. Yeah, these Be Like Waters are so tricky. You kind of are forced to block them most of the time because you could start, you know, a combo line out of nowhere. Uh, but if we look at, at Pudding's hand, well, it doesn't matter if it hits or not. He's going to start swinging Kadachis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Be Like Water, very, very threatening on hit. Not only are you going to turn it into a Surging Strike for one, you also get the Katsu on hit as well, so... Very, very scary to let the card hit. Yep, and ending this off with a Fluster Fist for and a Mask Trigger. Usually in this case, the Mask Trigger doesn't matter, but it allows you to Arsenal a better card for the next turn. Now, the question is, what does Dirk have as a follow-up? It's so hard when you're looking at dragons in your hand, and you're like, if I play this, um, yep, I'm Ashless for the rest of the game. <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, he's probably in Sand Covers as well into this matchup. Oh. So you can't just be sitting on one Ash and being like, yeah, this Sand Cover might be a dead card that does a block in my hand anymore. Blocking with a CNC as well was Dirkwa, so not going to have some sort of disruption on this turn. But Dust Up, a key Ash generator if this hits, Elliot. Yeah, uh, I mean, one Ash could be a huge difference, especially knowing that he has Sand Covers in the deck. Let's see if Pudding wants to respect the Ash Wing. Ash Wings on a Dishonored board doesn't mean a lot because it's only one damage with no go against most of the time. I'd be surprised if Dirkwa chooses to make an Ash Wing here given he's sitting against a Mask of Momentum as well because that mm. makes, you know, every even the first Chain Link really, really weird because then you can guarantee the second Chain Link by just hitting an Ash Wing or even the third Chain Link to draw off a Mask of Momentum. So Dirkwa, if this hits, probably might just end up making an extra Ash, maybe saving that for a Dragon later on or one of the Sand Covers as well. Yeah, that looks just like that. Getting a Sigil, evening up the life scores. Now the question is, what is Dirkwa choosing? He is making He's that making the Ash Wing. Right. You know, for all the hype we had around Dirkwa getting this honor, he is still he is still in this game. Life totals are even. He's just continuing playing this game, continue saying, look, it's fine. I have all these extra attacks. I've got the dust ups, I've got the CNCs, E strikes as well. I'm gonna continue playing this game. You do not have this free win. You've used a lot of offensive power. You saw back to back red surging strike, red whelming gust wave, not getting any value for putting Tom over there. He's quickly running out of threats, and that's something that can happen in Katsu against Romai. No, absolutely, absolutely right here. We know that Pudding isn't running the double strikes as well, so getting the Mask of Momentum efficiently without spending an actual card on this Ash Wing is not that effective. Now, the big question is, what's this uh, Kodachi going to do? Is it going to face in order to lock things up? Having that Ash Ring on the board is Dirkwa. Let's see if that's going to be a liability for him, whether it's going to just represent an extra card draw for putting time. Yeah, killing this Ash Wing as well, and then sending in that 100 wins to face, saying, yep, you got to block this. If not, I'm drawing a card. Mm -hmm. And what Doug doesn't know is, Art of War is alive in the hand. Let's see if he chooses to respect the, uh, the combat trick over here. Could be Ancestrals as well, could be Art of War. All right, coming in that mirror guy, and let's see where the Art of War connects. So this is not going to be banished draw two and plus one, but he's going to draw one off the Mask of Momentum as well. This time, the second mode of Art of War being relevant. The first time it was just a plus one, uh, but this time the plus one and banish going to be relevant. Drawing an extra card is putting Tom. Now has the Katsu trigger to also think about. Yeah, and he doesn't really need that um, Warmonger's Diplomacy anymore just because, well... Yep. <laughs> it's only war now for Dirkwa. <laughs> so going ahead, searching for a card. Uh, he has pitched one Winds of Eternity. I'm wondering if he wants to end the combat chain since 100 Winds are already there. Or he might just want to find another 100 Winds to fill the graveyard and come in for five on the next one. 
Also drew a surging strike with the blue as well off the Art of War. So has a line, has a potential line to go surging into a whelming. If he searches a whelming off of this hit, could go surging into whelming should you choose to do that as well. Or, or maybe he'll just conserve the surging strike for the following turn and go for that line on a full five card hand. Well, looks like he is going to find that one. whelming gust wave. You know, drawing more cards seems like a good plan. Yeah, especially on an Art of War turn. So this Surging Strike coming in for five, Loming Gust Wave in the Banish Zone, also going to be coming in for five thanks to the Art of War. And I wonder what's in Pudding's arsenal at the moment. He's just blocking three um, to preserve some life here, taking two on Dirk Hua's side. He knows the Whelming's coming and he has to block it as much as he can. But Whelming for five, precarious position. So I believe Pudding has one floating here. If he just has the natural Mugenshi in his arsenal here, Elliot, that would be incredibly punishing. Oh, that is absolutely crazy. And looks like we're finding Bonds of Ancestry. This could mean he could find the third Flusterfist from the deck as well, I believe. Yeah. And that just means 4-4, four and four, you're bringing Dekwa down to at four and life. 4-5, five, four Elliot. Oh the Art of War is that, yes. You're right, 4-5? and five? That's Kadachi Lock. That would be that straight is. to Kadachi Lock for Dirk Hua. Being at one life, you need to find his last Sigil of Solace. Oh, wait, no. Finding Dishonor? Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's just deal more damage in this case. <laughs> That's going to be a five as well. Getting the plus two because Bonds of Ancestry was the last card played. Now going down to one is Dirk Hua. Let's see if he's able to find the Sigil of Solace. Let's see if he can pull. Let's see if he can pull. Having and some fun right there, taking the Dishonor and saying, hey, double Dishonor feels pretty good. Well, there was no Descendant there over no there, descendant. so it's no, no Dishonor uh, on hit. But let's see if he's able to pull off an other tray here and uh, draw a Sigil when he so solidly needs it to get out of this Kadachi lock uh, for Dirk Hua. Is this the year of the Sigils, Pankaj? That would be crazy. <laughs> So it's just back to Pudding's turn. If he has that blue zero cost in hand, we're going to see Kodachi lock and any sort of damage presented after that is going to be lethal. Lord of Wind being pitched. Time is of the essence for Dirk Hua. Looks like he did not find a Sigil of Solace. Starting to commit blocks onto this Kodachi. That does not feel good for Dirk Hua at all. Locking three. I think that's going to mostly seal the deal. Another Bonds of Ancestry. You still have to commit a card here. The Breeze Rider Boots also still available for Pudding. And, and that is the strength of these Katsu lists. You know, you see Pudding get the natural combo lines turn time and time again, and you think it is just yeah, him getting lucky or something. It is no. not. It is the deck building. It is yellow Bonds of Ancestry, yellow Descendant Gust Wave, six Surging Strikes. It's, it's, this is what just happens when you give the Katsu space. They'll just set up a combo piece in their arsenal or a starter in arsenal and then just draw the other one and just start going ham. And Pudding was very patient in this game at the start, not having very uh, smooth hands. In fact, quite awkward at the beginning. But once he started arsling surging strikes, he was fishing and fish, fish, fish through your deck. Finally here, we're looking at probably some of the last few turns that are going to be available uh, for the Qua. And we already know. Oh, that's the game oh. right there. Yep, just a final two block with that ravenous rabble. Pudding Tom, as you predicted, going straight into the semi-finals. A masterclass in dishonoring Dromai's. Unfortunately, that also means the Dromai living legend dream. Unfortunately or fortunately, depending on who you ask. I'm sure Mara Ferris is in the chat, really blessing our lucky stars that our hero stays around for ProQuest season, as are many other Dromai players. But for now, that is Pudding Tom advancing on to the semi-finals of the Calling Phuket, off of a masterful showing. Mugenshi line into the prism to end his, uh, to end his Swiss rounds, and a dishonor to start off his top eight. My goodness, these blue pitch guys are really showing up here at the Calling Phuket. We're going to go into a backup match afterwards to show you guys Azalea versus Suzuri if it's still ongoing. I think we have it live as well. But uh, let's just re recap and review uh, that match previously. <laughs> what do you think Dirk could have done? It was there anything could have done he, the way those cards played out. He overblocked the Dishonor by two as well. And you can't really do more than that. You can't just go in and put three cards in front of Dishonor and be, like, and be safe from every single pump. So you know, he overblocked it by two, saying you would need three pumps, Ancestral plus Breaking Scales plus something else to get over it. But Pudding Town had it out of all Ancestral and Breaking Scales. Without a defense reaction there to protect yourself, it was just yeah. not quite in the cards for Dirk in that match. And the... And the amount of resource lined up so perfectly. It was the tunic turn. It was the bee like water. It was the Asvola in the table. Even if it was just the Yendurai, 
he wouldn't be able to trigger the Be Like Water. But instead, oh, everything went crazy from there. We are ready to show you guys our backup match. Uh, we are going to showcase Josiah on Azuri going up against Brody Spurlock on Azalea. Let's turn the camera. We're going to jump right into the action here, not starting from the beginning and, you know, playing it at a fast speed. Well, We're just going to go jump right into action 10 to 5 here. Well, talk about beginning. We're actually approaching the end in this case. <laughs> uh, Brody here having a frailty on him at the moment. A Seek and Destroy and a Bolton Shot. So this is a clean six, um, honestly, from uh, Brody. But, you know, Azuri is actually pretty good at blocking sixes here. Brody still having cards in hand to activate the Death Dealer, and that's exactly what's going to do. Spire sniping trigger on the stack after drawing with the Azalea ability, looking for a dominate uh, for an arrow to dominate here is Brody. Yep, spy sniping allowing him to arrange the top two cards. Not opt in this case, just being able to arrange the top two. Azalea still not activated yet, so Brody may be trying to find a Hail Mary in all of this. If there is a Ridden Ledger on the top, that could be useful. If there's a Sleep Dart on the top, that could be useful as well. Sleep Dart, probably the arrow that Brody wants to see the most. Render Legend, normally not too amazing into Uzuri, but Sleep Dart, you get to play your next turn knowing that Uzuri has to make all her plays face up. So let's see if Brody has found one of those coveted arrows. We've already seen that he no longer has those bullseye braces on the field, which means he won't be able to uh, put any arrows into his arsenal from his hand anymore. Death Dealer is the only way for him to do it. So if he doesn't hasn't found an arrow in one of these two cards, he might just be forced just to send the Spire Sniping. Yeah, and Spire Sniping in this case, only coming in for four. Well, that Black Tech Whisperer looking real juicy could bring him down to one. But he has to worry. I wonder how if there are any Rain Raiders that have been played so far, because that might be a consideration uh, on Josiah's mind as well. Josiah took that first Bolton shot for six completely, going from ten down to four, saying, I'm going to block something a little more threatening than the Bolton shot with basically no on hit. You know, you might be worried when you see the Bolton shot saying, oh, there's an on hit reload over here, but if your opponent hasn't activated Death Dealer, that's a fake on hit, because they always want to activate Death Dealer, draw the extra card. Yeah, who doesn't want drawing cards? In a card game, <laughs> I love drawing cards. I've heard that's pretty good, yes, drawing yeah. cards in card games. <laughs> seems, uh, like, seems like the play. Yeah. So, two cards still in Brody's hand here. I'm wondering what they are. They could be pumps. Uh, thanks, Brody, for leaving them face down. Uh, but yeah, pump. pitching the amplifying shot is actually very relevant here. You always need that extra resource in case you find a one-cost arrow on top of the deck. Pumps don't cost much except for Dead Eye. Uh, right now, Brody in a very tight spot. Any sort of attack, any sort of go-wide opportunity here. Azeda hates playing with two-card hands. The moment you have to start blocking, that's when you know you're in trouble. Also, we spoke about getting uh, arrows into his arsenal for Brody. No longer has a bullseye braces, but when I was watching some of his um, top table Swiss games, yeah. I noticed he actually has a few copies of Take Aim in his list. Ooh. Take Aim, bit of a interesting inclusion, recent inclusion into a Zeta list. It gives your next arrow attack plus three, your next ranger attack plus three, but critically has a keyword reload on it so mm -hmm. it's one way to put an arrow into your arsenal after you've used a bullseye races after you've, you've used a death dealer yeah i, I think that's that's a actually a really good inclusion especially into the skullbone cross wrap list sometimes uh you don't mind reloading and then activating the skull uh skullbone cross wraps to see one more card on top of the deck and maybe manipulating the top a little bit more Brody taking his time here to really decide. This is the top eight of the Colin Pocket. This is what decides who moves on to semifinals and potentially takes down the entire thing. Yeah. He's not. He's going to make sure he analyzes every single play line he has. Make sure he gets the most optimal play line. Absolutely. At fifth seed, more like more likely than not, he's not going to have the agency of choosing going first or second. So every decision that he makes usually comes from the position where he's not favored in the first place. But I mean, the fact that he's already made this matchup as close as it is, it is favored for Azuri after all, with all the arsenal disruption mm -hmm. that she has access to and also those codexes of frailty as well. So Brody showing how he's made it so far. He's just analyzing every single playline that he has. Yeah, and the frailty token is still on the table. So mm -hmm. this is actually very advantageous um, for Josiah. A lot of the cards, such as Bolton Shot, you need to have a pump, otherwise 
it, it just doesn't get gold again no matter what happens. So very interesting to note as we look at the equipment on Josiah's side, headpiece gone, also arm piece gone. Looks like flick knives was potentially used and block with because Josiah's just sitting with one dagger right there. Yeah, in the earlier match that Josiah was playing in on stream, he was running the crown of providence mm -hmm. rather than the mask of perdition. So using that two block on some dominated arrows just to preserve health or to fix hands can be quite a powerful thing. Uh, and I think Brody is still looking at the top two, has arranged them. We're going to see the Dominate come in. And Layers with Plush looks like he probably has those take aims we were talking about. That is a take aim. Oh, but into a Codex. That's another way to get an arrow into your arsenal. Oh, yeah, that sounds pretty darn good. And an infecting shot that's not dominated in this case. Um, and with the frailty token also means that um, this pump's only for five. Coming in for 11. Uh, oh, 10. 10, 10 after the frailty. Yes, that's right. Coming 10. for 10, but you know, with the blood rot on it, that's an effective plus two damage rider. Now those black tech whispers can imagine they might come into come in handy here to stop that tenth break point. You know, you put three three blocks in front of us and the black tech. Looks like that's what Josiah is going for. Huge turn and being able to probably have to block nine from hand to prevent all of this is really critical. Thankfully Josiah does have an arsenal card as well, so he'll still be playing with like a two card. We normally talk about how against Assassin, typically your life total is actually not 40, it's actually 38 because of two potential flick knives representing two unpreventable damage by the end of the game. But Josiah looks like he had to block with the flick knives earlier in the game, which means Brody is actually at a proper five life. He, he can comfortably, uh, he's not scared of himself flick knife shenanigans to come out at the end. Mm -hmm. That's, that's an excellent point, honestly. Brody going to be able to refill his arsenal with that ponder token. That's going to be huge going into the next turn where Josiah, with two cards, if he's going to present, you know, five damage, Brody can easily take, take some of it to the chin and maybe block a single card. Um, traditionally, as you were saying earlier on, Uzri doesn't have that kind of explosive damage. Unless it's maybe an E-Strike in Arsenal, it still might not be enough. Yeah, the problem would be whether Josiah can actually represent some form of disruption to Brody on his following turn. If, say, his Arsenal card is a stealth card and he manages to keep a CNC, can actually blow up Brody's Arsenal, put him down to two as well, potentially, um, and get some tempo back. But for now, he does need to deal with this 10 damage infecting shot on the combat chain. Yeah, 10 damage. And we know Josiah's list actually has, like, nimbleisms and whatnot. Mm. Those block twos, which traditionally in Uzuri, you know, we always say that she's a block three kind of deck. That could be a liability in this particular matchup. Nimbleisms, looking for scraps, ravenous rivals, Codex, there's many, many block twos in this particular flavor of Uzuri. Yeah, this could put Josiah in a really tight spot. Thankfully, in top eight, he has all the time to think. Mm -hmm. Both players definitely making use of the untimed rounds, and of course, as they should, you don't want to make a mistake when you're at, at this high stakes of an event. Yeah, uh, I'm sure these players must have tried, you know, playing really hard here in Phuket. Now they have to play even harder at the top eight. <laughs> so a big decision point here for Josiah. What can he do in the face of a 16 damage turn? With frailty. <laughs> that has to be crazy. And uh, if he doesn't manage to optimize that Arsenal card on the next turn, remember, Seek and Destroy is live. Hundred percent. <laughs> Looks like there might be uh, some sort of judge call happening at the table. I believe we saw a quick peek of the player there. That is not Brody. So I have to wonder what is happening over there. I'm sure the judges will get that sorted out. Shout out to our judges, of course. You know, it is they are a big reason why these games can even happen in the first place. Yes. Always grateful for the judge community and the way that they handle all these like rules infringements or like rules disputes, more like that. It's like the judge has gotten up from the table. Looks like whatever the dispute was has potentially been settled. Might see Brody get back to the table as Josiah is still considering his blocks on this 10 damage infecting shot. Wow, well, it's potentially a 14 damage infecting shot. I mean, mm -hmm. if you let even one point of damage leak here, Josiah has only one turn to resolve that. Yep. So Josiah probably priced into blocking this out and you know with the number of two blocks that he has but might not be able to mount up any sort of offense you know might need to be might need to seed all tempo to Brody's side and you have to wonder whether that frailty token is also messing up potentially what Josiah wants to do if he has something like leave no witnesses in his arsenal for example would that frailty token be reduced to three 
much easier to stomach for Brody. You can easily block three with just some sort of spare arrow. Yeah, and he still has two pieces of equipment that block for one uh, on his side. That Skullbone cross wrap or that Tunic, even on three, doesn't matter when you're this close to the end of the game. If that one block on the Tunic is going to save you a whole card that you don't need to block with, yeah, you take that any day of the week when, you're, when the life totals are this low. This is one of those classic matchups, Zuri into Azalea. And for it to be this tight, you know that the games at Calling Phuket <laughs> have been just straight up bangers. We have been treated to just an amazing two days of just beautiful Flesh and Blood games. Delve all of day one, all of day two as well so far. And this is just the backup match of our quarterfinals. We have two to three more matches for us of today. I'm I'm so incredibly stoked. We're probably going to be able to watch both semifinals games and the finals, of course, to figure out who our winner will be in the Calling Phuket. Yeah. Looks like uh, one of the updates we have is that Eng Chu Heng, my boy, made it into the semifinals, beating Shannon on KO. <sighs> I look, looks like my prediction is uh, so far, <laughs> my fantasy league points, guys, uh, please. Pass me four of them. Yeah, it looks like Ethan saw the future and he joined you in that prediction as well. Chu Heng managing, managing to take down one of the Prism Menaces in the top eight. So still mm -hmm. one Prism left in Vespa. We're not sure how that matchup has gone yet, but Chu Heng will be advancing on to the semifinals alongside alongside Pudding Time. Uh, he'll be facing Pudding Time. It's going to be Katsu versus KO as one of our semifinals matches. And this is going to be... The winner of this is going to move on to our other semifinals facing the winner the winner of Vespa versus Lionel. Yeah, that match I don't think has concluded yet. So we will give you an update when we can. Um, but this, this uh, match on screen is going to take a little while to resolve. I'm not sure if they've come to a conclusion of um, the, the judge rulings and stuff. So we're just taking a little bit of a pause on that. But yeah, I mean, just recapping the week, the weekend, it's been really, really good in terms of the quality of flesh and blood. Right after Pro Tour LA, we were thinking, okay, looks like the meta is going to shape up. It's going to narrow down a little bit. Well, this top eight says otherwise. Seven different heroes in top eight. When we came into the top eight, at this point, the Katsu has progressed, beating down the Dromai. Akeo has progressed, beating down the Prism. And looks like we might have Total of four different heroes in our semifinals and guaranteed, no, no matter what. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I didn't think about it that way. Yep. Uh, but what a story in the sunny island of Phuket. Just having, everyone's having like smiles across their faces. I don't think yeah. there's a single sad person. Even, even the games that are lost, <laughs> yeah. I've watched people walk to the beach and be like, you know what, oh, I'll yeah. just take a breath of fresh air. Yeah, the vibes are absolutely amazing. The beach is right there. You see it through the window. When you lose a game, you're like, ah, all right, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to walk about 10 meters and just hit the beach and just uh, roll around the waves. Pankaj <laughs> isn't even like joking about that. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a video later on Twitter and I'll mm. show you guys. You can walk out of the, of the convention hall, turn right, and then you'll see the beautiful horizon that is the beach. Yep. Tons of great food, tons of party people, honestly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this, this is such a party town. I absolutely love it. <laughs> so glad that LSS has decided this would be the holiday destination for flesh and blood. Yep. The food in Southeast Asia is just you know, something else to speak about. I grew up in Singapore and I just... Every, you miss it, do you miss oh, it? I miss the food country? every day. Yeah, <laughs> always. So uh, getting to come here and eat Southeast Asian food again for this little break is uh, absolutely amazing. Yeah. One thing I will talk about, and some of the players at home might not know this, is uh, one of the packages that were offered for this was the Marvel package right here for the Calling Phuket. Mm -hmm. And you know what it includes? It includes this buffet. Incredible, yeah. <laughs> incredible buffet spread down. It's not even far. Like, you literally yep. take the escalator downstairs from the, from the playing area, yep. and it's right there, spread out. Yep. And just eat. You sit in the dining hall, fully air conditioned, and it's free flow. Just keep. Oh, my yep. goodness. I think we've been super spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> well treated throughout this entire experience at Calling Phuket. So, so uh, our dedicated viewers might have realized that we have been taking lunch breaks uh, over today <laughs> and yesterday. And yes, that is exactly where a lot of the players have been. Just downstairs in the buffet hall, just helping themselves to this amazing, amazing food out here in Phuket. That's like lunchtime. You know, they also provide like tea breaks. Yeah. It's like, it's like cakes, samosas, yep. whatnot. Thai iced tea. Oh, Thai, Thai iced tea. On tap. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Thai iced tea on tap. <laughs> Just so, so interesting. Um, yeah, I think for. A 206 player calling. We've just had uh, so much fun. Everyone's all smiles. 
people are playing the side events, uh, the Ravis Rebels. I think those are some of the most gorgeous extended art we've had as a mm. promo. Also, uh, Merlion sigils being given out at the side yeah. events as well. You come to Southeast Asia, you got to get those Merlion sigils, man. Mm -hmm. Southeast Asia, and especially Singapore Pride in that one. Started with 206 players at the Colin Pocket, down to our final six. We know, Ooh. yep, uh, two out of the top eight have been eliminated already. Uh, eliminated already. So just our final six players. This match going to decide, well, another one of the, <laughs> of the final six. Uh. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I don't know. I've, I've, I think this weekend's stories have been so good. And all this is still the backdrop for... A whole season of ProQuest that's coming yeah. up, right? This calling is going to shape a lot of what's going to happen next week when you go to your locals, play those ProQuests, try to win those gold foils. And uh, now that Dromai is definitely not getting Living Legend Stays from this calling alone. From this calling, but there is still a battle hardened happening at the same time. You know, this right, is not right. Dromai's final chance to LL this weekend. That battle hardened that's happening. At the same time, yeah. uh, we might be able to get some of those games recorded and put out on the old YouTube channel at some point. But, you know, <laughs> for those of you hoping that Draw My LLs, you can still continue to hope despite it not happening at the calling. Honestly, I have to think of another deck to bring to my ProQuest if that happens. Oh, like, Draw My is your main? Uh, well, I'm playing her now. I was actually mm. trying like the Kasai build and I saw your deck tech during the break. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think I gotta try that list out. Mm. I love the one copy of Raise the Army, man. Like, that's, oh, yeah. that's actually big brain. Yeah, yeah. You only need one. You, you only even need to resolve one. <laughs> yeah. It looks like we might have an update from yep. production. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, overcomes real quick. Uh, update on this situation. There is a judge call going on that uh, we cannot share details about at the moment. They are still in discussions about things. Um, so... While that unfolds, uh, no, the stream is not frozen. Uh, we are we are unsure when it will, um, when the game will basically restart. So we're just keeping tabs on this. Also, for everyone in the chat who's asking about the battle harden incessantly, the battle harden is still in like round five or six of Swiss. Mm -hmm. Not There's even like seven today, right? There are, there yeah. will be seven rounds of Swiss. Uh, Swiss was not expected to end until after the CC, uh, or the calling top eight rather. So there is a lot of time still before the battle harden top eight. You will get updates when there is a top eight. Uh, we can't say anything else about the matter because there just isn't a top eight yet, so hold your <laughs> horses, people. Uh, but there we go. I'm going to go check in with the judges again to uh, see if we can get back to the gameplay. Thank you so much, Manson. You know, he's just been such a great production crew, like, this entire time. Yeah, yeah. He has crazy. been the, the production crew. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just him and Esmond, like, yeah. these two guys behind the scenes. Yeah. And these overlays, I don't know if a lot of the viewers at home have seen, like, in between, all the little cosplays that some of the card oh, yeah. arts have been doing. Oh, yeah, it's been, it's been absolutely beautiful. I just absolutely love that. Oh. And also, big shout-out. I mean, he is the reason why we get to watch two games for the price of one every round. You know, we've been, we've been able to watch the main feature match and also tune in to the backup match and just get two great games of flesh and blood every round. Every single time. Well, we get the Cosmo, so I'm very happy about yep. that. We get to see these players really duke it out. <laughs> nail for nail. Oh, what a weekend it has been. Oh. Yep, I think they're still, they're still kind of talking about it. We're going to switch the... Oh, looks okay. like equipment being pushed forward here, so... Maybe they're back on. Yeah, I was going to say equipment being pushed forward by Elliot over here because that's that's a name down the bottom of the screen, but you're right next to me, Elliot, so I don't think you're the one pushing is the equipment. Is this our match? Is, <laughs> yes. This might be our match. <laughs> that, that nimbleism being very key here, yep. having to, to throw that equipment in just because there's that two block... All right, 100%. looks like uh, the, the match has proceeded. Uh, Brody is going to arsenal his card. And uh, it looks like Josiah only has one card left in hand and one card in arsenal. Let's see if magic can happen. Will Thunder strike in this quarterfinal match? Oh, that's a straight-up CNC coming in for five in this case. Well, five actually still a pretty good break point here uh, to protect that arsenal because... He can't just give the tunic if it was a leave no witnesses. He has to give up the cross wraps, and that kind of also doesn't, you know, synergize well with protecting the arsenal. If Brody really wants to, could give up just one arrow and two equipment pieces. Opponent is at four. It'll be a bit of a last stretch sort of play. You only do that if you are confident that a game isn't go on, going to go on much longer, because the longer the game goes after you've given up those critical equipment pieces, that's when you start opening yourself up to some really bricky hands from Azalea. Mm hmm. Absolutely. The two to three card hands on Azalea are not fantastic, as we've seen throughout the weekend. Once you're only setting in an arrow for eight at tops, that feels pretty bad at times. 
So CNC name of the game for Josiah here. He was really hoping to be able to you know, play a stealth card to swap into the CNC. Playing face up when you're an assassin known for playing sneakily, not where you want to be, but at least was able to cobble together some sort of on hit that Brody does need to respect. Is going to strip some cards from Brody because not oh only is it an on hit on the CNC, it is also lethal. Yeah, and also one of the cards in his hand is a Rain Razors at the moment. Ooh. So one of the no block cards that you can't commit and you probably have to use as a resource at this point in time, right? Potentially, but he is conserving his tunic counter, so then that rain raises when your opponent is at four, could push over a potential on hit. We spoke out of Blood Rod Pox in a previous turn cycle. If Brody's able to send the two damage over the rain raises connected and say put on a Blood Rod Pox on top of it, that could be lethal from his own side at reaction speed. And flipping up that knock the death whistle, but flipping it away in this case for a Endless arrow that's going to be dominated Ooh. at seven with a rain raises in hand. No arsenal for Josiah. This is looking really bleak right now, Pankaj. This is an incredible. That was an incredible hit for Brody off the top of there because he still has Snapdragon Scalers and has not activated Death Dealer. So should this endless arrow hit, it'll go back to his hand. He'll be able to tunic in. You'll be able to tunic Death Dealer, put an endless arrow back in, and send it again because of the Snapdragon still being up. Wow, this is just such a Cinderella story for a difficult matchup for Brody Spurlock. But like you said during our predictions... Uh, and the fist bump's extended by Josiah. Wow. Seven damage, endless arrow dominated, couldn't deal with that. Doesn't even need the Snapdragon skill as Brody. He's moving on to the semifinals of the Calling Poquette. Oh my goodness. And so we had three Malaysians come into the top eight. Two of them already eliminated. So Down Malaysia, to Lionel. Down to Lionel. This is a very tough matchup for him, but the... Yeah. Very. Fans of Malaysia are behind him. Yeah, well, I think Malaysia had a fantastic showing this weekend. Not a lot of players showed up. They are not the most represented region, but 8.3% of them converting into like the calling top eight. You can't ask for that. that's a that's a crazy statistic. In an think extremely about it. competitive field as well. These 206 players that we've had, we've had nail biter matches all weekend. Yeah, and incredible performance from the Malaysians here. That's really really good. So we're still waiting on the results of the other two matches. We haven't seen it yet. Uh, we will probably want to um, show you like the brackets afterwards as well. We're still working on some of the graphics. In the meantime, Pankaj. Who do you think is going to win that? I mean, we talked a little about Lionel um, earlier on with Vespa. Uh, if that match comes up, Lionel, what do you wow. think? Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. If, that, if that match somehow comes up, Lionel, he's going to be playing off against Brody on Azalea. Yeah, so in that matchup, uh, the edge definitely goes to Azalea. It's one of the reasons Brody brought this deck because of the resurgence of the hatches during there specifically from PTLA. Azalea is well equipped to deal with that matchup. Now, if it was a Dawnblade Dory, then it's a bit more of a toss-up between the matchup because Dawnblade Dory can raise you and Azalea, you know, just unable to block. Uh, but the hatches are in there. Uh, Brody on Azalea is much more happy to play that game. But Lionel does need to beat Vesper uh, for that to even happen. And that is a tough, tough hill to climb. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we have three out of the four semifinalists locked and loaded. Still two more incredible... Oh, well might be more series. We might have cast <laughs> three different series mm -hmm. for, for, for this tournament. I am so, so happy the way this is showing up because not only do we have a diverse top eight, we're going to have a diverse top four. Yeah. <laughs> and we're definitely not having any mirrors today, which yep. I think makes me the happiest flesh and blood spectator I can be. Oh, for sure. It is just... Way more fun to watch two different heroes duke it out rather than mirrors. Of course, some mirrors have a lot of skill expression to them as well. And, uh, you know, I enjoy in their own right. You know, a lot of Kano players particularly talk about how the Kano mirrors peak oh, our flesh turn and all blood. The time, yeah, yeah it's, just, it's our turn. We're both playing the same deck, the same cards, and <laughs> at the same time as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no mirrors to speak of in this calling top eight. Yep. So, uh,. I don't know, man. Like, I'm, I'm looking to see how this thing plays out. Uh, we've already had our predictions go in. Ang Chu Heng putting time, man. This is, this is a rivalry. Hong Kong and Singapore have been playing this game for just the longest time. In fact, you know, a lot of the Hong Kong players, they love stopping by Singapore and playing our local armories once in a oh, while. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. some of the noble names, actually our ninth place in this calling, Pei Tong Liao. Ah, Unfortunately, just didn't make it. it. Yep. Just missed it by just that little bit. Uh, he's a very good friend of a lot of Singaporeans. And, uh, I think we went to Calling Taipei the last time. It was very nice to show us around. Brings all the like good food. Um, yeah. All right, I'm I'm here. Hey. All right, sorry for. Hey, we got the production guy. Held down the fort very well. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that 
The Vespa versus Lionel game was amazing flesh and blood. It did not come down to an ALS loop. Wow. It came down to a merciful retribution that disrupted the loop because ALS yeah, then went goes to soul. soul. Yep. And it turned into a grind fest. Lionel just lost to Arcane Damage from Herald of Rap wow. Uh, Archangel well, of Rap thanks for telling us that was an amazing game that we didn't get to watch, yes. Ethan. Wow, just, just giving well, us all the FOMO. Moves on. We'll, yeah. <laughs> we, we will get more flesh and blood, I promise. <laughs> but, you know, if, if Ethan is saying that it went really, really close, maybe Lionel has something yep. to, this, to this game plan, even without those time snap potions. So I'm really excited to see uh, and hear from Lionel himself on how that thing played out. Unfortunately, we will not be seeing him play anymore because Vespa yeah. did take it down. So it's going to be a Prism versus Azalea for one of the semifinals matches and putting Tom and Katsu against Shu Heng on KO for the other one. Two extremely, extremely spicy matches and I cannot wait. Yes, we will be back with that shortly. I think we're going to take a short break at the moment. We'll come back. We're going to drink some water. I think oh. we've had so much shouting. <laughs> that, that dishonor really took the wind oh, out of yeah. me. Yeah. So we'll see you all in just a bit. Don't go anywhere.
draconic illusionist might have fallen in the calling, but we just went ahead and checked out some of the top tables of the battle hardened here in Phuket. And there are plenty of Dromai sniffing around the top tables. We're in round six of seven over there in the battle hardened. So depending on the top cut, we might still get a chance to witness Dromai ascend into living legend. But before we can get into that story, we have to look here into the semifinals of the calling. Phuket, Sam O'Byrne, Elliot Tan. That seemed like it was just pretty intense game in the last round. My goodness, I think we are looking at the Ash being blown away at the moment. What a top eight start, both on the fact that Brody managed to beat an Uzuri, what is considered a difficult matchup, as well as the fact that putting just dishonored a Dromai on the stream. Yeah, pretty sick. Pretty, pretty sick. But putting, getting a lot of style points over the last two games on stream, right? Oh, yeah. we, with Mugenshi. the Dishonor, the Mugenshi release into the Lord of Wind. I mean, I don't know if it gets much more stylish than that, but we got to look ahead to the semi-final now where you're leaving the ninjas behind and returning to the land of the Illusionist. This time we are on our undefeated player, Vespa on Prism. We've got to continue to see if the undefeated player can take it down on a hero that no one expected to do so well. So let's go ahead and check out the bracket as we get ready to check out the semi-final. Look at the top of the bracket there, folks. It is a kid you've seen plenty times, time and time again. Brody Spurlock is in the semi-finals. We're going to be watching him take on TC Vespa, Prism, Awakener of Soul, and then down there on the bottom of your screen, Pudding Tam had made his way into the top eight and is now trying to bring the Kadachis through Eng Chu Hang's KO. You know, I just want to say we did some predictions earlier. Me and Pankaj were sitting here. I'm fully correct so far. Let's go. Come on. All right, well, let's do it right now. Make make some more. Make some okay, more for okay. me. No, I, I went all the way. Oh, so, okay. Um, we, I was saying that I think Pudding has the advantage in this one. Chewing, a very well-versed player fighting against Katsu, but Pudding just showing a masterclass on Katsu, even in a field of victors on day one and day two. Yeah, so, absolutely. This guy knows the deck inside out. He's played with some of the best players within Hong Kong. Not just Hong Kong, but in the region, mm -hmm. right? And um, I think the story above with Prism versus Azalea, Vespa also just the hometown hero, <laughs> showing that Prism was the pocket pick of choice this time. Now, the question is whether or not he will have what it takes to meet, to beat Mr. Worldwide, the pit bull <laughs> himself, Brody Spurlock. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> I mean, Brody travels all around no, the world. You, no, no, no. I love it. Like, <laughs> let's be very clear. I think that's brilliant. Mr. Worldwide, Brody Spurlock. A little bit incongruous when you look at the actual individuals, but the yes. titles do work when you consider Brody's resume and how much he travels around the world. And the Colin Phuket, no exception, but he's yeah. got his work cut out for him in the matchup we are about to watch. Yeah, I think it's going to be a Prism and Katsu finals. No one would have expected a Prism Katsu finals after PCLA. We all know the three big bads was going to be KO, Dromai, and maybe Dory. But in this case, things don't look... That picture is not painted within this top four. Absolutely not, and I think it's time to get down into the semi-final, my friend. So let's waste no time and begin to get down to it. We have got Vespa, your undefeated player so far here in the calling. The first seed, of course, on the Awakener of Soul, Prism herself. And you can see, given the side eye on the right side of your screen there, Azalea getting ready to try to knock the single death whistle and take down this match, punching Brody's ticket into the finals. But I think Prism, the Ward, and the Angels are certainly going to have something to say about that. Yeah, Vespa's going to be rocking that Empyrean Rapture in this matchup. So you're going to see a lot of angels. You're going to see these figments just transforming into Archangels across time. Heralds, very difficult to pop. We know Vespa's running the Rainbow Herald of Triumphs in this case. Brody has his work cut out for him. 100%. And these players did play in Swiss. Brody did take one of his only losses to Vespa when, when the top eight was about to start. I, I was sitting and watching pretty much all the other games while you guys were casting. And uh, uh, while Brody and Josiah were chatting, they were talking about their losses throughout Swiss. And Josiah was like, yeah, well, I, I lost to, to, to Vespa. And Brody said, I think we all lost to Vespa at one point through the run as Vespa just went in and just took down the entirety of the Swiss. Well, Vespa is looking like he's paving the golden road undefeated in this tournament so far not dropping a single game if you asked me a week ago did i think that prism awakener of soul will be the undefeated deck in this current meta undefeated zero losses all the way to top eight i'd say you'd be joking <laughs> well the jokes are not finished folks as prism is getting ready 
to try to take on Azalea here. Yeah. You can hear the music swelling behind us as these two titans prepare to do battle in yeah. the arena. Lots of time for them to think about the top eight. Remember, there are no time limits, so they're going to be able to play. Don't tell Brody that. I, don't I, tell know, Brody that. I know, I know. I don't let's, need some of that. Let's just pretend that there is a timer. Here's the thing. Brody's got a flight. Yeah, he so, didn't say on stream early on. <laughs> so maybe for the first time, maybe for the first time, we're going to see Brody play with a little bit of a fire under his belly as he knows he's got to get to this flight if he wants to get home. You know, I would have put it past Brody to rebook his flight. <laughs> if you, honest to God. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. This, this is really... What a classic story, Brody. The person who's been flying all around the world, playing all these different callings, playing all these different events. And Vespa, homegrown talent. Yeah. Just representing and protecting the pride of Thailand right here. 100%. So exciting to watch these players work all weekend long. Major shout outs to the hometown hero, right? Coming in here and showing the rest of the world what's what. You come to my turf, you better be get ready to throw down the hometown buff, proving alive and well for Vespa. And just huge shout outs, of course, to Brody Spurlock. Someone, of course, when someone travels around the world as much as Brody does, trying to punch his ticket into as many top eights as he can and has this, you know, this amount of consistent success, you gotta, you know, you gotta respect not only the competitor, but also the type of person willing to just put it all on the line for a game he loves. Absolutely. Thailand had 19 people show up in this 206 player calling and two of them made it all the way to the top eight. Vespa carrying this country's entire, entire ambition on the line to try to secure a calling at the international level. Brody, uh, of course, one of four Americans. <laughs> Come on now. Four people from the US. Come on now. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, I'm, I know all our hopes on these two players. The world is watching at the moment. Thank you all for tuning into this stream. The players are shuffling up. I think Brody's still thinking about a couple of sideboard pieces. They've already played this matchup before, so they have the prior experience, and they can decide now. How do I adjust that game plan? That is something Brody was discussing a little bit with me after his round with Vespa through Swiss. He said, listen, it was a, it was a close game. I know I made a, a couple misjudgments, and I think with more practice in the matchup, it absolutely uh, would be winnable. And he's had a little bit of practice now. He's been able to watch some of these games throughout the weekend. So we'll see which lessons he did, in fact, take away from the round in Swiss and how he wants to put them into practice here to try to take down the hero who has not dropped a game all weekend long. Yeah, that is really the narrative of this entire tournament. No one, I, I would say absolutely no one, expecting this prism list. I, I was speaking to Vespa earlier, and the funniest part was that he was the one who was asking um, Putrashi about like this list, and he adapted from that. He was like, yeah, I just I just kind of net decked it from him. Uh, he's the number one Thai ELO player, so... <laughs> Uh, why not run that list? Just want to try it out. There you go. Yeah, and uh, look where he is. First seed all the way here in the calling bucket. He's got to be happy with his performance so far. Just you have to imagine. Yeah. No, lose, no losing so far. Yeah, just on that real big hot streak, and he's not even a warrior at this point <laughs> in time. Uh, Brody Spurlock as well. I think he's had a pretty good run. I mean, in a field of victors, I would say that uh, Brody was, was a very bold choice to bring in the Azalea. But specifically, I think you were talking to him, this was about targeting the Dorinthias. This was about having that really good hit into Chaos who don't really want to block. If you get dominated Ridden Ledger, you'll be able to push things through. So both people making some amazing meta choices. Absolutely. And that's why they're here. 100%. The players are placing the headsets on, getting the mics adjusted. Preparing to throw down here in the arena. It's the semifinals of the Calling Phuket. It's been such an incredible weekend. And of course, once again, thank you all for joining us. We got two more rounds of Classic Constructed for you before we close out this calling. And they are the two most important rounds we have gotten to witness thus far in the tournament. Semi-finals into the finals. And it's time for the semis to get ready and get going. Looks like their players here are just having a final little discussion. Yeah, we are going to be definitely crowning a new calling champion. Always exciting to say so. That's that's one of my favorite things about this game. You never know who's going to sneak up, coming to top eight with a commanding performance. There are all these great comeback stories, all these great people who are... He, Brody, so much experience, always clamoring into that top eight. So let's see if he can close it out. And Vespa, who's having a stellar performance. He, he was talking to me about how uh, he crashed out of PTLA, didn't have the best performance on this prism list. But he's showing that he has actually so much reps into the game right after uh, that major event. 
Absolutely. All smiles on both players' faces. They're ready to throw fists. You know, <laughs> all smiles on their faces, ready to beat the living hell out of each other. Hey, man, that's Couldn't be more excited. You. Without a doubt, these players stepping into the arena. And that is, I mean, I think it does really speak to the kind of soul of the community, right? Yes. Like, a lot of people join this game, and they're like, oh, wow, the game is fun. And the people are pretty amazing. And it, you, you've witnessed it all weekend long. If you've been here with us in Phuket, players having a great time, trying their absolute hardest to kick the living crap out of their opponents, but doing it with a smile, doing it with grace, and doing it... <laughs> yeah, it in the way that we all, you know, respect and value so much. To be fair, I've had so much fun with you, Sam. This oh, weekend. my brother, it's been a blast. I, I think I'm, we're going to be seeing much more of you on these casts Aww. if I had to have any, you know, um, uh, if I could see into the future, that might be what would make sense to me. <laughs> all right, so these players are starting for us. Vespa does get the choice uh, of starting this game. So I wonder, is he going to let uh, Brody get the first hit in you know sometimes the trouble with letting Azalea go first is that you can get one of those cheeky blind dominates on top of the deck mm -hmm. and then just like seek in damage uh, but going second as Vespa sometimes you get the tempo play you get to block a little bit and then send that herald that's actually going to do some damage and actually strip cards from Brody's hand yeah I think we I think I might have caught as the players were beginning and setting up there that Vespa is first and decided to put himself first we're going to start things off here this is just a war tune herald Four or five with go again. Mm -hmm. And uh, very importantly, he's pitching the, the figment of triumph here. So if Brody decides to pop this one, he can't just switch in the halo and uh, bring this figment in. And I'm sure Brody, aficionado, analyzes, takes his time, looks at the board state. He knows that this halo play is off the table. And just sending a, you know, little five or two now, uh, go again, easy. Uh, Vespa also interestingly has a passing mirage in his hand so after this turn i think brody's gonna be a bit of a shock that his poppers are not going to be that effective next turn and a soul shield as well a perfect arsenal target for vespa on this first turn right. against a hero that likes to dominate having a defense reaction in the arsenal is key to feeling a little more secure throughout the game in the soul shield with those phantasmal footsteps can sometimes put in major work on a combat chain yep and uh, for sure, we were expecting the Empyrean Rapture coming in for Vespa here. It's the one of the effective ways to cheat resources in order to flick, uh, flip those figments into angels, turn them into some powerful ward fours, uh, get some maybe secondary effects off them, like drawing cards, dealing arcane damage, what have you. It's, uh, it's Vespa's world. You get to choose whatever effect you want because <laughs> these angels, they're going to be hitting. And uh, there is a popper in Brody's hand, but... Are you willing to use one on turn zero? That is always a big question. That is the important decision that he has to make. Luckily for Brody, that attack only coming in for five means that that two block in the lace with frailty will go a nice way ensuring and that up. Vespa showing that passing Mirage and Brody cannot be happy that that down and dirty is in his hands. It's either, you know, Kid Wonderbread has to hit this passing Mirage and just negate all the damage this turn or and, and leave that down and dirty in Arsenal. Or he's just going to try to swing in face and what he's going to do with that uh, down and dirty. Yeah, absolutely. The passing mirage, these Spectra Auras against Rangers. So challenging for them to deal with because perhaps you can do something like a bolt and shot into a ravenous rabble into the Spectra and then have another piece for your arsenal. But certainly the offensive pressure will be hampered by having to consider what attack is going to go into the Spectra. How much is Brody going to want to get rid of that thing, especially given he has the down and dirty in his hand already? How many more of those poppers has he put in just for the matchup that are going to be a lot less worse when he's trying to deploy them on offense or defense? And time's a ticking for Brody. In this matchup, Vespa has the more efficient attacks going into this. One for sevens. There are three red Wartune Heralds. There are Heralds of Triumph that go again. Most of the time when you're Azalea, you're committing three to four cards to pumps and resources and one arrow just to match that same level of efficiency that uh, Prism is able to deliver with those Phantasm attacks. Absolutely. So uh, a bit of an awkward hand here for Brody, yeah. not a single pump in sight. Yeah, and a big Spectre. You have to wonder if maybe he's just going to cut his losses, draw a card, and then send something into the Spectre, allow Vespa to have the tempo in the agency. But like you said, if that Pascal Mirage sits on the field, Brody, Azalea hates to block in any matchup, and especially these big oversatted attacks. The downside being Phantasm, but listen, 
Aston Mirage is going to have something to say about that. Yeah, Brody's in a tight spot. He knows he's going to try to draw from the Death Dealer, but sometimes when you're just pumping for three most of the time of one attack, if he draws it from the, from the Death Dealer, eight is an easy break point most of the time, right? Especially if that Soul Shield all the way in Arsenal. Yeah. Oh man, you, you got a feel for him right now. Not drawing any pumps to go over the top. Even a two-card block might sometimes be enough if the on-hit isn't necessarily that strong. So let's see Brody's first move. Thinking of what to load uh, in this death deal, or maybe just sending an attack straight to Pass Mirage. 32 to 40 are the life totals. Prism. That's just all normal. That, I was going to say, yeah, all that ward means that she had to start with a little less life than the rest of us. Yeah, and I love the fact that uh, Vespa chose to bring in the Wave of Reality as his choice of equipment into this entire calling. The thing about uh, Wave of Reality, unlike a lot of other cards, say, for example, um, your Iron Height Gauntlets or your Goliath, uh, your Goliath Gauntlets, is that it blocks one breakpoint mm. for free. You're not twice. using another card. And you do it twice. I mean, you can't ask for a better card than that. Very relevant in this matchup in particular because, you know, some of the Rain Razor turns are also coming in for seven. All right, looks like Brody's going to load his first card. This is a Bolton Shot. Did he draw up a pump to make this Bolton Shot somewhat effective? Let's see how much he wants to respect the passing Mirage. This turn might be a bit of a dud, a bit of a clunker for Azalea here, but was able to find the pump. It's a Lace with Inertia. Okay, that's not too bad. A good way to start. Uh... With this being seven go again, actually, that soul shield's really going to cover it up. Absolutely. And there's no other way for him to reload the arsenal at the moment. This might just be the end turn arsenal pass. Well, unless Brody wants to, you know, break those bullseye bracers right here on the first turn of the game, oh, which would man. be a very aggressive line. If he does that, one of the problems is that that's his only piece of arcane barrier that he's going to have this Very entire true. game. So Sekum can put the clock on him. Another passing Mirage just there to cover it up and using the wave of reality uh, to say, well, there we go. That's a two-card block on this, and I'm going to keep um, my three-card hand. Seven with go again has been stuffed by the Soul Shield and the Ward, and critically now a card heading to the Soul. Looks like Brody's going to break the combat chain. And that's going to be Arsenal Pass. No, it's going to be the Bullseye Bracers. Oh, my God. Brody just unwilling to sit there with two cards in the hand. The red and the ledger are going to hit the Arsenal. Going to get that plus one, but it's going right into the Passing Mirage. And you want to know why? Because that's the final down and dirty in the Arsenal. Ready oh to pop goodness. a Herald at uh, will. Let's see, though, those yeah. phantasmal footsteps. We haven't seen them in a while, thanks to Dromai, but man, do they put in work. And that is a very difficult spot to be in. Without the Bullseye Bracer and there are no Snapdragons in this particular list, well, Brody's damage cap just got a lot lower. His burst turns are going to feel pretty mid at this point in time. So let's see, what is Vespa's retaliation? Maybe we'll try to see if we can see his hand. The perfect hand, honestly, right? This is going to be, you know, the first War Tune Herald. He can send that in. Maybe just send the blue in. Once he sees it down and dirty, well, you have your take of your pick to put the yellow War Tune into Arsenal. This is going to be quite an interesting turn and perhaps give Brody a little bit of space, but not putting Vespa too far on the back foot. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the down and dirty here, the resources don't quite work out to go all of both of these heralds through a popper because the Phantasmal Footsteps, of course, does cost one to get the action point back. So for Brody here, the down and dirty will most likely just cover up one of the heralds and force force Vespa into an arsenal, and then give Brody a lot of breathing room from this point forward. This is going to be the Herald of Protection with the go again, and that just is going to get the down and dirty block from the arsenal here. Very interesting. Now Vespa has to decide whether he wants to leave. Yep, and he looks like he's opting to put the Wartune Herald blue into the arsenal uh, instead. All right, so Brody getting some, some breathing room. Only thing is that he can't use the Skullbone cross this turn unless he uses like a take aim uh, in this case to load the arsenal face down. But uh, we're seeing a seek and destroy and a lace with blood rot in his hand. Um, on each action, will you just give like a verbal yes? Yeah. Okay. Just, just to make it easy sure. and, and faster. Uh, okay. Load draw. All right. So pitching that infecting arrow at the start. I'm not going to use it because Tunic is still on two. A drill shot. Uh, not super relevant in this matchup just because the Phantasmal Footsteps hardly is going to block any of these arrows 
uh, because you know the pumps just always put it above six. It might ha it might work in the late game a little bit more, but drill shot is just a very effective zero for four arrow. Drill shot here gonna go in and draw a card off of the death dealer. It's always happy when you're always happy facing down an azalea when you see them pitch a red into the death dealer. The only you know and when their uh, tunic is only at two. The drill shot here only costing zero is nice. You can go zero cost pump into zero cost pump into the drill shot, but wow. right here is going to go ahead and every single time ask for permission upon resolving one of these cards because any any point Vespa, Vespa can play an instant speed aura like that Arclight Sentinel and turn three pumps into a whole lot less of an exciting turn. Yeah, that's going to be one of the more powerful things that Vespa can do. He has to kind of read how many pumps Brody want, wants to play from his hand, and Brody can also choose. We've seen some sneaky plays where you can just... You know, be a slightly inefficient with number of pumps, so you can send the arrow through still. Remember, Arc Lake Sentinel is an instant, so it does not lock. But Brody, very fortunate to also find um, this read the glide path off of the Death Dealer. That's his third pump in his hand that costs zero. We still have a Seek and Destroy and a Lace with Blood Rot that we've seen in, um, in his hand. Chip. Looks like he's leaving this one on top. Does this mean we might see a Dominate attack? Azalea activation here. Brody making sure this is all copacetic, and it is going to be the Codex of Frailty with another zero-cost pump in hand. Looking forward, did Vespa find the Arclight Sentinel here to completely make this Codex of Frailty significantly less impactful and turn these three cards played from, you know, giving them their effect to just basically doing nothing on the turn. It very early in first cycle, so Vespa would have to be pretty fortunate to find it here. Yeah, and there is a Bolton Trot red in Brody's um, discard pile. That's very important to note, especially because I think Brody has one more um, one more arrow in his hand. If that's the case, yeah. Wait, is he can, no, is he can destroy, lace with blood rot. Yeah, he had, two, he had two pumps, right, earlier on. Oh, there's no cards in Brody's hand. Yeah, the Codex of Frailty here, always so good okay. without cards in hand because you don't, have to di you don't have to discard. You go ahead and grab a card from the graveyard. We're going to put the bolt and shot yep. into the arsenal. Well, that's a, that's a big one. So this is 9 plus 4. So you're coming for 13 damage and will refill um, the arsenal later because of that Ponder token. If Azalea comes really meta, I mean, like, stonks for Ripple Away. But yeah, this is this is a pretty good one uh, using that Skullbone cross wraps uh, to flip up just to, you know, every little margin matters. The fact that you can see the yeah, next exactly. card is really, really good. Not re you know relevant on this turn, but Brody's still making sure he gets the optionality out of the opt effect for the card he's going to draw on his next turn. If he didn't like it, could ship it to the bottom. Clearly, was happy enough, and there is a no block in the hand there for Vespa. This is going to be a light of soul there. That is going to make it more challenging to block this out for the total of 13. The Spectral Shield does help, but listen, I don't think he's going to be able to cover all this up. And he might not have to. I think we've seen Vespa play some pretty... Uh, I wouldn't say risky, but he's using life as a resource, mm -hmm. right? He's happy to take some early damage. And even if there's a blood rot there, it doesn't mean he needs to flip that angel on that same turn. Light of Soul is a really good card to fill up the soul and uh, hopefully return some offensive pressure to Brody. Once you start dwindling life down into the same even amounts, those angels are going to help you, quote-unquote, recover for health each time. So this big thing coming in for 13 damage, it is thankfully not dominated in this case, but I don't think Vespa is going to be able to fully block it and choose to block with a red water unit. That's a premium piece of the puzzle. Take 10, right? Yeah, 9 because it's shield. Oh, yep, 9, thank you. Yep, yep. 23. It's good to help. Uh, using the Spectral Shield to block a little bit more, but that means no more breakpoint uh, defenders for this one. And critically, the Blood Rot Pox at the end of the turn. If there are any Angels hanging out at the end of Vespa's turn, that means the Blood Rot Pox damage would go ahead and knock through the ward. So Vespa has to be very considerate of doing any type of Angel flipping with the Imperial Rapture if he doesn't have Spectral Shields to eat up the Blood Rot Pox damage, or the Angels are going to fall upon the sickness in front of Prism saying, no, 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 I got you. Yeah, Azalea's win condition here. What Brody needs to be able to do really is keep that Dom train going. You got to keep dominating. You, you got to keep making uh, making stuff happen. And unfortunately for Vespa, that is a blue water unit herald on top of the deck. So not being able to find a figment. He would have loved to find maybe a figment of triumph this turn just to make sure that the heralds can go through. Uh, but this travel triumph by itself, 
Yeah, it's still pretty solid. Yeah, it does the same effect, only on the single chain link, but can be coming in for seven, does have Phantasm, but upon hit, gets another card into the soul and gets to grab the first figment of the game here. Yeah. But soul looking a little light. It's why you saw him grimace just a bit upon seeing that the Light of Soul did not hit. Needs to find some more ways to get cards into the soul to really power up the angels and make this deck start to move. Absolutely, and only the Yellow Herald tenacity in hand. This also means that if he finds a figment from this turn and places it on a battlefield, he can't safely use the Imperial Rapture to flip it up. Because there's just no way that the Blood Rump Hawks is going to be able to yeah. uh, be paid for. Without a doubt. Seven damage coming in. This is seven go again as well. So, um, yeah. you know, the good thing is that Brody, um, uh, Brody has that Seek and Destroy trigger as well yeah. that he has to think about. So it's very likely that that Vespa is going to have to just full send another Herald from that arsenal. We know it's a War Tune Herald Blue inside of it. And that's okay for four because that Frailty token is still in effect. Let's see what the... Grab is here for Vespa. If you want to grab the Herald of Area Edition, you can, of course, you can order the Seek and Destroy trigger and the Ponder trigger, or how does it work? Because it's not, because it's inertia. Is it different with inertia and a Ponder trigger versus like a Seek and Destroy and a Ponder trigger? Uh, yeah, it works exactly the same, the same way. Same thing. Okay, cool. The, the player gets to decide. So if he finds the Erudition now, you're right, Sam. What an, I love you the way your mind looks, my <laughs> friend. Like, if you find the Erudition as he did right now, you're able to put the Seek and Destroy trigger on the stack first, let that resolve and then ponder to refill your arsenal. Well, let's be very clear. You know, a lot of my knowledge about this game comes from watching and listening to to my more experienced co-casters like Rhea Adams. Who has, Rhea Adams, uh, of course. That's I've crazy. Watched a fair amount of her games and watched a bunch of her YouTube videos, let me tell you. <laughs> this is now the ponder going to be created off of the figment of Erudition now. And this is really good because he's going to be able to maybe fish for a blue here to stop the Blood Rock Pox token as well. Pitching that Herald of Tenacity yellow and then saying, yep, uh, I don't mind going to No Soul. I'm going to get a ton of soul this game. So let's try to find a blue and see if we could make magic happen. And I, you want a one blue? How's two and one of them being a Pierce Reality? Wow, a Pierce Reality that you can play off of the go again here because there are two yellows in the pitch. It's pretty darn good for Vespa. Going to be able to get rid of the Blood, blood Rot Pots. Now the question is, is, is the Seek and Destroy still going to go ahead and... It'll clear out the blue herald in the arsenal. Yes. And then you can let the ponder token trigger and just go ahead, which perhaps might be okay getting rid of that blue herald in the arsenal. Hey, man. Like, this blue herald in the arsenal is coming for four this turn. I think there's so much better EV plays here. Like, you're smacking that Pierce Reality on the table. If Brody was trying to block seven, try blocking nine <laughs> on each turn. Yeah, it looks like he might just be throwing it down. Wow. Go this one won't That's have the go again. He is going to go ahead and pitch the Angelic Wrath and then just pitch the Pierce Reality most likely away. Or maybe he's going to keep the Pierce Reality, just take the... Oh, no, because then the then the our angel will die to the blood rot posh damage. We're gonna have to see what Vespa is cooking up here, folks. Because he he's undefeated. He knows what he's doing in this deck. They've already played once. It's been a little, I think, clunkier than we've seen. A lot of Vespa games have come out. He's come out so strong. Yeah. The turn zero light of soul, grabbing a herald, going from there. These are the type of plays that Vespa has been making throughout the tournament. Things are a little clunkier here. And this is now four five more damage, and if it hits, another figment is gonna come in. Yeah, it's four more damage because of the frailty oh, token frailty, thank you, playing yes. from Arsenal. But maybe just maybe, Vespa's thinking, I could just pitch this uh, PS reality to, to protect the angels. Oh, yeah, well, 100%. At this like, point, he's definitely, I mean, he, you have to imagine he's not going to just let the angel die. So keeping the, you know, keeping the resources around does make a lot of sense if you're wanting to make sure you get rid of the blood rot pox. Yeah, the plus two damage here. Uh, maybe Vespa's thinking it's not super relevant or being able to find another figment here could be even more advantageous. And getting another card in your soul for the Soraya if it is able to stick around. Now you're Always. not gonna have you're not gonna have an arsenal, you're not gonna have any spectral shield, so all the defense is gonna be pretty face up against a five card hand from Azalea that very well might be trying to do some huge dominate damage. So gonna have to be able to see if that Archangel can stay around. But if it does, it will be able to, of course, utilize that soul nicely, draw two more cards. Yep. So this Herald Protection is coming in. Uh probably just negate a little bit. Uh, you, you can save one Spectral Shield in this case if you're letting the Soraya die. And if you are just pitching the Pierce Reality to stop the Blood Rock Pox, well, suddenly you're Ward 5. Nice try to dominate me, friend. True. 
Yeah, and you know, you could just find anything off the top of your deck from this Ponder token. So I think Vespa's still contemplating, uh, do I want this Spectral Shield or are there better plays? I mean, he's running a full suite of, of angels because each of them represent four health. The Figments come very, very powerful in this matchup, especially with the Rapture just giving you free four value every single turn. So yep, here we go. Uh, definitely deciding Peril, a uh, Figment of Protection being the figment of choice. Getting that spectral shield. Nice. This is a, a point. This was a pretty big turn. It was 7-4 into 4, right? So just a 15 damage swing uh, on the same turn with a, what, 5 extra value behind on the Ward 4 and Spectral Shield? <laughs> it's pretty nice. Seems pretty good. I can see why you've uh, decided to buy out some of the Prism cards. Well, well it's, actually pre it's actually pretty funny because I just I wanted to play the deck because I was like, dude, this deck does so many weird things. And I've just really realized I like to do weird, more implied value than just the numbers game. And that that is pretty fun for me. And just I wanted to try it out. I've never played the True Illusionist. Then all of a sudden, I've been, I was telling people that as yeah, I was coming into the tournament. It looks like they're going ahead and just making sure that, you know, it's coming in for the right amount of damage. Um, but... After I after I came with all those cards, all of a sudden prison's doing really well. I'm feeling like a bit of an oracle. <laughs> yes, and I think I'm going to follow you on this one. Uh, Prism probably going to storm up some of these are uh, pro quests in the next season, and it looks like he will pay for the blood rot pox, uh, making sure that Soraya lives to protect him for more health than necessary. And the plunder grabs an arc light sentinel. Like come on, right come on. That what an incredible huge. draw off the ponder. Come on, this is huge. Vespa on a roll. He has seen two of his blues that he just drew up this turn. So that could be um, a little bit scary because the deck doesn't run that many blues. Yeah, we'll have to see if he can find two blues to pitch into an arc light sentinel when Brody has kept so many cards. Oh, he does? He has two blues, so he could, he can, if, if Brody flies a little too close to the sun, the Arclight Sentinel can stop the turn, and then the Soraya, because he has the card in soul, can draw two more cards. We're thinking like, oh, that Pierce Reality is such a slam dunk play, and Vespa's showing us why he's undefeated here at the Calling in Phuket, putting himself in such a powerful position. Gonna be Rain Razors from the Arsenal, revealed off the Skullbone Cross Wrap activation, so now Brody heading deep into the tank. Now that the Opt is in the middle of being resolved, this is, if you've ever watched Brody play Azalea, this is where he spent the majority of his turns. Oh, finishing his opt resolution, flicking his cards back and forth, and deciding exactly how he wants the turn to go. Because even though he's taken all that damage, he did not know exactly what this turn was going to look like. Because he didn't know what card was on the top of his deck until he starts the turn here with the Skullbone Cross Wrap. And this is a pretty big turn, honestly. There's so many options for Brody to play with. Not enough pumps, but there is a Codex there. And if that's played out, well, you can bet your bottom dollar that that ALS is flying out. <laughs> Have you ever seen Brody play Kano? Have I ever seen Brody play Kano? No, I've seen the meme where he's like staring up like, what is this? And from, I think I think it might have been a trip to the APEC region, maybe even calling Singapore. I, I, I've seen the meme, but I haven't seen him actually play, play the <laughs> That would be so funny. Le opting to choose uh, the Skull Bone Cross Wraps and leaving the card on top here, using the Death Dealer off the Tunic. This is going to be huge. And the question is, now Vespa's in a bit of a, of a weird spot. If you play the Arclight Sentinel now, you're still going to be able to take six, and the Surayo will die as part of that process. I think the only time he had a chance of like playing that ALS Four. is to was was when the Death Dealer trigger was on the stack. Yeah, absolutely. Because once you allow the Death Dealer to, resol to resolve, you don't have priority again until uh, the That's active player makes a game action. The active player Brody made the game action. Attack with the Bolton shot. So now we are past that window. We're going to see exactly how Vespa wants to deal with this attack. That Arc Light Sentinel can hang out in the arsenal for quite some time unless there's something like a Seek and Destroy mm -hmm. or uh, Inertia effect coming through. And we know that these decks, that's part of what makes them so strong. The disruption of the on hits beyond just the damage. Absolutely. Well, now the interesting part is that um, there is no snap. There are no s bull tie bracers at the moment. So this six that's coming through, right. if blocked... Oh, that would that would be the end of the turn. Well, except oh. for the Codex of Frailty, but that would of course cause a discard and not as an, exactly. not as impactful. But Codex, it, you know, it, it could still do a bunch of stuff in this case. Um, interestingly enough, uh, in this scenario, I would say Vespa's not necessarily in the driver's seat. There's so many plays, and with like three cards in Brody's hand, there's still so many things that he could do. He hasn't played the read the glide path yet. So even with the codex, he could still activate Azalea in the previous on, on the later turn. On, on the later part of this turn, off the read the glide path and finding an arrow on top of the deck. Brody gonna go ahead and ask the judge a quick question about either the cards or the matchup or making sure he understands what's going on in a certain aspect. Heading away from the table to do so.
Now going to be at this attack for six. Going to hang out on the combat chain for a moment. So, you say Prism not necessarily in the driver's seat. What do you think that has to happen for the Prism to kind of retake control of this game? Or for Azalea, how do you keep the pressure on and get to the finish line? This is exactly what Brody wants to do at the moment. Setting these goal wide attacks and also like kind of like pump faking in a sort of way, this these Bolden shots leave very few priority windows um, for Prism to get extra value out of the Arc Light Sentinel. Normally, if you see like one or two pumps, you'll have like, okay, pause right there. I'm going to waste those two pumps and use this ALS. It's a one for two card trade. But interestingly enough, I think if Vespa choose to tank some damage here and play the ALS on his turn, that could be huge. Oh, that's true. Then you draw up with the four cards, still have the card and soul. You most likely lose the Soraya in the process. And it did seem like he took the line last turn kind of to maximize the value of the two card draw off of the Archangel of Erudition. So if we look at, let's just analyze Vespa's hand real quick here, right? Two blues, two yellows, and we have a... a two sorry, reds, I think, maybe. Two reds and a, and two blues? Was that was that it? Oh, if it's two reds, it... Whoa. Wait, what, what happened, happened to, to the blue? blue? Okay. Not sure what happened there. Maybe we just we, we could, could, could have literally just thought it was a blue <laughs> when it wasn't, but it certainly looked like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought I saw another, like, um, Angelic Wrath early on, but I, I could be mistaken about maybe that. Maybe that was his pitch deck? Oh, maybe that was his pitch. It totally might have been his pitch. Yeah, we he did pitch in Angelic Wrath. And the Pierce Reality. And the Pierce Reality. <laughs> okay, so okay. scratch everything after hello. Let's just go back to the start of the game. Hey, How's so that sound? I'm Elliot Tan. This hey, is Sam. Yeah, I'm Sam. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a pleasure to meet you guys. Um, what's this game called? <laughs> yeah, I think we're playing Flesh and Blood. Flesh and Blood? Yeah, it yeah. Is, it has both? It's not or blood, it's just oh, and okay, blood. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is actually a. Let's, let's look at this hand real quick while we are. Um, while we're looking at, at what's going on. Okay. This hand has no go again. Okay. So actually, there's a lot of time for him to block in this round, right? Yeah, and then on a turn that Brody is posturing like he wanted to do a big turn, maybe you are in your best position to try to just utilize your cards on defense. But of course, Soraya, a card that you'd really like to get the value out of. Yeah, and that Arc like Sentinel in Arsenal is going to cost him all the cards in his hand to play. Not a position you want to be in if you're Vespa at this moment. So not being in the driver's seat, well, he's in the back seat at the moment, my friend. Brody hitting us with a bit of the fake out, coming back to the table, but looks like uh, requiring or, you know, just choosing to talk to the head judge, something con conferring about whatever uh, the, the question is here. Yeah, well, the way I look and analyze Vespa's hand at the moment, it feels like you could definitely try to block this one out. Blocking the six here is still pretty decent. You have that five health buffer on the board, and even if Brody were to throw out that Codex of Frailty, at best, it's coming for seven, right? You, you, I mean, it's like a zero cost arrow, probably, plus the current pump in hand for three. Yeah, you could, you could still stave off that turn, even though, yeah, in the process, Soraya will be destroyed. But hey, there are worse positions to be in if you're Vespa at this point in time. Yeah, this is a tough kind of position, you have to imagine, for our Prism player here because you, you block out this turn, but then you leave Brody with a lot of the agency and a lot of the tempo. However, that Arclight Sentinel might have something to say about the whole notion of tempo. Yeah, that's that's the beautiful thing and also the scary thing about Arclight Sentinel, right? As as far as I'm concerned, Arclight Sentinel is one of those cards that it costs six for a very, very important reason. You need to be able to trade cards in hand Prism is traditionally a very yellow heavy deck. So trading four cards to get a time skip effect, mm -hmm. I think that's usually what people consider fair. It's only when Prism goes on those combo turns with Vestige of Soul, and in this matchup, he doesn't have access to that. Yeah. He has to hard cast this every single time. Vestige is not going to help him. He's probably not even running the Genesis um, in, this, in this matchup as yeah. well, because it's... So um, while this match is still in its early days, I've just gotten confirmation that Pudding has beaten Ang Chu Hang. Sending Katsu straight into the finals. Ethan, I just want to say uh, for you in the back, uh, my prediction is still ongoing. I need a drink. Someone uh, someone buy me a beer. <laughs> a at the lottery end of ticket, bro. That's what you need. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I don't think there are any casinos in Thailand, but uh, if there was, I'm hitting one of them. Now later. that means it's looking like we're going to have a Katsu in the finals of the calling Phuket. 
But before we can see who Pudding's opponent will be, we have to deal with this bolt and shot for six. Two heralds have been placed in front of it, so this one's going to get blocked out. Yeah, and I, I think what Vespa can do here is also block the next one with the third red herald in his hand. Just play a, a Pierce Reality. I think that's not too bad. Or was it a Passing Mirage? One of the lures. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, 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 it's the Passing Mirage. Yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, it's tough for Vespa given that you, know, you put in a bunch of work to maximize the potential value off the Archangel of Erudition. But listen... Uh, Brody had a five-card hand and a lot of a lot of you know a lot of agency, and without the blues for Vespa, can't do anything about that with the Arclight Sentinel. So sometimes you just gotta accept, take your licks, place down the Passing Mirage, and pivot into a different style of game plan for the next turn cycle. Yeah, one of the things about the Azelio deck that I want to point out from the earlier turns is we've seen a lot of clumped hands, a lot of like big arrow yeah. hands, a lot of codexes and stuck inside. What that signals to me is that within this first cycle, there might be a chance that. There's an NAA stack just like all oh, together. Yeah. That's the thing about when it's like kind of like playing Rune Lead. The more you see it, and when those attacks and non attacks come together, it's it's quite disastrous at times. Uh, but the read the Glide Path here, extremely useful. Not getting the reload value off of um, the Bolton shot is pretty huge. What Vesper doesn't know is that there's a Codex of Frailty coming his way. Read the Glide Path, gonna get plus three, of course. Brody gonna go ahead and looks like leave the card on top. Oh, leaving the card on top is a very big tell in this case, because once he plays that Codex, okay. you could actually see a dominated attack. Um, Brody here has to get through eight points of, of, uh, of damage to even tickle Vespa at this point in time. Uh, one card blocked from hand and five ward in the table uh, okay. is a very different monster. So this is okay. this is probably um, a coming and facing. Oh, okay. Never mind, he had another lace. So in total, we are coming in for what could possibly be 10 damage this turn. And now looking here, the lace with inertia sitting on the combat chain. This is going to be a big old attack. 3 plus 3 plus 4 is 10 damage. The spectral shield and the Soraya can block 5, but you're going to have to put the other two cards in front of it if you don't want to lo you lose your Arclight Sentinel. That's right. The Lace with Inertia here, just a devastating card for Vespa to stare down. There are a couple of options that you can do here, but I don't think many of them get through a 10 damage turn. You have what? You might have to give up the footsteps here if you really want to Oh, Rain Razors, this is for 12. Oh, this is for 12. My goodness, how could I have forgotten that one? No matter what Vespa does, this Arc Light Sentinel is going to it's the bottom gone. of the deck. Yeah, it's gone. Well, I'll well, what I will say, and this is kind of just to balance out the matchup and to not skew it too much, is that Prism shuffles the deck a lot. It doesn't matter if it goes to the bottom of the deck. Every time your Herald hits, you're getting a Figment, you're shuffling the deck. It's kind of like every time Katsu tutors, you're not worried about a blue clump at the bottom of the deck. Sure, the only problem with it is it's no longer in the arsenal for Vespa here, right? Yeah. Where where this game has been really slanted towards Brody, able to keep the pressure on and keep up a kind of applying the te or, you know, keeping the tempo in his favor. So here, having to take the damage and lose the Arclight Sentinel, I wonder if he's going to, you know, utilize the life as the resource a little more and try to establish the Passing Mirage, knowing that that Arclight Sentinel is headed to the bottom of the deck, thanks to the Inertia Token that we know it's going to hit. I don't think Vespa has much choice at this point in time. He'll... <gasps> Wait <laughs> a minute. It's time it's for time. the Halo of Illumination to have something to say. We're going to go ahead and put the Herald of Triumph in. It looks like it might be time to go ahead and grab maybe another Figment here and draw a card, keeping the Arclight Sentinel around by utilizing a bunch of Ward, perhaps? Yeah, maybe. I think that's such a risky, risky play. I mean, you're going to protect... Um, the Herald's on your turn, and you're going to try to search for like one of these figments to come in. But at the same time, at the same time, I mean, you protect the Arc Light Sentinel, but you're still losing a ton of cards from this. And the Halo will yeah. not protect you on the, pre on the next turn. Yeah, I mean, this, it, it, if this is the play, that, that means it, it, it just goes to show how much Vespa values Arc Light Sentinel in the matchup, right? Yeah. Clearly knowing that it can do so much to stop an Azalea's turn, non-attack action, non-attack action. You are trying to resolve the arrow in your arsenal, and the Arc Light Sentinel just completely stops the turn. But Vespa here, I'm very curious. It's going to be the Arc, the Figment of War coming down, going to make a Courage token. And with the two floating, you have to imagine it might just be pumped into the angel as well. Oh, uh, the, it actually is free thanks to... No, no, the angel has to hit for it to be the no, free for the Imperial. And it's only free in your turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, that's, the, that's why the two floating is going to, you know, shore up the cost there 
turning on four more ward, and then if we block with the Herald of Erudition that uh, Vespa was able to draw off of the Halo. That's 12. That's, that's, that's enough. That's nine on the board and three in hand. Wow. Vespa showing a masterclass in thinking, this is what it can do to prevent 12 damage. Think about that. Brody jumped through so many hoops to present this 12, and Vespa says, I can do acrobatics too, my friend. <laughs> yeah, and Brody probably also going to be keeping a, a hot eye on that arsenal. Like, man, you really wanted to keep that around. Brody might be starting to sniff out a bit. I think I have to be considering Arclight Sentinel in my future plans for the next turns of this game until I, you know, until I'm for, for sure safe. Yeah, the cool thing is that... Um, Vespa using to find Figment of War, one of the less relevant Figments um, in this matchup, and just using it for straight up four health. So the Halo essentially became like a seven. Does the does the War make a Courage token? It does make a Courage token. Where is the Courage token? Yeah, I think I think they missed out on the Courage token oh, here. Oh no! Uh, in the meantime, it is a mandatory trigger, so they might be able to uh, reverse that. But uh, in the meantime, uh, Vespa just drawing up and uh, and let's look at his hand. He's got that two blues, but also a figment of judgment at the same time. Brody showing that seek and destroy at the start. We can't really see his hand in the meantime, but he's opting that one card from the cross, uh, the skullbone cross reps. I keep calling it skull reps for whatever reason, but yeah, the skullbone cross reps really be really strong here. I think they might ask you to keep it on so that. Oh, okay. Okay, the Seek and Destroy. Once again, another inertia-like effect that is going to threaten the Outline Sentinel, but uh, Vespa's ready. He's got a good hand. He's got a, a Yellow Herald, a Figment of Judgment, which can pitch on the next turn. He's got two blues. This is going to feel really, really good. Yeah, see if the Arclight Sentinel is the play, depending on exactly how Brody wants to sculpt the hand. He has been able to keep the pressure on, but all of the ward that Vespa has been able to deploy, keeping his life total at 23, only has lost 9 health so far in the game. And yeah. Brody has taken a couple big licks from some Heralds, already down to 25 himself. This is the semifinals of the calling, even though these players have been kind of sitting at these left totals for a long time, you know, uh, in, 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 in the real world. In game, we've only gone through a couple of turns. So it's been kind of moving hot and heavy through here. Yeah, just turn four. <laughs> Literally, we are just at turn four. Do you hear um, that the other match concluded? Yeah. 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 Oh, without a doubt. <laughs> without a doubt. Of course. And we, and, and we knew that. It was, it was KO versus Katsu. Naturally, that was going to be the game that finishes first. <laughs> so we are, three, uh, we are two Heralds, uh, two Archangels down within this matchup. Uh, with the Herald of Judge, the, oh my goodness, I can't say Herald of Judge, but with the Figment of Judgment in Vespa's hand, we can assume that he's running the full Figment package minus Tenacity. So that's seven pieces of Ward 4 that Brody has to worry about throughout this entire game. Well, at the same time, uh, every time he sends a Herald, that's one of the most efficient plays you can go for. <laughs> I love that Vespa has a cup of tea on the yeah, side. Yeah, I know. He's a little iced coffee or something. Yeah. Just like Great advice, whoever told him to get an iced tea on the side. Four cards in hand here for both players in the middle of the Skullbone cross wrap, opting, checking in with the judges. Again, we're going to have to see if Brody is able to really continue to push and pressure Prism, or if the Arclight Sentinel is going to stop him in its tracks. This is... I mean, this is kind of really what it all comes down to. Pr Prism needs to go ahead and buy some breathing room. You've already activated your Halo, so the kind of one quote-unquote yeah, no, spike wrong. turn you know? is is uh, is is, sure. is over from this point. Yeah, I mean, once we're at this stage, once we're at this stage, uh, I have every single already. every I single to put it in. like play yeah. counts, that's, right? You need to get these more, margins. I, I bet that's what this is. Yeah, the player's sniffing it out. I bet you this is about the Courage token from the Figment of War. They're trying to figure out how to resolve the missed trigger, I have to imagine. So for those of us at home and those of us hanging out here, what should we talk about? <laughs> I just like the art of Skullbone cross wrap. Just real quick, yeah. real shout yeah. out here. Um, I don't see where the Skullbone part is, honestly. It kind well, of it covers your Skullbone. Oh, you know, it's a cross. It yeah. wraps across your yeah, skull your, bone. Your skull bone, which is, I think, the the scientific term. Oh, for that's your just skull. skull. No, it's skull bone. It's a skull bone. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I see, I see, I see. Um, so, I, I, I do. Yeah, I think that that art is beautiful. I like all. It's almost like they're like sensors on the front. They're like 
some kind of like infrared. Infrared. Also, also like just some, I like you know that that ranger. Who's who's that homie? It looks like old him inside. I'm not gonna lie. No, it does not look like <laughs> old him. It looks like like it's just a white bearded guy. Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Ranger Coming equipment. Out, yeah. yeah. Flesh and Blood, one of the few card games where an angel is fighting a ranger with arrows. Oh, absolutely. I, 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 I will say, it is one of my favorite things about this game is how much it really feels like the, the two heroes and the two classes are battling it out. You knock a huge arrow, you go ahead and throw it against the, the archangels who are trying to swoop down and protect Prism as the angels, you know, are, are being popped by the phantasm attacks. The arrows are shooting through them and exploding feathers all over the sky. It, it, my, my imagination runs wild. No, I, I absolutely love I have that same thing. Sometimes I'll dream about it. Especially when um, we're just sending auras for 111 and spectral shields. Yeah, that feels like such a slam dunk. Nothing, right? I mean, it's not epic, the games there, because I just... Huh? Because you're supposed to remember it yourself. Resolve like they're going to go ahead and resolve the ruling here. Yeah, they're looking to try to fix the game state, and I think there's just a, f a little bit of um, up and down between the judges and the players to make sure that this is okay. Yeah, their players are just going to go ahead and figure it out. Go ahead and oh. chat once again. Hey, it's all handsome faces once again. Well, oh. what about handsome faces? Oh God, look at you, look at you, look at this, look at this shirt. You got it all working together today. Yeah, Thank my you. God, you you said you want to get a drink. I'm gonna have to buy you a drink. Sheesh. <laughs> all right. So it well, is the semifinals. It is the semifinals. It's been the semifinals for a little bit. <laughs> it's been the semifinals. It's been the semifinals for a minute. Yeah, yeah. I think knowing Chu Hang. So just want to talk a little bit about our other two semifinalists. Putting Tom and Eng Chu Heng. Uh, both players have played before. They've been around the circuit in Asia, been calling Taipei, calling Singapore. They've traveled around uh, quite a fair bit, even in PTLA, where we're all there, kind of just like chilling out. Um, knowing Chu Heng, I'm just going to tell a fun story to stream right now. He's probably just sitting down at the one collectibles booth, <laughs> taking a little bit of a nap. <laughs> he loves his power naps. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big fan of the power nap? I mean, I, I don't Are you a fan of the power naps? Am I a fan of the power? I mean, you now? work at the production side, so like you know, in between scenes. Yeah, I I I can't say that I'm a. I mean, it's not that I'm not a fan. I just wouldn't say that I'm yeah, good like, at. It's like executing. a modus operandi. Basically. Yeah, I just I, I wouldn't say I'm I'm good at executing the power naps. Like, <laughs> I've, I've there have been a couple times where I've been like sitting down and like gotten really tired. You know, your your eyes get really heavy. Yeah, and, the droopy eyes. Yeah, and I've just like realized like, oh, I have an hour to kill. I can just succumb to the blessed embrace of of slumber, and and that feels better than most things I've experienced in in in, in my life. But that they've been few and far between. Few yeah. and far between. Really wish a lot of our viewers could experience what it's like over here in Phuket. So we're gonna just walk around a little bit, maybe go and see what's happening around here. Let's go take a short break right now, just a little short little intermission while they settle what's happening on this semi-final table, and we'll be right back with more flesh and blood.
All right, folks, and we are back into the game. The judge call has concluded. The trigger was missed, so no courage token here for Vespa. Brody is in the process of resolving the opt off the Skullbone crash trap. The Seek and Destroy has been revealed from the arsenal, and so now it's time for Brody to decide what does he want to do with the opt, and for Vespa to try to figure out how to stay alive in a game that is really starting to look more and more like it's in Azalea's favor. Well, as we look at Vespa's hand over here, we know, and just for a recap, there's an Alkalite Sentinel stuck in the arsenal at the moment. He used so much of that previous turn to protect the Arclight from being hit by a double Seek and Destroy. Now the question is, is he going to load? Does and he... if he lets this go, that's probably going to be straight into Vespa's face. Brody smells an Arclight sitting in that arsenal. I guess he's shuffling his cards so he doesn't know what's what. I don't... Oh, now as he plays down the premeditated, so he doesn't know which card was drawn. Interesting. So now another big pump coming down onto the field here. Yeah, Vespa allowing this and not using the ALS at this point in time. I think he's thinking, I'm going to trade 12 damage on this turn and expend everything. On my turn, it's going to be ALS. Send a, but send a Herald down your way. And I'm going to try to take Temple by losing some right in this moment. All right. And look at that. Without a second question, 13 damage taken down, 210. Ponder trigger resolves, two seek and destroys. So that arsenal and any cards left in hand for Vespa, they're not sticking around for anybody's money. Now Vespa has done it, kind of what we've seen these prison players do all weekend long. Take a bunch of damage, utilize the life as a resource, and now attempt to go ahead and really put things in their favor. I really like this play from Vespa. It shows so much gumption, right? He is going real gung-ho about this. Gonna pitch it through blue on his turn. And he has to do this. He has to take advantage of the fact that the ALS will buy him a full grip on the next turn. Um, card left in hand and two ponder. So deciding what the arsenal card is going to be is Brody. Yeah, looks like the, the ponder token over here. Um, going to be really interesting. Brody getting a choice of three cards instead of two. Um, very interesting, very interesting. Okay. Draw two more cards for Azalea here. This is the turning point potentially of this game. Going to have to see if Vespa is able to utilize the tempo gained from the potential arc like Sentinel. But first, rather than show the information of what's coming, let Brody think about a Herald of Protection first. No, absolutely. I think this is the correct play. You want to conceal as much information from your opponent as possible, especially when these sort of things, are, these sort of things happen. There is these two seeking destroy triggers on the stack that maybe Brody might, might look at him and go, hmm, maybe he's just going to play out the full hand without knowing those two cards. They could have summoned the ultimate protector in this game. Brody has to think about this Herald of Protection now. Easily enough able to be blocked by two, three blocks, but he has got to be thinking about Angelic Wraths. He's got to be thinking about ways to get over the top. We've seen a lot of... Um, We've seen a Vespa throughout this entire tournament use health as a very powerful resource. And in this case, I think he's making the right play. Going down to a low deficit. Remember, every time you find an angel or a, 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 an archangel back from your deck, you're getting four health. Mm -hmm. the, the life doesn't matter until you're dead. This is Prism we're talking about. The one hero who's like a cockroach. You can have one <laughs> health and still climb your way into victory. I don't know how you can look at that beautiful art on Herald of Protection and think it has anything to do with, with such a, with wait, such a little... Wait, those are feelers right now. I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> wait, wait, those are antennae. Uh, the Herald of Protection, such a powerful um, card. Gonna go ahead. Let's see if Brody wants to give any blocks to this. Okay. He so. does have the popper out of the arsenal, the down and dirty here. I mean, when you saw so many cards off of the ponder, it was nice to be able to find the arsenal Arsenal Popper itself in the Down and Dirty. However, Action Point's not necessary to play the Arclight Sentinel, and it is going to be the next part of the turn. Oh, Brody not happy to see that Arclight Sentinel being played. The Down and Dirty was supposed to buy him a turn. Yeah. But it looks like the tables have turned. <laughs> nice, I mean, nice for Brody that it only took one card to block not only a card in soul, but also a spectral shield. I mean, that, that that actually can't be overstated. This Arclight Sentinel is going to be annoying to deal with, but it's just going to be four cards for Vespa here, and he could have had another card in soul, another figment, and a spectral shield if Brody had wanted to let that damage through because, you know, take two cards to block is not what he was in the, you know, interested in doing. I mean, 15 health difference doesn't mean a lot when you're playing a hero that can technically regenerate life. So uh, Vespa's hand, I think, is the more interesting one at this point in time because uh, Brody... 
Oh, we can't really see his hand. But Brody doesn't have a lot to deal with. And this Herald of Erudition, it's really, really nice. The only problem is there's Perch Grapplers. Yeah, and they're still hanging out, getting ready to roll. Yeah. I'm very interested to see how this plays out. Um, interestingly, we also saw that there was a Herald Tenacity inside of Vespa's hand. So it is possible for him to send the Tenacity first to deny the trigger and then like go over the, per like, destroy the Perch Grapplers in the process. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens upon the next turn because we know what Brody's turn is going to be. It's going to be attacking into the Arclight Sentinel with the Red and the Ledger in a, in a hero that likes to do a lot of instant speed effects. These Red and the Ledgers have both gone into Spectra Auras, auras so far to start this game. Now Brody yeah. just had Arsenal up, start with the five card hand, and now it's time just for Wartoon Herald on the side of Vespa. This is six damage. If it hits, goes to Soul. Only costs one meaning that the resource floating can be put into the Phantasmal Footsteps if yet another popper is found for Mr. Spurlock. That's right. Uh, Red in the Spectra just totally destroying <laughs> the Arc Light Sentinel, giving Vespa some breathing room for a double Herald turn. Or if this Wartoon Herald hits, hey, we, gonna, we might see another Angel come on board to breathe another 4 health into Vespa. Because 6 is a lot. Um, 6 is a lot to go again. No relevant on hits except uh, maybe finding four. <laughs> no blocks. No blocks. No blocks Called. declared. No reactions. Brody's going to go down to 19, and it's time for another Prism activation. Prism going to go on the stack here as the Herald hits the soul. Let's go grab a Figment, and now critically the Empyrean Rapture as well. On line for Vespa here. Yep, Empyrean is activated. Will allow him to gain Ward 4 on the table. I, I'm really liking Vespa's chances of like clawing back into this game. This is some of the most, I think, the most back foot we've seen him in a while. Oh, absolutely. He is certainly kind of fighting for his life here in these games. Uh, in, in this game in particular, the Azalea just finding so much damage and so much pressure. And honestly, Vespa's hands have not been super cooperating. It started with the Light of Soul finding the blue on top. The first time we've seen that, I think, on coverage all weekend long. But it did you know, have have a real effect as that soul was something Vespa did have to fight for on the turn that he had the pierced reality and was thinking about the, the blood rot pox, the figment of ravages here gonna come on just to deal one arcane well, from entering the arena. This hand's gonna be really good because there is another blue um pierced reality in Vespa's hand. So we can activate the protection now to try to gain two more health mm -hmm. from um the spectral shields yeah. and then uh send a an erudition at the end of the turn threatening more cards as well as getting an arsenal. So here we go, Aegis being sent, and we're going to expend Soul. Like, Vespa has been so aggressive with using the cards in Soul in order to, you know, buffer that health lead. And suddenly, 10-18, it's looking more like 16-18. Did I bend you the Soul yet? I you did. did. You did. Because you had, you had one at the start of the turn, right? So, yeah. So, yeah, still needs to banish the Soul here for the effects. Oh, no, no, for this you need to banish again. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Love that the players are communicating about these things. You can, you can tune into them. They're keeping each other very honest in this have game. Uh, Age is coming for four. Go again. Is it this one right that hit? Yep. I have. Correct? Do it. I have that one or two so at the beginning of him. One? That was correct, yes. He can't hear us, but I'm letting him know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Vespa, okay. we're talking to you from beyond the screen. How many so I have at the beginning of him? One or two? It was one. You had one, right? Then, yeah. Yeah. It was, in fact, one. It's like the Arrested Development. Yeah. <laughs> it was one. <laughs> Ron Howard just... We're really showing our... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ron Howard just jumps on. It was one soul. It was. <laughs> and this, four damage with go again. Oh, man. That is so good. Uh, this is an Angel Aegis coming in for four go again. <laughs> uh, Brody, if he takes this, Azalea hates blocking of cards. And that's yeah. honestly very little reason for him to commit any sort of blocks in this scenario unless his hand has bricked. Uh, but what he doesn't know is that he's going to need three block uh, on and with those perch grapplers yeah, very, if anything's going to happen. Question. I promise this will be fast. Oh, another judge question, Brody. He tells us he promises it'll be fast. He promises. You can see a little smile on the face, but he's just going to go ahead and check in with the judge real quick away from the table. And we're going to hang out a little bit. And you know what we should talk about? Hey, okay, Arrested look, Development. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's be very real. I don't get a lot of time on coverage. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, you're happy. You're happy hanging out. I mean, I'm just happy to hang out with you. Honestly, I mean, the stream people, great. Thanks for all the comments and thanks for all the nice banter you've been having. I just want to hang out with you. So. Nah, my honestly, brother, my brother. Like, well, for, for those of you at home, if you've enjoyed Elliot's coverage as much as I have, go ahead and show some love in the chat for our boy because I think uh, you've, you've been doing such an incredible job. It's been so great to hear you share your expertise. And before I, you know, get too, too misty-eyed about it, we should get back into the game. Yeah, let's do this. Let's it's do time this. to see exactly how this attack is going to resolve. Does Brody want to take the four damage or present any blocks? So this is four go again. The two spectral shields on the board does mean suddenly there's a soul shield on the table, right? Blocking for an extra six without having to pay a card. This two at the very end of the resource pile for Vespa is very suspect and I'm very sure Brody is super aware that this is not the end of the turn. Yeah, I mean it is curious because the two cards drawn off the Herald of Erudition, right? You'd, you'd love to find some kind of instant speed aura, right? Because we've seen Two, it'll be two heralds that have attacked with Go again. Mm -hmm. It'll be one angel, but you don't have the ability to make another angel because Prism's already been activated. So there's how, what, what's the best use of the instant speed there? Because there won't be any action points if the Herald of Act er Erudition is what is played here. Well, because he doesn't run Vestige of Sol, this yeah. doesn't really matter. In fact, if anything... It's mostly just an arsenal. You just want an arsenal. Yeah. If you, you don't want to be drawing these instants in your next hand, right? So filtering out the two, the two cards off the top and then finding something to sink inside that arsenal is going to be so, so key. Um, the one way that Prism does lose this matchup is when you draw a bunch of figments. Right. Sure. Yeah, I, and I think that could be the worst possible decision. Or if he draws Light of Saul in this case, then, you know, that, that could be disastrous as well. His best hope is finding Arc Light Sentinel or like a Soul Shield to place in that arsenal. Oh, you know would be cool? If you draw Light of Soul and another card, you can you can pitch it into the Rapture, right? Yes. Once per turn instant and just like pitch it away, get yeah. the effect, and then you still get the arsenal because you have two cards. That'd be sick. Yeah, yes, that's the whole point of running the Empyrean Rapture here. Uh, but Brody, very astute here, trying to preserve some life. And does have the Herald of Erudition. You can see him throw his head back. He can All he can do is smile. He didn't want to play two cards to block with, but does have to think about this one now. Committed the Spire sniping to the block, but and does have... that was have a three block. That was a three block. That right? was a three block, absolutely. You can see he's not happy about this one. Yeah. And, you know, critically, that yellow Spire sniping, just in case the great library of Solana comes out, you have to imagine that's why he's brought in the yellow Spire sniping. Oh. It was anti-prism tech the whole time. <laughs> I highly doubt that, but no, 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 that's no. a great theory, it's honestly. It's definitely true. Again, right, I don't know if you heads. were here for this, but earlier in the first day, I, I let you guys know, in my rider, I'm actually not allowed to be wrong. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh. Not allowed to be wrong at all. So anything I've said that you guys might, you know, perceive as wrong, it's actually not me being wrong. He said al Gaib, my friend. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, this 5 erudition is really, really strong at the moment. Having to commit perch grapplers and another arrow is not where you want to be, and especially because Brody has already blocked with one of these arrows. Let's see, does have another three block in the hand? But it's only that endless arrow. Yeah. So when you use that, that means you're committing the other two non-attack actions, which only block for two, somewhere in that pile. Yeah, also the tunic will be on three, but no other arrows in the hand, so you're gonna really have to be worrying about the top of the deck, as well as potentially whatever is in the arsenal here. Brody really has to tank on this one just to see what the, what the outs uh. are. Like Brody was just given a little heads up from the judge. Do have to go ahead and make a game action here. Uh, Brody asking the heralds themselves for guidance. <laughs> I think he might just eat the five here, honestly. If not, there that, might not be a next turn for him to do. Yeah, that, that's uh, probably going to be a meme. I think I, I actually think uh, he. Uh, I've not, not seen Brody sweat like this in a long time, honestly. Go to, uh, I'm sorry. I will. Gotta think about this one. Is he? Does he want to commit the block or does he want to take the five? He is gonna commit the block, block the five out. He, but you can see he kind of makes the grimace on his face. Even he's not sure of the play. But now look at this. Vespa all of a sudden has the Archangel out, has the two Spectral Shields, and Brody's only got two cards to work with and a card in Arsenal. Tunic's gonna be on three. It's gonna really maybe depend on the top of the deck. Let's see the Skullpunk Crusher because that is a non-attack action in the Arsenal there. Yeah, and if that's a non-attack on top of the deck, this is gonna be a brick. Turn. It's going to go to the bottom. This might be a blind Azalea. This has to be it's a blind It's going to be a blind Azalea. Azalea. This could be a huge turning point in the game. It's oh. an Amplifying Arrow. Could that be a bit? Could there be a better pick? Well, to be very honest, Amplifying Arrow is not the best one you want to hit. At okay, the great. Okay, great. Yeah, because <laughs> because it's, a zero for, it's a zero for two at the base, and the two pumps in hand are only going to make it a zero for four, which is just an on-rate arrow with no relevant on-hits, right? So... 
You could easily. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, only because of the two pumps, he gets a plus two. No, for sure, of for sure. Because arrow's sure. Uh, effect. Um, I got excited because I haven't seen this card a lot, so I just assume it's here because it's like busted. But I do understand it's it's got a high ceiling, but often can it just be another zero for four. Because as you can see, if it's gaining any power, it's gaining that much power plus one. But because it only comes in for two, this is like a normal Bolton shot or like an endless arrow, one of those zero for four arrows that yes. Azalea but, does like to run. And it is also a zero for four. In this case, he's not using the tunic resource. He would yeah. love to hit like a five with six ward on the board. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of ways to get over this. Yeah, absolutely. Going to see this is a Lace with Blood Rot and a Premeditate as well. Going on top of the Amplifying Arrow here. Yeah, so if there's like a Soul Shield in Vespa's hand or something like that, a lot of damage will be um, like negated just from the fact that Brody is coming for 10. To be fair, 10 is a very good breakpoint at this point in time because there are no 0 for 4s. Does have another Arclight Sentinel though, does Vespa. The question is how does he want to either deploy it or try to keep a card for the Arsenal? He is only sitting at 10 even though there is a lot of implied life on the Spectral Shields and the Ward. Yeah, I think Vespa's considering here, do I just drop everything here to play the Arclight Sentinel? It would deny so much on this turn. It would deny so much on the turn. It would leave Brody with just a 4 card hand. No Arsenal. No perch grapplers, no like uh, ponder or blood rot. Yeah. That, this could be a huge one. Oh, so you get ponder and that's how Yeah, so you can hear Vespa saying right now, oh, you can ponder this. Yeah. And uh, I think Vespa is very, ha like, he's in a very precarious spot. Attacking 410, threatening the blood rot, threatening the ponder. And no easy way to block out an additional four here. Brody, the blind Azalea, just getting that margin in to try to close out this game. Three, six, and then plus the Angel would be ten. Deny the Ponder, deny the Blood Rot. The Blood Rot, you know, go, goes a long way to eating through those ward pieces as well. Yeah, and ten dominate here is actually really, really scary. Oh, wait, yeah, it has dominate. It has dominate, that is correct. Let's see. Yeah, it's it. Uh, dominate from Azalea. Yeah, Vespa has to take a moment to remember it. This was off of the blind Azalea here. That was the Hail Mary oh, that Brody need Spurlock needed. That's my fault. Yeah, no. Sorry. Ten damage with dominate off of the blind Azalea from Brody, Brody Spurlock has come all the way to Phuket. Barely made it in time, getting it at yeah. after 10 p.m. on the day before the tournament. Without knowing, I think Vespa assumed that it wasn't dominated earlier yeah. on and missed the trigger to play the ALS. I don't know that it dominated. Yeah, tough because it doesn't know about the dominate, but it is just how the Azalea ability works, right? Like, once you saw it come in off of the... Yeah, I think this is gonna. This might be one of those things which caught him off guard with this board state, not remembering that the amplifying arrow is on a, uh, that the amplifying arrow is on a dominate trigger from Azalea itself. So let's see. We are able to just shore all this up with one three block. That'll block three, four, five. Oh no, nine. Yeah. So he's gonna leak that one damage, but even more so. There's a ponder yeah, and, and there's a blood, blood rot. rot. It's huge here for Brody, able to get that damage through. Just the one able to sneak over, and that is a massive blow for the prism here. Going to get the ponder, which is going to go ahead and put another card into the arsenal. You can yeah. see this has been a long game for both of these players. Yeah, there is a certain kind of mental fortitude and gymnastics that you need in order to play this matchup. But Brody, looking like he's in a I very, very good spot. Time for a Herald of Protection coming down. This is going to be technically having the go again, thanks to the yellow in the pitch. Do you think it's an Arclight Sentinel in the hand there? So all of that ward that Vespa worked so hard to get on the field, just taken down by the blind Azalea there from Brody. Two damage will be taken down. Vespa 2-7 at the end of this turn, and no soul yet. Need something like a soul shield to turn that figment of ravages into something that can also ward again. However, the Herald of Protection, unless there is a popper in the hand, is going to make a spectral shield token and head to soul as well. So this is still a threatening attack. Yes. I mean, 
all, not all hope is lost for the hometown hero Vespa over here. Herald Protection worth about 8 points of value if it hits. Getting a Spectral Shield, searching for Figment, turning up the Ravages can be huge, but the Blood Rot Pox also going to prevent him from just like straight up flipping it. Yeah, that is so tough because you'd like to be able to flip something with the free ability from the Rapture, but the Blood Rot Pox would just eat through that ward immediately. Not something, not the position where you'd like to be. Yeah, and this, I, th I think this Arc Light Sentinel is still stuck in Vespa's hand. Yeah, so we'll be heading to the Arsenal, so that is another way to try to go ahead and buy back some tempo, but... Sometimes it's hard to, to actually be able to get it off. You need to draw the blues, and the deck runs a whole lot of yellows to, you know, make uh, the seen engine go. a lot go. of blues already, yeah. Uh, but the good part about this is that, like I was saying, Prism's ability just shuffles cards over and over again. So your blues are being recycled. Yeah, and They're not always stuck at the bottom of the deck. All right, please speak the I'll take uh, something out of 10. Right. So Brody opting here to go all the way down. This might actually be some extra room for uh, Vespa to breathe. Brody has seen two Arc Light Sentinels. He's not expecting a third. Not expecting a third, and it could be absolutely massive on this turn. Already has a Spectral Shield now, able to go ahead and grab another Figment. The Blood Rot Pox is going to deal two more damage. Well, it will do one at the end oh, of the Oh, true, because of the Spectral. Because of the Spectral yep, Shield, yep, yep. and that is actually massive. Uh, I'm, oh, man. Vespa has such a tough choice here. He can do one of two things. He can either flip this Judgment just to eat that Blood Rot Pox, or he can just leave it on the table because there is no relevant effect on this Figment at the moment. Yeah, but you have to imagine it might be nicer to save it to actually block a total of four with the ward, right? You don't want to let it die to that Blood Rot Pox. So the Spectral Shield... Well, it looks he, like he's nope. flipping it. He is just going to flip it. Keep the Spectral Shield around, it looks like. And, yeah, it looks like that might be the play. Or unless he's just going to go ahead and attack for another four. I think he's going he's gonna to go to the end of the turn trigger the Blood Rot Pops, and then kill off this Herald of Judgment. Just wow. saving that two life. Yeah, saving saving the life and also keeping a Spectral Shield around for a break point. So no more soul, but an Arc Light Sentinel in the graveyard. Let's see if that's going to... Not in the graveyard, excuse me, in the arsenal. Let's see if that's going to be enough here for Vespa. There's two a no blues. block in the hand. Two blues. But one of them is a blue, and there is a Passing Mirage as well, or spe uh, a Pierce Reality as well. Yes, this... It all comes down to this 9 and 10. What a grind of a match we've had so far. Playing out the ALS, not wasting any time. We're yeah. not we're not stopping. We're, we need to stem the bleeding right away. Brody, that yeah. face of looking at three ALSs has just been absolutely devastating. What is Vespa going to be able to string together now that the turn will ostensibly be over for Brody? Only two cards left in hand. I, I don't quite remember exactly what they both are, but it most likely will be a Herald coming down. Let's see if that will be enough here for Vespa to go ahead and take a little more control of this game because this is the last time the Arc Light Sentinel is really going to be relevant for some time. A lot of the non-attack actions have been used, such as Read the Glide Path, already used up. So every single time that he wants to opt, Brody's options are getting fewer and fewer. That's just how the gas of the Azalea deck works. We go ahead and resolve the opt here. Bottom. Okay. Gonna go to the bottom. Brody does have the ability to do some, you know, kind of, you know, op he has some optionality on the turn still. It's not like... He's playing a deck that is just chock full of things that he can see and do, using the crossbones first, then using the, and using the spire sniping on top of that, layering the effect, and then being able to up one of those cards down. A lot of effects that Brody would have liked to use to send damage at Prism's face here, but instead all going to be soaked up by that Arc Light Sentinel. Yeah, this is so, so clutch at the moment. Both these players are still are still going to be able to make it, right? You can't count either of them out of this fight. It is neck to neck. Oh, the absolutely. closest Prism has ever seen. This is a matchup that many were considering highly favored for our Prism here, but it's been a little clunky. That huge dominate off the top for Brody did a lot of work. We're just going to go ahead and grab a sleep dart here. That would be great into the matchup. We're going to go ahead and give it a... Aim counter just to get in more cards out of the hand. We're trying to filter the cards, right, just to make sure that Brody gets the arsenal that he wants, isn't left with a card in hand, and finds four fresh new cards off the top at the end of the turn. And what is this turn going to look like from Vespa? It would have been a sick turn if yeah. not for the Arc Light Sentinel. There was a knock the death whistle a so, and, and a, a pre-pump to find the right card as well. Uh, just, just an insane level of play that's going on here. 
think Brody thinking about like how to pitch stack at the moment before we move yeah, on to Vesper's turn. What card is going to go on top? What card is going to go on the bottom? In case we get there, I have to imagine it might be tough. Okay. Uh... All right, Brody passing the turn, drawing up to four. Vespa only with one option. Here is sending Herald of Triumph for six. Six, and it cannot be blocked with a six power popper. And if it hits, we can go ahead and grab a figment. And then the Empyrean Rapture is, Rapture is probably going to turn it into four more ward. Yeah, two down and dirties have already been shown. If that's another one in Arsenal, this could be terrible. Yeah, absolutely. Because you don't want it to be stuck in the Arsenal there. Yeah, that is one of the things which uh, could essentially make you need to blind Azalea in that moment just to get rid of the down and dirty in Arsenal. Yeah. Or just, you know, if you want to block it out, but that plus one of your other one block equipments and a, and a three block from the hand. Blocking Let's... two from Arsenal and then just like uh... taking the taking the rest of the damage still feels pretty darn bad. And I look, <sighs> there's the third down and thir dirty. Dirty right in the in hand. hand. Yeah, it's just oh. going to go ahead with another uh, three block and the Skullbone cross wrap, kind of like we just said. It's going to go ahead. Blocking six over here. Okay, I, I, okay. It sounded like you said make a play, and I made a play, so I'm confused why there's a warning. Generally, you need to increase your pace. Dependent on me to keep Judges here just talking about making sure the rate of play is maintained. Let's go ahead and continue the turn from here. We're blocking out this Herald. The second warning upgrades or the four players? No, this is just Which one? Which one upgrade? Yeah, yeah. 100%. 100%. Can you go ahead and make this block here? So it looks like the blocks have been done, and we're passing on the turn back to Brody. I'm not, I'm not. So Brody left with like the, the two card hand and the arsenal, preventing that soul. That's actually a very important part of this of this matchup so far. Now that Vespa is empty, he can't just activate the the figment of ravages uh, on Brody's turn in order to gain that four ward. Uh, just a key critical play. And now that Brody knows that there are no more arc like Sentinels that he needs to deal with, uh, it's all face-up play from now on. Two take aims. Well, one, oh. Yeah, yeah resolves. Uh, Gonna go ahead and now just play out a Codex of Frailty. This is absolutely painful. Yeah. And I think we might be able to smell blood in the water at this point in time. Yeah, because this is now going to rip a card from Vespa's hand as well. He's going to go ahead and check the graveyard, see what are the potential attack actions that I have to think about, but these cards are going to come through and threaten a whole lot of damage for Brody. Yeah, the good thing about this Codex of Frailty in, in a very weird way, I say good, but I don't really mean that good, is that you can take like a one-cost Herald, right? A lot of the times, you have only like a couple of red uh, one-cost Heralds, like the three war teams. Uh, in this case, placing an Arsenal and just saving for a different turn could still be fine, as long as... Like I said, the the winning um, play from Azalea here is just like Dom Train. Okay. All right, going to go ahead and grab a Fatigue Shot. Yes. Going to go ahead and take a look. That one is going to go ahead and have the attack of the attack that is played from Prison Side along once that the Fatigue Shot has hit. Yes, and this is like 11 damage to be presented on the board, but Vespa is going to go down one card from here. Absolutely. And that is not a, a solid place to be in. Once you reach a certain life total, well, the prison player just doesn't have that buffer to set up some two like phantasm attacks each turn. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm waiting for him. Uh, you shoot that one, right? Okay. What? Well, I mean, I it again. Yeah, I, I gave it to him because he's shooting. Gonna go ahead and see exactly what Vespa wants to grab out of the arsenal, and of course, because the codex, it will also have to. The codex will discard a card from Vespa's hand as well. This is five. Five. Yep. Just I think Vespa's just doing the calculations on what, how much damage he can afford to take this turn, and whether or not, oh, you know, there's a good card to take from the arsenal as a result of this. The clock is ticking. For yeah. Vespa, I mean, figuratively, not <laughs> literally. I mean, and, and a little bit of both here. Both players are at 10 slash, you know, 9. Kind of both players basically at 10 because of the Spectral Shield there for Vespa. So it's all coming down to these final turns. We have to see what Vespa's decision is going to be here. 
He's got to decide what Herald to take first and afterwards discard, uh, decide what card to discard as well. But lots of mental gymnastics that needs to be performed here to take aims. And the Herald of Area Edition gets to go back into the arsenal there for Vespa. So even though we're going to be blocking out on this turn, it does certainly mean that the next attack is going to be pretty powerful if that Herald of Area Edition can come out on a future turn. Mm -hmm. So shooting this fatigue shot uh, with the tunic counter here, uh, that means we're going to be staring down an 11 uh, on the board. And Five then plus three plus three. Blocking 9 and 10, so just taking 1 this turn with no relevant on hits, which is actually such a good spot to be in. No inertia tokens, no blood rot, no more extra incidental damage. That frailty is going to be, it's, it's, it's rendered useless, honestly, right? And the ponder token, not the most relevant card uh, for Brody, just because there's no more Skullbone cross wraps. Yeah, absolutely. Brody's deck also looking a little thin there. If I take a look, Vespa just going to pass back. This is really the moment, right? No soul to speak of for Vespa. Brody has a five card hand. His opponent is at sub 10 life. No ward on the board whatsoever. If Brody wants to take control of this game and move on to the finals of the calling here in Phuket, this is the moment he has to do oh so. Rain Razor's in the hand to release the tension means no d reacts can be played from arsenal we know it's an uh herald of erudition in there however but it's this is really the moment for brody gonna this have to go ahead so... and make a play and a no block in the hand for oh, vespa no. two no blocks in hand there is an angelic wrath blue and a figment of triumph this is such an unfortunate draw here for vespa but will he be able to make something out of it with only eight health left and no Skullbone cross wrap, so no optionality here within the op. Let's see how Brody wants to go ahead and start this turn. He's got to make a move. The clock is ticking. They need to make sure that the pace of play is maintained. With only with only a one card in Arsenal, which is a take aim, mm -hmm. he can load up an arrow, try to blind dominate, and still play up um, one more card. So, oh, that's crazy. He's sending out this bolt and shot for seven and the Death Dealer still is able to load, Vespa does not have enough cards to yeah, block this is th this is looking like this might spell the end of the game, folks. It, it might be all coming down to this. Azalea desperately trying to send the arrows through the skies and pick off heralds, pick off angels. One by one, they fall to her bow. The question is, will it be enough to get to their master? Prism sitting amongst the clouds, standing high above it all. The question is, can she stay alive for just a little bit longer? Or will Azalea finally be able to take control of the game? Looks like we're going to put the fan the phantasmal footsteps in front of this given that we have a couple no blocks in the hand this is going to block it out because we put the no block in the pitch just one card left in hand it does not block for vespa is there enough damage here for brody to finish the game well i mean he has a death dealer so pitching one of the arrows to load the other and then drawing a card if that's a pump spell yeah that might just do it the question is brody has to think about if that if those two resources represent a soul shield in the arsenal well, he knows it's an erudition. Oh, right, of course. <laughs> of course, of course, of course, of course. No, 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 this game has gone so long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Even I sometimes forget what's in the arsenals. Is yeah, so Brody thinking, can I, can I, if he closes the chain, does it It destroy? definitely breaks, yeah. The moment he loads Death Dealer, yeah. this will go back to the combat chain, uh, go off the combat chain, and then... To oh, but he has the Rain Racers as well. He has he's the Rain thinking about the Rain Racers. Does, does he want to push it over? He's saying no, he's Might just going to close the chain, from, yeah. Uh, from, from the Rain Racers in this case. Uh, but yeah, with that, the Phantasmal Footsteps uh, are broken at the end of the combat chain. All right, heading to the graveyard here. Time to load up the Death Dealer, pitching away the Rain Razors. Gonna go ahead and load, draw. There's the Fatigue Shot. Does he find the pump off the top? Does he find the pump off the top? We can see two release the tensions. There is one floating. This is your moment, Brody. Go ahead and play down those cards. See if you can punch your ticket into the finals here of the calling. Well, this is gonna come in for 11. 11 is... Nigh impossible for Brody to, uh, for, for Vespa to block through. Resolves, at least the tension. I think this. Resolves, one floating fatigue shot in the arsenal. Vespa's taking it all in, seeing what exactly sits on the table. Brody stares across at the opponent. There is nothing left for Vespa to do except shoot out that fatigue shot. And I think at 11 damage, this is going to be the game. He only has an Empyrean Ward, uh, Empyrean Rapture for one. 
And that is oh. going to do it, folks. The game is over. Brody Spurlock has won the semifinals, and he moves on to the finals. A very hard-fought game by both competitors. You can see the emotion on their faces. Very tired from a hard-fought battle. Sometimes it's not clean. Sometimes it's not easy. But congratulations to Brody Spurlock for moving on. And, of course, to Vespa for just an unprecedented run through this tournament. Absolutely dominating all the way up until the semifinal match. The dominating arrows, I mean, the, the dominance at the end went to the hero who likes to dominate from the arsenal as Azalea moves on into the finals to take on Pudding Tam's Katsu. Brody, once again, spoiling my fantasy league for Oh! And uh, let's look at the bracket to see how wrong I was this time. Looks like Vespa uh, falling finally to Azalea Ace in the whole our finals. Is completely set. off the, the radar from what I thought a week ago. But this is Brody Spurlock from the U.S. Facing off against Blue Pitches, putting Tam from Hong Kong. Katsu Azalea. Now this is a match to watch. Absolutely. Going to be tough to imagine that Katsu was excited to see Azalea win that game. Maybe hoping to put a little more damage across the deck that has no blocks. And Azalea with those, you know, red in the ledger and inertia type effects might make it hard for Katsu to come out. But as we've seen all tournament long, putting Tam looks, you know, uh, bad matchups in the face and laughs as he brings Katsu to the tournament and has made an incredible run today. He has not lost a single game here on day two of the calling to push his himself into the finals and he's gonna have to take on the young buck from america to get his way into the winner's seat well we're gonna take a short break after this i'm gonna go buy a few packs of heavy hitters hopefully open a card for putting tam down but not out oh this is not <laughs> the matchup that he was looking for but never count a man out of the corner even with his back against the wall 100 percent. so we're gonna cut to a short commercial break and when we come back it's time for the finals of calling Paquette. This is going to be a good one. Welcome, traveler. You must be starving. Please, come inside. I think we can satisfy your appetite. Anything you like. Intimacy, or perhaps ecstasy. <laughs> Come a little closer, I won't bite. Tell me, what do you desire? Beware the tongue of the snake. Her things shall soon follow. Pleasure is but the shallow illusion. Walk the true path, and you shall see clear. Who seek may discover formless, perfect, the serene, unchanging infinite, eternally present, eternally boring. Why don't we play rough? Embrace the solitude. Embrace the sensation. Look within. Look at me. Just a breath. Just a taste. Enough! A tiger does not fall prey to the snake. The tiger walks its own path. Those who flow as life flows know they need no other force. The heavy is the root of the light. The unmoved, the source of all movement. The center is unbound and free. Walk the path. Seek the truth.
What a grinder of the day we've had here at Calling Phuket. Pankaj, we're finally here. The epitome of flesh and blood. The finals of Calling Phuket. I am so hyped. I was not expecting this finals today. When you showed me that bracket, I got one wrong. So here we have Brody Spurlock. We're going to look at the standings in a real bit. Brody Spurlock, fifth place. Coming in with Azalea, ace in the hole. So he yeah, finally has a chance to choose who goes first or second against Pudding Tam from Blue Pitch. Playing that Katsu. This finals, I don't think anyone could have predicted. This is pretty wild. Two players from the 5th to 8th sides, 5th uh, to 8th seeds making it all the way yeah. to the finals. And a very, very intense matchup. Now, a lot of people look at this matchup and think, oh, hey, the ninja, the aggro deck is obviously unfavored into Azalea. But there is one critical card in putting Tom's arsenal. We've seen it so many times. Warmonger's Diplomacy, a card that just hamstrings Azalea right in the offense. Absolutely. There's a lot of things. And Brody cannot discount the Dishonor as well in this matchup. Once you turn off that hero power from Azalea, hey, suddenly these on hits are not looking that scary without Dominate. There's a lot of block three cards as well in putting Tam's deck. So, you know, those dominates are very effect uh, are key, I would say, in this matchup for Brody to try to bring that dominate train onto pudding. And uh, I think the players are almost about ready. So, Pankaj, you and I are going to have just this wonderful little match to watch. Mm, as uh, well as all the viewers back home, of course. Yeah, these two players will be playing for 2400 US dollars a Goal for extended art balance justice. Not that many given out this year so yeah. far. So mm -hmm. very exciting. And of course, to be the first calling champion for the Fab Holiday <laughs> hosted here <laughs> by Legend Story Hashtag Studios. Fab Holiday. Dude, fab, I, I think it's been a real holiday treat for, for people like Every, me and you. Everyone. Yeah, the players, the viewers. And it looks like we are ready to dive right into our match. Let's get right into it. Call Finals of the Calling Phuket. I love this. This is the match of East meets West. Putting time from Hong Kong versus U USA's Brody Spurlock. I am so excited. Brody has a flight to catch. So let's see <laughs> how fast this game is going to go. Or if he's going to have to call his airline and say, book me on the first one tomorrow. Yeah, I just want a calling. I'm going to need to go on the second, uh, on, on a later flight. But Pudding has definitely has something to say. Uh, yeah, I just that. want uh, some prize money. Uh, <laughs> That's not a problem. So let's see how these two players there. They are shuffling up. Putting Tam here. You think he's going to wear the pouncing links in this matchup? Yes. So the way I like to describe this matchup is that it is actually very fragile. So Azalea is on the more controly side of it, going to be able to disrupt the Katsu a fair bit with Randall Ledger, even something like Sleep Dart, even something like Codex of Frailty. So Brody has a disruption in his deck, but it's fragile because once he misses on the disruption, or if he gets stuffed by Warmonger's Diplomacy, suddenly Pudding, uh, suddenly Pudding Town can just come in with a Mask of the Pouncing Links, and, and maybe even an Art of War off of a Tunic and go into a 6-7 wide chain link and Azalea, one thing about Azalea is that she does not block very well, hence why this is pretty fragile. We can expect Brody to start uh, to be in the commanding lead, uh, in the leading position at the beginning of the game, but once he misses, that fragility is just going to come in and bite him. I want to see how many times Pudding Tam can go up, down, up, down on the Descendant and Bonds chains. That's going to be a big one. The strength of the Pouncing Lynx is that you can present a 30 plus damage turn and once that life lead is too high, once you put Brody down to those single digits, suddenly those blocking hands, you're forced to put cards in front of those attacks and we know that Azalea does not like to play with two to three card hands. Yeah, in front of Kadachis too, that is the worst feeling ever when you're in the Kadachi log. And looking at the equipment suite over here, putting oh. Tom, bringing in the heart and cross trap, just going, is showing his mindset in this matchup. He's just saying the moment I get an opening, the one opening I get in this game, I immediately want to capitalize on it. Come in with the heart and cross trap, save myself a pitch card, potentially have five cards fully towards being offensive. Yes. Everyone loves using that hard cross trap just to start the surging strike. It puts so much pressure on the defending player to decide, is he on the natural line? Is he going to tutor? It's a, do, a win if you do and lose if you don't kind of moment, right? Whatever decision you make, that can change the tempo of the game. So Brody, being the highest seed in his matchup, seems to have chosen to go first, which is a very interesting call in this sort of matchup where it's a bit more tempo-y. Typically, you choose to go second, but perhaps Brody is saying, I want to maybe have a knock-to-death whistle. Pitching a knock-to-death whistle here, does he have another one to try and dominate? Yeah, this is just a straight-up loading of the red in the ledger here. This is not something that you as putting one to see going turn zero, because if there's any way for that to connect, 
your first turn in order to take tempo immediately lost. Currently, this render ledger not dominated, but with the knock to death whistle in the pit zone, you fully expect Brody had another one in hand because you want to dominate turn zero. He's just going to swap out this render ledger for another red and ledger, and critically, very importantly, this means he's going to end his first turn with a red and ledger in the graveyard. Now, we spoke about Codex of Frailty. Red and ledger in the graveyard means that now your Codexes can just find that arrow again and again. That is a perfect start for Brody Spurlock here. Getting that Red and Ledger on the top of the deck and then getting into the graveyard. As you say, Codex of Frailty is essentially your fourth, fifth, and sixth copy of Red and the Ledger on the condition you can find and play one first. So, a very powerful start. We'll see how many pumps go in. This is dominated. So, you're going to be leaking damage on turn zero. And that's not how you want to start the game. Leaking any sort of damage feels extremely bad this coming in for eight dominate i'm trying to i'm trying to think about uh, i guess uh they want to try to think about how much damage can be stemmed and what the next point of damage is going to be the choice of going first here definitely paying off for brody that was a bit of a gamble for him definitely you don't always get to dominate going to answer as azalea but he chose to go first and it's paying off for him in yeah. this finals of the calling pocket well in this kind of matchup where you don't want to give your opponent katsu some breathing space sometimes you got to take that gamble you got to take that risk and try to start off with an explosive one now you should think what block three am i going to do and uh, probably take five from here Coming in for eight over here, and Katsu not known for their armor, just two block on the breaking scales on the Breeze Rider boots, potentially two on the Mask of the Pouncing Links. We saw oh. him use that defensively in his game against Prism to great effect, but probably not wanting to do that here. Pudding Town might just need to settle for just having fallen a bit behind in the early stages of this game. Yeah, and that flick flack in hand is just gonna, it feels so bad right now, like, because you're starting on the defending side of turn zero. You'd love to have that in Arsenal instead but um you know right now just having to commit a one of the attacks looks like uh he's considering this whelming gust wave blue just blocking for three taking five on turn zero and with the on hit effect of red and ledger this starting turn i don't think it's going to be really powerful for putting time it's an absolutely devastating start for brody over here now on putting Tom's side not entirely doom and gloom because that is two knock the death whistles accounted for one was pitched and that goes to the bottom after the shuffle from the first one so one used one to the bottom it is a little bit harder especially with death dealer to dominate more arrows without knock the death whistle you might need to get lucky off of you know ops from like with the glide pass stuff like that uh but you know without the extra dominates you know bring time at least has a bit of hope to come back into this game. Yeah, and drawing the Mugenshi, I'm surprised he brought the Mugenshi into this matchup because generally that's a card that we see for anti-fatigue strategies in this current meta. Uh, but no, nonetheless, maybe it comes in as a block three sometimes. It is a combo piece that works well with Flick Flack on the turns that are Bolt and Shot uh, rele relevant. Uh, and yeah. Or Ravenous Rabble as or well. Or Ravenous Flick Rabbles Flack. as well. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Another thing about the Mugenshi release really is that oftentimes as Katsu in this matchup, you're priced into blocking a bunch of times. Normally you just put your whole hand down. If it's just a massive arrow that you can't deal with, maybe it has a frailty on it, really going to mess up your turn. Or like a sleep dart on it where it's like if... Like, you know, once it hits you, you're not going to have an offensive turn anyway. You put your whole hand down. Mugenshi release lets you at least put some gas back into your deck. And very critically, pump up the Lord of Wind if it hits. You know, you need cards oh. in your graveyard. You need Surgings and Whelmings in your graveyard for you to have a massive Lord of Wind. So that's potentially another reason why that card is in the list. Oh, yeah. We've seen some really big Lord of Winds today oh, yeah. uh, being pulled off. If there's someone who can do it, it's putting time. So this read the glide path, Brody thinking about the op for a moment here. Death Dealer not been used yet, Azalea still available for activation. Every opt matters. We do see a remorse on his hand and an amplifying arrow from the op, but he's choosing to sink it below instead. Remorseless yet another on head that Katsus really don't like facing. They want to go wide with multiple, multiple action cards, but Remorseless says, hey, for Every action card you play, I'm going to take one massive arrow from Brody coming out here. And most importantly, that Flick Flack is stuck in Arsenal because Remorseless was loaded face up. So if that's the case, there is a secondary part of Remorseless that people forget. You just can't use defense reactions from the Arsenal. 
And not only is, it, is that part of the text relevant here of stopping putting Tom's flick flag, there is a ponder attached to the on hit of this Remorseless as well. And we saw Brody opt the card for, to the bottom. So he has sculpted a little bit what he wants to draw and hopefully Arsenal after this. 17 damage on this Remorseless coming into Pudding Tom. First few turns of the game have been going all Brody, Elliot. It's been very dominating as a start, uh, without dominate, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> well, the first turn did have dominate. Yeah, the first turn did have dominate, <laughs> yeah. but this is a 17 damage arrow, and it's threatening a ponder. It's almost impossible for Katsu, without that defense reaction from Arsenal, to cover the 17 damage. So, Pudding Tom does have the option to take this and mount an offensive turn because while this remorse is really, really painful and going to give Brody the arsenal and going to deal him damage every time he plays an action card, it is not disruptive in the sense that Reddle Ledger is. So, you know, he could go for that extremely aggressive line should he choose to do should he choose to do so, or he could just lay his hand down. And as we were speaking about earlier, the Mugenshi in his list means that sometimes he is actually okay to just put his hand down and say, all right, go again. I'll wait until you actually give me an opening. If he does take the damage this turn, Remorseless has that part yep. where he says every action you take, you lose one health. Imagine taking a Remorseless that could be 17 and upwards like of five to six. Yeah, 50% of the HP of one arrow. That's a hard shot if I've ever seen one. And that's what he's going for. Putting Town, making the bold choice finals of the calling book and taking 17 from this Remorseless. Oh my goodness. Pudding says, all gas, no brakes. Let us fight it out to the death here. I mean, if there is someone who knows when he has the opening as Katsu, it is this man right here sitting on that side of the table at the calling pocket. He has declared that, all right, Azela, you've given me an opening. You've given, sent an arrow that I do not, there's just more vanilla damage. That's all you're doing this turn. I'm going to take this damage and send massive swath of attacks back at you. I am kind of worried though, if you look at the discard, there isn't that much uh, for putting to play with. We only we know that there's a bonds inside, a yellow bonds that he can banish from his own bonds here. Uh, but yeah, even in those scenarios, like you can't go up down that many times. You have to try to push a lot of damage on this one turn because every single card you play, that's one step closer to death. And we also know that his arsenal is a flick flag, so not the full five card offensive hand from Katsu over here. The arsenal flick flag, you know, Brody doesn't know that. So Brody's staring down the surging strike, noticing that putting, you know, took 17 damage from the remorseless. He's gonna take these remorseless damage triggers every time he plays an action card. So Brody probably expecting that to be an offensive card, but putting Tom maybe trying to bait Brody into blocking or saying I have more of an offense than you act than I actually do some mind games happening here perhaps it's a surging strike red though and that always looks very suspect when it's on the board pitching a dishonor as well so it's a very clean hand from the start let's see how he carries this one through Brody has a big decision to make and the one floating actually looks a lot scarier because normally is a one one floating off of a zero cost blue pitch. So he could have started with the Kadachi into Surging Strike, but no, he went Surging Strike first, leaving the one floating there. And you know what that represents? That represents a potential Art of War. Oh yeah, 100%. In this case, thinking about the Katsu trigger, whether or not he's going to discard a card and go into a combo line here. No need for discards when you got the natural. Here's Whelming Gust Wave coming in for four, threatening to draw a card. Putting Tom losing one more health in the process. So critically, the Katsu trigger has been triggered and passed. That means even if his Whelming hits, there'll be no more tutoring for Putting Tom. So that means he's pretty happy with his hand. Perhaps he has Bonds of Ancestry in his hand as well. Didn't quite get a good look. If that's but, the natural, then yeah. let it be. <laughs> <laughs> he can find he can find the uh, use the bonds, but there is no flusterfist in in the graveyard. There is only bonds of ancestry and another whelming gust wave. Hoping here that maybe the whelming gust wave draws him into more gas in that case. But no, like you said, no tutoring unless it's the pouncing links. But no, you can't even find dishonor because you haven't played the descendant yet as well. Yeah, the dishonor. Uh, text the uh, debilitating text on Dishonor won't be live because there's a Whelming Gust Wave instead of Descendant Gust Wave. However, the card draw over here is something Brody probably might want to respect. Yeah, card draw is very important in this matchup. Brody also very astute in looking into putting Tom's discard pile, deciding what's the worst that could happen right now. 
Just blocking three, going to take that one damage to leak it out. Allowing, allowing Pudding draw. to draw a card, but when you're not running the Mask of Momentum, <laughs> uh, that is... Oh, oh. Fist. Uh, <laughs> you couldn't ask for a better zero for four yeah. to end this chain. Not, I would say, like, you're still taking 17 upwards. He's already taking 19 damage from the Remorseless on yeah. this turn. Uh, <laughs> going up to twin, uh, 20 damage, I think, at this point in time. Mm -hmm. 20 damage, and we're so far only trading a total of, what, 12 damage? So, it is a tempo play, but Brody very astute in holding a full grip here. Brody recognizing that so far all of Pudding's damage has just been that, just vanilla damage, no on hits. There's an like on hit draw, but on hit draw just represents further vanilla damage because that was a descendant gust wave. It wasn't, uh, it's a, it does a whelming gust wave, not a descendant gust wave, where it's a dishonored Brody might actually care about. Yeah, he might have to think really long and hard about this one. Finding another, uh, sorry, banishing the whelming gust wave blue and finding another whelming gust wave blue uh, in this case. A blue one, critically finding a blue one, wants to keep the reds in his deck for offensive power, recognizing that this on hit wouldn't actually happen. Um, you know, this blue, uh, since it's not going to be following a surging strike, the blue whelming gust wave isn't going to draw him a further card. So he's saying, I'm just going to get a blue and stop the red and save that in my deck. And I'll no block go 28. Yeah, and maybe what Pudding might want to do here, I'm not sure, is to like maybe crack pouncing links or, or something. No, looks like it's just sinking out that uh, harmonized Kadachi here for one. That kind of stops a lot of the, the combo lines, as you would say, but yep. and restarts it all over again. Yep. But I, we know he's holding onto a fluster fist. Do we think we're just getting rid of this whelming glass wave blue so you're yeah. not like clunking the deck up? Well, he's just doing that because you, he's not wasn't planning to use it on offense anyway, so might as well get rid of a blue one instead of a red one. Yeah, that, that makes yep. a lot of sense. So coming for fluster fist for four, putting Tom, it's turn two. He's down to 15. 14. I think he hasn't taken oh, he the hasn't one taken damage. He hasn't taken the yet. one. Yep. Down to 14. And Brody at 23. The live guests have closed up, but yep. is it closed enough? So that was a 21 damage remorseless there for Brody Spurlock on his you know, second turn of the game. The first one being the dominated Red and Ledger on turn zero. Someone get me a high score counter because I don't <laughs> think I've seen a 21 damage remorseless in the longest time. Uh, one of those one arcade scoreboards just for that. Okay, Pudding Tom has oh drawn into that critical card we were speaking about before you went into the matchup, the Warmonger's Diplomacy. Absolutely. Would this be what he needs to get back into this game? If he can put all his other cards down to block, just resolve the Warmonger's Diplomacy, tell Brody, hey, you're not going to have much of a turn following that, and I still have all my armor pieces, critically have the Mask of the Pouncing Links, I might be able to come back into this game. That's a very key card. He only runs one copy of Warmonger's Diplomacy, and the fact that he found it could be the Hail Mary that he needs. Uh, uh. <laughs> I've heard that sound plenty of times today. <laughs> but yeah, this is the, the, the Skullbone cross wraps op that we're looking at. A key decision, honestly, for Azalea, and I, I can see why he's taking a lot of time. Brody, very methodical in this play. Yep. Always thinking about, you know, even the pitch tag really matters a lot to this guy. So just sending out a four endless arrow? No, just four. It doesn't have go again. This is extremely non-threatening. Wow, oh, I think yeah. Brody completely bricked on his hand. Wow, oh my god. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> I mean, uh, Bullseye Bracer and uh, Snapdragon's Cough Cough. <laughs> this is a, it's a turn that Pudding Tom could actually use some cards and the blocks from both Breaking Skills and the Breeze Rider Boots uh, in order to, um, well, stem some well, of the bleeding. Also, critically, the Flick Flack in his arsenal. We have to remember that, Elliot. If Brody tries to go for a Snapdragon play, trying to hope that his, rain that his uh, Endless Arrow hits, Pudding Tom can stuff that with the uh, Flick Flack that he has in his arsenal. Absolutely. And the question now is, does Brody want to send out that Rain Raises as well, risking the fact that he could lose a resource card hmm. and the fact that the Endless Arrow won't go back to his hand for additional pitch? Well, that's... So, at this point, it looks like Snapdragon's I don't know if it has resolved it, because if it has resolved, um, that means Brody has passed on reactions. It looks like Pudding Time is the one that's thinking. So if he has passed on reactions, that means he's not deploying a rain raise. I don't even know if he has one in his hand, but uh, uh, but if he's passed on reactions, then you know he's not deploying the rain raises. Yep, absolutely. So let's see how this turn plays out. Only taking one at this, but when you're at 14 health, one is a lot of damage. And it's also a Tunic turn. Azalea's yeah. still open for activation. Death Dealer's still there. So no reactions here. Uh, no reaction. 
Looks like Pudding said no reactions. So priority pass back into Brody. So it looks like the Snapdragons was on the stack uh, when Pudding said no reactions and then Brody responded after Snapdragons resolved. Yeah, but All this right. flick flag well, coming in yep. uh, very clutch, honestly. Uh, just for the fact that he won't get... He lost a resource card and he's not able uh, uh, to get the Atlas Arrow back in hand. But this Bolton shot, technically six go again. Yep. And remember, the flick flag effect is active. Any combo card that putting time blocks with will be blocking for two more so potentially going to be able to stop this reload off of the bolt and shot which is actually pretty critical because a death dealer has been used however bullseye braces are still there yeah but the bullseye braces here if you're cracking it this far and pudding actually just wants to block this turn that warmonger's diplomacy after this is going to buy so much breathing space against brody spurlock at 23 14 you can't discount any of these players out at this point in time Ooh, committing uh, the Fluster block. Fist. So blocking a clean six here. Very, very good block. Honestly, Flick Flack showing its worth in this matchup so far. Bullseye braces are being popped. Brody wants to get full value out of his rain raises, followed by release attention into an amplifying arrow, Elliot. This is being buffed an extra three because rain raises, bullseye braces, and release attention. Yeah, that's 11 damage on this turn. And Pudding is looking at his hand going, I don't, I don't think I have that much leeway to play anymore. Oh. Brody's blown the entire equipment load onto Pudding. In this case, 11 damage. Well, that's a rough spot to be in. So critically ending without an arsenal, though, is Brody. And this did cost him quite a bit of his equipment. He, it cost him his bullseye braces and cost him a snapdragon scale. Is Pudding time looking to try and play the Warmog's diplomacy and establish an arsenal. It's very critical that he also establishes an arsenal because once he gets a tempo, uh, from playing the Warmonger's Diplomacy, he needs to come back with a five-card hand to have a hope to get back into this game. That's right. We, I will say that a Hearts and Cross Strap does help a lot in those scenarios, just because instead of pitching a card, now you have just like two free resources to start the Surging Strike combo. Pudding showing so much gumption here. Blocking just one, taking ten, going to four. Wow. Locking one there, definitely a bold choice from putting time. Now you won't have the breaking skills there for a potential breakpoint on the following turn. Here. However, this is a random four cards from Brody. This is actually very risky for Azalea. You're not going to get an opt off the Skullbone Cross Trap. This, is, could, this could be a turn where you draw the dreaded, you know, four non-attack hand. Looks like it did not quite happen for Brody, but Wamong's Diplomacy definitely going to stuff a bit of his plans. And without, without choosing War or Peace, it doesn't matter. You can't attack at all on that turn you you have you can't just you you will load death dealer as action and uh, then well that's a weapon that's a weapon, a weapon action, action so you yeah. can choose so war can and select so yes. yep, yep. yes. so just just being able to a vanilla weapon uh, a vanilla arrow in this case might be the only thing that brody can do i do believe he has a sleep dart in his hand though Oh my goodness, a sleep dart oh. here would be devastating. And Pudding's reaction to that, you almost wonder whether he regrets giving the two block on his equipment on the, van uh, on the vanilla damage previous turn. Oh, I guess that was a bolt and shot reload. So no, yeah. not exactly vanilla, but now forced to give up two cards if he wants to keep the and hero this ability. this is not the hand that Pudding needs, really, if he wants to strike a counter attack with the Pouncing Lynx. None of the combo pieces readily available uh, for Pudding. At this point in time, you could see the frustration on his face. He's thinking long and hard. If there's a time to tank right now, this is the time. Every life point counts. Five damage on the field from Brody Spurlock. That was a full five card hand, only representing five damage. But has that lethal pesky on hit trigger of the sleep that Katsu needs his hero ability to work and Brody just had the answer, has had the answer time and time again. Yeah, just the, and the fact that he drew up this particular hand means that he can't just like... If, if this wasn't like... Um, if he had a proper hand, you could still block one card and still send something in return without using the Katsu trigger. But oh, with what he drew up, this is looking so rough for putting time. He has to look at every single thing at his disposal at the moment. Pudding, searching for an answer in the discard pile. Pudding Tom with, the, with his back against the wall in the finals of the Calling Pocket. But if there is one man who's able to make his way out of this hole right now, it is that man sitting there on the Katsu side of the field. Yes, the pride of Hong Kong riding on his shoulders. They've been looking for a big win for now.
and could, this could be it. At this point in time, it might not even just be about the on-hit trigger from Sleep Dart. This could be about death. <laughs> yeah, at some point the, the arrows. Effect. Yep, at some point the arrows are gonna have on hit death. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, looks like he has to commit two cards here to launch a, an attack. But Brody still has cards. He's gonna have an arsenal for the next turn. Those skullbone cross wraps. Once you have an arsenal, really just means you're gonna have the option to dominate on the next turn. So no more Warmong's Diplomacies in putting Tom's deck. And even if he had one in his hand, wouldn't be able to play it because you must have to imagine he chose war on the card. It means if he chose war, you, you won't be able to play in on the Warmong's Diplomacy anyway because that's obviously not an attack action card. So, Good. Folks, we are only on turn three of this match <laughs> so far. Brody has just ticked up his tunic for, for like the second time, right? <laughs> it's on counter one. I'm mm -hmm. using it the previous turn. My goodness. Definitely quite a change of pace from the previous match. It went quite a while, the Azalea into the prison. This Azalea into Katsu, a little more explosive, a little more risk being taken from pudding to be honest uh, taking that 17 damage remorseless and then five more from its effect that was a big risk that he took and this just hasn't quite paid off for him as we go into the turn four this is so interesting we saw that pudding blocked with the winds of eternity and a an lightning strike instead chose to just play a winds of eternity naked on the field yeah, brody is confused about that he's saying wait what? <laughs> if you're gonna keep a two-card hand, wouldn't E-Strike even better? Why are you starting with this? Am I supposed to respect Breeze Riders here? Maybe some Mask of the Pouncing Lynx shenanigans? Is there a key card inside that Pudding Time is holding? Is this a combo piece that he's hoping to just hold for a little bit longer? Or is it just mind games? Oh, this or is he just, just trying to get in everybody's head? Yeah, Les Psyops is always very strong, you know what I'm saying? But the finals, Pudding must have a plan. I can't... I won't believe that this is the only thing on his mind. Brody very respectfully showcasing th on the block, getting an ancestral empowerment, using that breaking scales, and probably going to use that Breeze Rider boots in response as well. No. Well, I mean, the Breeze oh, Rider Boots it, is it, on hit. It's on hit, yes. So he's going to be able to resolve Katsu. Looks like he wants to activate Breeze Rider Boots and also Master of Pouncing Links. This looks to be the last hurrah for putting Tom over here. Let's see if he's able to concoct something to get back from this 18 life deficit. Yep, discarding that uh, whelming Gust Wave Blue. He has a thick discard pile at the moment, so there is a lot of options to choose from. But on a three card hand, I don't know if he can present 22 damage to even tickle Brody at this point in time. So quite fortunate for putting drawing the zero cost off of the Ancestral Empowerment. If it wasn't a zero cost, he wouldn't have been able to discard it to cut the, the Katsu trigger. He's doing but whatever he can right now to inch back into this game. He's playing to his outs. He's recognizing that this is the way he can win. Play he's not playing to not lose. He's playing to win. Yes. And that is what we've seen all weekend here at Calling Paquette. Players have been showing a lot of gumption, a lot of that mental fortitude to eke out any percentage points they have in any given matchup. Back against the wall, no problem. We're gonna fight, we're gonna just push it all the way to the limit. Even if you lost, it means that you, you know, just found every advantage possible. Finding bonds of last ancestry is putting time, so probably has one of those gust waves in his arsenal. Breeze Rider Boots has been popped, so even if that's a whelming gust wave, it will have go again. Of course, he's also resolving the Mask of the Pouncing Lynx trigger. No, he's just finding the gust wave of the Mask of the Pouncing Lynx, so he has turned this turn into something somewhat threatening. Whelming gust wave with go again into Bonds. Bonds going to be able to find another card from the graveyard. Yeah, and finding all these cards. Whelming gust wave here, not a bad idea to take on as well, just because that's going to help you uh, start the Bonds of Ancestry chain. Uh, yeah, just thinking, thinking. Yeah, 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 just sure. two. Two damage with go again. Katsu yeah. trigger has already triggered this turn and been resolved. Yeah, so the bonds of ancestry will extend it for a little bit more, but there isn't any resources in putting Tom's uh, pitch zone. So from here on out, we can't just start with another descendant from Arsenal. Well, Heart and Cross Trap is resources on the oh, field. Oh yeah, so yes. you, you would crack the hard and cross crap, Good. start it all over again, and probably go up, down, up, down as much as possible. Yeah. I mean, you know, with the Breeze Rider Boots popped, he does have access to some really sneaky lines as well. You could go Bonds and say something like a Fluster Fist. Fluster Fist does have go again, could convert, could do a hard and cross trap into a CNC after that, if that is what's in Pudding Tom's arsenal. I don't think we quite know 
what he has over there. No, I don't think we've seen it either. Uh, this Whelming Gust Wave, no relevant on-hit effect at the moment. It's not drawing a card. It's yep. coming in for a straight vanilla 2. Just vanilla 2, not, not at least not drawing a card, not even threatening Katsu. A lot of things are being faced up at the moment. Brody committing one card so far. So holding on to a three card and one arsenal in the grip. Brody wanting to make sure he covers all his bases considering every option Pudding Tom has to find off of this Bonds of Ancestry. You have to applaud these players for the most meticulous play. Every single detail, they're trying to not let it escape them because Every percentage point closer to your opponent winning, that's taking percentage points away from you. Just, just math facts. Both these players extremely close to being the winner of the of the calling Phuket. You know, this is the finals. This is their last step. They're going to make sure they measure every decision. No rush. No need to take... No, no need to make decisions too rashly or too quickly. Even though Brody's so far ahead, he's saying that I'm still going to respect you because this is pudding time yeah. from Hong Kong of Team Blue Pitch. If someone can come out of this rut, it is him. Okay. Yeah, this uh, is really, really good. I mean, Blue Pitch did some amazing performances over at Pro 12 LA. Their day to conversion was just off the charts. Mm -hmm. uh, this Bonds of Ancestry coming in. Let's see what Pudding's looking for. It's going to be another... Well, Ming Gus Wave Blue that he uh, that he banishes. So, and, and remember early on in the game where he left the red Whelming Gust Wave in his deck, he could, he probably going to be able to find it now. Tells us potentially has a Bonds of Ancestry in his arsenal, so able to go Gust Wave, and if there's if that is a Bonds in his arsenal, it could be another Gust Wave into another Bonds, and then into a final piece, maybe like a Fluster Fist, some sort of 0 for 4. Yeah, just throwing out as bonds. much damage as possible. He needs to eat this life gap as close as he can, but, you know, just as Brody exploded with all his equipment, Pudding has done the same this turn. <sighs> this has to be just playing on a razor's edge for Pudding Tom. Still left to wonder. I mean, the option for a CNC to come after his Whelming Gust Wave is also very, very possible. Brody Fulog does need to consider that as well because of the Heart and Cross type. It just represents so many possibilities, so many options for Pudding Tom, for threats that Pudding Tom can generate right after this. Yeah, and this is four more damage. Bringing the life closer to 12 will also be a pretty, pretty tough. Another Bonds of Ancestry red in that arsenal. He has to find a Fluster Fist at this point in time to bring that health as close as possible. But nothing threatening the arsenal at this point in time. I just want to point out, this one started with the Blue Winds of Eternity, Elliot. That was all putting... It was a two-card hand, Winds of Eternity, another card, and one card in Arsenal. And this has suddenly turned into six chain links onto the field. And that is the strength of Katsu. That is what he can do in the hands of a player like Putting Tom. I was not expecting a go-off turn <laughs> <laughs> off of this. Especially, it's very rare to see the Winds of Eternity uh, be an actual thing. So the score is now four, uh, 4 to 5, I believe, because of Flusterfist. And you have to imagine, you just have to imagine putting Tom just feeling extremely unlucky that the Brody had the sleep dart after you went warm on his diplomacy. If there was some other vanilla arrow, putting Tom could have done this turn off of five cards instead of just three. Yeah, this was not what he was hoping for. He needed that tutor to begin this chain. Brody holding three cards in hand, one in Arsenal, activating those cross straps. Let's see what's on top of the deck. It's a premeditate. Also a Codex of Frailty in Brody Spurlock's hand. Oh no, that Codex could spell doom for the fact that Pudding has nothing in his Arsenal and just stack full of cards in his discard pile. Looks like pitching away the Codex is Brody. So probably not what's going to come out this turn, but you know what is going to come out? A massive bolt and shot coming in for nine, threatening a frailty, threatening a ponder as well. Yeah, and there's one card left in Brody's hand. Pudding is going to have to decide like what he has to block with the full thing. Oh, and the Codex of Frailty. And that's the game. That's Brody Spurlock is the winner of the Calling Phuket off of an amazing, masterfully played Azalea. Wow, that opener. That red and ledger to start it off, hampering any sort of damage that Pudding Tom could send back on the receiving end. Brody Spurlock is your calling champion. Thank you, thank you. Players just 
talking about the game as well, and yeah, you you called it, Elliot. That was an amazing start for Brody, and it wasn't just an amazing start. It just continued on the following turn, 17 damage remorses, following turn, the exact sleep dart for the Warmong's diplomacy, and then finally ending off with a bolt and shot into a Codex of Frailty to just take the game out of Pudding Tom's hands. Just to correct you, that was a 21 damage remorseless. And if you count, yep. <laughs> Man, just the fact that it halved most of Pudding Tom's life there was such a commanding lead for uh, for, for Brody Spurlock in that matchup. But really, commiserations and really just a standing performance for putting Tom. Taking Katsu in this field all the way to the finals, I would say blow up performance for a, a lot of our top eight players. Stellar performance from Pudding Tom as well, especially that final salvo, the final push. You know, he did not give up until the end. He saw his one out. The winds of eternity start to change to turn on the breeze out of boots, the mascot of Pouncing Links, trying to send as much damage to Brody as possible. Got him down to five before finally falling as Pudding Tom. Just amazingly well played from both our players here. I have to say, I love watching high-level flesh and blood because of this. Even when their backs are against the wall, nothing is going to stop them from trying to bleed as much of their opponent's life as possible. There is just so much that can be said about this entire weekend, Pankaj. It's been a pleasure casting with you. We're going to take a short break. And when, when we come back, we're going to have a winner's interview with our calling Phuket champion, all the way from the US of A, Brody Spurlock.
Welcome back to the booth, everyone. I am here with your calling Phuket champion, Mr. Brody Spurlock. Congratulations to you, my friend. How are you feeling? Thanks, Sam. Um, oh my gosh, I just feel elated. I was so excited just to make top eight. I was pretty terrified of that Prism game. Um, two really crazy, long, intense grinds in the top eight. I'm just, I just couldn't be happier. I'm so excited. This is my biggest accomplishment ever in Flesh and Blood. I've never won Let's go. a tier three or four event. I'm so excited, man. Well, I'm, I'm so happy for you. I know everybody back in the U.S. is cheering for you. Uh, talk to me a little bit about just the tournament run you had. Talk to me a little bit about Azalea into this field, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the experience. But for those of every, every, everybody at home that just wants to hear about you know, bringing Azalea to a calling and winning the whole damn thing, talk to me about how it went. Yeah, so I've been working on Azalea a lot this year. Obviously, I played her last year starting in March, and uh, it's actually, we just hit the one-year anniversary of me learning Azalea. Aww. Oh, yeah, 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 the brawl. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, it was that week, and then that was the end of March last year. Um, so anyway, this year I've been working a lot on Azalea and really working really hard on my deck list to try to uh, improve things and just trying this new, new style um, with like no with very few blues um no dead eye just like a really lean low to the ground mostly zero cost list and um i played it at a bunch of events rtns and then i brought it to pro tour and i was feeling really good about the deck and i don't i honestly don't think that azalea is the very best deck in the meta but i think it's very very good and i think for me it definitely made sense to play it um just because of the sheer reps i have on it and anyway i was just really excited to take that deck list to pro tour and i ended up um not doing quite as well as I wanted. Um, and so this was kind of like my shot at redemption as the <laughs> last like big event in this meta before mm -hmm. Drill My goes and everything changes. So I'm just so excited to have uh, finally like Taking gone all the way yeah. with, that, with that Azalea deck. Shout out to uh, Justin Koo, my Azalea buddy who's, mm. who's worked on the list with me. And mm. uh, he won the last calling in Asia with Azalea. So, um, next time we're in eight bag, you better bring his alien if you want to win. I hear you're hearing it from the champ himself. And he's been kind of my, my buddy all weekend, just talking through sideboard choices and stuff, especially nice. in the prism matchup. That's something that I haven't, I haven't practiced that much. I didn't expect a bunch of, and then of course there were multiple prisms doing really well. Um, so he helped me through some stuff and then big shout out to my team and, uh, the Azalea players, Nick, Travis, uh, Raj, even though you jumped off Azalea, everyone on the wolf pack who's helped me with the deck. Um, um, your mom. Oh, huge shout out to my mom. <laughs> I'm just, it's, this is like so much emotion yeah, right now, but 100%. Big, of course, a massive shout out to my mom for just always supporting me and, uh, uh, being the best mom in the world. Shout out to MinMax Games for sponsoring me, helping me make my way here all the way to Phuket for this amazing holiday adventure. Um, Oh, man. I'm so grateful. I'm feeling good. Couldn't be more happy. Let's go. We, we are all happy for you as well. Now, this has been such an incredible I experience. We, we had to tear you away from taking pictures on the literal beach during the sunset because they were taking pictures with this. I mean, you got to show the people at home what's, oh, yeah. what's the champion. What are the spoils of the champion here? It's shining in the light. There, it doesn't make sure it doesn't fall. There is the gold foil balance of justice. I promise you it's, it's prettier in person. The, the light that is used for our faces is not good for the glare of the thing. But look at the balance of justice there for Mr. Brody Spurlock. So congratulations to you, you again. You've gone from winning the celebrational to winning a calling. Are you going to go ahead and just take down the pro tour now? You tell me. I don't want this to fall. Is, 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 is this it? Pro Tour champ, confirmed? Confirmed? I'm really excited <laughs> for Amsterdam. Yeah. I Things are going to be really different by then. We're getting a new set. Dromai's gone. So a lot more to explore. But uh, yeah, P PTLA definitely left me hungry for the next Tier 4 event. Well, and it's uh, I, I'm surprised to hear you have not eaten your full over the weekend here in Phuket, but also by winning the whole damn thing. Brody Spurlock, congratulations to you again, my friend. I think I speak for everyone at home when I say we have all just loved watching you on the monster run you've had over the last year and can't wait to see just what you do next. Oh, thanks, Sam. I, uh, I am just oh so excited. It's been such a fun weekend. I, um, I booked this trip kind of last minute, and then like had such a blast hanging out with people, seeing friends, getting to see the beach. Yeah, <laughs> just literally right outside. <laughs> yeah, we literally, literally, I, 
I won the tournament, and then they were like, we gotta go, let's go, like, uh... We're losing light! <laughs> we gotta, let's go take photos on the beach, and then we just, like, walked outside. It, within, like, four minutes, we're there on the beach taking the coolest photos ever. It was awesome. Unbelievable. I'm sure you'll be able to see those on the live blog. But let's go ahead and welcome in the whole team. We gotta shout out our whole coverage team, Elliot Dan, Pockage Bajwani, Esmond Hang, and Ethan Mansant. Van said, these are the people that brought you the calling, Phuket. Show them, share them some love in the chat. Congratulations to Brody again for taking it all down and on behalf of everyone here at Savage Feeds and Legend Story Studios just want to go ahead and thank you all for hanging out with us all weekend long this has been such a blast we hope you enjoyed watching the coverage and we hope to see you at the next calling out here in this region because let me tell you it was kind of a dream come true I know it was for you Brody congratulations for to you again for all of you watching at home thanks for hanging out and we'll see you at the next one much love we'll see you soon